Red Hood is the revival of the Robin that died. And a lot of people are a fan of Jason Todd's evolution into the Red Hood. Well, today I want to tell you about his origins all the way up to the Under the Red Hood storyline, which is the one everyone knows. Here is Red Hood. Our story begins with Batman and Robin hunting down a child pornography operation in a warehouse in Gotham City. When Batman goes in to shut it down, his partner Robin rushes into combat with reckless abandon. While this is easy work for the dynamic duo to take down these criminals, Batman does reprimand Robin for his brash tactics. When he goes home, he has a discussion with Alfred concerning the boy Wonder, who at this time is Jason Todd. With Dick Grayson recently retired as Robin, he decided to recruit another Robin that he took in from the streets. Something is wrong with this new Robin. Most of it stems from the fact that he's still mourning the loss of his parents, something that Bruce Wayne has put behind him, but Alfred confirms Bruce's suspicions when he decides to remove Jason as an active duty Robin. Jason, however, overhears this argument and then gets into a verbal argument with Bruce before storming off. Batman is called in by Commissioner Gordon because of some very grim news. The Joker has escaped Arkham Asylum, leaving many dead people in his wake. The world's greatest detective is on the case to find out what his oldest rival is up to, and we soon learn that the Joker has escaped only to discover his funds have been depleted. But don't worry, he still has an ace up his sleeve. He has his very own cruise missile. He's had it stowed away for some time, and instead of using it to murder innocents, he decides to hawk the weapon to some terrorists in the Middle East. His goal is for a change of pace that doesn't involve crime, but something involving international politics. And with this money, he just might do that. Meanwhile, Jason Todd is wandering the streets of Gotham alone. He comes across his old home, a place of happier memories. Suddenly, an old neighbor recognizes Jason, and she has a gift for him. Old heirlooms from his family. Jason takes these items back to Wayne Manor to look through them to get in touch with his past. However, he soon comes across his birth certificate, and he learns some shocking news. While his father's name is on the document, his mother's name is different. Water damage has ruined the document, but he identifies the first letter of his mother's name as the letter S. And using his father's old address book, he learns that there are three female contacts with names beginning with that letter. Using the bad computer, Jason soon discovers that these three names are Sharman Rosen, Shiva Woosman, and Dr. Sheila Haywood. All three women are operating overseas in the Middle East and Africa. And so Jason decides that he's going to find them on his own because he thinks Batman wouldn't understand his desire to meet his mother. Using the wealth and resources of Bruce Wayne, Jason leaves Gotham in search of his true birth mother, who might still actually be alive. Little does Jason know, though, Joker has already hijacked a plane with his cruise missile to go to the Middle East. Shortly after, Batman uses his incredible detective skills to discover that Joker is in possession of a nuclear weapon that he deduces that he's taking it to Lebanon to sell to terrorists. However, Alfred informs Batman that Jason has run away, and he has to make the decision to find Jason Todd or pursue his deadliest foe Joker overseas. It's a moral dilemma for Batman that will change his life forever. Batman touches down in Lebanon, and he tracks down the plane that Joker arrived in, and that's when he learns that Joker killed the pilots and successfully transported the cruise missile with him. Batman's worst fears are confirmed. He knows that in order to find Joker, he's gonna have to go through the violent streets of Beirut to track down his prey. Meanwhile, Jason has also arrived in Beirut in search of Charmin Rosen. Using his detective skills, he finds a hotel that she's staying in. Before he's able to ask for her, he's grabbed off the streets by none other than Bruce Wayne. Bruce recently learned that the man selling the missile for the Joker is a man named Peter Brando, and he too is staying in the same hotel. Jason tells Bruce that he's here to track down a woman who might be his mother, and Bruce tells Jason that the reason he's here is to stop the Joker. While it seems that their cases are separate, they soon see Sherman Rosen and Peter Brando walking past the hotel, and that's when they realize they are actually on the same case, and they begin to track the two of them out into the desert of Lebanon using their bat gliders. They soon arrive at a camp near the Israeli border, and lo and behold, Joker is there to make the deal. One million dollars for his cruise missile. The terrorist is anxious to use the weapon and begins to arm it, so Batman and Robin begin to dismantle Joker's thugs and the Palestinian terrorists slowly and methodically. During the fighting, though, Peter Brando realizes that Sharman has been deceiving him and she's actually an Israeli agent and threatens to kill her. Jason, seeing his potential mother in danger, recklessly moves in to stop Peter. Before Brando can pull the trigger, the terrorist arms the cruise missile and launches it, except the missile malfunctions, creating a giant explosion. Somehow, the nuclear warhead did not detonate, but in the chaos, Joker escapes without his precious suitcase filled with all of the money he needs to start his new operation. After all of the villains are cleaned up, Batman and Robin question Charmin Rosen about her past. Had she ever been to Gotham City? And has she ever had a child there? 
Sadly, the answer is no, and Jason tells Batman that he will now go searching for Shiva Woozin back in Barut. Batman agrees to come with him to make sure that he stays out of trouble, and at the nearby airport, Joker in disguise buys a ticket to fly to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, for reasons unknown. The search for Jason's potential mother, Shiva Woozman, begins with a troubling abduction in Barut. Batman and Robin learn that she's been abducted and taken back to Bekaa Valley, and in order to infiltrate their camp, they beat up some terrorists to take their clothes as a disguise. The two begin the dread work of incapacitating the henchmen quickly and quietly, but it all seems so easy to them, too easy. They take a look in the tent where Shiva is supposedly being held captive and she isn't there, and Batman deduces that this is a terrorist training camp, and then a hit over Jason's head leaves him unconscious. Batman turns to learn that Lady Shiva is the woman in charge of this camp, and she also happens to be the woman that they think might be Jason Todd's mother. War proceeds as a magnificent duel of martial arts between Lady Shiva and the caped crusader. She proves to be much more than a match for Batman, and the combat is drawn out until Jason wakes up to see Batman and the woman that he thinks might be his mother fighting to the death. Jason decides to help Batman, and with a surprise strike to her back, Batman finishes off Lady Shiva with a couple of moves knocking her out. He then uses a time-delayed charge to destroy the terrorist camp, and the two take her away for questioning. Again, they ask her a simple question. Did you ever have a child? She gleefully replies that she's had many children all over the world. Batman is obviously not amused by her humor, so he takes out a dose of sodium pentothal to force the truth out of her. This time, the answer is more direct, no. Satisfied, they leave her out in the middle of the desert left with only one more option, the Dr. Sheila Haywood, and it seems that someone else has found her first. Over in a famine relief camp in Ethiopia, an all too familiar face barges in on Dr. Sheila Haywood hard at work, and she recognizes him immediately, the Joker. He knows this woman from her troubled past in Gotham City, and plans to use her connections to gain medical supplies in order to sell them on the black market. Yes, the Joker has been reduced to hijacking trucks. Just another victim of re -economics. That's me. So the Joker's next plan is set, another fateful coincidence. It takes a little time for Batman and Robin to locate Dr. Sheila Haywood in the Ethiopian refugee camp. Innocent starving refugees are all around them, and perhaps this is the place where Jason Todd's true mother is. They easily find her tent, and then the two of them, in their public identities of Bruce Wayne and Jason Todd, introduce themselves. Sheila immediately realizes that Jason is her long-lost son, and in a moment of elation, the two embrace, and Batman looks on. He leaves them for a time to have their happy reunion, and the doctor relates her sad story to Jason, revealing that after giving birth to him, she was a part of a botched operation and it ruined her medical career in the United States. She fled for England, where his father, Willis Todd, was going to meet her. However, he fell in love with Katherine Johnson, and the two of them got married. After that happened, she abandoned Jason because she didn't think she would ever win a custody battle because of her troubled past. She has since dedicated her life to helping people, but the reunion is cut short as she gets back to work distributing food to the refugees. Jason walks along in the camp when he recognizes that familiar face in skin-colored makeup, the Joker. He walks into Sheila's tent, and Jason eavesdrops on their conversation. He learns that the Joker is blackmailing Sheila in order to enact his villainous scheme. Joker leaves with Dr. Haywood to go to a warehouse where the medical supplies are being kept, and Jason follows, acting alone without Batman. He follows them to the warehouse where he learns that Joker is taking medical crates and replacing them with crates of a lethal laughing gas to kill everyone in four acres after they get opened. With this grim news, Jason heads off to find Batman, and he relays the evil plan to Batman, but by the time they get back to the warehouse, they see the trucks are already delivering the crates of deadly gas to the nearby camp. Batman begins to think that they can stop them in time with his mini bat helicopter, but he has to go alone. It is a mini bat helicopter, not the big one. He tells Jason to watch after the warehouse with explicit warning, do not act until he returns. But as the bat helicopter takes off, Jason makes a bold decision to save his mother from the clown prince of crime. He goes into the warehouse and he finds Dr. Haywood, and he tells her that he knows what's going on and reveals to her that he's actually Robin the Boy Wonder Batman's sidekick. And she tells him that the Joker is long gone and guides him into a warehouse to show him something. That something is the Joker with a gang of thugs in tow. Jason turns around, and then what should have been the happiest day of his life turns into the worst day of his life as he sees his own mother pointing a gun at him. It seems that the good doctor has been embezzling medical supplies on her own to make money on the side, and if he interferes, it could make her life worse. With Jason surrounded, the Joker proceeds to give Jason the beating of a lifetime. He can barely fight back, and the Joker nearly beats him to death with a crowbar. Blood is everywhere, and his mother looks on and lights a cigarette. Batman is in hot pursuit of the military truck with the poison gas, but his bat helicopter gets shot down by unsuspecting soldiers. After incapacitating the soldiers, Batman tells the drivers that this crisis is over and to turn around. Batman needs to get back to Jason, and he uses one of the convoy trucks to race back to the warehouse, where the Joker is. Speaking of the Joker, he's back in the warehouse deciding his next move. 
With Jason near death, he decides to tie up Dr. Haywood and blow the warehouse up to remove any evidence that he did this. Sheila is helpless to do anything after being betrayed by the Joker. And as time is ticking away on the bomb, Jason miraculously gets a second win and he unties his mother. But he's too beat up to deactivate the bomb. And their best option is to escape. With only seconds to spare, they make their way to the door, only to find that it's locked. The Joker locked them in the warehouse. Batman sees the Joker driving off and he opts to go to the warehouse to see if Jason is alright. But as he arrives in his truck, he sees a massive explosion. Jason! Oh my god! Oh my god, no! Now, at the end of Batman 427, there's a famous page that followed the exploding warehouse. It was an advertisement for readers to decide what was going to happen next. And there were two 1-800 numbers printed there. One was to tell DC that Jason Todd Robin should live. The other one was to tell DC that Jason Todd Robin should die. And so... On September 16th of 1988, the comic book readers would decide the fate of the boy wonder. What happened next was the result of those phone calls. Batman slowly walks through the remains of the warehouse that he left Jason at to watch over. Worry begins to wash over his face as he braces for the worst, and he blames himself for leaving Jason behind. He regrets his decision that led him to recruiting another Robin after Dick moved on. He moves through his memories of Jason Todd from his first meeting to their encounter with Two-Face, and as he looks through the rubble of his memories and the warehouse, he finds Dr. Sheila Haywood lying there, nearly dead. In her last breath, she tells Batman that the Joker trapped them in the warehouse with the bomb in order to kill them. And in the final moments before the explosion, Jason jumped in front of her to save her life. He was the hero in the end. He was a good boy. He loved his mother. With the regrets of her own life choices, she dies in Batman's arms. And the Dark Knight silently continues to go through the wreckage, hoping beyond hope that Jason is okay. And he sees him at last. He goes to check for a pulse. And there's nothing. He's lost him. Jason Todd, the boy wonder, is dead. The Joker is off selling his stolen medical supplies. As he receives his money, two secret servicemen from Iran are there to meet him. They are there at the behest of a man that wished to speak with the Joker. They go into the next room to find that it is the Grand Ayatollah himself, and he's there to offer the Clown Prince of Crime a government position. The Joker's dream has come true. Back at the ruins, Batman as Bruce Wayne deals with the authorities. He removes any evidence of Robin's disguise and he answers the questions that they have, keeping the truth to himself. No authority will keep him from dealing with the Joker. Soon after, Batman follows the Joker to his location in Ethiopia. And the only thing that he can find is a warehouse filled with dead henchmen and a bloody message. B. See you at 42nd and 1st. J. Batman takes the body of Sheila and Jason back to Gotham, where they have a small funeral that only Commissioner Gordon, Barbara Gordon, and Alfred attend. No one knew the identity of Jason Todd, and all of his family is gone. Alfred tells Batman that he can contact the Nightwing to help him, but Bruce refuses. No help from here on. That's the way I want it. Batman quickly deduces the address that the Joker gave him was not in Gotham, but in New York City at the United Nations Plaza. And when he gets there, he's prepared to find out what the Joker's game is. But that's when he's greeted by someone else entirely different, Superman. Superman is there at the request of the State Department because the Iranian government warned them that Batman may arrive. Superman tells Batman that there is a new ambassador for Iran who has diplomatic immunity and all of his past crimes are washed away. Superman is there to stop an international incident and he tells Batman to walk away. But Batman finds it weird because Superman refuses to state who the ambassador is and he even punches the Man of Steel out of anger, bruising his hand. It is then that the new Iranian ambassador steps out of a car and it is as Batman feared. The Joker is the ambassador. Batman has a meeting with a CIA agent who tells him that he needs to leave the Joker alone and the president has asked Superman to keep Batman from doing anything that might start a war with Iran. After the agent leaves, Superman asks Batman about the death of his ward, Jason Todd. And Batman confirms that it was Robin and the Joker is responsible. Superman pleads with him not to put his vengeance above the country's interests. But Batman will not be swayed from his mission and he leaves. Bruce Wayne begins to pull strings so that he can attend the UN meeting where the Iranian ambassador is going to be speaking. But that isn't for another day, so Batman decides to hunt down the Joker where he's staying. Batman gives Joker the ultimatum, surrender yourself to Arkham Asylum. The Joker knows that there is nothing Batman can do, so he just mocks him and his dead partner Robin. This gives Batman the confirmation that he needed to truly learn that the Joker killed Jason Todd. Batman leaves before the Joker can shoot him, and at the UN meeting the next night, Bruce Wayne is in attendance, and the Joker takes the stage. He stands there and he gives a crazy speech about how the UN will not be allowed to keep Iran down. And then he unleashes poisonous laughing gas on the UN members in attendance. All of the world's leaders would have surely been dead, but Superman in disguise was there to save the day. Superman breathes in all of the deadly laughing gas, and he stops the Joker's mad plot. But 
the Joker has a backup plan. Explosives set in the UN building overnight. In the mayhem, Batman jumps out and he begins to fight with the Joker, but the Joker has already started his getaway and he runs out of the building towards a helicopter. Batman leaps after him, jumping on board as it takes off. On board the helicopter, Arab bodyguards shoot indiscriminately at Batman and the Joker, wounding the Joker and killing the pilot, which causes the helicopter to crash into a nearby building exploding with the Joker in it. Before the crash, Batman leaps out of the helicopter and into the water below, with Superman there to pull him out. Batman demands that they find the corpse of the Joker, but he knows they won't. The struggle of Batman and the Joker is once again left unresolved, with the death of Jason Todd in their wake. Our story begins years ago at Ra's al Ghul's mansion while he discusses business with his daughter Talia. As the two talk, Ra's mentions that the detective's partner has been killed. Jason Todd is no longer in the world of the living. The ramblings indicate that it was at the hands of the Joker, and Talia stops asking, how is he? And Ra's says, well, the boy is dead, crushed in an explosion in a warehouse. Talia tells him, no, how is Batman? Roz says that he is unharmed, but if you're asking about his emotional state, I would obviously have no knowledge of that. Don't act as though I am unaware of the feelings you have for him. As Roz walks off, he tells her that they will monitor talk in Gotham, but she must mind her work. She is not to reach out to him on this. As the months go by, Talia keeps tabs on Gotham, gathering any information on Batman and his mental state. However, one night she found someone else. Someone who looked like Jason Todd. As Roz and Talia watch from a control room, Roz says that he wants to see it. The young man before them was unresponsive in any way, except whenever he was attacked. When Roz gave the order, the men below began to attack Jason, and as a reflex, Jason knocked out each of them. After he was done, he returned to his unresponsive state, not even saying a word. The next day, Talia speaks with Roz, telling him that this man is half dead received massive trauma, has flash burns from an explosion, and he was found wandering a road in a suit and tie. His clothes were dirty with soil, and he had dirt in his fingernails, which would indicate that he... Roz finishes the sentence, stating, he dug himself out of a buried coffin. Talia goes on stating that he is not a clone. Their blood samples match those that they were able to obtain, meaning that this person is the real Jason Todd. As Roz watches the doctors walking with Jason, he tells Talia that he wants her to find out how this man cheated death. Sift through every inch of dirt that he has ever walked on, and no matter what, the detective must not know about this. After speaking with the thug, he beat Jason with a crowbar. Going through the police reports, and even investigating the coffin that Jason crawled out of, Talia is nowhere closer to finding any answers. As time went on, Talia continued testing Jason, and the doctor watching over him says that his physical conditioning isn't an issue. It's his mental capacity. He's not improving. He doesn't respond to anything other than when he's attacked, which could be some form of muscle memory. Jason eats, he covers himself when he's cold, but he has no sense of the world. By now, they would have hoped to have seen his brain utilizing other undamaged cells, but he's not getting any better. Talia tells the doctor that he is wrong, and then she heads down into the room with everyone. She slaps Jason across the face and shouts, you will never fight her. So if it's just him reacting to attacks, explain that to her. After the testing, Talia takes Jason outside and tells him that he misses him. Since losing him, he has changed. He's become unforgiving. And in a way, she thinks that maybe him and Dick Grayson gave him light, gave him hope. He feels responsible for this, feels as if he failed. He really does miss him. But as Jason sits there, he doesn't respond. And then Talia sees a single tear running down Jason's cheek. After bringing Jason back home, Roz stops Talia, telling her that this ends now. We've had the boy for over a year. We have no clue how he came to be. This whole thing has since turned into an obsession. Talia says that Jason is getting better, and in time they will learn the truth. If not from research, then Jason himself. Roz tells her to stop. He knows what this is truly about, and no, he won't love her for this performing a miracle and restoring the boy to everything that he was, and then returning him to the detective, it will not make him love her. In the morning, we will be sending the boy away to be cared for and kept, protected and sheltered out of respect for his mentor and his present caretaker. As Roz retires down to the Lazarus pit, Talia thinks that tonight they shall leave then. Centuries ago, her father discovered these fountains of youth, and since then has deemed that he and he alone will bathe in their waters. Jason was dead, murdered, 
buried, and mourned. But for him to return to this world is a miracle. Jason Todd was meant for something, and only time will tell what that is. She's doing this out of love and hopes that in stepping into the Lazarus Pit, it will guide him into what he is to become. A short while later, after learning what happened, Roz shouts, demanding to know where he is. I am to believe that you have taken Jason half a mile from the sanctum of the pit to a cliffside and hurled him into the waters with only a survival kit? How can you be so sure that the pit has not driven him mad? Perhaps not tonight or tomorrow. It could take weeks or months or decades. You have no conception of the power that you are trifling with. Jason Todd is an unknown entity. We do not know what force has returned him from beyond. And you have just empowered him with the nature of the pit. Elsewhere, as Jason walks throughout the streets, he begins to think. The Joker had murdered him, but he's still alive. The Joker is alive to hurt, kill, maim. Still alive to rob people of their friends and families. He has to know what he did, how he left him, how it felt, and now he's back and no one knows why. But he does. It's obvious. He's come back to do what needs to be done. Several days later in Gotham, Jason sits in an alley looking at the Batmobile. For someone to catch Batman, they will have to wait and put the time in. Which lucky for him, he has plenty of, thanks to Talia, access to some very fat overseas accounts. So to lure out Batman, one would have to set up a deal that even he couldn't ignore. Find the biggest fish so that he could take the bait. All the while, Batman is off dealing with a fake setup. It's just to know how to deal with him. There are a few things about the Batmobile that no one except him, Grayson, and Alfred would ever know. It can sense thermals, air currents, and even has video recognition. But even there are chinks in the armor. For example, this wetsuit is made of a high-end seal work, invisible to thermal, and has reflective fibers, which happens to play hell with video. So to do this, you would have to be slow. Five seconds per inch slow. But still leave plenty of time to plant the bomb and make it out before Batman gets back. As Jason finishes up, he heads into the abandoned apartments overlooking the alley, and he waits for him to return. While he watches, he thinks, how hard could it have been? Just killed the monster that took me away. The truth is that Batman never really did give a damn about his Robins. He was the one that made this happen. He has no one else to blame but himself. As Batman returns to the Batmobile, Jason gets ready to press the switch. And he decides not to. Later, Jason tells Talia that it's not what she thinks. He didn't lose his nerve. He just couldn't let him go so easy. He would have never known what happened or why. Batman would never know that it was him. So instead of killing him from the shadows, he will face him. He will kill him with his own hands. Batman will see his face just before he's taken out of this world. Jason then turns back asking, will you help? And Talia tells him, of course. But in her mind, she thinks back to what her father said and says that he was right. She has unleashed a curse upon this world. Later, and with Talia's connections, Jason meets with the German known as Egon. He loves ska music and drinks a disgusting cherry-flavored energy drink all day. And he murders people for a living. And he's teaching him how it's done. He brings down a man and he says, that's good, now how would you finish him? Jason puts his foot to his neck and Egon tells him that the neck is thick and might not give. Jason then says that he puts his full weight behind it maybe, but he is also knocked out. So he could always stomp on the bridge of his nose and get into his brain pan. Egon says, fair enough but you're still stupidly going for the head and not the eyes. Getting angry too easily will just waste and show that you're an idiot. As the two walk out, Egon mentions that he may have broken his ribs in there. Derek will escort him into the city to get some x-rays. Jason tells him it's probably just a bruise and Egon stops him telling him that he pays weekly. If he punctured any of his lungs and dies, he loses his fee. So go to the town. Days go by as Jason continues his training, but one night after returning, Derek asks, what's your story? How does some kid have enough money to buy time with Egon? Jason brushes off the question and he tells him that he always invested wisely. And Derek goes on telling him, Yeah, everyone has their secrets. But I've been watching and I can tell you're good. That's why me and another guy have been talking. Maybe we can get you some work with us. Before Jason can answer, he listens and hears footsteps coming, but not coming for him. So it's best to just watch. Seconds later, Egon kicks Derek in the back and then again in the face. After he falls, he goes stomping on Derek's face and then he tells Jason that he will forgive him. Some of his men forget that they have to refrain from discussions. Jan will take him back to his room now. As Jason gets into the truck, he notices two trucks off in the distance and he hears whimpering. But not the whimpers that dogs make. After staying with the Germans so long, Jason has learned their patterns. And when people are watching him and when they are not, and right now he only has two hours to figure out what's in those trucks. As Jason jumps out of his window, he remembers Egon mentioning something about the west side before being brought back. 
and so he decides to head down the west road. After sneaking down the snowy roads, Jason finds the west side compound and he sees trucks from before, and then he moves in closer. When he looks into the window, he sees the trucks were moving children, and by his count, there's 42 of them, all drugged, all undernourished. Jason then looks back at Egon's office and he sneaks in to look through any paperwork as to what he could be doing. And once inside, Jason finds a ledger. And though he's been writing in code, Jason can make out numbers. Big numbers. This is a slave trade. Egon is selling those children. And as Egon's men start to load the children back up into the truck, Jason says that it's going to take them about 45 minutes before they can get on the road and move out. It will leave him plenty of time. After finishing loading up all of the children, Egon's men drive out, but before they can get any farther, they find a flaming truck in the middle of the road. The passenger shouts to the driver to turn back, but as he finishes his sentence, the driver is shot in the arm. As the passenger leans back up, he feels like gun being pressed against his head, and Jason tells him that he is bleeding out through his shoulder, so he can either drive or take a bullet, his choice. A few hours later, Egon returns to the office shouting on the phone that they are two hours late. Find out where they went! But back in the office, the door opens and Jason tells him, It's okay, I got them. And he fires a shot into Egon. Egon ducks and then he tackles Jason outside shouting and asking, What is he doing? Egon then slams Jason into a tree and Jason tells him, It's cute, your accent gets thicker when you're pissed off. Then Egon headbutts him and throws him to the ground shouting that he can beat him. He taught him how to fight. And Jason tells him, No, you can't. That's why I poisoned your energy drinks. Egon stumbles back as he begins to foam with the mouth and then he falls to his knees motionless. Some time passes and Talia meets with Jason and tells him, it's funny, she finds him a teacher and he murders him. Jason tells her that murder sounds fancy. He didn't orchestrate whacking him over inheritance. He was a killer for hire and he made extra money selling children as sex toys. So tell him that the world isn't better off without him. Talia smiles and Jason asks, what's that for? And Talia tells him, nothing. It's just that you're learning. After some time, Jason's next stop is London to learn about the bomb making from Shurik Avanko. He has worked with IRL, PLO, and a few Aryan supremacist groups in Germany, and now him. After a day of working together, Shurik tells Jason that he can come with them to have a drink with his friends. They're Russians, and they might not be as smart as him, but they are good drinkers. As Jason sits with everyone, they all laugh and they drink, and then Jason sees another man walk into the bar. Shurik tells the group that he'll be a moment. He's just making some more room for vodka. Then he enters the bathroom with the man. His name is Yuri Karnov. He's in the Russian mob. Later that night at another pub, Jason tells Talia that it wasn't hard for him to find information on Yuri. In fact, he's well known. Yuri is a part of the Ivangen clan, and they've got three police task forces and Interpol crawling all over them, which means a person will wonder why they need a bomber. Talia says that this is becoming a habit, his little investigations into the inner workings of these criminal organizations. A pattern has formed between them, Talia and Jason. She is assisting him in finding teachers. He studies under them to expand his repertoire, and then half of them end up dead. Jason tells her, it's not without reason. The surveillance expert was a pedophile. The small arms guy ran a smack ring, but half of his product was poison. And the close combat master was planning on killing her own husband and daughters. Talia sits back stating, she isn't criticizing, just pointing out the obvious. His road to revenge seems to have brought on a new interest or an old one. She pulls out a folder from her purse saying that she has some new business and she wanted to show him. Jason pulls the photos out and he sees Batman and a new Robin. Talia tells him that she has some operatives doing low-level work in Gotham, and these photos were taken 72 hours ago. The new Robin. His name is Timothy Drake. Talia then asks if he's going to be alright, and Jason tells her, Ha! <laughs> sure! Why wouldn't I? As he goes back to his room, he lines the photos on his walls. And he stares. The next day, he heads out to follow Shurik to an old barn where Yuri has come out to meet them. As Jason listens in, Yuri says that they need to move their plan up by three weeks and know they don't have a choice. The longer that they wait, the more connections that they lose. Their business is already dying. Shurik tells him that he can't do nine targets in that time. He could do maybe six, maybe seven. Yuri tells him that's fine as long as the blame goes where it's supposed to. And as they go on, Jason learns that Yuri has hired Shurik to detonate a series of bombs all over London and make it look like an era terrorist cell. The UK will focus on their terrorists and they will leave the clan alone seeing them as a second tier problem. All they have to do is murder 700 people in a single afternoon. Shurik once told him that if he was going to do a big job make sure to have a staging area so that if the need comes he can abandon his work and never return. 
As Jason looks into the warehouse where they're having their meeting at, he finds the bombs and he thinks that it's good that Shurik takes his own advice. Shurik made the bombs pretty low tech to hide the fact that they were going to be detonated remotely, but after changing around some of the wires and the faulty ones, all he'll have are duds. Just as Jason shuts the case of the bombs, Yuri's men appear asking what the hell is going on. And Jason thinks that he's lucky that they're in London and no one is supposed to be carrying guns, because that means that he can fight them off. However, through the punches, Jason hears a click and the sound of metal. A clip going into an MP5. As the gunman opens fire, Jason jumps back and he quickly sees that since he's been using handsprings, he dropped his own gun. He looks around and sees the front door is blocked so there's only one thing that he can do. He starts pushing the boxes forward to where the bombs are being kept and he tosses one of them at the hitman. As they look at the bomb slide by, they ask what is that and Jason jumps up telling him, it's my exit strategy. He runs straight at the door and the bomb goes off, launching him outside. And when he looks up, he sees Yuri and Yuri tells his men to kill him. And Jason stands up telling him, just wait a second. I came down here to work on the bombs. Shurik told me the deadline had been moved up and he didn't want to tell you that he needed more time. So I'm only here to help. Yuri tells one of his men to call Shurik to confirm that story, but before the call can connect, Jason vomits all over Yuri's shoes. He wipes his mouth, telling him, I'm sorry, I'm just so nervous sometimes. And in the moment of hesitation from Yuri's men, Jason grabs Yuri and pulls out his gun, shooting Yuri in the foot. He then spins Yuri around and holds the gun to his head, telling the other men that Yuri will bleed out in just a second. I shot off a chunk of his foot. So before the police can arrive and find all of us carrying illegal firearms in a burning building, we should probably go our separate ways. The men keep their guns trained at Jason and Yuri shouts for them, to just let him go! After escaping from the clan, Jason heads over to Shurik's place to find some more information. Once he tied up Shurik and placed a bomb over him, Shurik began to tell him all about Yuri's plan. The bombs are going to be placed in the Arab teen's backpacks and detonated to act as if they were just another suicide bomber. Jason races through London deactivating the bombs on Yuri's list, all except for one. The girl Susan is not where she was supposed to be, so Jason calls her, telling her that she needs to pull over wherever she is. Susan says that she's sorry, but who is he again? Jason shouts, I'm Detective Miles, and I have reason to believe that your life is in danger. You need to pull over and give me your location. Susan says that she can't. She's on the Westminster Bridge. Jason swerves through the traffic, asking, what kind of car are you in? And after giving the description, Jason quickly pulls up next to her. He shouts, hand over the bag! And Susan says that she's not sure, until she opens the bag and sees a bomb. Susan tosses the bag out, and Jason takes it and pulls the bomb out to defuse it. But as he does, a real officer shouts to Jason, asking, what do you think you're doing parking your bike on a sidewalk? Jason pulls his gun out, and he points it at the officer, telling him to hush! Daddy's busy! Jason continues his work and he sees that the bomb isn't set up by remote, it's set up by timer. And time's almost up. He looks over the bridge and tells the officer that he wants it noted for the record. I did check for ships below. And he tosses the bomb. An explosion goes off in the water and everyone runs over to see what's going on. Using that opportunity, Jason jumps back on his bike and he heads back to his hideout. Right now, he just needs to get out of there. There's too many people that have seen his face today and he should have enough time to. But as he opens up his door to his flat, he sees Yuri and his men and he tells them, Hey, you wouldn't happen to be here to fix the toilet, would you? He runs in knocking out the first few men and then he takes out his gun and starts to shoot out the rest of them. One by one, Yuri's men fall and then finally Yuri himself. As Jason holds his gun to the last man's head, he pulls the trigger and he only gets a click. He says that it looks like he's out of ammo and then he smacks the man with the pistol telling him, it's okay, I got another. The man shouts begging for him not to kill him. He has connections, he can get him merchandise, drugs, anything he wants. And Jason tells him that he'll pass. As he holds the gun up to the man, he goes on telling him, I can get you one of the 10 most wanted men. I know where the Joker is. Jason pulls his gun back, telling him, okay, now you have my attention. It doesn't take long to find out that what the man was saying about having the Joker's location was actually true. However, the problem right now is that he can't hear much because of some audio issues. The one thing that he can really make out is that the Joker is asking if everyone's happy now because apparently he just shot two of his own men. The Joker was to meet up with some armed traffickers and he said that he would bring four men with him and he ended up bringing six. Since the traffickers were getting a little edgy that he brought six, well, the Joker just killed two of his own men to make it more even for them. He shouts, now that we've got that out of the way, shall we continue and get this little shindig into full swing? What the Joker is buying is something new. It's a liquid that can travel through water, and once exposed to the air, it bursts into flames. The Joker is revamping his original plan of poisoning Gotham's water supply, so when people turn on their tap, flames will shoot out instead of water. The trafficker says that he can get them the shipment by water, the Port of Los Angeles, Site 7, in four hours. As the night begins to set, Joker meets up at the docks to get ready for the exchange, but as he stands there, he sees a car speeding towards them. Joker tells one of the traffickers that, ah, uh, there's a dune buggy heading right for us. So do that thing where you shoot at it a lot to make it stop. 
The traffickers open fire on the car until it comes to a rolling stop right in front of them. But as the traffickers move in to take a look, Joker decides that it's best to just run now. Seconds later, the car releases a gas into the air, causing all of the traffickers to stop and cough, and then Jason jumps out of the trunk and he fires a shot into the Joker's leg. Jason then heads over to where the Joker fell and he tells him, that's gotta hurt. Just hang in there, there's a lot more of it to come. But before he can open fire again, he's shot in the back by the traffickers and the Joker laughs. <laughs> There's gonna be a lot more of that too! Jason quickly grabs the Joker and he pulls him into a warehouse telling himself, It ends right here, right now. And the Joker says, You know, it won't take them long to get through the door. So whatever dance party you've got planned, I'm coming close to pumpkin time! Jason takes out the nozzle of gas and says, Don't worry, this won't take long. And he pours the gas all over the Joker. The Joker laughs as he coughs. <laughs> <laughs> if I'd known this was gonna be that kind of a party, I would've worn shorts! But as he continues to laugh, Jason takes out a lighter telling him, SHUT UP! He looks at the fire thinking, you're gonna laugh at first, but then the pain will hit and then you'll scream. But after your lungs go out, well, you'll be gone. Jason starts remembering back to when the Joker was hitting him with a crowbar, and then he flips the lighter shut. The next morning, Jason tells Talia that he didn't do it because he was rushed. It just simply wouldn't have been enough. It would have been a quick and agonizing death and the world would have been a much better place for it, but when he thinks about it, he really doesn't care about the world. He realized that this isn't about the Joker. Hell, it's not even about Bruce or even himself. It's about all three of us. When this ends, however it ends, it'll be me, the Psycho, and Batman. Talia asks if he's still planning on killing Batman and for a moment, Jason smiles. He says that he knows that she doesn't want him to and he gets that she loves him, but he's not sure murdering him is part of the plan anymore. Talia says that if you won't murder him, then punish him. Take what is most important to him. Take Gotham from him. Be the man that he never would be. Cross that line. Jason pauses for a moment, and then Talia says that her father is dead. He's, he's gone. Ra's al Ghul is no more. He did it. The Batman. So punish him. Punish him for all of them. And then Talia leans in and grabs Jason by the shirt and kisses him. Later that day, Jason wakes back up to see Talia gone on a message on his computer. The message says that the purchasing of Wayne Tech was successful, and the trail of him never existing ends with the coffin maker. So they also have a new business deal. There's a man going by the name of Hush, and he should probably meet him. Later that night, Hush asks, So you've got insight on Batman, right? What's it gonna cost me? And Jason tells him, Nothing. But when the time comes, I want to face him in person. Hush tells him, Fair enough. There's also something else that I've heard. The Riddler claims that he solved the mystery of Batman's identity. He claims that he's Bruce Wayne, is that true? Jason waits for a moment and he tells him, yeah, Bruce Wayne is Batman. As Jason heads out to the hideout, he finds the company that Bruce uses to make his gadgets is now within his grasp. So everything Batman has, he can have. Talia also left behind another present, a replica of a dagger her father once used. Jason then thinks back to his days as Robin and Bruce telling him not to take the Joker lightly. That he's not like the others, that he can't be reasoned with. If he's not careful with him, he will die. And as Jason thinks back on those words, he holds up the Red Hood mask. Sitting in the streets, a man is pondering the poor decisions that got him to this point, trying to figure out what he should do. Should he move on? Should he stay here? That's when he feels the drops of blood hitting his forehead. He stands up and he looks to the top of the building, but it's too far. He can't quite make out what's going on. If only he understood how important this moment really was, the true magnitude of what was happening above him. It's because it's actually the battle between the Red Hood and Batman, and that blood is the bats. He falls to the ground and the Red Hood takes out a knife, pointing it directly at him. Tired? Batman thinks about it. This guy likes to talk, but it's not ego, it's a distraction. Red Hood jumps into the air, kneeing Batman in the chin, and Batman realizes whoever this is. He came ready. He fights smart. The knife alone is built to cut through the belt, the body armor, and anything else that Batman uses to protect himself. Using the small opening that he sees, Batman grabs the Red Hood by the jacket and hurls him off of the roof. As the Red Hood drives his blade into the wall to stop himself, Batman comes barreling down on top of him, kicking him off of it, and sending him to the alley below. He lands on the Red Hood and he begins to swing at his head, but Red Hood reaches up grabbing at the cowl, tearing it off, leaving Bruce Wayne looking back at him. Red Hood and Batman both stand up and they stare at each other. Look at you. I guess we should keep it even, the Red Hood says, as he releases the pressure holding his helmet on. He lets it hit the ground with a thunk, and Bruce stares at him. 
Oh God. But this is not where the story begins. Oh no. It starts five weeks earlier. Lucius Fox arrived to inform Mr. Wayne that all of his R&D tech is about to hit the public sector due to a hostile takeover of $560 million. They also removed Bruce Wayne from the board of directors. Realizing that this means that at best he loses his future development and at worst every psychopathic enemy of his gains use of the bat toys, Bruce suits up and he heads out for the night. Over in a warehouse in the seedy part of town, a bunch of gang leaders talk about the situation with Black Mask running the show. Then they begin to question who set up this particular meeting, because Black Mask doesn't seem to be here. They all thought it was each other or Black Mask himself. And then a scattering of bullets hits the table and everyone looks up to see the Red Hood standing there with a gun. He welcomes them to his new organization. Here in the Red Hood gang, you'll get total protection from Batman and the Black Mask. Oh, and you have no choice but to join. To hammer home his point, he throws a duffel bag full of heads onto the table. There are your lieutenants. It took me about two hours to kill them all. Imagine what I could do with the whole evening. Word quickly got back to Black Mask, who wasn't exactly happy that he just lost his troops. So he brought in someone else to help kill this mysterious Red Hood, Mr. Freeze. The next night, Batman is off doing his usual, beating up thugs and hanging out on rooftops until Nightwing shows up to say, Hi. Batman turns to him. Are you checking up on me? And Nightwing grins. It's exactly what I'm doing here, in light of recent events. Bloodhaven is your home. New York is where you work now with the outlaws. How does Gotham fit into that? Good to see you too. I'm working a case. If you want to stay, I won't stop you. Meanwhile, Black Mask has his best men working on making Mr. Freeze a new suit. His assistant David walks in telling him that he has information on this new player. He goes by the name Red Hood. Black Mask then looks at a monitor overlooking the harbor. I'm already ahead of you, David. Down on that harbor, thugs are loading up weapons that Black Mask has secured until the big boot of Batman comes flying in, kicking him in the chest. Nightwing jumps in after him, asking the guys, hey, where'd you get the guns? High tech gun show or off the internet? The two then show us why they're the greatest superheroes in the world, as they flip, punch, and cartwheel around these thugs, dropping them one at a time. And eventually they make their way inside and they pop open one of those crates to find Joker bombs, Captain Boomerangs, Boomerangs, and Mr. Freeze's guns. Both of them wonder who's been trading off the weapons of Batman's enemies. And then the bombs begin to tick. Batman shouts, move! And through the fire and destruction, Red Hood is watching from the pier. He watches as Batman and Nightwing swim up and he makes sure that they see him as he takes off on the rooftops. Batman and Nightwing give chase and right away they notice that the Red Hood is fast, agile, and capable of every move that he is attempting to make. He's been trained well. And Batman notices that there is something about his moves, something that stands out. Something familiar. As Batman throws a grappling line around the Red Hood's hand, Red Hood cuts it off before it can even go taunt. He looks back at Batman almost as if he knows what Batman is thinking. How did he know that I was going to cut that cord? And then he leaps through a skyline and into a dark room. Nightwing looks at Batman. Impressive. Nothing we haven't seen before. And they both leap. Or done before. They both come crashing in after Red Hood and they look around. Batman tells Nightwing, stay sharp. And that's where we see where this Red Hood character was leading them. Into another warehouse with Amazo. Amazo is a highly advanced android with the abilities and powers of the full Justice League, with the primary function of destroying them. Batman and Nightwing are outclassed in every way. Batman leaps over Amazo's head using bat grenades on him, only to have Amazo knock them away smiling. You'll have to do better than that. Batman turns his back. I did. Amazo then notices another explosive in his leg and the entire area explodes as Batman takes cover. Both Batman and Nightwing run out of the building as Amazo runs through the wall chasing them. As Batman and Nightwing leave, Batman tells him, it's an older model, no plastic man or Green Lantern ring or Wonder Woman lasso. And Nightwing tells him, well, I feel lucky then. Amazo leaps into the air, demonstrating flight as he grabs Nightwing, but Batman throws a grappling line onto Amazo's leg and he gets pulled along. As Nightwing takes out two batterings, he jams them into Amazo's ears. All three of them begin to tumble back down to the ground, and as they catch themselves on a fire escape, Amazo tears it out of the wall. Heat vision and his strength are displayed as the caped crusader and his former sidekick dodge and mess with him. Batman eventually gets his plastic explosives onto Amazo's eyes, taking those out of the equation, and then he runs Amazo over with a Batmobile. As they load up trying to figure out who is buying and selling high-tech villain weapons and killer androids, Red Hood makes a call. He calls up Black Mask and he asks, Can I call you Mr. Mask? Or Blackie? Black Mask replies, telling him, 
I'm thinking of killing you. And Red Hood tells him, Now that is no way to start our relationship. I have something that you want. Something that you thought you were gonna get. Pretty sure it's a top shelf item. Black Mask curses and then asks, What is it? It's a box filled with 100 pounds of kryptonite. Black Mask's eyes go wide. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna need that. Red Hood negotiates it down to $14 million. Tonight, and he gives them a place to meet. But once he hangs up, Black Mask has another idea and he sends out Mr. Freeze to that location. The door to the warehouse opens and they walk in with a briefcase of money to show the Red Hood. Red Hood points his guns at Mr. Freeze. How do I know you didn't shove Chinese newspaper under the top layer? Freeze stares at him. It's actually six inches of Gotham Guardian. And he opens fire on Hood. Red Hood fires back with a crack, 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 and the freeze gun blasts the wall with a scrag. The Red Hood leaps over, tumbling onto the ground, dodging the regular bullets from the thugs. And then all of the crates in the room open up, showing turrets, and they kill everyone but Freeze. Red Hood then leaps over Freeze's head, slapping a bomb onto his helmet, which blows up, not even breaking the glass. You have succeeded in making me angry. And then a grappling line fires around Freeze's arm, and Batman informs him. You're not the only one. Nightwing and Red Hood begin trading blows until Red Hood hits another button, popping more turrets out that open fire on Freeze again. Freeze is unfazed as he throws the Batarang aside, and then he blasts the ground, lifting himself into the air and out the roof. Nightwing walks over to Batman to inform him. Red Hood split as well. He's good. Very good. Batman grits his teeth. Yeah. Very good. Later that night, Red Hood walks into an amusement park. It didn't take him long to find the person that he was looking for. It's a reunion of revenge. And this one is particularly funny. He walks into one of the rooms to see the Joker himself sitting there with his head and his knees. He looks up asking, Who are you? And the Red Hood grabs him and he raises the crowbar. He brings it across the Joker's face and then he hits him again and again, over and over with no mercy, allowing the blood to fly through the air. And then, as the Joker is unconscious in a pool of his own blood, Red Hood removes his mask and he asks, Tell me, how does that feel? And that's when we see, it's Jason Todd, former Robin, former dead Robin. The Red Hood is still off causing problems for Black Mask though, as he blows up another of his transports. Black Mask turns to his assistant, wanting to know, what did we lose? He's told that it's a bunch of rifles, and he responds by telling the assistant to send down a couple of his best men, to which Daniel, his assistant, replies with, he already did, and now they're missing. They look at the situation and Daniel explains, this guy is sending a message. He isn't stealing the weapons, he's destroying them. Black Mask turns back, well, he's not just our problem, so let's get someone else to take out our trash. Meanwhile, somewhere else in the world, Batman stands with Zatanna at a temple, and she tells him that it's sealed. Can't he see that? Batman tells her, I do. They both look down at the sealed Lazarus pit in front of them. So why did you drag me out here if you already knew that it was sealed? I didn't seal this one when I destroyed them all. All right, but why am I here? Can the Lazarus pit raise the dead? No, it rejuvenates the living. Is that a theory or a fact? I guess it's a fact, but, well, it's what I've always heard. Then it's a theory. I still need to know why you wanted me here, Batman. I needed someone that I could trust, but I had to settle for you. He then takes off in the Batplane as Zatanna is left to wonder what that was all about. There is tension between Batman and Zatanna, and it's from Identity Crisis. I'll link that down below. Meanwhile, in Gotham, Onyx is looking at some of the thugs. She jumps down into the group and begins to beat them, demanding to know who they work for. And they tell her, the Red Hood. Meanwhile, over at Star City, Batman is looking at a living Green Arrow. He died and was raised from the dead recently, and Batman wants to know how. Green Arrow explains that he died in a plane crash, and that Hal Jordan gave his gift to him to allow him to return. It's just like that. Batman looks at him, and he asks, Were you preparing for it with any occult actions? And Green Arrow tells him, I died in an explosion on a plane. It's not like I had time to pack a lunch or anything. So Batman takes off again, and as he's soaring through the skies, he gets a call from Onyx who asks if he knows who this Red Hood guy is. He tells her to tell him if she has the location and call about nothing else, and then he hangs up on her. She sits there frustrated when Red Hood walks up behind her. Those morons I killed were selling drugs to 12 year olds. Hi there, I thought I felt my ears burning. She looks at him, you're the Red Hood. Very astute, what was your first clue? 
They both look at the thugs and he asks her, so what did I miss? Well, they seem to want to know why Black Mask hasn't killed you himself yet. Well, I guess that tells you that I'm either lucky or very good. Either way, I seem to have made myself an enemy out of all of the bad guys. Over in Metropolis, Batman knocks out a goon as Superman swoops in covering him. I had him, Superman. I never had a doubt. Now, why have you come to Metropolis to stop a bank robbery? If you had called ahead, I would have gotten us theater tickets. I came to talk. Really? Because I was serious about the theater tickets. I really need to talk. All right, let's talk. Back at the warehouse, Red Hood drops a smoke grenade on the table and he leaps in. You can watch me or join me, it's up to you. And then he jumps into the fight. He throws one guy into a wall and Onyx looks down and decides, why the hell not? Back with Batman and Superman, Batman asks Superman about the time that he died. Superman explains that he didn't die, he mirrored death with a Kryptonian coma. And Batman looks at him, did you? Or is that what we told ourselves so that it would all make sense? I don't know, we've seen a lot of people rise from the dead, Bruce. Metamorpho, Green Arrow, Hal Jordan, it's not science. It has to be for me! I've always had the answers, the facts for every one of them that we lost. Whether they thought it was heaven, or God, or even magic. Magic is just another realm science. He forms a fist and he raises it, as Superman asks him, what is this about? And Batman softens up, I don't exactly know. Back at the warehouse, the two individuals, Red Hood and Onyx, find themselves surrounded with the bullets flying over their heads. But that doesn't stop them as they kick and drop every enemy that they find until they decide to make a break for the door. They run outside and that's where Hood has a weapon waiting. A Gatling gun. And he opens fire, murdering every single person in the building. Onyx calls out for him to stop. What is he doing? And he takes the barrel of the gun and he shoves it into her chin. What do you think I'm doing? What do you think this is all about? That we're just gonna rough up these guys to teach them a lesson? Welcome to planet Earth, baby. These dead sacks of meat on the floor made their living by beating, raping, and devouring. Fear isn't an answer. I'm not letting you get out of here. That's not really up to you. That's when Onyx notices that Red Hood slid a dagger into her shoulder before she even knew what was going on. And then he pointed the gun right at her. Batman flies back to Gotham thinking to himself, the armor has to be light enough to move to fight, but strong enough to protect. Sometimes, a great many times, it's not strong enough. It didn't protect Barbara who's fighting from a wheelchair, and it wasn't strong enough for Stephanie Brown. And it certainly wasn't strong enough for Jason. Willful Jason, who ignored danger, spat at risk, who was never frightened enough. I've always wondered, always, was he scared in the end? Was he praying that I would come save him? In those last moments when he knew that I wouldn't, did he hate me for it? Back in the alley, Red Hood stands over Onyx and he tells her the truth is, we need to kill everyone. He pulls the knife out, giving her a compression pad to stop the bleeding, and she hits the ground as he tells her, this is the part where you get up and you fight me. Then from behind him, he hears someone has joined the party. He turns his head and Batman tells him, no. Wow, I didn't even hear you land. That plane is really stealthy when you want it to be. You can be so quiet and crack, crack, crack. The Red Hood opens up on Batman with his guns. Batman runs into the building and Red Hood gives chase. Batman runs into the back of it and he slaps an explosive onto a dumpster. So as the Red Hood runs out into the alleyway, he jumps out shooting at Batman. The dumpster explodes, forcing it towards the Red Hood who leaps over it. And as he jumps into the air, Batman throws his grappling line around Red Hood's foot, yanking him back down to the ground. Red Hood chuckles. <laughs> You are beyond thought. You act on instinct, Batman. A finely tuned instrument. A body trained to perfection. Techniques honed and mastered, along with expensive toys. Red Hood slices through the line. But you're not the only one with toys. And he fires a device at Batman, hitting him hard. Batman falls over, telling himself, That's impossible for Red Hood to have that. It's a device from Cord Industries that I ordered from them. Special. How can he have it? No more questions. No more dead ends. No more guessing. Tonight I find out the truth of this. And as Batman tells himself this, he throws explosives at Red Hood, blowing up the area, throwing him aside. They both run along the rooftops as Batman calls out, I need to know! And Red Hood continues to taunt him as they go back and forth. That's right, I want you to ask yourself, what have I done? Tell me! Murder! No, I've killed, not murdered! Lightning goes off behind the two men as they go back and forth. A kick from Red Hood and then a headbutt, but Batman cuts into the mask. They both tumble over the side of the building and into the alleyway below, where Red Hood tears off Batman's cowl. They stand up and they look at each other, and Red Hood presses the button that releases his helmet telling Batman, I guess we should keep it even then. And Batman looks at him. Oh God! And Jason Todd looks back at him. No, you want to guess again? This has to be a ruse. Yeah, I think you know it in your gut. You can feel it. You've known it for weeks. Longer even. You knew it when we fought in the graveyard. 
You felt it when I swapped out with Clayface. That fight began with me and it ended with him, but you know what? I'm standing here in front of you right now. Batman stares at him. How did this happen? Jason touches a batarang with his ungloved hand and then he cuts into his own scalp to put blood on it. How I got here really doesn't matter. Here's my fingerprints and blood for you to check. But no matter what I am, it doesn't matter. That's not what this is all about. I'm the you. You that you are supposed to be. If you had killed the Joker years ago, beyond what happened to me, you could have saved so many people. You could have saved the world. But no, the Joker's murder is a long line of acts that you refuse to commit. You'll never cross that line, but I will. He then presses a button blowing up the helmet and it provides the escape that he needs. Batman went back to the Batcave where he ran the samples and it all added up. Alfred and Batman both realize that it's all true. And he walks over to the old Jason Todd Robin costume. Alfred asks if he wants it removed from the cave, but Bruce tells him no, this changes nothing. And he walks back into the cave, leaving Alfred looking at the Robin suit with sadness in his eyes. Alfred stands over the grave of Jason Todd as two men ask him if they are needed. Alfred tells them that they are no longer needed. He'll take it from here. They can take five hours off of guarding an unmarked grave. They ask if this means that they are to maintain watch on the other grave sites, the Waynes. And Alfred tells him that they can assume correctly. Then he walks to the wall to inform Batman that it's safe to come in. Which brings us to the graveyard where his body was buried in an unmarked grave. Through the rain and the wind, Batman walks to the grave to retrieve the coffin to confirm that the body is missing from the site. And as he does this, he remembers when he met Jason Todd. It was a late night in Crime Alley, and when he returned to the Batmobile, he found the incredible car on blocks. Someone had taken one of the wheels off of it, and while this perp could have gotten away with it, he decided to come back to get more tires. That's when Batman sees it's a young boy, Jason Todd. Batman went back to the Batcave where he explained to Alfred that they were redesigning the tires and hadn't replaced the hubcaps, along with the security systems being down from the night before. It was the perfect time for someone to take the tires off of the Batmobile, and this boy did just that. Alfred tells him, well it seems you and this boy were fated to meet. Jason became Robin, the newest in a line of sidekicks for Batman. Alfred fully believed that if he hadn't intervened, Jason would have become a part of the crime element instead of a sidekick to the Dark Knight. And while at times his boy was brash and over the top, Batman liked having him there. But now, things were different. Jason Todd had returned and murdered thieves, crooks, and killers. He returned as the villain the Red Hood after he was supposedly killed at the hands of the Joker. And after revealing his true identity to Batman, Batman has been awake for 80 hours trying to disprove that it is Jason. But early on, Batman saw the anger in Jason's eyes, the darkness within. Jason always wondered why they didn't finish off the thugs, become more brutal with them. They deserved it, didn't they? Wouldn't they just repeat their actions once free again? And as Batman finished his research on the coffin for what must have been the 20th time, he realized what he was missing. There was never a body in this coffin. Jason was never buried. Across town, Black Mask's men are working on their latest project, when Batman comes bursting through the wall yelling for everyone to get out. He runs to the nearby walls, tearing them open to reveal the explosives lining the facility. As he begins to tamper with the bombs, Red Hood comes over the radio. Freezing won't work. I set up sensors so if you tried that it would go off. Batman preps a battle ring to catch the Red Hood, but Hood tells him to calm down. I'm just a fly on the wall, Batman. Batman flings the battle ring, cutting off the camera, and Jason tells him, that he has seven seconds to save an empty building. You won't even bother. Batman thinks about it and he leaps out the window as the whole building explodes. And from a building nearby, Jason tells himself, I love to watch him work. Black Mask gets the report that the Red Hood has just taken out a whole building, ruining an entire operation. He's also riding around blowing up the transport trucks, killing the men and destroying the weapons. On top of that, he's purposely finding all of the manufacturing locations and killing everyone inside. He's eliminating all competition, and Black Mask freaks out. Then why isn't he dead? His assistant tells him, truth, he's better than anyone we have. Black Mask asks again, why isn't Batman removing the problem then? His assistant offers the idea that maybe Batman is letting the gangs fight it out. And Black Mask asks, what is this, a tennis match? No, he can't catch this guy either. 
Black Mask looks out the window. Can you feel it? We're stuck in the damned crosshair. And then he realizes what's outside his window. Red Hood, looking at him with an RPG pointed right at his office. Damn it to hell! Black Mask yells as he runs out of the room. Jason snickers. <laughs> wow, he can really run when he wants to. And he launches the RPG, taking out the entire floor. As both Black Mask and his assistant are now wandering the streets, Black Mask asks, how did he do that? The whole floor was fortified against airstrikes. And his assistant informs him, all except the east window. They were repairing it. As furious as he is over what happened, a man from behind him asks, Do you want some help? Everyone turns their guns to whoever this is, and that's when they see. It's Deathstroke. Black Mask tells everyone to drop their guns. You'll all be dead before you run out of ammo. Smart man. I've come representing the society, and I'd like to know if you want to join. Both Batman and Jason are watching from cameras, and they both respond with an affinitive. Damn it. The offer was simple. If Black Mask saddles up with the society, Deathstroke and this organization will supply him with a super-powered individual who can take out the Red Hood. But he's kind of angry after they present their offering. They gave him a couple of super-powered individuals, Captain Nazi and Hyena. Deathstroke tells him, I think you're underestimating the Nazi and Hyena. But Black Mask isn't about to back down. The Nazi is like 150 years old and he's blind. You gave me a blind supervillain. Not entirely, Mask. He has cybernetic implants that help him see. In black and white! If the Red Hood steps in front of a Christmas tree, he vanishes! And I thought the hyena was dead. One of them is dead. This is the other one. I thought the other one was a chick! For all I know, this one is a chick. I didn't care to check under the hood. How about you? Pass! Deathstroke has had about enough with the Black Mask's attitude, though, as he tells him, Listen to me. I say this not with respect, but as a reminder that I'm a breath away from killing all of you. There's a third member on the way, and it makes this whole thing a perfect combo. The Red Hood will be dead. Fine. And Black Mask and Deathstroke look out over the city. Hyena looks kind of like a girl from behind. I was thinking the same thing, Mask. A short while later, as Red Hood is killing more of the Black Mask's friends, the Nazi and Hyena leap in to kill him like they're supposed to. Red Hood flips out of the way. Oh my goodness, I've been bamboozled. He lands opening fire on them. You people aren't the most subtle strategists. They keep leaping at him and he keeps shooting, but the Nazi continually blocks the shots. After throwing grenades at them, he blows up the Nazi, but Hyena jumps on him, pinning him down. The Hyena growls at him. Too slow. And he tells Hyena, or I'm stalling. Yeah, I'm stalling. Batman leaps in, knocking the Hyena out as Red Hood asks him. What took you so long? Couldn't decide if you wanted me to live? Batman puts up his fists alongside Jason, telling him, shut up and fight. Almost like it's programmed into them, they're right back to working as a team, using combos and team maneuvers to fight off against the enemy. And as they're beating down on the Nazi, Count Vertigo arrives, dropping Batman and Red Hood by screwing with their ears and eyes, something that doesn't affect the Nazi and Hyena. While Jason is down, Batman turns on a mode on his cowl to block the effects of Vertigo when he gets back up. But it's not enough. He's still not fighting at 100% capacity, and Jason has an idea. He crawls over to Hyena, jamming needles with adrenaline into Hyena, driving it mad! Batman gets Vertigo sent onto the Mad Hyena, and it lunges onto its own teammate. During this time, Nazi has gotten back up, and he begins to choke out Red Hood. But that's when Red Hood grabs a taser, shoving it into the Nazi's cybernetic eyes, burning out his entire head and killing him. Red Hood leaps up to a fire escape, telling Batman, Just be happy, I only killed one Nazi today. Batman watches as his former sidekick, the boy that he saved, runs off. Now, a mass murderer. And he realizes, it's time for this to end. Our finale begins with Alfred opening up a package from Jason and telling Batman to get back here for it. Batman rushes to the Batmobile, where, elsewhere, Black Mask is telling his men that they've failed him. He opens fire, murdering all of them before turning back to someone behind him, asking, Happy? And Red Hood replies with, Getting there. As you can see, Black Mask has finally decided to stop trying to fight Red Hood. Back in the Batcave, Alfred opens up the package to find nothing more than a lock of green hair. Batman knows right away what this means. Jason Todd has his own murderer captive. He has the Joker. Back with Black Mask and Red Hood, Black Mask asks him, What the hell do you mean getting there? I just signed a contract by wasting all of my second in commands. Hood doesn't even uncross his arms. And I appreciate that. I don't want your damned appreciation. I expect your obedience. I think you may have misunderstood the terms of our agreement, Mask. Really? You come to me wanting to end this, claiming that you are done with the whole mad bomber routine and wanting a seat at the table. 
But now my gut is telling me that you had a change in attitude. Am I wrong? Red Hood doesn't even move. Probably not. And Black Mask cracks a stool over his head. He pulls out a gun to shoot Hood, and that's when Red Hood leaps into the air, kicking him and grabbing the gun. They go back and forth with Red Hood throwing Black Mask out of the window into the front. After all of your attempts to have me killed, you hide behind a mask. I'm not afraid. You're just another gangster. Black Mask looks up at him. Look who's talking about myths and dress up. He jumps back into the building and he stomps on Red Hood's chest and then he pins him to a pool table. Red Hood pulls out his knife and he begins to take a swipe at him. And then Mask stumbles back into a bunch of pool cues where he grabs one, breaking it over Hood. And then he stabs him in the back. All of their fighting has started a fire in the building and Mask throws his coat aside furious. The two men lock arms, determined to end this right here and right now. And that's when Batman pulls up to the building and he watches as Hood goes in to stab Mask and Mask grabs his arm, flipping it around, stabbing Jason Todd in the chest. Mask goes and he removes the helmet to find out who's actually been taunting him. And when he does that, we see that Jason hasn't been here this whole time and Batman is relieved. Not him. Mask looks up to see Batman there. When did you get here? A radio then goes off in the mask. Oh, I invited him. Tonight's just full of reunions. That's when we see Jason has his mask off and he's holding the Joker. Didn't I kill you? We've been over this. I know, but I like talking about it. <laughs> Back with Batman and Mask, Mask turns to Batman. What do you mean, not him? Do you know who this psycho is? That's when the helmet grows hotter and hotter, and Batman yells for Mask to drop it. He kicks it away from Mask, watching it explode in the back of the building, and once that's resolved, Batman asks Mask how Hood contacted him. And Mask explains that his assistant was murdered and thrown through his window with a cell phone taped in his mouth. He's been playing me, Batman, and I think you know exactly how that feels. Back with Jason and Joker. Dead man walking! <laughs> yeah, that wasn't funny the first five times. Two times, boy chick! That makes three, and comedy works best in threes. Like Batman, Robin, and me. Let's ask the $24,000 question. You left me to live. After everything I did, you couldn't pop my balloon. You just couldn't! The apple doesn't fall far from the paterfamilias. You're just like daddykins. That was enough for Jason as he jumped in, kicking Joker across the face, and then he threw a knife pinning him to the wall. The only thing everyone in the room could hear was the laughter as Jason pulled out the knife. <laughs> Jason leaned into the Joker's face. I know a secret about you. You're not nearly as crazy as you'd like us all to believe, or even as crazy as you'd like to believe. It just makes it easier to justify all of the sick things that you've done. The Joker looks away without a smile on his face. Look at that, I wiped the smile off the Joker's face. I've been waiting a long time for that. <laughs> Back with Batman and Mask, he takes the clues and he leaves Mask there surrounded by mini explosives, telling him to stay put. Mask simply tells him, oh yeah, because I'm known for my patience. Batman goes to Crime Alley where Jason walks out telling him, this only seemed fitting. The place of your birth, the place of our first meeting, and now where this ends. Batman looks at him, where is he? And Jason tells him, I have him in the other building, but don't try ditching me and finding him. I rigged that building to explode. Now that would be fitting payback wise. I'm not going to let you kill him. You can try and stop me. And they both prep to fight. And that's when a plane above Bloodhaven drops the living bomb onto the city. Batman is forced to watch as what appears to be a nuclear explosion goes off in Bloodhaven. He calls out, Dick! And Jason confirms it. My God, is that where Nightwing is? Imagine that. One son returns from the grave as another enters it. What a fitting ending this has become. If he's there, you're too late, Bruce. Again. Batman leaps over in the direction of Bloodhaven, but an explosion goes off at his feet. Jason, please! What? You have to be sure? Getting out of that alive would be one hell of a neat trick. If old Dickie is there, he's dead. And if you leave, someone else dies tonight. Batman leaps in, throwing two batarangs that graze Jason's neck. But Jason counters by throwing a sticky to Batman's cape, and then the other end is attached to a rocket that launches him into the sky. Batman grips the edge of the roof, trying to keep himself there, and the Joker watches the explosions as he comments, This is getting good! 
Jason jumps on Batman as he begins to swipe away with his knife as he holds Batman's head back. Batman realizes that Jason isn't playing anymore. He's going for kill shots. He has to respond properly. And he throws an explosive onto Jason's coat, burning up all of his tools. Now let's see how you do without your toys. He throws himself into a window and Batman follows suit telling him, You say that you want to save Gotham, to kill a part of it so that it could survive. You say that you want to be better than me, but it won't happen. All the while, he's beating on Jason, throwing him around, and as he stands over, the defeated Jason Todd. I know I failed you, but I tried to save you, Jason. I'm trying to save you now. And Jason points a gun at Batman's face. Is that what you think this is about? You letting me die? I don't know what clouds your judgment worse. Your guilt or your antiquated sense of morality. Bruce, I forgive you for not saving me. Batman looks on saddened by the thought. And Jason gets up, opening the door that holds the Joker. But why in God's name is he still alive? And in the room, the Joker laughs. <laughs> we got ourselves a party! Jason walks in, punching Joker in the chin, knocking him over into the explosives, and he shoves the gun into his face, ignoring what he has done in the past, the friends that he crippled. I thought, I thought killing me, I would be the last person that you would ever let him hurt. If it had been you that was left in a bloody mess in that room, I would have done nothing but search the planet for this pathetic pile of evil, this death-worshipping garbage, and I would have sent him off to hell. You don't understand. You've never understood. What? Your moral code? It's too hard to cross that line? I want him dead. Maybe more than anything I've ever wanted before, but if I do, if I allow myself to go down that path, I'll never come back. Why? Why what? Why do all of the Cub Scouts and Spandex always say that? If I cross the line, there's no coming back. I'm not talking about killing Cobblepot or Scarecrow. I'm talking about him. Just him doing it because he took me away from you. Well, you don't have a choice, Jason tells him, throwing him a gun. You either kill him or I will. And if you want to stop me, you'll have to kill me. Me or him. Decide. Put the gun down, Jason. One. Don't. Two. No! Three. And in that moment, Batman threw a battering into Jason's neck. And as the blood spilled onto the ground, Jason hit the dirt. The Joker laughed at it all. <laughs> after all of that, you found a way to win. And yet, everyone loses. Don't you just love how this is ending? Joker then grabs the gun, shooting the explosives next to him. And the entire building goes up in smoke and fire. You see, fate is a funny thing. It swells up like raging waters that we are forced to travel. It provides no exit, no deviation. It drops us in a bottomless ocean and compels us. We either swim or drown. And sometimes, as we struggle against the tide, a great truth arises. There are many things that have been hard to do in Jason Todd's life. Saying goodbye is one of them. He decided that it would be best for him to never say it. As he attempts to climb out of a sinking submarine, a criminal grabs a hold of him, telling him, Give it up! Escape is impossible! We will die here together like men. Jason sighs as he points his gun at the man's face, telling him, You did it again! You underestimated me. He pulls the trigger, pulling himself up, stating that people like him should have thought twice before smuggling nuclear weapons into Miami. Why couldn't they just have brought drugs in like everyone else? That way they wouldn't have to worry about people like him. He breaks through the inner wall to crawl out of the submarine, and a second later, it explodes. A few days later, on a small island, Jason rests hooked up to an alien machine. He slowly opens up his eyes as someone tends to the machines, asking where is he? As the medicine flows into him, though, he falls back asleep. A few more days later, a beautiful woman with a slightly orange tint to her skin and fiery red hair stands beside Jason, asking if he's still not awake. Jason mumbles some stuff, and as the woman touches his forehead, he jolts up with his gun at the woman's neck, telling her that he knew that if he played dead long enough, she would. But his grip loosens on the gun as the medicines take over, and he asks, How did I get here? And where are my pants? The woman tells him to hush and rest, and that's when Jason's gun begins to melt from her skin. Several more days pass before Jason has the strength to get up on his own, and when he does, he explores more of the island. After a bit of wandering, he stumbles upon a giant, wrecked alien spacecraft, and the woman from before tells him that it's good to see him up. Now please come in. Before Jason has the chance to say anything, the woman explains that her name is Princess Cory. From the planet of Tamarin, some have also known her as Starfire, and welcome to her home. Jason stands there trying to cover himself up, telling her, uh, Todd, Jason, Todd. 
I don't really mean to be impolite, but I'm assuming that it was you that I must thank for getting me out of the ocean. This place feels less like a home and more like a hideaway, Starfire. And unless your decorating style is early shipwreck, I'm going to assume that this place crashed on Earth without anyone even knowing about it. So are you using a cloaking device? What's your power source? Starfire says that it's good to see him getting his strength back, and Jason goes on asking. I I'm talking too much, right? I just, I've never seen an alien before, orange or otherwise. Starfire glares at him, telling him that she's been in solitude for a long time. She's forgotten how obnoxious humans can be. You're right, you're being polite and I'm treating you like my own personal copy of National Geographic. Maybe we should start over. Thank you for saving my life, Princess Cory. Starfire looks at him and points over at a rack, stating that he needs to get dressed. There is some male clothing in there if you'd like. As he looks over, he sees the uniform that she's pointing at and realizes it belongs to Nightwing. He stumbles back, thinking of a time when he held Batman at gunpoint. But before he could shoot, Nightwing was there to stop him. Jason asks if this is some kind of a joke. Playing a sick game of dress-up isn't going to help you deal with, well, whatever you have going on here in that bright orange head of yours. Starfire asks what is he talking about? How can clothing do him harm? You are not the man who once wore these, and I am aware that if I needed anything beyond myself to validate my own existence, then I would have already given away my power to be self-defining. It's just that, that human. I have memories of him. Happy ones. We spent day and night together when I arrived on this planet. His name escapes me, but I will remember him if I see him again. But I do not define myself by the men that I have known, only by their clothing, and neither should you. As the night falls, Jason looks through the Tamaranian weaponry, telling himself that Starfire is right. His mind dwells too much on things that have no bearing on him anymore. It's also clear that she loved Nightwing almost as much as, well, Jason hated him. Jason begins to take notes, thinking that this will completely change the war on crime. But with all of this amazing tech, all he can think about is how to use it to hurt people. Has he really fallen that far from Dukra's teachings? A short while later on the beat, Jason finds Starfire and tells her that they need to talk. There's something that she needs to know about him. But before Jason could get in another word, she grabs him, kissing him. He pulls back, asking what was that, and she tells him that it is one of the ways that her people assimilate language. Knowledge. He said he wanted to talk, so she assumed. Jason points over at a rock, telling her, uh, yeah, how about we just, you know, sit? As they do, Jason tells her everything. He explains that like Nightwing, he too was a ward of Batman, a partner. He was a superhero named Robin. He explains his history, he tells the stories of Red Hood, of his death, and they talk so long that the sun comes up, and at the end of it all, Jason asks if she's mad. She laughs, stating that that would be foolish, on Tamarin. They appreciate the past, they respect it, but they don't live in it. They live here, they live now. Starfire then begins to create dazzling lights with her powers, telling him that some people think that she is a walking nuclear reactor, a danger to herself and others. This heat that roars through her body is supposed to be there, but him, if he keeps all that heat inside, that heart fueled by rage, it will consume him. Starfire hugs Jason, and as she does, Jason takes a moment to think to himself. They don't always get to choose their teachers in life. Sometimes they are crazed vigilantes pretending to love them like a son. Other times they take the form of a space kitty who is smarter than anyone gives her credit for. Reminds him of himself. So the next day, Jason browses the internet and Starfire asks what he is looking at. Jason shows her a news article with the headline, American put to death in Karak. Roy Harper to be executed by interim Karak government and asks, Hey Starfire, are you, uh, you up for a road trip? The following day, the disgraced Roy Harper walks out of his cell with his ball and chain stating, Ha ha! Sunlight! That's not something I see every day. What's the occasion? One of the armed soldiers tells him that if he can believe it, he's got a visitor. He's got five minutes to confess his sins. Roy looks over at the portly priest stating, I would shake your hand, but you know, have I met you? He says that he has Pastor Beerback of the International Agency of Amnesty, and these conditions are deplorable! Rest assured, I will be filing a complaint with the State Department. As Beerback takes out his Bible, he asks the soldiers if they can give him a moment of privacy. The soldiers scoff as they move away, and Roy tells him that he doesn't want to sound ungrateful, but holy God! Beerback opens up his Bible, and in the cutout pages sits Roy's folded up bow. And Beerback says, Exactly, son. An open mind and an open book will set you free. Roy asks him, You do realize that this is incredibly insane, right? And Beerback yells, Amen! Beerback then pulls on his suspenders, making a clicking sound, and suddenly the suit and the face fly off, and Jason comes out, guns blazing! And Roy quickly snatches up his bow. As the two fight their way out of the compound, Roy asks, 
What's on the other side? A Batmobile? And Roy points to the rundown, barely functional Jeep, telling him, The Bat Jeep! Hop in! Roy stares for a moment, and Jason asks, Are you speechless? Well, that just made my whole trip worth it, buddy. Once the two jump in, Jason steps on the gas, and they get away from the gunfire just around the ridge. They pull up to three tanks, all aimed right at them. Roy says, Well, I really hope we've got some good backup for your escape. And Jason tells him, No worry! We'll be fine! A few seconds later, Starfire floats down, destroying the tanks. And Roy simply replies, Oh, is she with you? And Jason says, Us. Yeah. But yeah, she's been with me as well. Starfire then asks if there's anything else that she can do. And Jason asks, Well, you know, if you could, you could fly ahead and take out any bad guys or, you know, tanks or anything. Starfire tells him, Certainly. She'll see him soon. And Jason says, Can't wait. As Starfire flies ahead, Roy sighs, stating, she didn't even say hi to me. And Jason tells him, she just has a lot in her mind. Me. So later back on the Paradise Island, Starfire plays on the beach and Roy says, I thought people in Gotham hung out in like abandoned opera houses. Jason laughs. <laughs> yeah, Gotham sucks. Psychopaths that live there deserve each other, even the bad ones. Roy leans in and whispers, aren't you worried about what happens when she finds out about you and her ex? Jason asks, what? On account that I tried to kill Nightwing? Unfortunately, it is a non-issue. Turns out that Tamaranians don't see humans as much as sights and smells. They have a terribly short attention span for all things Earth. Seriously, ask her about the gang she used to hang out with. Doesn't remember them. Roy goes back to looking at Starfire and says, That is interesting. And then a shadowy figure appears asking Jason for a moment of his time. A few moments later, Jason sits at a bar and he says that she is the last person that he ever expected to see again. What's up, Essence? The white-haired woman named Essence tells him that there have been several murders recently where organs have been taken from living bodies. Jason gets up and says, You came to me with this? Really? Don't fall off the broomstick on your way home. And Essence tells him that there's more. The missing organs were removed years before the victim died, but there were no incisions. Jason stops looking back, telling her that that could only be, and she responds, the untitled, yes. So back at the beach, Roy asks Starfire if she's sure that she doesn't remember anyone named Dick. And she tells him no. Roy then asks, what about Garth? Dustin? Vic? And she grabs her towel, telling him no. And he's beginning to bore her. Would he like to have sex? Roy coughs. <laughs> wait, wait, <laughs> aren't you like Jason's girlfriend? She tells him that she is free to do whatever she wants, when she wants. And if he is not interested, Roy jumps up. No, 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 happy to oblige. Is there anything I need to know before making love to a Tamaranian? Starfire smiles, telling him that all he needs to know is that love has nothing to do with it. Over at the bar, Jason sits back down, stating that if what she is saying is true, it has nothing to do with them. The Untitled is the whole reason why the All Cast was formed all those centuries ago. Essence says that she is sorry to state that the Ancient Order is no longer a consideration. Witness. She spreads little droplets on the counter, and Jason can see the image of a woman dead, and he asks if it is... And she tells him that he knows it is. He quietly yells that it's impossible. The all cast is without any known equal. Nothing short of an alien invasion could do that. But why him? Why doesn't she deal with it herself? She tells him that he knows the answer better than anyone. She was banned from the all cast. Please, Jason. I know you vowed to never return, but please, for me. Jason gets up telling her, fine, I will. But tell me one thing. Why did you? But as he looks back, Essence is gone. A short while later. At the well of the all-cast, Jason kneels down beside Dukra's body, stating that he's so sorry that he wasn't there for her. He's sorry that she sent him away. He is sorry that he let her. It's at that moment that the blue light swirls around and the ghostly image of Dukra appears, telling Jason that there is no time for tears, man-childs, nor regrets. An untitled was here, more powerful than ever, and it broke into the chamber of all. Jason says that he will find it. He will find it, and he will avenge them. Dukra reaches out, holding Jason's head, stating, that he is always going on about avenging people. It's as if he learned nothing. Keep your heart free of vengeance, man-child, and I will see you in a better place. As her spirit fades, Jason can hear footsteps getting closer, and he turns back, pointing both guns. Finally, someone to shoot. As he gets ready to pull the trigger, though, he stops himself, stating that he can't shoot them. Even if they are animated corpses, they don't deserve to re-die at his hands. But at that moment, an arrow sticks in the back of one of the animated corpses and explodes. Starfire flies down, asking if it was really necessary, and Roy pulls back at his bow, telling her, The guy was dead! He totally didn't feel a thing. As the last of the zombies fall, 
Roy laughs, stating that it's like taking out the trash. And Jason tells him, no, they weren't trash. These people were warriors. They were teachers. They may have been the greatest people that I've ever known. And after bowing and taking a moment to pray for the dead, Jason tells the others that it's time to go kick ass as a team. After Red Hood and the Outlaws defeated the zombies, we cut to a different location, at the Chamber of All, where the youthful looking boy, Saru the Proctor, sits on his throne. He looks up at Jason, stating, Hey, didn't see you. And Jason asks, Uh, did we come at a bad time? No, that would mean that no one, no sentient being or single omnivore could have gotten in. Jason asks, You do realize that we wouldn't have gotten this far if, and Saru asks, if the All Cast hadn't been slain by if the all cast hadn't been slain by the same untitled that walked past me half an hour before you got here? Duh. What now though? You want to run off after the untitled exact some cosmic vengeance? Jason tells him, this isn't about revenge, N not yet at least. I was trained by the all cast, which means that it falls on me to find that thing, the untitled. Saru tells him that that's fine. They can enter the chamber, but before that, he is responsible for holding onto their most cherished memories as collateral. They can have them back, if they return. Roy tells Saru that he'd better not get comfortable having those. They will have them back. Saru points them off in the direction they should be going, telling them, I'm certain that you will. Soon, the three of them step through the door and find themselves in a twisted room with doors and stairs leading, well, everywhere. Jason tells them to take a moment and let it sink in. The chamber of all can be a little overwhelming at first. Also, stick close. Starfire asks where are they going, and Jason tells her that he doesn't have a clue. And Roy says, great, not at all reassuring. Outside, Saru holds the floating memories, stating that he shouldn't do this. It is against the protocols, but those three are rather curious. Let's have a look at the aliens. There are no rules against watching alien memories, just a peek. Starfire's memory orb opens up and Saru sees the young Starfire when she was a princess being traded into slavery. How could this be a cherished memory? He continues to watch as the young princess falls in the mud and a soldier tells her to rise as he kneels down. The soldier brushes her hair from her face stating that he was her age once. She should be running free. He's sorry on behalf of his people. Starfire told him that she thanks him for his kindness, but if she could get a petition for a boon, the soldier tells her that if it is within his power, of course. Starfire jumps up, blasting into the soldier, shouting that she may be trapped here, but she will not suffer compassion beneath the boot of a spineless worm. The memory fades and Saru leans back. That was disturbing. If that is her most cherished memory, just how screwed up is this trio? Later, down below, Jason leads Roy and Starfire into a large open chamber, and Roy asks if the shiny thing on that creepy altar is the thing they're looking for because they should probably hurry back. The dude looking into their memories makes him feel a little unclean. As Jason and Roy begin to walk, Starfire shouts for them to stop moving. This is a setup. Roy laughs. Oh, it's adorable that she's concerned. At that moment, spikes shoot out of the ground and Jason tells Starfire to fly up and tell them what they're dealing with. As Starfire looks at the giant monster whose spikes are spanning across its head, Jason sees the monster's face telling her, uh, never mind, I, I got it. I know exactly what we're fighting, Starfire. He grabs onto the monster's ear and shouts that they need to hurry up and focus on taking on this big green ugly thing. He opens fire into the monster's ear canal and as it screams and shakes him off, Jason says that it's probably a good thing that he doesn't understand the language because he's sure that he'd be blushing. A giant tongue whips out grabbing onto Starfire, but as it pulls back, Roy asks, Is that thing eating her, Jason? Back at the entrance, Saru lies on the floor holding Roy's memory, stating, All right, I already broke one rule. Amuse me, Roy Harper. A vision of Roy fighting Croc appears, where Roy is clearly losing the battle. Roy gets up, swinging, asking, Is that all you got? And Croc shouts, That is enough! Why won't you stay down? Roy wobbles, asking, Are you kidding? I'm Roy Harper! It doesn't get any downer than me! Croc gets ready to attack, but he stops when he states, It all makes sense now. You're trying to get me to put an end to your miserable life. Death by Croc. How about instead you pull your head out of your butt and figure out how to get on with your life? Everyone knows that you got rolled by Oliver Queen, lost all your shares in Q-Core. Is this really how you want it to end? Beaten to death on a rooftop in Hell's Kitchen? You want to kill yourself? Do it yourself and leave others out of it. Roy stops. For a monster, you're not such a bad guy, Croc. 
After picking Roy up, Croc says, You won't think that the next time we meet. The memory fades and Saru says that that was almost sweet. In a pathetic kind of way, though. Down below, Jason climbs onto the altar and Roy asks, Aren't we going to, you know, like, work on Freak Starfire from the Big Green Ugly? Jason reaches out to grab the object on the altar and he finds a snow globe of Colorado. That's supposed to be their big clue. And just then, the monster starts to move in a confused state. Roy swings around the monster's neck, asking, What's that smell? And a second later, Starfire explodes out of the monster's chest as she says that, those were unacceptable accommodations for a princess. Let us get away from this place. As Starfire rescues both Jason and Roy, Roy says that this isn't too emasculating, is it? And Jason tells him, what's really emasculating is getting killed. Get over it, Roy. As the group returns to the top, Saru looks surprised, stating, wait, you actually made it? Jason holds up the snow globe, asking if there's any significance to this thing. Why would the untitled leave this behind? Saru tells him, no. You can have your memories back now. As Saru hands Starfire and Roy their memories, Jason walks past and Saru asks what about him. Jason doesn't look back and tells him to keep it. Once the trio leaves, Saru sits down and takes a look into Jason's memory. The vision forms and Alfred tells Batman that Master Jason is sick with the flu. It wouldn't be at all prudent to allow him out on patrol. Batman says that Jason is smart enough to know when enough is enough and Jason coughs weakly. Yeah, that's it. But upon thinking it over, Batman tells Jason, stay in until you get better. Jason sighs, telling him, yes, sir. Upstairs, Jason sits down and Alfred brings him some tea, stating that they should really see what's on the telly. Jason yells that he isn't a baby. He can take care of himself. And then Batman walks in, telling him, taking a night off once in a while isn't a crime. What are we watching? After Batman sits down with Jason, Jason leans over on his adopted father, falling asleep. Meanwhile, somewhere in Middleton, Colorado, Jason and Roy sit at a bar where Roy points out that he probably shouldn't be here, you know, being that he's a recovering alcoholic and all. Jason sips his drink while a large group of gruff men tell Jason that he may not have heard, but he's sitting on the stool talking to his lady. As one of the men reaches out, Jason spins around, kneeing him in the groin, punching another in the throat, smashing a glass on the third's face. The bartender tells Roy that his friend here is cut off for the night, and Roy says, That's what I've been telling you! You need to open up more, Jason, vent! Otherwise, things like this happen. Jason leaves money for the bartender, telling her that he apologizes for the mess and they'll be on their way. As they leave, a sheriff stops him, stating that she would like to have a word with them downtown. So the two follow the sheriff, with Starfire watching from the sky, stating that if she is with them, there will be more questions from the locals than letting two humans investigate. It is such a wonder why a princess like herself is so captivated by these two court gestures. But suddenly, something cuts into her back and a scaly hand grabs her by the throat, throwing her to the ice below. Starfire pulls herself out, shouting obscenities in her native language, when a giant green bat-like creature lands before her. The creature yells for her to get up. He didn't spend his parents' fortune tracking her down just so she could die before he even gets his talons into her. She tells him that despite his cowardice by his ambush, she is honor-bound to introduce herself. She is Princess Coriander from the planet Tamarin. He should speak his name whilst he has a tongue left in his head. The creature shouts out that he took the name Crux because he is a human who is willing to draw the line between them and the invading horde of. But Starfire lunges at Crux, stating, You're just another xenophobe. Not too many of your kind left. Over at the sheriff's station, the sheriff leans against the wall, stating that he will never get away with this. And Jason takes her cuffs, stating that she'd be surprised. All he needs to do is go through her files for any red flags that will lead him to the untitled. The sheriff asks if that's an indie rock band or something. And Jason sits down, telling her that they are a very ancient and evil mystical race, maybe a dozen left on the planet who have been hiding among humans for centuries. The sheriff asks why would he think they came here, and Jason tells her, not they, just one. They never travel in groups, they usually hide in positions of authority to make it easier to cover things up, like maybe town mayor or a local doctor. And then he stops, realizing his statement, or they could also be a cop. With her arm inside of Jason's back, the sheriff says that he is one of Dukra's pets. It's to his credit that she didn't smell him back at the bar. The few remaining of their members have been hiding for the past 100 years. Why would the all cast break their truce with them? Jason begins stating, it wasn't the all cast. You broke it. Just then the sound of whistling arrows shoot by as several arrows find their way into the back of the sheriff's head. The sheriff turns around shouting, idiot. Steel-tipped arrows are a petty annoyance! Only copper can harm me. 
Roy laughs, telling her, Ha! Jason mentioned something like that. Another arrow is fired, but it's much larger than the other ones with a large copper tip that shreds through the sheriff's head. Back at the lake, Crux slams Starfire into the ground, holding her underwater, asking, does she know why he's doing this? Why he must purge the earth of aliens? It all started long ago when he and his parents were on their way from their family outing. His parents were scientists at a university, so they didn't get to be home a lot. As they drove, a Tamaranian war cruiser crash landed on top of them. It seemed like a freak accident, but one of her kind just got out and left, unharmed. My parents, though, they died. I took up their legacy, and with their knowledge, I was able to become what I am now, a tool to dispose of the alien kind from our planet. Starfire grabs Crux by the neck, telling him, You used your intellect to fashion yourself into a living weapon? Got it. I'm so sorry that your family died. I'm so sorry that you tossed your life away on something as pointless as revenge. But I will not suffer by the crimes of others. As Starfire throws Crux into the lake, he begins to swim away. And Starfire asks, Really? Retreating already? While she begins to give chase back at the station, the sheriff says that they are toying with dangerous forces here. I have lived among the humans in this town for nearly two decades without incident. And Jason yells, I only tracked you down because you're the one who lashed out at the all cast. With the sheriff's head stitching itself back together, Roy asks, What do we do now? And Jason says, We should just leave. Back with Starfire, she chases down Crux, asking why would Crux attempt to fight her with physical strength? He knows that he can't possibly win, augmented or otherwise. But then she sees it, and it's too late. A Tamaranian transubstantiator. Crux is using her own racist technology against her. She has to get away before, but at that moment, she is hit with a bolt of lightning falling to the ground in a fiery blaze. Nearby, Jason and Roy see the flash of light with Roy yelling that that's Starfire's energy signal. One of the untitled must have gotten to her. Jason says, I would love to help, but I can't leave right now. Roy gets up telling him, then I'll go check it out. See you in hell? And Jason tells him, unless there's any other place hotter. As Roy runs off, Jason peeks around the corner for the untitled, but he tells himself that guns aren't going to help this. The only thing that could stop the untitled is the all blades. So he pulls out two mystical blades from his boots, and the Untitled hangs from a lamppost telling him that this is all on him. Know that after I kill you, everyone else in this town that protected my cover will be moving on. This is all because you wouldn't leave me alone. Jason tells her, I suppose I could learn to live with the guilt, but I'm betting I'm gonna be okay. Back over at the lake, Rux flies up into the air to make his way to Starfire with a grappling hook arrow shooting out, hitting him in the leg. Cross, Crux asks, seriously? Arrows? Who would? But before he could finish, lightning courses through his body and he comes crashing to the ground. Roy steps down on Crux's head, stating, I would be the one who still uses arrows. The name's Arsenal. If it makes you feel any better about getting your ass kicked by a guy with a bow and a baseball cap. Crux struggles, stating, going to kill you. And Roy tells him, nah, I'm going to help my friend while the big bad monster stays down. Anyway, BRB. Roy stabs an arrow into Crux to keep him in place as he asks, Why? We're humans. We're supposed to be on the same side. Back with Jason, he and the Untitled begin to fight with the Untitled yelling, You should not have come here. Duker should not have dispatched you to instigate on her behalf. Jason tells her not to insult Duker's memory. You slaughtered Duker and the rest of the Allcast. As Jason cuts into her, the Untitled says, I did no such thing. The Allcast was the only institution in place that kept my siblings from an all-out war. Jason asks if it's possible that they have been... And the Untitled stops. Tricked? It would seem so. You're just a tool here. A particularly blunt one at that. Jason then asks why him, though, and the Untitled asks, Did Dukra not tell you everything about the Untitled? Maybe she didn't trust you as much as you think she does. Back over at the lake, Roy hurries over to find Starfire curled up in the snow. When he gets there, he slams a thermal arrow down to give some heat, and Starfire tells him thank you. He brushes it off, telling her, Shh, you'll ruin my reputation. I'm supposed to be the idiot, so don't worry. We all found each other, and we're going to be fine. Starfire smiles, and as she looks up, her eyes widen, and Roy asks, He's right behind us, isn't he? Crux pulls Roy off the ground, yelling, I can't believe a human would side with her! If you want to live with Azalea Dog, then you could die like one. Back in the town, the Untitled sees Jason hiding in the fountain when she notices that it is just his helmet. She asks that all that's left of the mighty Allcast is he their final legacy. Pathetic. She should have eaten his heart. 
Jason jumps out of the fountain from the back, stating that she will have her chance. Jason then uses the all blades to cut into himself to draw out the full power, telling himself that Duker was right. The Joker, the one who killed him, Batman, the one who let the Joker get away with it, none of that matters right now. He is no longer an angry little pup. He is a warrior of the all cast, determined to end the reign of terror that dates back to the dawn of man. Over at the lake, Roy begins to laugh with Crux asking, What is it? You don't have your bow. What can you even do? Roy unhooks the strap on his quiver, falling to the ground, and Starfire says that this is going to be a little loud. A second later, the quiver explodes, knocking Crux over, sending all three of them into the icy lake. Back with Jason, the untitled says that it wasn't her, as Jason stabs the all blade into her chest, telling her, I don't care. He wipes his face off, telling himself, That's not completely true. There's still a question of who sent me, and seriously, you turn back into a human after dying? A few moments later, now that he has killed the sheriff, the townspeople gather around asking what did he do? They all quickly decide to get Red Hood. Back over at the lake, Starfire flies out holding both Roy and Crux, and as they land, Starfire gets ready to kill Crux. She says that they will see if everything he has done to his body in the name of misguided vengeance will protect him from the living flame of a star. And Roy asks, uh, isn't that a bit overkill? And Starfire stops, is it? Just then, Jason runs by yelling that he doesn't know what they're doing and he isn't even going to ask, but we have got to get the hell out of here. Starfire asks, wouldn't it be easier to explain what's going on? And Jason shouts, less babbling, more getting the hell out of here. And so, Starfire picks up Crux, the three escape the angry mob. Not long ago in Hong Kong, Jason Todd stands atop the coffin of the crime lord asking if he's got everyone's attention. The room full of mobsters silently stare as Jason takes out the all blade from the corpse, telling them, Good, I'll keep it simple. All of you represent the seven crime families of Hong Kong. I don't care how much money you have or honestly how you make it, but starting today, I get 10%. Questions? When he finishes, an old woman shouts, Someone, everyone, kill this little snot punk! And after that, well, everyone died. Starfire laughs, stating that she thought she had a temper. And Roy wipes a tear, stating, You have some of the best stories, Jason. So you killed Susie Sue's entire crime family, and that's why she has it out for you? Jason goes on telling him, No, well, not really. After that, family after family came to try and claim the power that I had gained. They all met the same fate as the first groups, and that's when Miss Sue came into town. On my way out of town, I killed everyone in her gang except for Susie and her father. Was it my way of trying to make amends with Hong Kong for all the trouble I caused? Maybe. But of course, I should have offed the two of them as well. I was just hoping that they'd see the light, but nope. After killing everyone on their gang, they just wanted to uh, get revenge on me, which is why we're in Gotham. After my run in with Susie and shooting her, Susie's father shipped her to one of the best hospitals for gunshot wounds. Now she's alive and has taken the entire children's ward of Gotham Hospital hostage. She said that I have two hours to turn myself into her or she's going to kill every kid there. That was an hour and 46 minutes ago, guys. Starfire says the ship scanned the building and there are roughly two dozen heavily armed men inside, all with their weapons trained on the innocent children. Jason tells her not to worry. We didn't come here for nothing. A few moments later inside of the hospital, the elevator door dings for the floor where the children are and Roy walks out asking if this is the cosmetic surgery ward. I can't tell in this light and I really hate my nose. One of the guards points their gun at him asking, Did you really think that you take us on by yourself? Roy snickers as he looks towards the window and everyone else looks and they see Starfire floating there. One of the men shouts, The boss lady didn't say nothing about no aliens! Starfire holds out her hand and with a fiery burst of energy, the window shatters and the men turn into ash. She steps in asking, Was that too much? And Roy tells her, No way! Those guys are here to kill a hospital full of children. They got what they deserve. While Roy and Starfire begin evacuating, Jason makes his way to the floor where Susie is staying, and he notices as the elevator doors open that there's nobody there. He waits for a moment to see if there's any movement, but then he hears screaming from up above. He sighs, really? And then Susie comes crashing down through the elevator roof, snapping the support cable. She shouts, asking, do you think that your mask is going to keep your head from being crushed? Jason asks, what's the plan here? We both fall down and go splat? As Susie yells that she is 600 pounds of white hot rage. I will survive this, even if you won't. As the elevator falls, it suddenly stops. And up above, Starfire holds onto the cable, saying that she trusts that she was able to stop the descent in time. Susie charges out of the elevator with Jason latched onto her, yelling, It don't end like this! It doesn't end until you're dead! 
Jason plants his feet to the ground and using Susie's momentum, he flips her over onto his back, quickly pressing his gun to her head. He tells her that this is her chance. She needs to accept that what happened in the past is the past. Let it go. Susie says never, not for a second. As long as she is still breathing, she will come back bigger and badder each time. She won't stop ever. So then Jason tells her that he respects her decision and he pulls the trigger. Once everyone meets back up on the roof, Roy asks, Seriously? That's it? We came, saved the kids and the doctors, and we just leave? This place used to be your old haunt, man. You're not even going to show us around Gotham? Jason tells him, No. Now get back in the damn ship. As the team takes off, a distress signal comes out of the Batcave, and Alfred's face appears on the screen. Jason gets ready to end the transmission, but Alfred states that tonight, the Court of the Owls have sent their assassins to kill nearly 40 people across the city. The Court's targets are all of Gotham's leader, the people who shaped the city. I have uploaded a list of the target's names here. The court's assassins, the Talons, are ready in a route to their targets. They are highly trained killers with extraordinary regenerative abilities. I will keep this line to the cave open as long as I can manage. Roy tells him that from what it seems like on this call that they intercepted, a lot of the Bat Buddies already have this covered. But before the line is cut, Timothy Drake says that he has intel that they have an eavesdropper. Hey, if you could hear us, Jason, we could use your hand. Starfire asks Jason if he knows this boy, and after a few moments of silence, Jason tells her, Yeah, I do. Starfire quietly asks Roy if he's staying or leaving, and Roy says, You've got to be kidding. No way in hell Jason is going to stick his neck out for... But Jason stands up at the control, stating, The information dump that Alfred sent out. Look through for a person of interest who hasn't been covered by the bat mites. Roy sighs, sitting down, and he scans through the files. And he says, There's one in Chinatown that they aren't covering. Victor Freeze. Cool. A short while later, over in Chinatown, Starfire kicks her legs as she lays across a stone gargoyle, stating that she doesn't understand. If you hate Batman so much, Jason, why are you helping him? Jason tells her that this isn't about him. It's about a city under siege by a group of maniacs. It isn't Gotham's fault that Batman happens to live here. Starfire then smiles, stating that she will say this about the man's work. It is a thing of beauty, though it cannot be healthy for those who live below. The three look at the giant pillars of ice, and Jason says, Yeah, it's gonna be fun. He leaps off of the ledge with Starfire asking where is he going, and Roy stops her, stating, He's fine, just watch. Jason fires his grappling gun, swinging down safely onto the ice, while Roy and Starfire follow. Jason tells them that they need to get as many people out of here as possible. He'll handle freeze. Roy then asks, shouldn't they all be going together? And Jason says, No, because we're not together. I'm here on family business. You just tagged along. Now go! He starts to make his way through the frozen city, asking himself, why is he doing this? He's supposed to be taking Batman out, not helping his cause. If it wasn't for the ice castle here, you'd think this whole thing was a setup to get him arrested, or... As Jason gets closer, he hears Free shout out, How dare you raise your hand on me? And Jason says, nope, not a setup. He climbs through the opening to see Freeze and the assassin fighting and the assassin yelling, No, it is you who will die tonight, now that you've chosen to no longer serve the Court of the Owls. Jason jumps between the two of them, firing his gun, stating, I don't really care who did what or why, but this ends now. Freeze shouts, I do not need your help. Allow me to make my point in a way you will understand. Jason holds out his gun and his hand begins to freeze with ice as it begins to travel up his arm. He yells out in pain, stating, I'm here to help you, damn it! And he bashes Freeze with a frozen arm. Freeze groans, telling him, Apparently you're helping the wrong person! The assassin got away! Jason looks back to see the assassin escaping through the window, and he sighs, Ah! All right, be right back, but if you make me track you down, I'm gonna kill you myself. He follows through the window after the assassin, and as he catches up, he tells him that this won't take but a moment. I just have to kill you and get back to Mr. Freeze. The Talon assassin spins back, grabbing onto Jason, telling him that it's too late, and the two come crashing down onto the decorative dragon float. The assassin tells them that many have served the Gord of the Owls, and they've had the honor of giving their lives as a Talon, whether they have died in the line of duty or retired after their all-too-brief tenure. On this night alone, we have risen again to smite our master's enemies. Just then, the assassin lifts his arm into the air, holding out a knife and bringing it down, chipping away at Jason's mask. He then goes in for a second strike, but an arrow whizzes by shooting through the assassin's hands. He shouts out in pain, asking, Who is foolish enough to attempt a rescue? Jason swings his frozen arm, cracking the assassin, stating, The guy has to. He's the designated driver. The assassin quickly jumps back, retreating as Roy and Starfire land, and Roy asks if they're going after him. Jason shouts, No! I've got it! 
If you're both done with the evacuation, then deal with this freezing at the source. Jason begins to follow the assassin, and Roy lets loose another flame arrow melting Jason's hand. And Jason tells him, Right, thanks. Jason quickly catches back up to the assassin, and as he looks around, he notices certain things. Things that he is passing, like the billboard for Haley's circus. The way the assassin moves, it's like he carries himself like a acrobat. The flourish, the flare, he was an acrobat. As the assassin stumbles into his landing, Jason asks if this empty lot has meaning to him, and the assassin yells back, Do not speak as if we know each other. Jason tells him, Come on, you led me here. Why? This was the old circus, and I'm going to take a guess and say you ran away from home and joined the circus because you believed the line that they fed every 10-year-old boy, that it's all magic and sunshine and anything is possible. What happened here? What did the court make you do here? What made a young circus performer sign his body and soul to the Court of the Owls? As Jason steps forward, the assassin steps back in his own defense, stating, No, not my soul, but my body, yes. It has become a mockery upon my return to life. Jason laughs, telling him, You're preaching to the choir, buddy. I myself have been to the other side and back. After a few moments, the assassin falls to his knees, taking off his mask. My name is Yao Long. This is my face. As a child, I was forged into a weapon. My every thought and deed dictated by the Court of the Owls. Even my death came in a time and place of their choosing. This time, I want a say in my execution. Jason also takes off his helmet, telling him, We're more alike than you realize. I was dead once. I get it. Starting over is scary as hell. Zhao tells him that he doesn't want to start again. He wants to end this life on his own terms. Surely he can understand that. So Jason holds up his gun to Zhao's head, and Zhao smiles. Please. A short while later, atop of the GCPD, Batgirl stands there stating, Took out my talent and dragged her up over here. Check. Replace the owl signal with the bat signal. Check. What to do now? A voice then yells at her, Hey, nice legs! Batgirl turns back glaring, telling him, You have two seconds to convince me not to throw you off this rooftop. As Jason leans back on the railing, Batgirl notices a knocked out Mr. Freeze and asks if he... Jason says, What? Can't be nice every once in a while? She tells him that this doesn't absolve him from every insane act that he committed. If she ever sees him again, he'll be finding himself in a cell right next to Freeze. Jason gets up, jumping over the ledge, telling her, Better bats have tried. Speaking of, if Bruce survives the night, tell him he's welcome. The following day, in the early hours of the morning in Miami, Jason meets with a flight attendant that he met while traveling named Isabel to try and take his mind off things. Since he's staying at the hotel and she is here because of a layover, Jason figured that he would meet up with her for some drinks and conversation. She talked, he lied, just like every other date that he's been on. And as he walks towards the hotel, he yawns, stating that he should probably call her a cab. He doesn't want her missing her flight and all. Isabel leans in, asking, she doesn't? Before Jason can get another word out, she throws herself on him, kissing him on the lips. He begins to lean into himself, and then something catches his eye. In one fluid motion, Jason masks up and tells Isabel to stay put. He opens fire on the alien. The alien looks at his chest, asking, Were those projectiles supposed to hurt? And Jason says, Ideally, yeah. The alien then swings his battle axe, and as Jason ducks out of the way, Isabel says that, he really doesn't own a dry cleaning business, does he? Before the two can go back at it, Starfire flies down with nothing but a single blanket, yelling, Hattal, you dare place your hands on the second daughter of Tamarin. Show yourself. The alien quickly kneels down, telling her, I beg your pardon. No, a thousand pardons. Humble Orn should have called ahead. She wraps her arms around Orn, yelling that it's been years. It's a wonder she didn't recognize him. Roy slides down, asking, So, uh, do you two know each other? Jason tells him, apparently. Starfire asks Orn to what does she owe this plan of fall, and Orn tells her that there is a black shadow that has fallen upon Tamarin. None but her might lift it. Roy laughs, ha <laughs> ha, oh please, peddle your tale of woe somewhere else. She's not going anywhere. And after a brief pause, Starfire says, very well, let's go. And then Roy, completely ignoring what she said at first, responds with, yeah, take a, wait, what? Orn lifts his arm and speaks to his wrist communicator, stating that he'd like to commence teleport. Starfire tells everyone not to be distressed. She will return. And Roy says, nah, no way. You're not going anywhere with an alien that looks like Moby Dick. As the teleportation commences, everyone is pulled into the force field. And Starfire says, as you wish, Roy. 
Once everyone appears, Orn motions towards the portal, stating that her presence is urgently requested on the bridge. It is better for the captain to fill you in, princess. Starfire casually strolls through, still draped in nothing but her blanket. And as Orn follows, leaving Jason and Roy alone, Jason yells, Seriously? He walks towards the portal, but Roy tugs on his arm, telling him, You should probably take a look around first, Jason. Because I'm pretty sure that girl, what's her name? The one that you wanted to hide from everyone? Jason says, Isabel's right behind me, huh? He turns back and sees the girl that he was telling that he was a owner of a dry cleaner business to and tells her, I can explain this. She begins to shout, Oh, because you're so credible right now. As Starfire changes and boards the bridge, she thinks to herself that it's been years since she was aboard the Starfire. Despite whatever horrors they may face, it's nice to be home. Captain DePaulo stands up stating, Your chair, Commander. Starfire begins to tell him that he knows the ship belongs to, but he stops her telling her that they both know that he was only ever keeping the seat warm. However, he must warn her, things are grim. Before he goes on, Jason runs in yelling, Okay, we gotta send Isabel home like right now. And Starfire tells him no. She would be dispersed to the cosmic winds if they tried to teleport her without docking first. So they have her word. The young lady will not be harmed. Apollo clears his throat and begins to state that less than three days ago, the intergalactic scourge known as the Blight sent their first wave against the Tamarin capital. As they know, this race of bile, ever decaying chaos bringers live only to thrive off the bones of civilization. So it is odd that after their initial attack, they have taken out all of the planetary's primary defense shields and have done nothing else. It's almost as if they're waiting. Starfire asks, what are they waiting for? And Apollo tells her, you, my lady. Just then there's a loud thoom as one of the walls explodes and Starfire yells, bring up the shields. Kitten, bring us about. Ord, open a signal to our assailants. As a fleet of blight ships surround the vessel, Starfire calls out over the comms. This is Princess Coriander, second daughter of the throne of Tamarin. You are hereby commanded to lay down your weapons and power down. Do this and I might allow you to live. Once the battle begins, my generous offer will be retracted. Jason laughs. <laughs> Who knew Starfire was such a badass? And Roy tells her, yep, that's my girl. Now I'm going to break up our story a little bit right here, just to kind of give you an understanding as to where we are right now. But a little bit of time is going to pass, and we're going to jump to after Starfire's declaration of war, Roy finds himself being beaten while held hostage by a Blight commander. The commander tells him that he is a stubborn meat sack. And Roy laughs. <laughs> really? This is what passes for torture on your world? Psst, whatever, man. The commander reaches down, touching Roy's bare skin. And as it begins to burn, the commander says, Hopefully this will meet your higher standards, human. Now this is your last chance. Where are you hiding, Coriander? Why is she once again involving herself in the affairs of Tamarin? Roy lets out a laugh. <laughs> now those are two very excellent questions. Guess there's no need for me to protect her any longer. Not after the way she left me behind. See, me and my friend Jason, we joined her on this trip when she learned about what happened to her planet. We've never seen her in a position of power like that, and <laughs> believe me, that was pretty awesome. Jason had his hands full with Isabel after their never-ending date. I mean, she just conveniently was around when he teleported her up. But hey, whatever, that's how we get a fourth member of our crew. And the battle between the SS Starfire, not to be confused with Starfire herself, but her ship, well, we don't need to go over how that went. It's not like she didn't give them a chance to surrender. DiPaolo helped maintain control of the ship, while the navigator, Kitten, did her thing. After a short while, you know, after the battle, everyone cheered, except for Starfire. You see, she was sad call it human intuition that I could tell. She told everyone that they'll hold back their victory chance, that their war was not over yet. And once they make it into orbit and free their people, including liberating her sister, they'll learn why Blight attacked in the first place. Now at this point, everyone knew that they had to do something. And Starfire conferred with her human friends, which made the alien ones a little upset. Starfire asked them for their advice. She told them that she actually had no interest in fighting for her homeworld. And while the humans in Starfire huddled around sickbay, Starfire explained why she had such a disdain for her homeworld. She told us her origins. She told us where it all began, which actually put perspective on quite a few things for us. Her sister, Commander, had given her up in order to protect their people. She was traded for the freedom of the homeworld. And that's enough to make anyone's blood boil, right? 
But it wasn't the torture from the aliens that made her the way she is, that cold-hearted alien that burns everything. It was because she was there because her sister allowed it to happen. Are you following my story here? She endured all that the aliens threw at her so that she could get closer to the one running the show. And that's when she took a handful of other prisoners and broke out. When she returned to Tamarin, Starfire wanted to kill her sister. Everyone called them heroes for freeing them, but Starfire knew that she couldn't stay in their planet any longer. So it's no wonder why she doesn't want to help, right? Over a billion people on that planet and not one of them, not one, did anything to save her. The Blight Commander steps back. By the grime, what in the name of Postulus are you even talking about? I asked you what became of Coriander. I don't give a flying frack about you and your friends or something called an Isabel. Roy stops him. Hey, who's the one telling the story here? Just then a voice calls out from the shadows that he is just stalling. He believes she's going to find him. The person then leaps down telling him she won't. She can't. Not in her nature. She has only ever been interested in herself. It's been that way since we were children. Now tell me, Harper, are you prepared to sacrifice your life for hers? Roy sees the person walk forward. Well, hello, kitty. And Commander grabs him by the throat, yelling, Enough! I tire of your games, human. I want to talk to my sister, now! Roy begins laughing, telling her, That's going to happen a lot sooner than later, but she probably won't be enjoying the experience as much as I am. We go right back to Roy being held hostage by Commander and her thunks. So, Starfire was still feeling a little wound up from the battle and still undecided whether she should go help the planet or not. Well, before we even really had time to talk about it, Apollo said that he needed to talk to Starfire regarding some personal matters. So I decided to go help Kitten with repairs to the ship. The shields were badly damaged, so I gave them some Roy Harper insight. And Kitten really wasn't having any of it until she suddenly agreed. She said that my idea was crazy, but it might actually work, and it sure as heck did. The one thing we didn't realize was that by diverting some of the ship's power to support the shields, we had inadvertently allowed some of the baddies to teleport onto the ship. Everyone got ready for a fight, but when Blight attempted to teleport Starfire away, I jumped in the path. And that's how your sister's favorite boy toy ended up on the Blight mothership. Commander then asks, are you implying that Coriander and you have been intimate? As if she hasn't already brought enough humiliation to the House of Tamarin. Roy then says, okay, let's not be rude about it. The Blight Commander tells Commander that she best not overstep her boundaries. Despite the considerations that they offer her as a member of the royal family, she is just as much a prisoner as the tattooed meat sack. Commander snaps back that for all of their vaunted tactics, it was her who got the information out of it. Roy then stands up stating, oh wait, just remembered. In all of the torture and excitement, I had almost forgotten. I only let myself be captured so I could do this. As Roy tackles into Commander, the two then begin to teleport away when suddenly they find themselves popping up in the teleporter room of the SS Starfire. Orange shouts to raise the shields. No one gets in or out of the ship without permission. Next, fly the ship into the maw of the Blight Mothership. They won't attack the Starfire without damaging their own ship. Commander stands up asking, You did all of this to save me? Starfire tells everyone, I would like a moment alone with my sister. Jason then asks if that's really a good idea, and Orin says that he has to agree with the human. And Roy tells them that it'll be fine. Let the two sisters talk it out. They won't kill each other, maybe. As everyone leaves, Starfire and Commander look at each other, and Commander begins to cry as she hugs her sister. She says that she is so, so sorry. She had to pretend to work with the Blight. It was the only way to stay alive while waiting for her. Starfire tells her that she never doubted her for a second. And Commander pulls away, telling her that she is not worthy of her kindness. Because of her, she was sentenced to a prison world for years. Starfire grabs onto Commander, telling her that she was a child entrusted with the throne, with the responsibility of their people. She did not have any other choice. Commander wipes her face, telling her, that her forgiveness means more than she'll ever know. And Starfire tells her to come. If they're going to save their people, she'll need her warrior sister by her side. Outside of the teleportation room, Jason tells Roy that it was quite the sacrifice that he made, going undercover like that to get close to Commander. And Roy laughs. <laughs> All the crap I've done to myself is much worse than the Blight will ever do. Honestly, the hardest part was when they injected that transponder into my arm in sickbay. But since that was the only way to track me aboard the mothership, it's not like I had a choice. And Jason tells him, yeah, 
piece of cake. You know, you don't have to shrug off everything, right? It's okay to actually feel something once in a while, Roy. And Roy says, are we really going to do this here, now, Jason, on a spaceship on the other side of the universe? After you've woken up with your best friend beat into a bloody green pulp lying in a pool of their own vomit, after you've seen the damage left in the wake of all of your choices, you kind of don't let anything else bother you again, Jason. Moments later, Starfire strolls by asking, are the ladies finished? And if they're done with their knitting circle, shall we set off? Jason sees Starfire and Commander geared to the teeth with guns and bullets, and he asks, for serious, right now? A commander tells him that this is their risk to take, not anyone else's. Starfire then tells Roy that she has a favor to ask of him. If she doesn't make it back, could he avenge the hell out of her? A short while later, down on the planet of Tamarin, the Blight Leader tells his followers that long before the people of this world shook off their fur and tails and learned to walk, the glory and grandeur that is the Blight was already sharing out sacred decay and death across the universe. The only thing that they've ever asked from the civilizations that they've toppled was the warm bodies needed to carry their unborn to fruition. Let's take a moment and thank the dying Tamarin for their sacrifice to the perpetuation of the Blight. Once our new generation bursts from the hearts of this warrior race, we will be stronger and more fierce than ever in history. Soon we will be able to take down even the fascist armies of the Green Lanterns. Come soldiers of the Blight, come feast upon the remains of the living dead of Tamarin. Come and... But that's when two streaks of light come crashing down onto the planet and they erupt into a fiery blaze. Some of the blight gather around the crater laughing, stating, those idiots, nothing could have survived that. And Starfire stands up, smoke billowing off of her, asking Commander, do I look like nothing to you? And Commander says, yes, nothing but trouble. One of the soldiers calls out that they need to kill these two before their foolish resistance endangers the future of their empire. Starfire steps forward with her guns pointed, stating, There is no future for your kind. Your galactic reign of terror ends tonight! Soon the tanks roll in, and as they set their sights on Starfire, Jason leaps in shooting the soldier in the back of the head, telling him, I'm gonna have to ask you not to fire. One of the Blight then grabs a hold of Jason, stating, I've never killed a human before. This is going to be fun. And Jason tells him, For one of us it is! Suddenly, the Blight's body splits in half, and Orn stands up with his axe, asking, Have I offended you by killing your assailant? And Jason says, Yeah, but I'm already over it. Just then, the field is riddled with bullets, and Jason calls out to everyone to take cover from the snipers. But soon, it stops, as Roy is unloading three arrows into the gunner's head, telling him, Don't worry! I got it! As the battle rages on, up at the SS Starfire, DePaulo tells Kitten to open up a line to the Blight ship. After a few moments, a screen pops up with the Blight aboard the mothership, and Apollo says that they are clearly outnumbered. He requests permission to teleport aboard and discuss their terms of surrender. The Blight tell him, fine, he'll be brought aboard in two minutes. And Isabel yells, wait, they're going to kill you if they go. Apollo doesn't respond to her and tells Kitten to set the ship to self-destruct. One minute and 56 seconds. And Isabel then says, wait, that's why you evacuated everyone off the ship? Kitten drags Isabel away, with Apollo sitting in the commander's chair thinking to himself, alone at last. For a dominator, being around other sentients is a study in agony. If he's going to die this way, he prefers to do it in blessed solitude. As the countdown completes, Apollo tells the Blight to lower their shields, one to beam aboard. Down below, there is a ground-shaking explosion in the sky, and Starfire tells Apollo, May Zal watch over you forever. Commander continues her assault, shouting that too many allies to the throne have died. Too much blood has been spilled this day! And suddenly, she stops. As the throne spear goes through her stomach and drips with blood, she tells Starfire that she has failed her. Jason and Roy look back, going, uh-oh. And the Blight High Lord yells that they have them on the run. Let us skin these meat sacks and rule the day! Starfire begins to focus her energy, stating that upon the graves of her parents, I swear, that is enough! And she begins to lose control of her powers, ripping apart the ground in a massive explosion. And through that smoldering ash, Starfire makes her way through, grabbing the High Lord, telling him that he was mistaken when he believed that he offered people some perverted gift of death. She is here to tell him that pain and suffering is easy. That's why there is so much of it in the universe. He wants to experience something unique. 
try life, hope, love. Starfire pulls the High Lord close and kisses him, and seconds later, he begins to burn from the inside out. A week later, Starfire stares at the throne, thinking to herself that she has spent so many years imagining her return, taking vengeance on the people who had turned their backs to her when she needed them the most. And now that she is finally here, the only way that she can ever be truly free is to forgive the world that betrayed her. She realized the very last thing she wanted was to rule anybody. And that's when Commander steps out stating that she will be the one sitting on the throne. It's what their parents always wanted. Starfire tells her that she should be resting. They can talk about things while she sits. And Starfire helps Commander onto the throne and she tells her that she has a request. Please stay, be here by my side. We can rule together. Starfire smiles, stating that just as Tamarin needs their queen, her friends, the outlaws, they need her. She has found happiness, maybe love, among the humans. And as everyone gets ready to make their trip back to Earth, there is already someone on the deserted island waiting. A twisted voice yells, You who? Anybody home? Where is it? Where is it? Come out, come out, wherever you are! And as the trunk opens up, the person reaches inside, stating, Ah, there you are! And here we go! The Joker pulls out Jason's mask, and he begins to laugh louder. And louder. And louder. <laughs> On his way home, Jason begins to think to himself that even before he died, there were a few things in life that could make him afraid. First was something happening to his mother. They know how that turned out. Second was an empty bread basket. Yeah, he has food issues. Third, Superman and he is currently knocking on the side of their ship, asking if they have a moment to talk. He says they do not need to do this the hard way. And Roy then asks, how about they pretend they don't see Superman and they keep flying? And Superman says, that won't work. Super hearing, remember? Isabel says, why don't they just talk to him? And Jason says, well, because we're outlaws. What do you think he wants? Orn tells Starfire that he can teleport her and the others down to Earth from here. A cloaking program would make it impossible for the Kryptonian to locate them. Starfire says that that is an excellent suggestion. Make it so. Everyone gets into the teleporter and begins to fade away, and outside, Superman's a little perturbed. Seconds later, down on the deserted island that is the outlaw's base, Jason holds up his gun and Starfire says that he must relax. There is no way that even one such as Superman could have fallen. Jason tells her, yeah. Keep telling yourself that. I fought beside him. Trust me when I say that when Superman wants something, there's nothing that can stand in his way. Roy says that it sounds like he almost respects him. And Jason looks around stating, yeah, just like how you respect a shark if you're surfing. And on cue, Superman floats down and Isabel asks, is it really a good idea to be pointing a gun at Superman? Jason says, look, I don't tell you how to serve the peanuts. Superman tells Starfire that his name is, but Starfire stops him, stating, I might not have lived on Earth as long as you, but I know who you are. There is a reason I never took the opportunity to introduce myself. Krypton was never liked by the people of Tamarin, even when it was alive. Just then an arrow bounces off of Superman's chest and he asks, Really? Are we really going to do this? And within a second, he uses his heat vision to knock everyone on the ground, excluding Isabel. As the red begins to fade, Superman says that he isn't here to hurt anyone. And Starfire lunges in stating, that's not going to be the problem that you think it is. Superman holds out his hand telling her, you misunderstand, I said I didn't want to hurt anyone. Not that I wouldn't. And with a quick punch, Starfire is knocked down to the ground. Just then another arrow hits Superman and he asks, this again? Can't you just fire them all at once so that we can move on? But before he could go on, a substance jets out covering Superman's face. And Jason asks, what's that one do? Roy explains that the arrow contains a chemical that when exposed to air, the gas turns into silicon. So his lungs should be filling up with gunk as they speak. Superman pulls what he can from his face, stating, that was quite impressive, but it won't work on someone who can raise their body temperature to the point where silicone burns. Everyone gets ready to brawl once again, but that's when a voice says, enough is enough. I'm a little disappointed. Superman, you're supposed to be the most powerful person on the planet and you can't figure out how to text? And the three of you 
You just overthrew an empire and freed a planet, and you can't take five minutes to have a conversation with Superman? Everyone stops, and Jason says, Yeah, that's fair. Superman goes on, telling them, Okay, well, I was recently approached by an intergalactic warlord named Hellspont who's looking to enlist extraterrestrials into his cause. As another alien on Earth, I was wondering if Starfire had been approached. Roy tells him, No way, that never happened. Starfire stops him. Well, actually, the encounter was so brief and so bizarre, I hadn't given it much thought since. I was blissfully alone for an afternoon when a blue-flamed alien appeared. He was speaking on behalf of this Hellspont. Superman says that he heard through the grapevine that the off-worlders were given the same hard sell, and that they also turned down his people. If it's not too much trouble, he would like to ask Starfire to contact him if she is to hear from these people again. Roy tells him you're just suck it up and ask, and Starfire says, It is very clear. Superman needs our help. Superman tells them, Look, the truth of the matter is that it is taking every bit of self-control to not drag the three of you back to the States and see you charged and convicted for the multitude of crimes that you have racked up. I can only imagine the things that you've done since you've all banded together, but I understand that they're your methods, not mine. Batman vouched for you, Jason. Superman then scans the table that Jason is sitting on and says, if you're going to be holding a trillion star blader, you might want to take the safety off first. Roy then asks, When you go back to the Justice League, can you tell Green Arrow something like, Hey! Superman tells him, I don't normally hang out with, You know what? Sure. Hey, got it. Later, back in Gotham, Isabel opens up the door to her apartment, stating that it isn't much, but it's home. It's close to the airport and it's functional. Jason tells her that he's the last person that she has to explain herself to. And as Jason gets closer, Isabel asks if he's going to kiss her, because the last time he wasn't very good. Jason says that that's when he was lying about everything. Allow him to show her the difference. Some time passes and Jason turns off the shower, getting ready to get dressed when he calls out to Isabel asking if she could give him something to wear since she decided to tear his clothes off. A moment passes and there's no response. So Jason grabs the shower curtain pole and rips it off the wall. He slowly creeps out and looks down to see an overdosed Isabel on the ground. To see an overdosed Isabel dead on the ground. He's known addicts. He would have known if she was one. Someone did this on purpose. Someone was trying to send him a message that Isabel is dead because of him. As Jason rushes to her side, the man on the TV says that this is Jack Napier with the weather. Whether I'm right or wrong, tomorrow's going to be a scorcher, folks. It's going to be dark all night followed by a scattered sunshine in the morning. Come on, kid, this is some of my best material. Relax, your lady friend is going to be fine. I've already called the EMTs, oh, in Gotham's finest. Jason looks back at the TV asking, is that you? Why? And Jack responds, why? Why not ask, why not? Just then the police break in shouting, freeze. And Joker rips off the face mask asking, Freeze during a heat wave? <laughs> These people serve, protect, and entertain. Jason, tell, Jason tells the Joker that if Isabel dies, he swears to God on what's left of that pasty face that he will kill him himself. It only took seconds for the Gotham PD to storm the room as Jason held Isabel. And Jason tells them that they need to get this girl to the hospital. He's going after the man responsible for it. And if they don't stand down in the next three seconds, he's going to take them all down. Harvey Bullock asks, And how are you going to do that? You're a nothing but a towel. After those three seconds are up, Jason grabs the shower curtain pole and goes to town. He went easy on them, mostly. They were just doing their job. And as all of the officers begin to fall, Bullock grabs his gun, but before he can even point it, Jason is already at his throat with the shower pole. After that, Bullock called in the ambulance to take Isabel away. That's when things took a turn for the worse. Jason had taken Bullock's keys, but there was already somebody waiting for him in the back seat. And what followed was a cloud of gas. Time passes and suddenly Jason wakes up to the sound of someone laughing. He blinks his eyes and quickly realizes that he can't move a finger. But why? What did the Joker do to him? As the laughter stops, the Joker tells him, Don't worry! You're not having one of those out-of-body experiences, though. If anyone would know about this, it would be me. I've injected you with a toxin that completely paralyzes your body, so no funny business. Joker then leans down telling him, How about I tell you a joke? There's something that I've been working on for a while. Jason kicks out his leg telling the Joker, No, let's not. There's one thing that the Joker didn't realize after he had come back to life. 
that he was trained by Dukra and the Allcast. Things like paralytic toxins mean next to nothing. Jason gets up, kicking the Joker back once more, pulling his cuffed hands around the front and reaching for a crowbar. He charges and slamming the Joker into the wall with the crowbar, pressed against his neck, telling him, we're gonna end this right here, right now. And that's when the crowbar emits electricity, shocking Jason, causing him to fall back. The Joker sits there and begins clapping, telling him, you and me, kid, same as it was, you and me. More time passes and Jason hears the faint voice of the Joker telling him, Wakey, wakey! You'll miss the first reel and then you'll be lost. Jason quickly jolts up yelling for the Joker to show himself and why did he call him son? Joker asks, Do you really want to know? The answer's right in front of your eyes. Jason looks down and says that he sees a spent bullet and as he picks it up he says that this has no significance at all. Joker asks, are you sure? It couldn't be the bullet that I pulled out of dear old Pops, could it? Jason jumps to his feet and begins to run, shouting that he will find him. And that's when he suddenly stops. It's a woman and a child, and Joker says, it's time for some traumatic childhood syndrome, loss of a parent. You were too young back then, too helpless to help. Jason kicks the mannequin, knocking off the mannequin's head that would be his mother, and Joker asks, Do you have mommy issues? Usually it's the other parent. Jason begins running again, and that's when he trips over a small medical box. He then asks, Do you remember that one, the night that you stole it from the good old doctor? Jason sits back up, asking, What are you trying to say? That you were there from the beginning, in the shadows, every step of the way? At first there's silence, and then the Joker tells him, Something like that. Jason snaps. No, I'm not buying it. My life might be a steaming pile, but it's my life, not some punchline to a stale act. The Joker begins to laugh. <laughs> Actually, you kind of are. And why would we lie to each other? We're practically family. The Joker pulls a lever and the floor beneath Jason falls and he begins to tumble to the floor below. But what Jason doesn't see right away is that there's someone else in the pit with him. Everyone comes from humble beginnings. Jason Todd is no different. The day he was born, his mother was screaming for him to get out while his father, well, he was busy trying to hit on the receptionist at the front desk. Then there was the time he died, but we'll get back to that later. First, we're gonna go back to how Jason Todd's parents met. His mother, Catherine, used to go off campus to get lunch each day, and one of those days, she met a loser. I mean, she met Willis Todd. The two locked eyes, and they couldn't keep their hands off of each other. Now, Willis had a hard life growing up, so in his defense, he didn't really have a chance. He would brag about how he was drinking and got into a car accident and escaped before the cops could get him. That was the big one for him. After some time, baby Jason was born, and this is when things got better, right? No, but he couldn't really complain. Aside from being a child and not knowing any better, he did at least have a lot of basics covered. At a young age, it fell to Jason to take care of the house since Willis was always working. Jason would take care of his mother while she went through depression, did Lord knows how many drugs, and, and she'd often check out for days at a time. As Jason got older, Willis taught him the tricks of the trade, how to make money on the corner while hiding in plain sight. Willis might have been a little proud, but who's to say? Then one night, Willis was shot in the back. Good thing he was spineless, right? Lo and behold, things got worse when he was arrested. It fell onto Jason to protect the home. Mostly, it was keeping a lot of his mother's dealers away and managing to protect his mother from them. However, there was one person that she couldn't be protected from, herself. By the time Jason had found her, she was already gone. And after that, Jason took to the streets, taking what he could. He never hurt anyone, physically, but the same couldn't be said for him. One of the nights when he woke up, he was in the hospital under the care of Dr. Leslie Tompkins. Nice lady, wouldn't shut up about second chances. So how did Jason repay her? Well, he stole prescription drugs from her. He'd almost gotten away with it, but that's when, well, he appeared. The man dressed as a bat. Batman was ready to take in Jason, but Dr. Tompkins begged him to give him a chance. Still to this day, Jason has no clue what Dr. Tompkins saw in him. After being convinced to give him a second chance, Batman did take in the young lad. And after some time, they had built up a trust, and Batman began to train him to become the second kid to wear the Robin costume. It was a pretty sweet gig, take down the bad guys and do some good in the world. But then things began to spiral. Jason would hit the bad guys over and over, harder and harder. 
Batman saw this and decided that he needed to be benched for a bit, let him cool off, and that was the mistake. One night, Batman went on patrol and Jason manned the Bat computer when he saw an image of someone, his mother. She was alive. Without saying a word, Jason set off to find Catherine in the Middle East of all places. Using every trick that he had learned as Robin, it didn't take long to track her down. And everything was fine until it wasn't. The Joker was there waiting for him. It was the first time that he died. Now, there's no telling what happened between the death and, well, revival. All Jason knew is that there was something called the Lazarus Pit. But now onto the man that created the Red Hood, the Joker. See, there's a little known fact about Jason's upbringing, and that fact is that someone had a little hand in how things played out. It all started the night that Jason's father got shot. It was a back alley, no name hospital, of course. But watching from afar, the Joker decided something. He was gonna make that kid a star. So after a little bit of planting and preparation, Willis was arrested for some bogus crime, but Lord knows he needed to be put away anyway. That's when the Joker just needed to play off Catherine's weakness. But that's the funny thing about drugs. Some drugs act like other drugs. Instead of getting high, some effects can mimic that of dying. So as far as anyone was concerned, Catherine Willis died from an overdose. That's when things started to get really interesting. The Joker had created a new Robin. Now the punchline to this is, a broken spirited boy turns to a life of crime and then becomes a hometown favorite. Touching story, right? Just throw in a heartfelt moment where the hero finds his mother and kaboom! What happened next was crazy. Jason Todd came back to life. The kicker is that Jason decided to take on the Joker's maiden name, the Red Hood, completely with bringing a 44 caliber pain to everyone, including Batman. Guess now it's time to sit back and enjoy the show. <laughs> now that concludes what the Joker was hinting at in our previous story. It is an origin story of Red Hood as it was told in New 52. It's been slightly retconned since then, and a lot of the fans aren't fans of what the Joker did to the Red Hood. It doesn't make a lot of sense for the Joker to have created the Red Hood. Personally, I don't think it matters too much, but a lot of people are against it. Now this story was told during the New 52 by the Joker when he was fighting against the Red Hood. It was a filler issue. And we're going to get back to the Red Hood versus the Joker storyline next week. But I thought you guys might be interested to know what Arsenal and Starfire were doing during this period. So since it's also a short issue, we're going to cover that right now. Now, with the disappearance of Jason, Arsenal and Starfire set out to Gotham City for answers as to where Jason could have gone. But as they arrive, they find themselves in the middle of a battle with a swarm of homeless men infected by the Joker toxin, as well as fighting alongside the Teen Titans of the New 52. Starfire asks why they do not simply incinerate these creatures, and Kid Flash says because he just witnessed them transform only a few moments ago. What if the Joker hasn't set in yet? Maybe there's a way to save them. Arsenal punches one of the men stating that he's with Kid Flash on this. Until they know for sure, they must do everything that they can to try and save them. As for starters, Speedy here is going to corral all these people so that they can contain them safely. Kid Flash asks where Wonder Girl is, and Arsenal asks, Wonder Girl what? Wait, are you seriously checking in with this girl before listening? Wonder Girl tells him to relax that she speaks on behalf of the Titans. While they appreciate the last minute backup, they have their own way of doing things. They hit things. Arsenal then asks, what do you guys do when that doesn't work? A Wonder Girl pushes everyone into a building stating, we hit them harder. As she closes the doors, Kid Flash runs back out, boarding up the door with planks and nails stating, there, that should keep them out. Arsenal asks if she knows how strong drugged up people can get. And just then, the infected begin to beat on the door with Arsenal stating, Look, we don't have to like each other, but if we want to get Red Hood and Red Robin back, then we got to work together. Wonder Girl says, All right, what's the plan? And Arsenal smiles, stating, I don't have one! And Starfire slaps her head, quietly muttering, Mother of Zol. Just then, a ping can be heard, and Arsenal tells them that his alarm just went off on his analysis arrow. Now he has a plan! During the fight, he drew some blood and sent the information over to the super-secret floating headquarters nearby. The lab on board broke down the toxin and found the elements used to create it. Working backwards, they've created a counter-synthetic to nullify those found in the toxin, and they can save all the people that are infected. The computer also identified a warehouse in the docks where they could find all the synthetics. So everyone else will go get the stuff while me and Bunker will stay here and hold back the infected. Bunker laughs, stating, See? It's all gonna work out. Wait, did he say Bunker? Arsenal yells, We don't have time! Go! The faster we are, the more people we can save. As Starfire and Wonder Girl and the others leave, the door breaks down and the affected begin to pour in. A short while later, over on the docks, Wonder Girl opens up a storage unit asking if this is what they're looking for. And one of the boxes says, Cure, do not touch. Wait, what's that ticking sound? 
Kid Flash quickly grabs everyone, running back as an explosion goes off, and Wonder Girl yells, Damn it! We were so close! Those crates were our only shot at a cure. And as they get back up, Kid Flash motions to the stack of boxes, asking, Were those the ones that we wanted? Thank you. Thank you. I may have saved them. Back with Arsenal, him and Bunker are fighting against the infected with non-lethal methods until Arsenal finally runs out of arrows. Arsenal turns to Bunker, telling him, Can't you do something else with your powers? Like, not just make giant fists? And Bunker yells, Of course I can! I just hit people! Oh wait, I get it now. Soon, Bunker steps back, creating psionic bricks and begins to contain the infected within them. Arsenal pats him on the shoulder, telling him, Ha ha! Knew you could do it! Good job. And a few moments pass, with the others returning with the crates, and Arsenal telling everyone that they have to be fast. The crazy clown has all these syringes pre-dosed, most likely to hold the city hostage at some point. Kid Flash? Kid Flash steps back, telling him, Uh... I'm not so sure. Needles really aren't my thing. Wonder Girl grabs him, asking, Are you kidding right now? You will so not pass out. Not until everyone is cured. Then you can pass out. Kid Flash sighs as he begins to get to work, injecting the infected. And Arsenal tells Wonder Girl that he likes her style. She folds her arms, telling him that he can't imagine how little that means to her, but thank you. Shortly after, the people inside the containment area begin to revert back, and Arsenal thinks to himself that everything turned out okay. Maybe... He could try to help these kids out sometime. Make sure they don't turn out like him down the road. A short while later, Jason realizes that it was Timothy Drake, Red Robin. And as they lay in their cell, there is a knocking sound and the Joker asks, Hello! Everyone decent? I certainly hope not! Without an answer, the Joker kneels down telling them, How can they still be unconscious? They just don't build bat brats like they used to. Joker bursts out laughing, yelling, <laughs> I know what to do. It's going to be awe-inspiring. Why is it that I'm at my best when there's only an audience of one? Joker rushes out of the room, locking it down before heading to the control panel and asking, Which one is the spotlight? He pushes a button and water dumps down on Jason and Tim, and the two quickly get up coughing from the intake of water. Jason says, Sorry for dragging you into this, Tim. The pasty-faced freak made this personal, but there's no way that he's leaving this place alive. And Tim tells him, You know, this may come as a shock, but this isn't about you. Not entirely, at least. If we act rash, we both lose. The screen turns on and Joker yells, Front and center, boys! You better turn around for your super secret surprise! As the two turn back, they see two men tied to a pipe. One with a sign that says, Number one, Dad and another one that says, Deadbeat Dad. Joker bursts out laughing again, shouting, I love family reunions. Now, normally I wouldn't spell this part out, but since you're so slow, we're gonna play a game. We have Red Hood's dad and Red Robin's dad, and there's going to be some red spilling out of one of them. I'll let you decide which is going to live and which is going to die. Tim asks if he really thinks that this is going to work. What are they supposed to do, fight each other to the death for his entertainment? You're crazier than. But before Tim could finish, he hears a click of a gun and the cold steel is pressed against his head. Tim sighs, asking, Is there any wonder why I'm your only friend, Jason? Tim spins around, kicking the gun out of Jason's hand, telling him, We have to work together. And Jason asks, Why would I risk my father's life? The two go back and forth, hitting each other, and Joker begins clapping, telling them, Ha-ha! This is it! Cain and Abel! Kirk versus the Gorn! It's the I versus the E! Except the C! Tim then hits Jason, yelling, Your father died in prison. And Jason hits back, telling him, The Joker brought my mother back from the dead. What's to say that this isn't it, too? As Tim falls, Jason pins him down with the gun, telling him, I'm sorry. I can't take any chances, Tim. Suddenly, there's a flash of light out of Tim's suit, and Tim leans up, knocking Jason back, and the two go right back at it again. As Tim hits, he realizes that Jason is too stubborn to get knocked out, which means he'll have to play dirty to win this. He uses his wings, swinging them like a blade, cutting into Jason's mask. He then tells him, I could kill you right here, and you'd have no idea, but that's not something that we do. And Joker yells, Come on! Find a way to do that or both men are going to die! As Tim goes in for another swing, he swings around, slashing at the glass divider that holds their fathers. Jason then opens fire, unloading his magazine into the Joker. As Jason holsters his gun, he asks, How did you know that those weren't our fathers? And 
Tim says, because the man that the Joker claimed was his had a discoloration on his wrist, not matching his actual father. So the two laugh, and the Joker begins to cough when suddenly gas shoots out of the bullet wounds in his body. Jason shouts, the Joker knew that I would shoot him. We have to, we have to. However, as the gas fills their lungs and they collapse, a shadow stands over them. It all started low at first, but the voice in his head can get louder. The Joker yells, look, look, wake up and see this amazing setting that we have here. Step into the light. Batman begins to open up his eyes as he sees Damien, Nightwing, Batgirl, Jason, and Tim all bound with bags over their heads. The Joker laughs. Ta-da! Dinner is served! Batman tries to force his way out of his bindings, but the Joker tells him, Don't worry! They're all just bound and gagged. They've kept me entertained, though, talking to them for hours. Batman struggles, telling him, I'm going to destroy you for this. And the Joker laughs. <laughs> Not so fast! I wouldn't want you to get up just yet! After all, don't you smell something, Bats? After a few moments, Batman tells him, I can smell gasoline. And Joker tells him, That's right! There are flints underneath the throne. The moment you try to get up, the sparks will fly! Now, you could stand up, leave the table at any point during the meal. In doing so, you'll burn away all the shame that you brought on to these kids. But first, let's have a look at what's for dinner. Hmm, oh Jeeves, Mr. Pennyworth! Batman begins to ask, What did you do? And an infected Alfred crawls out of a hole, and the Joker says, He's right here, itching to help! Batman lets out a sigh of relief, and Alfred walks over with a rope and pulls it down. All of the bags that are covering everyone's heads are pulled off, and each of them has bloody bandages covering their faces, only exposing their eyes. Batman looks at horror, asking, What did you do? And the Joker tells him, I've just dressed them up for the part! Or rather, I've undressed them! Mr. Pennyworth, would you please serve us? So Alfred begins to take off the domes on each of the plates, and inside of them are the faces of each of the Bat family members staring right back at them. The Joker tells him, Oh, I hope you like it! I made it with lots of love! Batman struggles, asking, How could you? And the Joker tells him, Oh, it was quite simple. Just a little slice here, pull a bit there, chill and serve! 30-minute recipe, Bats! Joker walks over, leaning on the table, asking, why is it that you have never killed me? Batman tells him, because you'd win. And the Joker bursts out laughing. <laughs> I love that one, because I'd win. But would I really? What if Batman killed the Joker and no one knew? It could certainly happen. But would Batman be able to bear that cross? Joker then takes out a small booklet stating, I wrote this love letter. It's a backwards map. It's a hit list, and I'd write it over and over again. It's the kids here who are making Batman afraid, afraid of what he's taken from them in the moment of their weakness. But he doesn't have to be afraid anymore, because the Joker's here now. I've carried out Bat's orders. The nightmare can finally end. Now who are we going to let do the honors? Joker takes on a match, striking it, telling him, Go on, stand up! Oh, I'll toss the match, Bats. After a few seconds, Batman kicks back in his chair, igniting the gas, running from the tables, telling him, If you knew me so well, then you would have realized that no one knows the caves better than me. Batman frees himself, tossing a small explosive up to the ceiling, and as it explodes, the water comes pouring in, putting out the fires. Joker looks at his work destroyed, not smiling. That's not funny. Batman quickly begins to untie everyone, asking if they're all right, and Nightwing tells him, Just hurry up and go after the Joker. We're going to be fine. Batman says that he can't. He can't leave them alone again. And Nightwing says, It will be fine. Go, Bruce. So Batman turns to follow the Joker deeper into the caves, but as he leaves, the cat Joker has had sitting on the table begins to beep. It meows and then explodes with gas, and everyone begins to breathe it in. And as Nightwing recovers, he asks, Everyone okay? <laughs> But up ahead, Batman turns a corner and Joker leaps out of the shadows with an axe. Batman catches it as Joker yells, You just had to ruin it, didn't you? Batman grabs the axe, ripping it out of the Joker's hands, telling him, Enough! No more dances! No more quarreling! No more of anything, Joker. 
back at the entrance. The gas is spreading, infecting all of the kids, and they all quickly begin to beat into each other, laughing as they can't control themselves. Meanwhile, back with Batman, he cracks Joker in the back of the head with a crowbar, and the Joker yells, Ow! Are you really going to let them die back there? Batman walks forward, telling him, No, I have faith in them. I've made them stronger. Joker's smile fades and he begins to yell, Liar! I know that they don't make you anything! Maybe this will help reveal your true self! He pushes a button and acid sprays out of the flower onto Batman's mask, and he begins to run away again laughing. But after only a few moments, the Joker comes to a waterfall. As he jumps off of it, Batman grabs him, telling him, No, not that way. But how about it? Maybe tonight I will go farther than I've ever gone before. How about I stop this game right here, right now, once and for all, Joker? Joker begins to laugh. <laughs> do it! I dare you! You never! Batman leans in, telling him, I'll do you one better. I broke the spell. I finally learned the truth. All of it. Your name, your history, who you really are. If I had to choose what family, I choose them. Now listen close, Joker. Your real name is... Joker begins to slam his palm into the Batman's mouth with an electric buzzer, pushing himself off, falling into the depths below. A short time later, Batman brings everyone back home, treating them for the toxins that they ingested, and everyone goes back to as it should. But as Batman walks into the cave, the screen on the computer shows an image of the Joker, still with the identity unknown text beneath it. The computer then reports that it found the isotope in the Joker toxin. Element 105, Dubnium. Batman stares for a moment and asks, does it have any other names? And the computer responded with Hanium. Batman then asks for the original element symbol and the screen changes to H-A. As the days pass and everyone is recovering from the Joker toxin, Jason notices Damien sitting all by himself outside. He walks outside stating that he should get ready to leave and Damien asks, who cares? Jason laughs off the comment telling him that he just wanted to say, good job back there. Damien scoffs telling him that it means a lot coming from someone of such mental health like him. Jason takes a seat at the bench and tells Damien that they've all been through what he's going through. He reaches out to touch Damien, but he shifts away asking, weren't you leaving? A few moments later, a minivan comes screeching to the entrance outside of the house and Arsenal gets out stating, and I thought Oliver Queen had mega bucks, dude. Can't imagine what the rent is like with all these bat safe houses. As Jason gets ready to respond, Starfire flies up grabbing on and Jason says, yeah, it's nice to see you too. Starfire pulls Jason into the air asking, where have you been? We fared the worst. And Jason tells her that he had some family things that he needed to take care of. Can you uh put me down? As she does, Jason motions to the door asking if she would like to come inside. There's a few things that he needs to get. She turns away stating that it might be best if she waited outside. Jason walks back inside asking, are you serious? Are you not even gonna say hello to her? Nightwing looks at him. The Joker opened up some very old wounds. Should be more understandable why I'm not close with anyone, right? Jason turns to leave, telling him, maybe. Or maybe that girl out there is more amazing than you give her credit for. Nightwing stops him. Don't judge me. Just promise to watch over her, Jason. Jason walks out, telling him, oh, I will. Every day of my life. Back outside, Jason sees Arsenal and Damien fighting, and he asks, really? And both of them point at each other, shouting, he started it! Once inside, Jason says his goodbyes, and Batman sits in the cave, stating, that he thought that there weren't going to be any goodbyes. Jason says that he bumped into the big guy the other day, said Batman vouched for him. Batman doesn't even turn to look at Jason, but he tells him, I'll never approve of your methods, but I cannot argue with your results, Jason. I learned a long time ago that I can't control everyone. Jason takes off his helmet and begins to walk back upstairs, but then he stops for a moment. He turns back and he says, I have to know, the things the Joker said, were they true? Did he actually create me? Batman tells him, no. Joker didn't make you. Batman didn't either. You made yourself. As Jason heads back upstairs, he puts his helmet back on, but suddenly it latches itself closed. A hologram of the Joker appears and he shouts, You played a joke on me, Jason! Only I'm not laughing. You were supposed to be one of my greatest masterpieces from start to finish. But you were too stubborn to stay dead. So here's what we're going to do. You're so determined to be your own man? Fine! Let's start you with a clean slate. Just then, the Joker toxin is released into the Red Hood mask, and as much as Jason tries, he can't take it off his head. Batman comes running up the stairs, catching Jason as the gas is fading, and the mask loosens. 
He pulls it off while everyone comes running in and Damien asks what just happened, but Batman can't respond. All he can do is cry as he holds Jason with his face burned. Later, as Jason lays on a slab of stone, he can hear something nagging in the back of his mind. A low ha-ha. But it gets louder, and it gets louder. Lightning strikes and the Joker is looming over Jason, shouting that he must really be obsessed with being alive. Too bad you're dead! Wiped that pretty pink brain matter off the crowbar onto my finely pressed purple suit. Joker brings up a massive fist down, destroying the altar that Jason was lying on, barely missing him, and that's when Jason notices something in the rubble. He pulls out a bundle of dynamite and he leaps into the air, shoving it into the Joker's mouth, telling him that he's not going through that again. Never! The explosion launches Jason back to the ground, nearly knocking him unconscious. But as he stands, he tells Dukra, thanks for the help. But she says that there's nothing that she can do to undo the damage that he's done to this place. He looks around at the mound of dead friends, including those of the Bat family, and Dukra goes on telling him that after he left the All Cast, he continued to let his life be defined by the actions of one man. He became a killer, lashing out to people who may or may not have deserved it, and eventually he hurt all of those that he cared for. In a way, how is he different from the Joker? Jason pulls out the All Blades, telling her whether she's a distant memory or not, she will never compare him to that monster. He is nothing like the Joker! Duker points at a tree, and on it, hanging by their necks, are Arsenal and Starfire. Jason falls to his knees, stating this isn't possible. And Duker tells him that he cannot live in the past and the present at the same time. Not without one reaching out to destroy the other, he has to let one of them go. The closest to him will suffer the most. How long did he think that he could continue to live and thrive in an inferno of rage that burns within his heart? They love him with their own hearts wide open. Yet all he gives in return is the hollow actions of a man going through the motions. Soon the bodies of those around Jason begin to reach out, grabbing onto him, pulling him under until finally, someone grabs his hand. Batman pulls as hard as he can, telling Jason that it's time. It's time to come back home for good. And as things change, Jason takes off the helmet, stating that there is no place for him. He tried to be a good soldier, even a part of Batman Inc., and he failed him again. Batman tells him that there's just too much talk about the blame between the two of them. There always has been. They have to let things go. They both have done things that they regret, but the one thing that he will never apologize for is taking a chance on Jason. In the real world, Batman is sitting by Jason's side as Jason opens up his eyes. He begins to tell him, I'm suck. But Batman tells him, shh, shh, and he embraces Jason. Somewhere over the Himalayas, a Wayne Enterprises jet flies over the snowy mountains when it's suddenly attacked by a group of assassins. The leader of the group says that if they would be willing to fly such an expensive plane in this area, they must be willing to pay a lot for their lives. Right? Jason sighs as he closes his book, telling the man that they really don't know what they just walked into. He's really not in the mood for this. The man points his gun at Jason's head and laughs, telling him, too bad you don't have your butler here to hide behind. Jason tells him that his butler would kick his ass all the way back to Gotham City, which would be much more pleasant than what he has in mind. Two hours later, Roy and Starfire find Jason's downed plane, and Roy says that it means that they're getting close at least, right? Starfire flies down telling him that there's no trace of Jason, and Roy says, you know, knowing Jaybird, he's covering his tracks anyway. Maybe the townsfolk will have some clues. So as a group of natives look on, Roy yells out, Greetings! We're big American superheroes and we need to find someone. But we must also reach the Acres of All, the home of the All Cast. Does uh, anyone know where that is? The people all begin to look at each other and a man waves his hand stating, Sorry, no English. Several hours go by and Roy pushes through the snow telling himself that he won't freeze. He's just got to keep moving. Starfire flies over asking if it helps at all with her stating over and over like that. And Roy shivers telling her, no, not at all. We just have to keep moving, go deeper. But as he finishes his sentence, he collapses. Starfire catches him telling him that he's not dressed properly for this climate and Roy scoffs. Says, you, we have to keep going. If we don't, there's no telling if we'll see Jason again. Not after that thing with the Batman and the Joker. These past few months, the three of us together, it's been good, right? Jason wouldn't just disappear and not want us to find him, right? As Roy and Starfire rest for the night, off in the distance, a voice tells Essence that they are closer than she thought. Essence asks, Mother? Dukra? How? You're dead. 
and Duker's spirit appears asking how many centuries did she spend leading the Allcast. These mountains are riddled with her magic. Until it dissipates, she is a part of them. The Archer Boy doesn't believe that he is capable of doing anything right, but even still he has the heart and the will and a deep love for his friend. We cannot interfere. Essence shouts that she must. She will shatter him through his dreams. And as Essence slips into Roy's nostrils, Roy wakes up with his mind surrounded by people of the past, all telling him that he is no good, that he should just give up, just accept it. Versions of himself and Green Arrow begin to shoot him with arrows, telling him that he is pathetic, a drunk. Jason only keeps him around to see what rock bottom even looks like. But soon, Roy begins to fight back, shouting that he is doing his best to commune with his own darkness and accept it. I may have fallen low, and I might not live up to what people think of me, but Jason needs me, and nothing will keep me from finding him. Just then, Essence is expelled from Roy's body, and he begins to wake up coughing, asking, why does it feel like he just smoked a dozen cigars? Roy then wakes up Starfire, telling her that he knows where they have to go. Fly him there now. Later, as the two are staring at a mountainside, Starfire asks if he's sure, and Roy tells her, yeah, just fly us through. Starfire picks Roy up, sighing, stating, you just woke her up to crack into a mountain. And as the two get closer, they phase through the side of the mountain and find themselves in the acres of all. Roy looks around, stating that that was pretty easy, or maybe not? And just then a snarling creature slowly walks up, followed by several more surrounding them. Roy lets loose an arrow, hitting one creature, creating a plume of foam, and he yells out, and you said my foam arrows are stupid. But while they fight the creatures back, there was a loud roar from the alpha creature. And then suddenly, it stops. The beast falls to the ground and Jason pulls his sword out with Roy yelling that that was pretty sweet, Jaybird. You're gonna have to teach me how to go all Beastmasters sometime. Jason wipes the blood from his sword, stating that he and his friend should leave. This place is dangerous. And as he begins to walk away, Starfire flies in front of him in a fit of anger, stating that he does not get to cast them away after they chased him halfway around the world. Roy almost died last night, all for the Himalayas. Jason looks at Starfire and says that she must have him confused with someone else. He uh, has no idea who they are. Roy grabs Jason, stating, This is a joke, right? What's my name? And Jason smiles, stating, How would I know the name of someone I've never met? Roy begins to shout, frustrated. This isn't even a little funny. Your name is Jason Todd. We're friends. And Jason walks off, telling him, The funny little man said something like that. Starfire asks who did this to him, and a voice tells her that Jason did this to himself, though he may have had a teensy bit of help. Starfire flies up to Saru, asking what did he do, and Saru asks if they remember that he can pluck memories out of people. Well, that's why their pal came here in the first place. Jason came to him, and he said that he didn't want to remember, and that he wanted to start all over. Of course, it isn't something that they were supposed to do, but Jason wanted to be stripped of everything that the darkness inside him touched, which happened to be everything. Saru turns to Jason, asking how is he feeling about everything, and Jason tells him that he's feeling pretty great, actually. Like it's hard to describe, it feels like a huge weight has been lifted off of him and he's finally able to breathe easy. Sara looks at the others and states, There you go! He asked for me to do this. Roy shouts, No! Jason would never want to rid himself of the memories of the Joker! He doesn't want a blank slate! And Saru tells him that he has to remove everything connected to the darkness. He really doesn't understand how memories work, do you? There's a network of collected images bound by deep and powerful emotions. Everything connected to the darkness means everything, period. Roy says that he's up to something and Saru asks, what would I possibly gain from this? Maybe you should feel what he went through for yourselves. Then you can judge whether or not he'd consider doing this. Soon everything changes and around Starfire and Roy, they begin to see the snapshots of Jason's life. The night that he found his mother, the day that he was killed. The day that he was brought back to life, all of the torment from the Joker, even after coming back to life. And Roy yells out, just stop! Jason went through some horrible stuff, we all have, but that's why we work well together. Together we are stronger than some crappy memories, and his connection to me and Starfire can go beyond anything involving the Joker. Saru reaches out asking, why don't I look through some of your memories then, when it all started? The memories changed to the night that Roy met Jason when he was still Robin. Roy is getting beat up by a group of thugs when Jason saves him. 
He offers him his bow and says that he looked like he could use a friend. Roy then told him that he didn't need friends, but Jason just laughs, telling him, ha, we all need friends. If you ever change your mind, you know where you can find me. Saru then explains that the night that they met, it was the night that Jason learned that his mother was alive. He left the next day to that moment when the Joker killed him. And afterwards, Dukra spent a long time to quiet that burning rage in his heart. He was convinced that the only way to get revenge on the Joker was to reject everything that Batman had taught him. He would need to become a killer, and he found the perfect people to teach him the art of death. So he fell in line with the League of Assassins, the one place that he could let his rage out. Roy steps back, stating that he seemed so hurt, so betrayed. And Saru goes on stating that Jason spent his life burying his past, trying not to let it infect his soul. But we all have secrets, don't we? The big bad things that will haunt you forever. Starfire says that they can't let the past haunt them if they don't let it. And Saru laughs, telling her, Oh, you're one to talk! The little games you play, the little lies. Out of this merry little gang, you're the worst offender. Starfire gets ready to attack and shouts, asking, What did you just say? And Sorrow asks, Isn't it time? You've spent so long keeping up your little ruse. Roy then asks, What is he talking about? And Sorrow goes on stating, I can see how her mind works. If anything, the bonds of memory and emotion are even stronger for her than many humans. But she still pretends. She tries hard to make those who care about her think that she can't connect to them. But she is only trying to protect herself. Seeing as her mind works differently than any human, it's beautiful, really. She feels so strongly, so deeply, that one terrible memory can destroy her. So she buries it away in the back of her mind, effectively making it not exist anymore. But it's a choice, selective amnesia, only forgetting what you want forgotten. However, you can feel it all lingering, can't you? Those emotions were far too powerful not to leave a trace. If you want Jason to live with his darkest memories, perhaps you should try it for yourself. Starfire cries out as her memories of Nightwing are displayed. She screams for him to get out of her head, but before she could really let loose, Jason yells that they all need to stop this. He's sick of seeing everyone fight about him like he's not even standing here. All he can say is that the darkness inside of him is gone. He can have a whole new destiny. He doesn't want those memories back. Let him start over, please. Roy reaches behind his back stating that he's sorry to do this, and he stabs Jason with a Trank arrow. Roy then grabs another arrow and points it at Saru, telling him that he better fix this thing. Now. As Roy lets the arrow go, Saru destroys the arrow, telling him that that's cute, but it's not going to work. And after a few moments, he yawns, telling them, You know what? I'm done being yelled at. Time for you to go. There's no place for the repressed and indignant in the acres of all. As Saru snaps his fingers, Roy tries to call out for him to wait, but before he could even move, him and Starfire are teleported outside of the Acres of All. With the icy winds of the Himalayas blowing, Starfire asks, what do they do next? Roy yells that the plan was to get Jason back, but now that they have, he doesn't have his memories, and on top of that, you've been lying to me? Starfire says that it's not a lie, not exactly. She may have exaggerated how her mind works, but Roy shouts that she basically told him that she would forget him if he was gone. Did you think that that keeps me close? Keeps me from leaving you? I'm not going anywhere. And the only thing I want from this whole damn world is the three of us to be together. But I need you to trust me. That was the memory. Why was Nightwing? Starfire holds Roy stating that she can't. She's so sorry, but she can't. And with our heroes all distraught and torn apart practically, we traveled over to Seattle, where a hacker is staring at his laptop when suddenly he is shot in the shoulder with a green arrow. The man falls to the ground and he yells that this isn't something to interfere with and Green Arrow tells him, That's why I figured I'd stick a few arrows in you and see what happens. Sound good? The man then says that there's $500 million in each of their heads, including his little... Green Arrow kicks the man in the face, telling him, Friend might be overstating it. Green Arrow then looks down at the laptop and sighs. Damn it, Roy. Guess it's up to Green Arrow to save you. Again. The next day, back at the Outlaw's secret island, Jason climbs up into the computer room. He thinks to himself that with everything that's been said to him, he has to know the truth. Was he a costumed vigilante? Who are these people that brought him back here? And why does he have a deep feeling of comfort around them? They said they did good, but every time he asks them, their eyes dart away. There's something bigger, something hidden, something bad. Jason tells the computer to access all of the files on Red Hood. 
The computer responds, telling him that it's accessing the files, when suddenly the screen pops up with images of Red Hood and his confirmed kill count of 83. Meanwhile, as Roy lays in his bed awake next to Starfire, the perimeter alarm goes off and he asks Starfire if she's awake. She opens her eyes, but doesn't look over, and Roy says, of course not. He just needed to talk to her. He can't pretend like nothing's different since they came back here. She's been lying to him for months about her memories. She is deliberately keeping something big from him. Guess it doesn't really matter, though, saying all this stuff while she's sleeping. A short while later on the beach, Green Arrow shoots another of the protective drones, and he says, <laughs> Appreciate the warm welcome, really. And Roy asks, What the hell is he doing here? And Green Arrow tells him, Look, we both don't want to see each other, but we need to talk. You and your friends are in danger. Just then, several robot arms shoot out of the ground, grabbing Green Arrow, and he shouts, For the last time, get your weird robots off me! Roy asks, How did you even know we're here? And Green Arrow tells him, I've known ever since Superman paid you a visit. But that's not important right now. There's a huge bounty on all of you, 500 million each. Roy says that he wants to get this straight. You found out that people are trying to hunt us, so you flew directly over to our secret island. Our secret island, Oliver. The place that we've been living secretly, in secret, for months. Doesn't that sound like a trap? At that moment, an explosion goes off in Roy's home and he yells, If Starfire is robots, I need Green Arrow so we can shoot things. The robots begin letting go of Green Arrow, stating, Hello, Roy friend. We are Robo Arms. Hello. Green Arrow laughs, stating, And I thought Roy Harper had gone crazy or something. Talking robots. Ha! As the two rush back, Roy steps into the burning building, shouting for Starfire. But Cheshire stands over her, telling her, Oh, look, it's the boyfriend. How cute. Your alien love doll is out of commission permanently. Now it's time to get after the real target. Roy unloads his arrows, telling her, you're bluffing. But Cheshire phases out and back to dodge the arrows, then kicks Roy, stating, I don't have time for you. Roy then tells Green Arrow that he needs to find Jason, and Green Arrow asks, isn't he the bat kid? He should be fine. But Roy says that Jason isn't himself right now, and that is the problem. Now go! With Green Arrow leaving, Roy follows Cheshire through the halls, firing his arrows. But Cheshire leaps onto the wall and back at him, kicking the bow and breaking it, telling him that she bets that those fingers are strong, pulling that bowstring so much. Roy swings, and as Cheshire phases out, she looks at Roy's arm, stating, So strong. She then disappears, and Roy yells, Stop being sexy and fight me! He begins to pull out a sword, and Cheshire reappears asking if he's planning on cutting her with that little thing. Roy swings again, but Cheshire jumps down, blowing powder into his face, telling him, You just need to relax a bit. Elsewhere in the compound, Jason is reading through the files, stating that they have all been lying to him. Who the hell is he? A hand reaches out, touching him, telling him that they need to get out of here. A really bad poison lady is up to no good, and... Jason swings his arm back, hitting Green Arrow in the mouth, shouting, Get your hands off me! Green Arrow wipes his mouth, telling him, What the hell is wrong with you people? Back with Roy, Cheshire tells him, The toxin is painful. It will take a few hours for it to kill. But I'm not done playing with you yet. Thanks for the hat. Gonna go pay an old friend a visit. In the computer room, Jason and Green Arrow get ready to fight, but Cheshire phases and jumping off of Green Arrow, telling Jason, you should have introduced me sooner! You have such cute friends! She laughs, telling them, I've been fighting them all! There are two teams playing this bounty, and my good old pal Jason here is the ball. Cheshire looks over at Jason, and Jason says that she's gotta be kidding. And Cheshire tells him, Nope. You've just spent months training by my side. You wanted to be such a bad killer. It was cute! Just then, she phases as an arrow shoots through her, and then jumps back, kicking Green Arrow, stating, I'm officially annoyed by the hero. Going to kill him now, yes? But before she can swing, a red arrow knocks her sword out of her hand, and Roy pushes himself through the toxins already inside of himself, stating, I want my damn hat back! Cheshire looks back, asking if that wasn't enough for him. How about he tries all ten poisons in each of her nails at once? Never done that before! She leaves back, stabbing all of her nails into Roy's neck, and he falls to the ground. She laughs, telling him that the pain must be exquisite! Now, where were we? Suddenly, she lunges forward towards Jason, slamming him into the wall, telling him that he is the real target of the night. Now stop playing this ridiculous amnesia card. And Jason says, I'm not playing anything! I have no idea who the hell you are! Across the room, Green Arrow looks through all of Roy's pouches, stating, Yo, you got, like, anti-venom in here, right? There has to be... 
Of course, same place where mine is. As Green Arrow injects him with the antidote, Roy begins to cough, stating that if he loses both his friends tonight, he'll never forgive him. Back with Jason, Cheshire says that he can pretend all he wants, but he remembers who he is, and they've got a bigger destiny for him in mind. But as she is ripping at Jason's costume, a red blur shoots by, grabbing Cheshire and taking her to the wall. Roy gives a weak laugh. <laughs> That's my girl. Before Cheshire can realize what is going on, Starfire says that that actually hurt. You unbelievable witch! Cheshire smiles, stating, obviously not enough. How about we try some of this? She lifts a hand to Starfire's face, releasing a powder that causes Starfire to begin coughing. Cheshire then begins to phase out, making sure that she tells the cute redhead that she'll be back for him to take one of those cute arms. Toodles. As Starfire stops coughing, she wipes her eyes and sees that Cheshire is gone. But back inside, Roy asks Jason if he's okay. Jason yells that they've been lying to him this whole time. They said that they did good together, but they were nothing but killers. And Roy says that it's not that simple. But Jason stops that apparently he used to be a killer. A good one. He saw the deaths attached to his name. How could he live with himself knowing that? How can they? Roy follows Jason out, stating that he doesn't understand. He's only scratching the surface and, but Jason says, you lied to me. No matter what you say, nothing changes. Green Arrow then asks if anyone would care to explain to him what is going on. Roy tells him, no, you should probably leave. Thanks for the save. As Roy walks off, Green Arrow laughs, telling him, you're a funny guy, right? And Starfire flies off, telling him that it's time for him to leave. Soon, Roy and Starfire return upstairs, but as Roy begins to state that they need to talk, he notices something at the back window. He pulls the piece of paper off, and it reads, I need to find my own destiny, and I can't do it with the two of you. Don't come looking for me, Jay. Meanwhile, on Green Arrow's ship, underneath it, Jason secures himself a ride. The next night in Hugo Strange's office, Roy sits on the couch stating that he needs help. There's a lot of crazy things going on in his life right now, and the worst part is there's nothing he can do to stop them. It's like someone said, hey, these three buds are having too much fun, let's go ruin it. Hugo looks at his clipboard and asks, this alien girl, am I to understand that you two are an item? Roy rubs his head, uh, yeah, maybe we were? She had me thinking that I was disposable, but it turns out that she can remember things just fine. It feels like everything is crumbling away all at once. It feels like it did, well, back then. Hugo stands up stating that he wears his heart on his sleeve. He always has. It's admirable, yes, but it leaves you vulnerable. But that doesn't give your friends permission to crush it any time that they wish. Outside, Starfire scoffs, stating under her breath, I'll crush your heart, you pompous windbag. But after a few moments of listening, she senses something else. Essence. And she flies out the window. As Starfire lunges at her, she shouts asking if she and the Allcast have not finished ruining their lives yet. And Essence yells that the Allcast did not send her. They don't even know that she's here. Starfire grabs Essence by the throat, telling her to talk. And Essence says that that's what she's trying to do. She's come to warn them. Warn them about what's to come. Hugo Strange, he sold them out. He wants the bounty set out on them for himself. He doesn't know what he summoned, though. He doesn't realize the scale of what is about to happen. They're coming, Starfire, all of them, and I can't stop them. And I'm sorry that I didn't see it before, but we're playing a game. They're using us. We're just pawns in the bigger game. As Essence fades away, Starfire demands that she come back, but Essence tells her that it's too late. They're here. Somewhere in the Pacific Northwest, Jason thinks to himself, all right, maybe I'm done with the explosions. Probably not, though. Just then, Rictus destroys the motorcycle that Jason was riding on, telling him that it was too easy. Do they need to teach him again? Jason jumps into the air, stating, Sorry, but the name isn't meaning anything. And a voice calls out that even without memories, he is running from his past. Lady Shiva kicks his leg, and Jason yells, Come on! How many of you are there? Back at Hugo Strange's office, Starfire bursts through the window, stating that they need to leave. This man is lying, and he is trying to twist his mind. And Roy says, This is supposed to be private. I've known Hugo for years. He's just trying to help. And Starfire tells him that no, no, he isn't. He sold us out to someone powerful enough to scare Essence away. And Roy looks at Hugo, asking, It's not true, right? And Hugo yells, Of course, I would never. But that's when the room begins to fill with smoke, and a voice says, it's amusing to see mortals bicker and turn on one another. All that should matter to you is that you are now in the presence of gods, and there is no escape from the untitled. Roy says, yep, this is definitely going up on my list of a very bad week. Back out in the forest, Jason walks away from the explosion asking, why the hell would I have ever trained with a bunch of lunatics? 
And suddenly Jason's body stops and begins to constrict as Blood Mage holds out his hand asking, Do you at least remember your old pal December Greystone? And another voice tells him, He remembers nothing. Bronze Tiger steps out. If he had, he'd know that he couldn't win back. Now let's get Jason home where he belongs. With a flash, everyone is teleported away into a desert temple. And Jason asks, what is this place? Bronze Tiger tells him that these are the gates to the Eth Elabum, the sacred city of the League of Assassins. This is their home. And this is where you will find your new life, Jason. Back with Roy, he begins to shout, asking Hugo, Do you realize what you've done? These guys are like evil, really evil. And Hugo shouts, I have no idea what's going on. This is all too much. As Hugo escapes, the leader of the Untitled, Drakkar, says that they are not here to kill them. And Starfire asks, If you don't want to kill us, what do you want? And Drakkar shouts, The same thing that you want. You just don't realize it yet. The League of Assassins has your friend in custody. He will not survive what they have planned. We are going to help you storm the gates of the League's sacred city, destroying the seals that prevent them from entering the ground. And then we will allow your friend Jason to leave, alive, and you will never hear or see the Untitled again. Starfire asks if they really think that Roy would fall for, but Roy stops her. Okay, we really gotta think this one through, Starfire. Yeah, sure, the Untitled will stab us in the back the first chance that they get, but one person within the League nearly killed you. Think about how a team of them could do it. Starfire says no, if he wishes to walk this path, to enter the League of Assassins to save Jason, then he will be walking it alone. Roy asks, is she serious? Their friend is in danger. They have to fight together. This is how they win this. She kisses Roy, stating, and this is where we say goodbye. She flies out the window and Roy wipes his tears, stating, I will come back for you when this is done. I promise. He then turns back. All right, Beardy. I'm going to need every piece of weaponry and machinery you have access to. And I'm going to need it tonight. Back at the gates, Jason follows the assassins down the elevator, looking over the massive underground city, asking, What is this place? And Bronze Tiger tells him, This is the paradise that Ra's al Ghul spent centuries trying to bring to the world. This is where the League of Assassins were born. The Untitled are coming for them. They are immensely powerful, and we believe that you may be the only one that can stop them. Jason asks, How the hell is he supposed to do that? And Bronze Tiger smiles, telling him, you have been chosen to lead the League of Assassins. Are you ready to step up and achieve your destiny, Jason? Later in the evening, after Bronze Tiger told Jason that he would be leading the League of Assassins, he meets with Jason telling him that the costumed heroes fight to maintain a broken system. They refuse to call the weak and the wicked. He once saw how broken this world was, the kind of justice it truly needed. He will soon see that again as he leads the League of Assassins. Jason asks, why are you doing this? And Bronze Tiger says that Talia al Ghul had a plan for him from the very beginning. She saw his potential greatness. They all do. That is why she revived him in the Lazarus pits and Jason shakes his head. She was the one who brought me back to life? That's so strange to say out loud. Talia al Ghul revived Jason Todd. Roy once told me, no, I don't want to talk about my friends. They lied to me about my life and they tried to set me down a darker path. But then again, how is leading an army of insane killers any better than what they offered? I don't want to be a killer. That's why I left my friends in the first place. Bronsteiger tells him that if he wants to do good, real good, then they can arrange that here. Meanwhile, over in the South Pacific, Starfire gets to work on a machine, and as she finishes the last minute adjustments, she says that they're going to try this again. As she presses the button, the machine behind her winds up, and there's a loud crackle sound. An essence is pulled out of her smoke form and falls to the ground. Starfire asks if she's okay, and essence tells her that she is not just some pet to be simply plucked out of thin air, you arrogant. Starfire yells, wait, just listen. Essence turns back, hitting Starfire with a blast and knocking her into trees, but Starfire returns with a blast of her own, telling her that she didn't bring her here to hurt her, but she can certainly be persuaded. Essence begins to wrap herself around Starfire's arm, and with one shift, Starfire flips Essence over her shoulder and slams her into the ground. Starfire then says that they both care about Jason. She can sense it in the air when they were all together. Dukra, the Untitled, the League of Assassins, they all have Jason in their sights. Why? Why does everyone want him? 
Roy was enlisted by her brethren to destroy the seals of the assassin's city. In exchange, they would allow Jason to live. And Essence shouts, asking, And he said yes? This, this is bad. Very bad. If the Untitled break through the walls of the Eth Elebin, nothing will be able to stop them. Ever. Elsewhere, in a garage, somewhere. Roy screws in the last piece of his massive gun, stating that that should boost them up to 600 terawatts. Any more, and he'd need some kind of backpack fusion generator thing. Drakkar says that that is rather impressive. Their associate did not believe that he'd be able to do this without his alien friend. And Roy takes off his goggles, telling them, Yeah, well, after spending a few months with advanced Tamaranian tech, you're bound to become a little creative. Drakkar goes on stating that their associate says that it's time to strike. Is everything ready? Roy shrugs. I could spend a little bit more time tweaking the mini robot programming, but hey, no time like the present to kick some assassin butt, right? Chakar agrees, telling him that the Untitled will uphold their end of the bargain. They will allow him to take Jason, but he must destroy the gates and the seal on top of the fountain at the heart of the city. Fail in that regard, and if the assassins don't destroy him, they will. Roy quietly tells him. Right. Great people. Always meeting great folks in this line of work. Back with Starfire, Essence tells her that there has always been a balance, good and evil, the Allcast and the Untitled, that everything is falling apart. Her family, the Allcast, she knows their lust for power. She can fight it within herself, but it runs deep and dark. When they found the Will of Sins all those millennia ago, her uncle Drakkar forced them to all drink it. There has never been such a powerful darkness in this world. They still don't fully understand it. They all still fear it. It is capable of stripping them of all of their power permanently, and it wants to take back what it gave them. And it is at the center of the storm that is coming. Starfire asks what the Well of Sins has to do with the League of Assassins, and Essence explains that everything starts with Raz al Ghul. When she first met him 500 years ago, he came to the Acres of All to learn the untold secrets of the Lazarus Pits that he was already using to prolong his life. He had a devil's tongue and he charmed his way into Dukra's heart. She trained him for a while and ultimately entrusted him with something that she had kept secret for thousands of years. The Lazarus Pits are remnants, runoffs of a far more powerful source. They are the children of the first and most powerful Lazarus Pit, the Well of Sins. Ra's al Ghul told her that he would create an army to protect its power, but he would never use it for himself. For centuries, that was the case. The Well of Sins set untouched under his protection. The seal has bound the Allcast to the League of Assassins. The truce between the Allcast and the Untitled extended to the League as well. To strike Eth Albin would be an affront to the balance of good and evil in this world. But by killing Dukra and her pupils, the Untitled will have proven that they are no longer interested in keeping that balance. Starfire asks if there's no other way to defeat the Untitled. There's only the Well of Sins. And Essence goes on stating that she had the essence of pure life implanted in her body, a weapon that she planned to use against Drakkar. She was forced to expel it before she was ready. Dukra knew another way though. It took her a millennia to build the technique. She used it to strip the powers of the Untitled from herself. She offered to teach it to her, but when it was declined, Dukra exiled her from the Allcast. If Roy destroys the gates, the seal, the Untitled will rip the fountain apart. There will be no stopping them. She must stop him from succeeding, even if it means killing him. A short while later, just outside the gates of the League City, Roy stands as a literal one-man army, armed to the teeth, and says to himself, All right, buddy boy. The Calvary's arrived. Just a bit away though, Drakkar watches with the rest of the Untitled, and a robed man stating that he can feel it. It has begun. The robed man says not to be certain, not yet at least. Helping the League is an amnesiac superhero trained by the woman who has kept him and the Untitled at bay for almost 10,000 years. Drakkar scoffs, telling the man that they are desperate. They will fall. Their night will weaken them and they will deliver the killing blow. While the man bat assassins fly towards Roy, Roy releases his Roy bots, yelling, Fly, my pretties! Fly! Dozens of small balls begin to fly into the air, shooting trank darts into the horde of man bats, but then the blood mage makes his move. The blood mage tries to attack, but as Roy's shields activate, he laughs. Ha ha! Look like I can handle this! The blood mage asks, Do you really want to dance? I'll lead! Roy charges in, knocking Blood Mage over and throws an ice grenade, freezing him in place, telling him, 
I took this one for Mr. Freeze! Sit back and watch the fireworks! Blood Mage tells him that he'll be watching the next part real close. And just then there's a gunshot and a bullet bounces off of the shield. And Roy asks, what was that? Cheshire teleports down, telling them, Hello, sweetie. Didn't expect to see you again so soon. Just need to grab onto this little shanty town shield generator. As she pulls her arm back, she takes with her a small device crushing it. And Roy says, You know, I'm pretty sure shanty towns can't afford shield generators like that. But don't worry, I got something special for you. See, I learned a little bit about you, like the short range teleporter implanted in your wrist that allows you to come and go. Just know that this is only roughly 75% personal. As Roy's gloves spark up, he grabs a hold of Cheshire's wrist and he releases an electrical charge, shorting out the teleporter in her wrist. Cheshire pushes him off, asking what did he do? Someone, anyone, help me! At that moment, she teleports away uncontrollably. And Roy says, okay, now to make everything go boom. He focuses his sights on the fountain in the middle of the city, but Jason jumps down telling him, you got to stop this now. You have no idea what you're dealing with. Roy asks, is the guy with no memories really telling me that I don't understand? <laughs> That's rich. Jason goes on telling him, I'm here because I want to be. And Roy asks, oh, they brainwashed you now? These are bad guys. They have assassin in their name, Jason. Roy jumps down, kicking Jason back, telling him, I'm here to save my best friend. He's locked up inside that pretty little head. Now sit back and enjoy the show. He charges up his gun, aiming it at the fountain, but that's when Starfire flies in, destroying the gun, shouting for him to stop. The gun explodes, knocking Roy away, and he asks, What? Abandoning me and Jason wasn't enough? You came to rub it in! She floats down, telling him, You do not understand. The untitled are manipulating you. Roy then says, I am getting tired of everyone telling me that I don't know what's going on. But a voice calls out, so are we. Rictus appears behind Starfire and she quickly turns back, grabbing, asking, do you really want to do this? As Starfire lights him up, Rictus laughs. <laughs> I can increase and decrease my density whenever I wish, and I can increase it so much that even an alien as strong as you can't lift me. Soon, Starfire's arm begins to shake, and suddenly the weight of Rictus overpowers her, and the two go crashing into the ground. Roy begins to get back up, stating, I'm gonna get us out of here. I could still save. But before Roy could do anything, Jason walks up with the rest of the League of Assassins, telling him, I'm sorry didn't have to be like this. Jason and the others take turns at beating into Roy, and Bronze Tiger delivers the final blow, knocking him into the fountain. Roy climbs up one of the stone spikes surrounding the fountain, telling them, ah, that's not fair, but I still got one more trick up my sleeve. Literally, well, kind of literally. Crack a Cthulhu! He takes out a small crossbow and he fires a bolt into the fountain. The bolt soars into the air, and when it hits the fountain, it bounces off. But that's when we hear it. The massive explosion blows apart the fountain, revealing the well of sins bubbling where the fountain once stood. Shiva grabs Roy by the hair, asking, Do you know what you have just done? We will all be dying today because of you. And Roy asks, Yeah, good. Couldn't happen to nicer people. As the other League members surround Roy, Bronze Tiger yells out, That is enough. We don't have time to mess around. Slit the intruder's throats. We have a war to win. Jason stops him, telling him, Now, if I'm going to lead the League of Assassins, then you're going to have to listen to me. And we are not killing these two. Bronze Tiger begins to state that Ra's al Ghul would never, but Jason stops him. Ra's al Ghul is not here, is he? And being leader, I do what I please. Shiva scoffs, folding her arms, telling him, This is ludicrous. And Roy laughs. Ha ha, you should listen to the boss, man. But a few moments later, Blood Mage runs it yelling, They're coming. I can feel it. The Untitled are here. Jason tells Bronze Tiger that they'll lock these two away. Talia brought him back for a reason and he's gonna figure it all out. And if he doesn't, they can kill him. Deal? Bronze Tiger says that if he doesn't obey, they all die. And Jason shrugs, yeah, pretty much, what do you say? As Roy and Starfire are taken away, Bronze Tiger then asks Jason if he's ready. Can he lead them to victory, then onward to bring Utopia to the world? Jason then says that he really hopes so. He has no idea what he's doing. And this all feels like a terrible mistake. But at that moment, his hands begin to glow as the all blades form and a voice tells him to take a deep breath. Everything is going exactly according to plan. Jason looks at the twin swords asking who the hell is talking to him. And Shiva says, great, our brainless leader is hearing voices and materializing swords out of nowhere. This bodes well. Bronsager asks if he's ready. 
and Blood Mage points off in the distance, stating that he sure hopes their fearless leader can figure it out, because it looks like it's time to save the world. Assassin style. As our battle begins, the League members try to hold their own with Jason stabbing his swords into one of the Untitled. The Untitled then asks him, what is this? And Jason cuts through him, telling him, this is payback. More and more appear as Jason gets to work cutting through them. And then down below in the prison cells, all Roy can hear is the explosions from the fight. He sighs, asking, what the hell is going on up there? And for the record, I can see you. I'm going to keep talking to you whether you like it or not. Cheshire rubs her head, telling him that he's getting really annoying. It was much more fun when he was trying to kill her. And Roy tells her that he's just really, really scared right now. He's scared that somewhere deep down, he made this whole thing much worse. Jason is hurting for totally legit reasons, and we were trying to force him into something he didn't want to be. Now he's pushing Starfire away because she doesn't want to relive something that almost destroyed her the first time around. He's just being selfish. Cheshire doesn't respond and Roy goes on asking, why am I so damn broken? Why does everything I do end up being wrong? Cheshire fades into the cell stating that she knows what broken looks like and he doesn't look like it. But back outside, Jakar grabs Jason by the jacket telling him, look at this, my sister's prized pupil, here to stop me from destroying the well of sins, the source of their power. Did these costumed lunatics convince you that you could offer some kind of salvation? Or is it just more of Dukra's trickery? But as Drakkar tries to look inside of Jason's mind, he pauses and says that his mind. She's done something to it. This is far more than simple memory wipes. Jason pushes the swords into Drakkar, telling him, It's more like a simple case of kicking your smoky butt. Drakkar laughs, telling him, The all blades. I have faced many of my sister's peons wielding these. Do you really think you can kill me? Jason smiles, telling him, They're not supposed to kill you. They're steering you. So the two of them begin to fall out of the sky, and Drakkar lands directly into the Well of Sins. Back in the prison, Roy asks, What is she doing? And Cheshire tells him that she can see it in his eyes. He really does care about them. Everything that he thinks he's done, it's to help them, right? Does he know how many people would tear down the walls of the most dangerous city on the face of Earth just to save her? He isn't broken, he's far from it. Roy sighs, telling her that that doesn't change the fact that they're probably going to die any minute. He'll never get to tell them that he's sorry. She holds his hand, telling him to grab on. And Roy asks, what? Absolutely not! You tried to kill me literally every time that I've met you. Cheshire grabs a hold of his wrist, telling him, just shut up! Over at the Well of Sins, Drakkar pulls himself out, shouting, No! Someone get me out! The arcane power is reaching inside of me! This, this can't be happening! They gave me this power! They can't take it away! Please! The Well of Sins then expels Drakkar from the pit and onto the ground as Jason looks up and sees the other Entitled and tells them, You can surrender now or face the same fate as your master. The Entitled tells him that he's lucky. Mortals cannot defeat them. And then a voice calls out, Oh, yes, we will. Shiva rides in the back of a man bat assassin, ordering the swarm to bring them down. And as all of the man bats begin to drag the untitled down, each of them is cast into the pit. And Jakara lunges at Jason from behind, telling him, I have done battle for centuries. You won't be able to defeat me, so. But with a loud crack, Bronze Tiger's there snapping his neck. Jason looks at the lifeless body of Drakkar, telling him that he supposes that that was necessary, but after everything that monster's done, Shiva hops on the man bat, stating that this is it. The Untitled die tonight, every last one of them. And Jason says that they can't just kill people without his say-so. If they want him to run this organization, they're going to do things his way. And then a voice asks, is that so? The road man from before walks in asking if he came all this way to face a leader of assassins who tells his warriors to sheath their blades. Is he really the one that Talia chose? He expected more. Bronze Tiger steps back stating that that voice and Shiva smiles. The robed man tells Jason that he played his part well, but the game is over. Jason orders everyone to attack, but Blood Mage says to hold. Do they not know who that man is? Jason walks towards the robed man asking, who are you? And the man says that he's the one who's been planning for this moment for the past three centuries. He is the one who gave the Untitled the location of the Acres of All, knowing that they would slay that foul crone Dukra, knowing that they would eventually come here. 
He is the one who knew that they would fall, imbuing this pit with the power that he has only ever tasted the scraps of once before. Who else could he be, young detective? Who else but Ra's al Ghul? Meanwhile, at the Acres of All, Duker's spirit and Saru watch the battle with Duker stating that this is simple. The end game. Everything falls to Jason. And Saru asks, will he know what to do after they're done with him? Duker says that Jason has done it before. A long time ago in the city that he called home. And now he must choose it again. Back in the city, Raz rushes forward, grabbing Jason by the throat, asking, What did my daughter see in you? Why would she leave everything to you? What did she hope to gain? Jason struggles to breathe. I, I don't know, man. Roz then blasts him away, telling him, For the first time in centuries, I seem to not know my own strength. How could the Untitled split the power amongst themselves all of these years? But none of that matters now. The reasons for my daughter and Duker cannot save a scared amnesiac boy. I will kill you myself! A short while later, Jason is strung up on a cross while Roy and Starfire sit chained to the ground. Cheshire says that she doesn't like this. The master's eyes. It looks as if he's willing to burn the world to the ground and she happens to like the world the way it is. Shiva tells her to get on board. This is their true master. Not some weakling that Talia thrusted upon them. Tell her, Bronze Tiger. Bronze Tiger looks up. Yes, we must do as our master commands. Jason looks down at Roy, telling him that he's sorry about all of this. They're going to put them to death and it's entirely his fault. He shouldn't have pushed them away so fast. He can't believe that he thought that they were evil. That's not them, right? They might not be the best guys around, but they're good, aren't they? Now they're just going to die. Roy laughs, telling him, You know, I know one guy that could save us. The one guy who could break us out in a blaze of glory. And all you gotta do is remember. The little dude with blue light said so. You have the power to take back your own memories. You have fought Ra's al Ghul before. You were trained by Batman, Jason. Do you seriously not realize how powerful you can be? That's when Ra shouts for the League to bring him the prisoners. He will start by killing the loyal compatriots. He's eager to test the killing power of these new abilities. Are you watching, boy? Imagine the blades in your own hand. You're the one who did this. Jason watches as Roy and Starfire are dragged away and he says quietly that he wants to remember. He wants to remember who he is. At that moment, a flood of memories begin to pour in. His life as a child, his time with Batman, his doings with Roy and Starfire, he remembers everything. Elsewhere, Dukra and Essence watch, and Dukra says, no, this can't be happening now. This is not how it's planned out. And back in the city, Roz asks what is happening as Jason is pulling himself free of the chains. And he tells him, that they really should be more up to date on these bronze Chinese padlocks. Batman told me how to pick these my first second in the cave. And speaking of bats, several of the man bat serum fueled assassins fly in with Jason fighting them off telling him, I only spent six weeks training under Shiva. They could have been students for years and they still can't land a punch. Shiva attacks telling him that she appreciates how highly he thinks of her. And Jason tells her, not so much highly, I just know how dangerous you can be. There's one thing that you taught me though, a few shortcuts to keep the upper hand when I needed it, literally in this case. He chops Shiva in the back of the head, knocking her out and Raz shouts to kill him. Bronze Tiger gets ready to jump in, but he tells Cheshire that he knows what she's thinking, just do it now. Bronze Tiger then roars as he lunges for Jason, telling him that he can assure him that there are no shortcuts to defeating him. And while they begin their battle, Cheshire sneaks over to Starfire, telling her to get as hot as she can in about three seconds, like heat-wise. As her poisons melt the chains holding her down, she tells Roy that this might sting a little. Bronze Tiger grabs Jason by the leg, and Jason yells that they used to be friends, and Bronze Tiger says, I've killed friends before. That's when a rock is thrown at Bronze Tiger, and he asks who dares, and Starfire rockets in, punching him across the city. Roy helps Jason up, telling him that it's good to see him again, and Jason tells him, you know, I'm sorry that you had to trick me like this. I didn't think it was going to go down like this. Roy asks, what? And Jason asks, wait, did you not figure it out? This has been the plan from the very beginning. You take the wizard and the tin man. I've got a bucket of water that I got to introduce to a certain wicked witch. Outside of the city, Essence yells that this is it. The tides are turning and Dukra says, no, no, it's not. It's imperative that Jason not recover his memories until the very end. He was meant to be purified, clean. Jason Todd just walked into his own death with his memories back. He finally knows that this is the end.
Months ago, at the Acres of All, Seiru welcomes Jason in his sarcastic fashion, stating, Look, the prodigal son has returned. Jason asks, where is she? He knows that Duker is the one who summoned him here, and he is really not in the mood to be messed with after these past few weeks. At that moment, Duker's spirit appears, stating that they are the keepers of the light. They are the all cast, and their destiny has ever been to fight the war against the one true darkness, the war against the untitled. He is all that remains, and there is a great darkness blooming. Raz al Ghul has taken command of the Untitled. He seeks to take their power for himself. He seeks to become a god. Jason asks how they stop Raz al Ghul, and Dukra tells him that the power to stop Raz rests in him. He's done it before as a young man in Gotham City. The final battle will take place in the Well of Sins. With all of the doubt and fear clouding his mind, it will eat him whole. Jason says, okay, well, I'm not hearing any solutions. And Dukra asks, how much will you sacrifice to save the world? And Jason stops her. Everything. She tells him, good, because that's precisely what she needs from him. They must strip him of his memories. He must enter the scenario as his purest, truest self. He can allow his memories to come back, but if he does it too soon, he may not survive. Now, we go to the final battle at the sacred city of the League of Assassins with Ra's al Ghul asking if he thought that coming to the Well of Sins would grant him power. You're showing none of the cunning of your mentor. The power seeks a master worthy of it, a master that can withstand what it has to offer. Now feel it, Jason. Feel the weight of the sins of this world. Apparitions begin to appear around Jason, all taking the forms of the Joker, and they all begin to laugh at him. <laughs> Jason starts to look around, stating that these can't be real. These can't be real! He falls to his knees as Roz goes on telling him, I know not why my daughter took special interest in you, but all I see is failure! Do you wish it all to end? Just say the word! The demon's head can be very merciful. Jason quietly tells himself, Accept the darkness, embrace the light, accept the darkness, embrace the light. And Roz asks, what are you muttering? Jason forms the all blades and he cuts through the jokers with Roz asking, how are you doing this? Jason tells him, I'm just a little bit stronger than people give me credit for. More than I can say about you. You got your own demons, isn't that right, Roz? Why don't you look them in the face? An apparition appears behind Roz, taking the form of Talia, his daughter. He begins to shout, asking, How dare you use the power of the well against me? Do you think you can get under my skin so easily? The two clash swords, as Jason tells Roz. You've never felt any remorse for the evils that you've committed. There isn't enough human left in you to fight and control the powers of the Untitled. You're weaker now than I've ever seen you before. Jason then smacks the sword out of his hands. The old Roz would never have allowed that to happen, not in a hundred years. It's tearing you apart from the inside out. But me? I'm that strong. I can control it. And you know what makes me strong? It's not because of Batman. It's because of Starfire and Roy. Jason pulls his arms back along with the shadows of his friends stating, There's a move that I learned from Talia many years ago. Something arcane and powerful that only a force of true good is capable of delivering. Jason then shadow punches into Roz's chest, expelling the Untitled's power as Roz is screaming, No! And outside the city, Dukra says that it's happening. Prepare yourself, daughter. Essence asks for what, and suddenly she feels power surging through her. She falls over, stating, This is too much. I can't fight it all. Dukra tells her that she is her daughter. She holds the essence of all of her teachings inside of her. Remember them. You must master the darkness. Fight through the pain. Reshape all that blackness, all that evil into light. Back is that Roz grabs Jason, asking him, How dare you strip me of that power? Kill them all. Rip them apart. But as Roz gives the order, a beam of light hits him and Essence says, I think not. Roz asks, who does she think she is to tell him what to do with his army? And Essence tells him that she knows the location of every Lazarus pit in the world. She is the one who has the power to hunt them down and destroy them all. He will back down. He will allow the three of them to leave this place or he will be forced to die a pathetic mortal death, just as he has always feared. The all cast will make sure of it. Roz gets back up yelling, but Bronze Tiger stops him, stating that they do not need their power to achieve the utopia that they've dreamed of. Roz snarls, yelling for them to get out of his sight. If I ever see you again, Jason, there will be stories of your agony for centuries. Essence begins to create a passage for everyone, and Jason laughs, 
stating that he's looking forward to it. Seconds later at the Acres of All, Jason tells Essence that he appreciates the help. Where's Duke for anyway? He'd like to, but Essence tells him that she's gone now, and who knows for good or not, but her power lives again. Jason asks what will she do with the all cast power, and Essence says that she will rebuild the all cast. They will rise again and they will tip the balance of the world back towards good. Will you join me, Jason Todd? Jason folds his arms, stating that if she knows him, she already knows the answer. He's had enough magic for a long time. It's about time to go back out to punching regular baddies without having to worry about immortals or mind wipes. Roy asks, what does that mean? What's next? And Jason tells him, it's about time. Time for us to do something good for once. The next night in Gotham City, a man asks if she wants him to come inside, and Isabel says that she's sorry, but not tonight, Jonathan. Jonathan laughs, telling her that it's okay. There are other nights, but can he just say one thing? He really likes her. He liked her since they met at the hospital. And there's something about her that says that she's not all in. That she's waiting for someone, and she has been for the past few months. He's waiting too, and he's happy to wait. But she needs to ask herself, what does she really want out of life? The fantasy or the reality? What's standing right in front of her? Isabel goes inside, closing the door, letting out a loud sigh. He sits down asking, what is she doing? But at that moment, dozens of small robots appear, and they start yelling, The Isabel! The Isabel has returned! We bring a message! Broadcasting live. Suddenly, a hologram of Jason Todd appears and he asks, how's it going? Long time to see. Look, there is a private jet at Kane County Airfield. It's waiting for you to take you to a private resort island in the Mediterranean called the Elysium. Isabel yells that he left her to die after the Joker overdosed her. And Jason tells her, look, I want to explain everything that happened, but more importantly, I want to see you. Please, I promise nothing crazy this time. So 12 hours later, as Jason, Roy, Starfire, and Isabel all stand with their backs together, surrounded by dozens of cyborgs, Isabel says that if these things don't kill Jason, she will. And Jason tells her, yeah, that's totally fair. But earlier that day, Isabel looks out onto the balcony, stating that it's beautiful. And Jason tells her that he wanted to pick a place that reminded him of her. This almost does the job. As Jason leans in for a kiss, Isabel turns away, stating that they shouldn't get ahead of themselves but it'll be nice to spend some time together, just the two of them. And Jason says, right, about all of that? A few moments later, out in the lobby, Roy and Starfire walk through, with Starfire stating that the stupid machine is broken. Roy tells her no, the holographic generator is not broken, she just keeps fiddling with it. Starfire shouts asking why should she hide the way she looks? And Roy says because they want to walk around like normal people, so that others don't try to show up and kill them. She begins to change her hair to black, and Jason calls out, stating that their guest has arrived. Starfire runs over, hugging Isabel, stating that it's so good to see her again. It's beautiful here, isn't it? And Isabel says that she's never heard of this place. Roy says that it's Elysium. You can only get here by private charter, and only if you prove that you're worth at least a few hundred million dollars. This is where the trust fund babies and celebrities go to bump uglies, and the best dance clubs and casinos in the Mediterranean. Now, how about we all have a nice night and dance? Later that night out on the dance floor, Jason says, admit it, you missed this. And Isabel tells him that this was never the problem. The problem was having a target painted on her head before she even knew who he was. The problem was that she was transported into the midst of an intergalactic war. The problem was making her a target for a serial killer clown. She's gonna get a drink. Across the floor, Roy and Starfire are dancing and as Roy leans in, a large man pulls Roy off, asking Starfire why she's messing with this bozo. How about she comes to his yacht with him? and there's a staff of 100 people there for him. So why don't they go? Starfire's eyes begin to glow as she grabs the man by the arm and breaks his elbow. Isabel runs over asking what the hell is going on here, and Starfire tells her nothing. These men are beneath our consideration. As the two girls go back to dancing, Jason says that she seems so far away. He thought bringing her here might make it all come back, but her mind is somewhere else entirely. He's not sure that this was a good idea. And then he sees her dancing out there. And it's like Isabel's the only person in the room. Roy leans in and says that he hates to break it to him, but he isn't being poetic. You're actually being literal. Jason looks around the empty room, grabbing Isabel, stating that they need to get out of here. At that moment, a voice then asks, where are you going? This place used to be a barren rock before I came and transformed it into what you see here. Jason turns back to see a man in gold, and he says, Midas. And Midas asks, oh, you've heard of me. Jason says that he knows of him. Susie Sue was trying to court his criminal empire for years, but she never found his core base of operations. He also knows how many people were killed to get the empire off the ground, even children. Is that what this place is? Some kind of death trap? Midas tells him, oh no, 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 no. That would be too obvious. I used all the money to build this place, and then I used the money from here to build an army. 
Jason asks, what army? And suddenly a dozen cyborgs surround the group with Midas telling him, meet the army of the golden hand. Roy whispers, next time, let me talk to the supervillain. As Jason takes out the all blades, Roy runs over to the coat checker stating that he needs to get his back. Here's the ticket. The clerk asks, what is he? But before he could finish, Roy punches him in the face. One of the cyborgs grabs a hold of Isabel stating that they thought this alien would be the toughest to take down. And Starfire shoots through the air, blasting the cyborg stating, you are gravely mistaken on all counts. Isabel tries to dodge the gunfire stating, oh God, oh God, oh God, before running into two more cyborgs. Jason then cuts through the two of them and asks, are you okay? And Isabel tells him, no, definitely a no. Roy calls out to catch before throwing Isabel a blaster, telling her, you know how to use this, right? She turns shooting one of the cyborgs, stating, yeah, point and click. While the fighting is going on, Midas heads outside, boarding a helicopter, telling his men to send word that Island 7 has fallen. Let them return to the Golden Hand. And a short while later, as the heroes stand atop of a mound of destroyed cyborgs, Roy asks, how much does everyone want to bet that Midas left the island? Jason tells Starfire to scour the grounds, and they need to make sure that there aren't any more cyborgs out there ready to ruin their night. Midas is going to fall, and they're going to make it happen. Isabel tosses the blaster to the ground, though, telling him, rah, 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 Team Red Hood to the rescue. Jason reaches out to her, look, once we're done here, we can sit and talk this through. We can make this work, Isabel. But she tells him, no, they can't. She can't. She's been living in this fantasy world for too long. She finally knows what she's been waiting for, and she's been waiting to give herself permission to have a normal life. She cares about him, but this is beyond her. It's fun and exciting and dangerous, but it's not anything she ever wanted for herself, and it's not anything she would have ever chosen. It's all extraordinary. It's their job to keep fighting against the monsters like that man. And if the fight ever ends, and we're not gonna pretend that that's anytime soon, you know where to find me, Jason. But for now, this is goodbye. And with a final kiss, Isabel walks away. The next day, Roy Harper sits aboard the Temerian ship on their secret island, tinkering away with his new pet project, asking what's wrong. This tiny robot has a nuclear core, 17 microns of hypergelic night, and a level 12 AI processor. Why isn't it doing anything? He sighs in frustration as he sits back, when suddenly the tiny robot springs up and skitters across the floor, climbing up into the air vents. Roy quickly jumps out of his chair, crawling over to the duck to chase it. But meanwhile, over in the cockpit of the ship, three figures begin to teleport in. As the aliens appear, one asks, shouldn't they deactivate the security system? And what seems to be the leader says that the Tamranian princess, she thinks she knows security. The fact that they got this far easily proves otherwise. But Tamaranians do know about interstellar travel, which is why you're here, and why we've commandeered this ship. Lift off in 10, 9, Roy stumbles out of the air duct, grabbing onto the robot, stating, HA! GOTCHA! And then he hears the engines kicking in. He looks outside to see the ship taking off and simply says to himself, Oh, this can't be good. Outside, Jason watches the ship rocket off into the sky and he radios to Starfire, asking, Why the hell is your ship leaving? She responds, Her ship? It's hers, because it came from her planet. Roy's the one who's actually in the ship. Why don't you ask him? Jason tells her that he's been trying, but he can't reach him on the comm link. Not on his cell phone, and not even with the psychic trap door that he set up with them through the League of Assassins. Starfire asks him what trap door, and Jason tells her, don't worry about it. The point is, our boy Roy ain't answering on anything. Starfire flies down, stating that the ship is gone and something is wrong with Roy. They're stuck here. This can't be good. So moments later, in deep space, Roy crawls back into the Aerodux and sees the three aliens and thinks to himself that, well, he needs to do something, so how about... At that moment, he just starts shouting, Hey, 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 hey! And he shoves the tiny robot out. The aliens look back and one of the larger ones picks up the robot, asking, What is this? The tiny robot begins to beep and several seconds later, it explodes, blasting that alien to pieces. The leader of the group then pulls the guts off of his shoulder and Roy watches, stating, all right, it's time for me to step into the spotlight. But before he can make his entrance, he sees the pieces of the aliens begin to reform and the alien groans as his body comes back together. He yells, that gives me a buzz. Anybody else get that feeling? And Roy pauses for a minute stating, okay, wait, stop, ah, new plan. He turns back and makes his way into the computer room to try and get a better picture of the situation. Then he sees one of the aliens loading something into the chute. The alien leader of the group enters a series of commands into the console when the large canister that the other alien loaded is fired out and down onto the nearby planet. 
Roy rubs his chin asking, eh, what could that be? Are these guys scientists? The planet down there's a paradise. Maybe I misjudged them. Or maybe it's a probe? At that moment, the canister explodes and hundreds of self-replicating nanobots pour out. Hundreds turn into thousands, then millions, then billions. Roy watches, stating, that isn't a probe. It's a weapon. One that just wiped out a whole planet. Wait, there's something else. If viewable from space, the emblem on the alien's coats is then imprinted onto the planet. And Roy asks, just who are these guys? Roy hurries back, grabbing his bone quiver, stating, okay, three against one, might as well make some trouble, right? Once the courage builds up, Roy kicks open the duct and he begins to load his arrows with the leader of the group shouting, ah, get him! Roy flips the switch on the battery pack on him and then wires hang out of the duct and the larger aliens grab hold, pulling him out. He tells himself that he just has to wait and deal with the punches until the battery pack then opens up as it reads, charged. The leader of the group pulls an arrow out of his head, telling the others to just hurry up and kill this guy. Their buyer will be here in a minute, and he'll be less than pleased if things aren't ready. Roy smiles through the hit, stating, Good night, ladies! And he pushes the button on his battery pack. Suddenly, electricity shoots out of the pack, striking each one of the three aliens repeatedly, with Roy getting back up, stating, Boom! Yeah! As the aliens' bodies begin to crumple onto the floor, burnt up, Roy walks back over to the computer, telling himself that he's going to need some aspirin. Lots of it. As he grabs the bottle, a call comes in with Jason shouting, Roy, Roy, are you alive? Is everything okay? Roy tells him to relax, everything's fine. These three aliens stole the ship with me in it. I took care of things. So, uh, why are you calling me now? Jason tells him that the aliens must have been blocking all transmissions, but don't worry, him and Starfire will be there soon. Roy tells him, all right, let's just get a few things straightened out here. Wait, what is that buzzing? Just then, Roy is hit with a blast and knocked to the ground. Before he can get back up, he feels a heavy boot press down on him and a voice tells him, Don't waste your breath. It's going to be taken away in a second anyway. I've been watching you and listening. I've seen everything. These idiots I hired were pretty bad, right? Saves me the trouble of having to pay them. All I need to do now is finish up the loose ends here. And then those friends, well, don't worry about them. You're going to be meeting them soon enough. You know, when everyone's dead. Now time to take that big gun and destroy this whole planet. Booyah! Lobo begins to laugh as he puts pressure on his foot, squeezing what little air is left in Roy. Lobo kneels down with his cigar, telling him, You shouldn't feel bad. You are going to die along with six billion others on this planet. All the animals, plants, fish, birds, and other vermin are cluttering up that rock. Roy struggles, telling him, You're bluffing! We are way too far from Earth for you to fire that gizmo. Lobo shouts, shoot at Earth! No, 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 that's too small. There's a war brewing, a big one, like Ron and Thanagar. That sort of thing. Firing a weapon at Earth isn't going to get much attention from the buyers. If you want a high prize, you're going to need lots of attention. That's why I ain't aiming at the planet. I'm aiming at a star, a white dwarf. I'm going to make it into a black hole. Lobo then begins to blow smoke in Roy's face, telling him, I know everything about Astro's physics. It's about time that you get real scared. As Lobo taunts Roy, the recovered aliens get back up with the leader stating that they can't seem to find where the signal from the other ship is. It just disappeared. Lobo asks, how does a ship disappear? This is a state-of-the-art war vessel. The stuff on this ship can find anything. At that moment, Jason radios into Roy telling him to get out of the way. Find somewhere to hide and close your eyes. Roy begins to ask why when there's a bright flash of light as the small spaceship teleports into the cockpit. Jason steps out helping Roy telling him, Hola, amigo. And Roy asks, how? Jason doesn't look. It's a long story. We stole a ship, which we used to steal another ship, and well, here we are. I guess it isn't such a long story after all. Roy kicks Lobo's hand, telling him, whatever. I appreciate the effort. Save my butt and the butts of billions. And Jason asks, all right, so what do we need to know now? What's the top priority? Roy tells him, well, first things first. There's a weapon on the ship that we need to dismantle right away. Trust me on that. And when that's done, we can take care of the bad guys. As the three begin to walk away, Lobo grabs onto Starfire's leg, slamming her into the side of the ship that they arrived in. Jason then cracks Lobo in the back of the head, asking, Did you forget about us? And Lobo laughs, Yo, I guess I did, but I think you also forgot about them. Lobo's mercenaries pull themselves out, and one quickly grabs a hold of Jason, and then he cuts off the alien's arm. Jason then asks, Is there anything else I need to know? And the severed arm begins to reattach itself. Roy tells him, Yeah, that, they heal. The second large alien charges in, punching Roy in the side. And Jason says, okay, just need to slice and dice these guys a lot more. Hold still and 
The alien fighting Jason then reaches out, snatching his sword, snapping it in half. And as the alien tries slashing Jason with a broken sword, Jason tells Starfire that he could really use one of those atomic energy blasts right about now. Her eyes begin to glow as she states, with pleasure. And the leader alien laughs. Ha <laughs> ha, pathetic. A pure blood Tamaranian warrior following around a bunch of inferior breeds from a backyard planet as if you were a lap dog. You've lost your edge. War is science and you haven't kept up with the recent advancements. Advancements in strategy, weaponry, and of course, verbal psionic trigger phrases. The alien then shouts something in a strange language, and before Starfire could stop him, she grabs a hold of her head, screaming out in pain. Roy starts to get back up and quickly scans the area, trying to come up with a plan. What is he going to do? Jason's busy, and Starfire is knocked out, and Lobo is... Well, he's getting the weapons set up. After a few moments, the larger aliens look around, asking where the guy in the red suit went. Lobo continues his work, telling them to go find him, beat him, and drag him back. After all he and his friends have done to them, they've earned a front row seat to the end of the world. Their world! To be specific, bastiches! Meanwhile, on another part of the ship, Roy is making last minute adjustments to another robot when the two large aliens appear behind him. One of them picks up Roy and the other two begin to punch him. After a bit, they return to the cockpit, dragging Roy with them just as Lobo launches the canister. As the canister goes flying, it changes course and the leader alien says that the projectile is heading back towards them. Lobo asks, how is that even possible? And Roy begins to laugh. He then asks, what did you do? And Roy says, anything is possible when you turn someone's ultimate weapon into their own. At that moment, there's a clicking sound followed by several more. The room is then filled with nanobots, but before Lobo can claw his way out, all of them disappear along with Lobo and his mercenaries. Jason sits back up asking, what just happened? And Roy tells him, nanotech, don't think too much about it. All you need to know now is that Lobo and his goons are far, far away. Jason tells him, right. So the trained assassin gets his sword snapped, the warrior princess is knocked out, and the fate of the world it hangs by a thread. And then you saved the day with a toy robot the size of my thumb. Makes sense. Roy tells him, yep, that's about the size of it. Jason stares. Wow. And Starfire wakes up. Yes, wow. As a large plane is carrying terrorists over to the Capitol building in the US, the soldiers inside wait for their orders. A short man walks through telling everyone that tonight we soar over this nation's debauched and disgusting capital. Tonight we blah, 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 meep, meep, meep. Well, there may have been more, but Jason kind of stopped listening at this point. Soon the hatch opens up and they begin to release the soldiers, but before they move out, a soldier asks another if everything is okay. He looks a bit disturbed. Jason slaps down his helmet telling him, yeah, Everything's fine. In fact, I'm having the time of my life. He opens fire on every one of those terrorists. With the pilots hearing the gunfire, they ask what the hell is going on there. Shooting a gun in here would be insane. At that moment, there's a thump on the windshield. Roy repositions himself and pulls back on his bow, stating, No, this is insane! As he lets go, two arrows break through that glass and they land into both of the pilots. Roy then climbs aboard and tells him, I'm in! And Jason tells him, good, had my doubts, now duck. Before he could ask, Jason throws one of the leaders of the terrorists into the cockpit. And out the window, Roy busts out. Roy shrugs, telling him, huh? At least I was being helpful. Jason goes back to take out the rest of the terrorists. When a small hologram pops up next to Roy and the man on it says, it matters not, soon they will be dead. You American scum! Roy asks if he's really being heckled by a racist hologram. Man. How far have I fallen? The hologram continues to insult Roy. So Roy then asks if this is his thing. Just hurling out all of this bull. Wait, just then Roy sees the true target in front of them. A bomber loaded up with a giant bomb. He shouts that this isn't the target. The bomber's going to drop a nuke over Washington. Jason pauses for a moment asking if that's necessarily a bad thing. And Roy yells, what the hell? So Jason tells him, fine, Starfire, you're on. Outside, Starfire radios back asking if he thought that she was waiting for his permission. As the nuke is dropped, she flies over to catch it and then kicks it. Both Jason and Roy ask if she really did just kick a nuke. Starfire sighs, telling them, fine, hang on. She flies down to the pond below, catching the nuke and safely detonates it underwater. Jason and Roy asks if that's really safe as a small bubble pops out of the water and Starfire says that she believes that this is one of those few moments. 
Once the plane has landed, Starfire flies over to give Roy a kiss, and Roy says that he should probably ease up a bit. Jason is still a little sensitive about the Isabel thing. Starfire flies over telling Jason that she has something for him, and she kisses him as well. Roy begins to yell out, Whoa, whoa, whoa! Boyfriend here! And Jason pulls back asking, Yeah, uh, what was that about? Starfire says that Roy told her that he was feeling lonely. She just wanted to assure him that he is never alone, and that the three of them have each other. Roy laughs, separating the two of them, stating, I wouldn't phrase it like that. We should probably just go home and get some sleep. In our respective beds, of course. At that moment, there's a loud explosion of light and everyone is knocked out. Sometime later, Jason begins to wake up with Starfire telling him, good, you are alive. Roy readies his bow, stating that he just woke up a few minutes ago, still trying to figure out who took them prisoner. Jason groans, getting up, stating that, Ugh, no one took us prisoner. We were knocked out. Whoever it is, they could have taken our weapons, but they didn't. We aren't prisoners. We're guests. Suddenly, a large steel door opens, and a man steps through, telling them, That is correct. You are guests of Shade. My name is Dr. Kurt Langstrom, acting head of security for Shade. We have brought you here today to speak with Princess Coriander. Earlier, a construct nearly collided with a NASA space station. We have determined that it was a ship. Also working on this is Dr. Ray Palmer. Palmer will go ahead and explain things further. Ray tells them that when they obtained this, they thought it was just cargo. There were no signs of life coming out of it from the inside. Starfire asks if they want her to use her solar powers to cut their way in. The ship can already withstand the rigors of space, clearly. Ray tells her, no, actually, we brought you in because the ship is broadcasting a single message over and over and over. Princess Coriander of Tamarin, you are our final hope. Starfire looks back at the ship, pausing for a moment, and then tells everyone that she's going to need a moment. She opens the door and walks in. And a few moments later, she lets out a blood-curdling scream. Seconds later, she rockets to the top of the ship and out of the building. Kirk Langstrom turns back, asking what the hell was that? And Roy says, how should we know? You're the ones that kidnapped us. Jason runs inside and Roy quickly follows. And what they find is a ship full of dead aliens. Some change the walls. Jason walks back out, stating that they must have been slaves. They must have been running. They came looking for Starfire. Sadly, they didn't reach her in time. Later, over at the city of Abu Dhabi, Starfire flies down onto the top of a very expensive hotel with determination in her eye. She scans the area and sees a man flaunting his wealth to a woman. And that's when they make eye contact with Starfire and she blows them up. The two people lean forward, revealing themselves to be aliens. And one asks if that was really necessary. She just picked the last place on Earth to pull a stunt like that. Soon everyone reveals their true forms and Starfire begins to blast away, stating that she's heard rumors of this establishment, a place where dregs of the universe come to spend their ill-gotten bounties. For years, she was willing to leave you to your debauchery, but no more. She will see him, who is the most base and vile among them. At that moment, a large alien jumps down onto Starfire, pinning her to the ground, asking, Were you looking for me? Seconds later, Starfire ignites herself. The alien jumps off and squeals, and Starfire rubs her head, stating, No, I was not. But to your regret, you will certainly do. After knocking out the rest of the aliens, Starfire turns her attention back to the ones who attacked her, stating, I'll be honest, Trevorall, I don't care how you came to this planet or how long you've been here. I'm only looking for your once and former overlord. Whether he lives or dies tonight is entirely up to you. Trevorall yells that if he tells her, I'm as good as dead, have mercy. She burns her hand into Trevorall, stating, that was the wrong answer. Clearly, you need motivation. She shoots off into the sky with Trevorall, telling her, will you just put me out of my misery? I will put you out of your misery, but refuse and I will keep you alive for weeks. Trevorall cries out, 30872 Pacific Edge Malibu. So later that night, at the address that Trevorall gave to Starfire, lightning strikes over the small house as a baby cries in its crib. A gentle older man reaches down, picking up the baby, stating, Shh, Grandpapa here. There's no reason for tears. Soon the baby falls back asleep, but as the lightning strikes again, the man sees Starfire outside of that window, burning with rage. He puts the sleeping baby back into its crib and then quietly opens up the front door asking Starfire, would you like to come in? As she enters, the man states, this is my home. My wife and granddaughter are here. If you have something you'd like to discuss, let's just be civil about it. 
can I offer you a drink? She breaks the bottle yelling, I am not here for a drink or to meet your family. I am here to avenge the death of so many who have suffered and died at your hands. I am here to kill you. The man recoils, telling her, you must be Coriander of Tamarin. I am sorry that this has come to this. Though I suppose I always knew that it would be a matter of time. I've led a good life, a full life, certainly much more than I could have ever imagined considering everything that I've done. She thinks back, stating, you could save it for someone who wasn't there. I can still remember the first time that I met you, the keeper of slaves. The others told me the first night that you had a heart of stone, but I knew better. A monster such as you had no heart at all. The man closes his eyes. It's all true, but things changed. I've changed. When you and the others stormed the camp, I escaped and made my way to earth. Only just barely. I was found. I should have killed her, but I couldn't. She was too beautiful, too compassionate. I married, I took a job, and I adopted a child. And later that child would give me a grandchild. It was the last time that I saw the memory of the people that I'd hurt in my past. If it means anything, I'm so very, very sorry for the man I once was. Starfire tells him, no, it means less than nothing. The man sighs, asking, can we do it outside? This is my family's home. The only thing that they've ever done wrong is love a monster like me. Lightning strikes again as the two go outside and the man kneels on the ground. And at that moment, Starfire focuses her powers in her hand with Jason and Roy calling out that she is better than this. Starfire shouts that this has nothing to do with them. They have not witnessed the crimes that this man has committed. Jason and Roy jump down and Jason says that they don't care about him. They care about her. Roy then says that they don't want to see her make a mistake. They've all done things that they aren't proud of. Don't let this man turn you into something that you're not. Starfire tells them not to ask her to walk away from this. Jason of all people knows why she has to do it. But if they ask her not to do it, she won't. But she cannot say for sure if she will ever forgive them. Jason says that he ruled her life as a child. Don't give him anything else. Without saying a word, Starfire flies off into the sky and the man yells, no! Jason tells him to relax, and the man says, You don't understand! She was right! The man then grabs one of Roy's arrows and pushes it against his neck. The arrowhead explodes, blowing apart the man. But later, at the hidden island of the outlaws, Starfire returns to her ship. As she goes inside, she opens up a container, and inside it is the drug that made her docile. Rain pounds against the window as Jason sits in a hospital room holding the hand of one of his best friends, Roy Harper. Jason thinks to himself that he's been fighting this darkness inside of him and it's all thanks to him. The guy just won't take screw off for an answer. But as Jason sits in silence, Roy turns his head and he tells him, Find her. Bring her home. Jason tells him no. Not yet. Not until he's out of danger. He then opens up the IV bag to allow more medicine to put Roy back to sleep. He then sits back down. How did this all happen? How did one of his best friends get burned over 90% of his body? Well, it all started four days ago in Malibu. Jason and Roy were at the home of the former intergalactic slave trader, the one who imprisoned Starfire when she was younger. They had just convinced Starfire to not kill him, but the man took it upon himself to do the job for her. And after cleaning up that mess, Jason and Roy headed back to their hidden island to go look for the now missing Starfire. And found her they did. Washed up on the beach, Starfire laid as the waves crashed into her, her eyes glazed in black. After a few moments, they lit up the vivid green that they've always been, and she rocketed up into the sky as if everything was normal. When they tried to explain what happened back in Malibu, she didn't seem to care, which was strange in of itself. But back at the New Orleans General Hospital, Jason continues to sit and wait. It's then that his eyes dart forwards towards the door and he pulls out his guns. The man who enters is Oliver Queen, or better known as Green Arrow, in the superhero world. Oliver tells Jason to put the guns away. He just wants a few moments with Roy, alone. Jason thinks back to the way that Oliver treated Roy, throwing him out when Roy needed him most. But they should at least have a chance to clear the air if this is Roy's last night. But back when this all happened, Jason and the others set out for the swamps of Louisiana to track down the terrorist group that they'd encountered before. While Jason and Roy were sloshing through the muck, Starfire took it upon herself to fly on ahead. She blasted her way into a cabin in the middle of the woods, and when Jason and Roy caught up, she was already fighting off a horde of... things. 
Starfire began to fight them off, but partly through, she suddenly took off, like she was scared or something. As any good friend would do, Jason told Roy to follow Starfire while he takes care of these, and without hesitation, Jason jumped into the pit of all the creatures. He then noticed something about them. They were super strong, like unnaturally strong. And after being knocked into a pile of boxes, Jason pulled himself out and sees a small metal device strapped to the men's feet with vials injecting something into them. With a quick swipe of a knife, Jason takes off one of the ankle devices and inspects it. Then it hits him. He knows what this is. He needs an advantage here if he's going to make it out alive. Meanwhile, outside, Roy caught up to Starfire, asking if everything is okay. She told him no as she pulls the needle out after injecting herself with the space drug that she had been forced to take for so long. And Starfire said that she was weak and she is sorry, but they must stay away from her. Before Roy could tell her no, Starfire loses control of her powers and rockets off into the sky, leaving a fiery explosion in her wake. And Roy, he was caught in the middle of that. Back in the cabin that night, though, Jason began to feel alone, completely, gloriously, and finally alone, and God help him, he didn't want it to end. At least that's how it felt. The truth is, since injecting the venom into his body, his heart rate had risen above 85. It's like any change that took place in his body was done on a molecular level. But in his mind, these men look like monsters. It makes it easy to do what needs to be done. He breaks a monster's arm, kicks the teeth out of another, and before long, it all begins to fade. He looks around at his work, and not a single terrorist is moving. Serves them right for trying to drop a nuke on Washington, D.C. Just as the venom drug is leaving his body, he falls back, passing out. As soon as he comes to, though, he races out of the cabin, and what he finds is the place on fire. He looks around to see Roy's burnt quiver, and realizes that while Roy's a smart guy, maybe even a genius, he's a guy that's going to need his arrows. And if his quiver was burned off of him, hours before Jason was coming to, Starfire was flying down over a hospital, holding the charred body of Roy in her arms. She told the nurses outside that this man needs medical attention immediately, and the nurses state that that's not how this works, he needs to be processed through ER, and... She tries to hold back her anger as the trees burn around her. She tells them, I wasn't asking! Back in the present day, Jason explains what the nurses told him when Roy was dropped off. Oliver Queen says, yeah, the girl sounds like a real peach. Starfire nearly fried him and then dropped him off. You want to throw a parade? I always knew that Roy was an idiot. Guess it was just confirmation with him hanging around you too. Jason stares, telling Oliver, you know, maybe we should take our conversation outside. Once in the hallway, Jason tells him that he's been around the billionaire types before. They all think that they can solve every problem with money. Oliver stops him. Most, sure. Watch and learn. He turns around, taking out his phone, telling the person that he needs an evac. While that is in route, he'll also need the best burn unit in the world in a bed. And just as he hangs up, there's a loud foom from inside of the room and the two quickly run back in. Over Roy's bed, Essence stands there with Oliver shouting, asking, What the hell? As Oliver checks on Roy, Essence tells Jason that the danger has passed, but it will still be a while before he can move. She did all she can do for him. Jason asks, will he be seeing her again? And Essence tells him, not likely. Her debt is paid. A short while later, Jason gets ready to take off to look for Starfire, but as he takes off, he wonders how he's even going to bring her back. And then he looks at all of the canisters of venom that he took from the terrorists. Back in the hospital, Roy is watching Jason leave through the window when he notices Oliver sitting there. He tells Roy that they need to talk, and Roy asks him, Do we? Oliver leans in telling him not to be rude. From the looks of it, he's his last friend in the world. Roy scoffs, telling him, You're off by two. Jaybird's gonna look for the one person that knows more about Starfire than probably she even knows. Crux. When we last left off, Oliver leaned in, telling Roy that he didn't want to be rude. But from the looks of things, he was the last friend that Roy had. And Roy told him, The Chamber is just looking for the one person who knows more about Starfire than him. Crux. This person's going to help. So the next day, a doctor sits in a wheelchair in front of Crux, and Crux says, Good. A visitor. I haven't eaten in a week. The doctor tells the Arkham security that they're no longer needed and to leave them be. The guards begin to step out, and one says that he really isn't comfortable with this, but they have their orders. So Crux begins to pull on his chains, and he says, You would be the ninth doctor sent in to try and cure me. Give me a good reason why I shouldn't be eating your bones right now. 
The doctor says because the ones before him were foolish enough to believe that they could cure him. For him, he's here to kill him. That is, if he doesn't do what's asked. Crux. Crux pauses for a moment, asking, Crux? No one knows that name. No one except, oh, oh, this is rich. Crux lunges forward, breaking through his chains, grabbing the doctor by the neck, asking, You came back? For what? Mock my imprisonment? Threaten me? Jason's disguise fades and he says, No, I'm here because I need you. I need some information that's floating around that big skilly head of yours. Crux opens his mouth to bite down on Jason, but Jason takes out a knife, stabbing it into Crux's tongue. As Crux swings, knocking Jason back, Jason says, That's gratitude for you. Probably could have planned that one out a bit better. But just before landing, Crux flies up, grabbing Jason, telling him, You're not going anywhere. After everything you and your friends did, Crux spins back, throwing Jason through a stone wall, asking, Did you think it was going to be over already? So a short while later, Jason opens up his eyes to find himself strapped to a chair, with the only comment being, Well, this is a bit strange. Care to uh, explain what's going on? Crux, now back in his human form, says that it's really not all that mysterious. Once he shapeshifted back to his original, more spectacular form, he needed to find something to wear. Shirt from him, pants from Arsenal, but don't worry. Didn't put on the hood. Probably booby-trapped, right? Jason tells him, of course it is. The question is, why aren't I dead? Let's face it, leaving me alive is a bad idea for you. Crux leans forward, unlocking the restraints, telling him, I wanted to thank you. And he hugs Jason. Ah, uh, you're welcome? Crux tells him, yes. All that education, brilliance, my parents' resources. I was focused on eliminating all traces of alien life on Earth. I'd probably be dead if not for the three of you and your unorthodox intervention. Jason asks, the one where we drugged you, knocked you out, and took you to Arkham against your will? That intervention? Crux tells him, yeah, I wasn't happy, sure. But between the drugs and the therapy I received, I was in fact cured. I can think again, clearly, and I realize that I've been a real jerk trying to see revenge on people who weren't even responsible for the death of my parents. And sorry about that back there, I kind of lost control. You saw a bit of me in the crux state, but I need to focus on the positive. While I was here, I tried to make amends by sneaking around the asylum. I used my multiple degrees to finally do some good in the world. Jason asks, So you were posing as a crazy bat dragon so you could skulk around playing doctor? And you don't have a problem? But just as Crux goes to answer, he forms another torso from his back, and he grabs the arrow pointed at him, telling him, It would seem that Arsenal here is much less trusting on my new outlook on life. Which is fine, considering I tried to kill each of you last time we met. Roy asks, How are you doing this? Didn't you used to be a dragon? Crux tells him, In part, yes, I took the DNA from multiple sources, Man Bat, Killer Croc, and Clayface to name a few. Jason then says, I cannot tell you enough how creepy shapeshifting is. Crux tosses Roy's arrows as he gets into the pilot seat and Jason says, I'm surprised it took you this long to show up. Roy tells him that he was busy trying to locate Starfire once he was better. But his usual way of locating her isn't working, and Crux says that that's not a problem. I've tracked people from Tamarind and other races for half my life. I'm confident that I can locate her within a quarter mile. I just need you to do something for me. Jason asks, what's that? And Crux hits the throttle telling him, Buckle up! Meanwhile, out in the middle of the Brazilian rainforest, Starfire sits by a tree chained up. As she sits there, a panther walks by and begins to sniff her. It steps back hissing and Starfire lunges at it screaming, but before he can grab it, the chain snaps, slamming her into the ground. Starfire looks at the chain, trying to burn it, but nothing happens. She screams in frustration as she falls to the ground and she looks up. You? Am I dreaming? She blinks to see her sister. Blackfire, Commander, standing before her, and Blackfire says, I'm sorry that it came to this, but if anyone's going to at long last put you out of your misery, be glad it's your sister. Starfire stumbles back, asking, Blackfire? You rule all of Tamarin. How did you get here? She holds out her glaive, telling her, That is a longer story than you might imagine. But get down! She tackles Starfire to the ground as a group of Citadel fly overhead, and Starfire quietly asks, How are they here? How is that even possible? Commander uses her powers to put Starfire asleep, telling her that she needs to rest. Everything will be all right. And as Starfire slowly passes out, she is mortified that her sister found her so weak. Commander, aka Blackfire, holds Starfire's head, telling her never. You have been, and always will be, the bravest, most courageous person ever. And that is why I am here, because you need help. Elsewhere, Crux lands his ship in the forest, telling them, Here we are! 
Jason tells him that he says that like it's supposed to mean something. And Crux says, well, based on my knowledge of all things Tamarind, I could guess approximately where she should be. And I have give or take 7.2 million square miles to guess with here. Before they get out, an alarm goes off and the ship is hit by a missile. Crux transforms, grabbing Roy and calling out to Jason, asking, where are you? But that's when Crux is shot in the back, falling to the ground with a loud thump. A woman with white hair steps out and looks around, stating, come on, show me some smoldering limbs, a melted red helmet, something. Where did you, oh, you're right behind me, aren't you? Jason pulls the hammer back in his gun, telling her, Hello, Rose. Love that mask. Rose spins back, kicking the gun from Jason's hand, telling her, I considered a heart tattoo that said Jason with an axe hacking it in two. Jason drops to the ground, swiping out Rose's legs, stating, Would you care to explain why you're trying to kill us? Last thing I remember, you had a big, satisfying smile on your face. Rose falls onto Jason, telling her, I was being polite. Besides, I'm here on business. You and your friends are a distraction, an impossibly adorable, positively scrumptious distraction. But while they're fighting in another part of this forest, Blackfire hooks up Starfire to a Tamaranian machine, telling her that she's so sorry, so many times that she has failed her. She can't even protect her own people. How is she supposed to protect her sister? Starfire smiles and weakly says, Nonsense. Every day, my every thought, you were there. She then begins to get back up, stating that they need to go find the Citadel. Find them and kill them. Blackfire sits back down, telling her that they will. There will be blood, but she must rest. Every warrior needs her strength. As Starfire sits back down, she hugs Blackfire, telling her thank you. And then Commander's tone changes as she asks, What was that back there? You were drugged out of your skull. You're too strong to be an addict. Starfire rolls over, telling her that she learned her tormentor was hiding on Earth. He could not have come here without support, the infrastructure. It comes through the black market drug trader. She wanted to get those responsible by working her way to the upper echelon, but it was a foolish risk, and the only thing she did was destroy their base. Commander grabs her Batagur, telling her that they could talk about it later. The machine will flush out the drug, and she won't be long. Elsewhere in the forest, Roy asks why they're bringing her along. She did try to kill them, and Rose says that she would just cut his head off if he tried to stop her. Jason then yells, if you don't stop, I'm gonna shoot you both. Rose then goes on stating that she is tracking Starfire because the little princess ticked off a lot of wealthy people, which means the bounty is very high. Starfire calls out that she won't be able to spend that money when she's dead. And as the two charge at each other, Roy asks, how long is this going to take? Jason tells him, about three seconds, Roy. Rose is thrown into a tree and Roy says that he was only off by three seconds. Starfire then flies over, kissing Roy, stating that she is so sorry about what happened. She almost killed him, didn't she? Roy tells her that she didn't do it on purpose. Just let's never talk about it again unless he does something really wrong and needs her to forgive him. Jason then tells everyone that they need to get to the bottom of this and get home. As far as she can tell, Starfire has been on the trail of the same people who hired Rose to stop her. Rose then asks, are you saying that the people that hired me are involved in an intergalactic drug trade? But before Jason could answer, Crux yells, you're gonna need to see this, it's imperative. Everyone looks over the ledge and they see the white Citadel fleet gathering on the ground and Roy says, oh, it can't get any worse than that, right? And right behind them is the leader of that army. Jason turns back, opening fire, stating, I can only assume that you're Hellspont. Hellspawn laughs, telling him, Oh, that is completely ineffective, and nothing less than I have come to expect from you Earthers. Jason tells him, True, but you wouldn't respect me if I didn't try. Starfire flies up, telling everyone to get back. Hellspawn is the most vile, genocidal warlord in the entire universe. But before she can attack, an arrow lands straight into Hellspawn's chest. And he asks, Really? That is almost too adorable to take offense. As he finishes, the arrow discharges an electrical blast with Starfire following up with an attack of her own. But through the fire, Hellspawn punches into the ground, igniting a massive blue explosion, telling everyone, I'm used to being challenged by warriors. Only Earthers assume to send children. Rose throws her swords into Hellspawn's chest, but as he pulls them out, he laughs, and they begin to deteriorate. Soon the Citadel surround the group, and a voice says, That is enough. Your next move against our liege will be your last. Everyone stops upon hearing the voice, and Jason says, Oh, I am so, so sorry. Commander steps out, stating that there is no need to feel bad for her sister. There is a war coming, albeit a brief one-sided war. And as a responsibility to her people, she is obligated to side with the ultimate victor. Rose laughs, telling Starfire, You got yourself some sister. I didn't realize you came from a family of losers. Hellspawn calls out that the people of Tamarin were wise to align themselves with his wishes. In exchange for their commander-in-chief, he will grant them their relative freedom. 
a generous offer that he is not making to the people of Earth. Crux looks back at one of the Citadel soldiers and states, That is interesting. Commander kneels down before Hellspont, telling him that the Citadel is ready to act at his command. She only asks that he spares the life of her misguided sister. Hellspont tells her perhaps, but unlikely. Crux whispers to Jason that he has been studying aliens his whole life, and one of them was the Citadel. The breastplates that they wear are wired directly into their brains and each other. Jason asks if he's stating that they can take them down with a switch, and Crux says, if given the opportunity, yes. So Jason steps forward telling Hellspont, I need to put this into perspective. You're getting a little flaming ahead of yourself. So how about we clear things up? This planet doesn't belong to you. Not yet, not ever. Hellspont laughs. I cannot take another moment, Commander. You know what to do. At that moment, Commander releases all of her black firepower into Hellspont, creating a massive explosion from within his body. Hellspot grabs her by the hair, yelling, How dare you! and throws her across the street. Jason shoots out the legs of one of the Citadel soldiers, stating, This one's all yours! And Crux begins to rewire the breastplate, telling him, I'm gonna need about five minutes! And Rose yells at him, You have two! Starfire flies in, hitting Hellspot, screaming, that she could kill him for hurting Commander. But Hellspot tells her that that is impossible. And then he's hit with an explosion as Starfire turns to see where it came from. And Jason runs up holding a giant blaster telling her, go find your sister. She takes off for the skies following the crater left by Commander's landing. And when she finds her, she finds the lifeless body on the ground. She screams, screams loud enough for the people on the battlefield to hear her. And Jason pauses as he listens. And in that moment of hesitation, Hellspot grabs him by the throat, telling him, You will pay attention. But as all of the Citadel aim at Jason, all of their heads suddenly burst into flames. Hellspawn says that he will die, knowing that their victory means nothing. There are more soldiers where they came from. There are more powerful weapons in this universe than even you could imagine, Jason Todd. And at that moment, there's a thundering BOOM! That deafens everyone as a beam of concentrated fire turns Hellspawn's body to ash. Jason falls to the ground, and as he looks up, he sees Roy riding one of the Citadel tanks and he gives a wave. A short while later, at Commander's ship, Starfire tends to her sister, stating that they are resilient people. If they can get her home in time, they might be able to save her. Jason tells her that if there's anything that they can do, the Starfire stops him, stating that they'll be fine. Crux will pilot the ship so that she can stay by her sister's side. And as Jason and Roy step out, Starfire tells them thank you. And Roy asks, for what? She says for letting her do this alone. It's a family matter. She hugs Jason, she gives Roy a kiss, and Roy asks if she'll remember him. And she tells him, forever in a day. As Commander's ship begins to take off, Roy tells Jason that he should probably go on ahead without him. He's gonna check for spoils of war, destroy what's left. Jason says that he understands that it's a good idea. So the two hug one last time, and Roy heads back to the battlefield alone. He looks at Jason and tells him that it's okay if he needs a minute. That couldn't have been easy, having lost his team. And Jason laughs, stating that they weren't a team. They were friends, helping each other pick up the pieces of their lives. They were the outlaws. This is Arsenal. He used to be one third of the outlaws, a group that was operated by Jason Todd, AKA the Red Hood. They weren't a group of villains or anything. They just did things how they thought it should be done. And right now he's sitting on a crate of arrows alone. He misses his old team, with Starfire heading off to Miami to be alone, and Jason, well, no one really knows where Jason went. But anyway, back to the mission on hand. Arsenal calls up Tara Battleworth as she walks out onto the field. She doesn't want to hear it. She wants to talk to Arsenal's boss. Boss? Jason was never the boss, he thinks to himself. And that's when another car pulls up, and a rather bulky individual gets out, and tells Tara Battleworth to present the man or the money. So the senator steps out of his car, laughing. I told you, Miss Battleworth, there's no need for this cloak and dagger stuff. The elderly man walks over to the large man and he grabs the old man by the wrist. There's been a change in plans, old man. Arsenal smiles. Yes, there has been. And he fires an explosive arrow into the car of these individuals. With a ba 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 doom, it throws everyone back. So Arsenal fires a blinding arrow into the field and he jumps in to start his assault. 
He fires arrows and he kicks his enemies until the CIA agents finally ask, What? How? He proudly tells them, I'm Arsenal, also not known as Arrowboy. The CIA agent tells him, Oh, right, didn't recognize you without the Red Hood. Oh, come on, it's not like we're married. I don't need him to save a senator from... But before he can finish his sentence, the senator drops from gunshots to his back. And then the head honcho grabs Tara Battleworth to use her as a hostage. Arsenal holds his hands to give up. When the senator rolls over and he opens fire on them. Okay, didn't see that anywhere in the program. The senator blasts the guy in the chest, dropping him and saving Miss Battleworth. Didn't ask for your help, Arsenal yells at him. You two know each other, Miss Battleworth asks. So the senator drops his hologram and he reveals that it was Red Hood the whole time. With the job done, they argue for a second as to why Arsenal left the group last time, but Red Hood asks him. So what's it gonna be, Arsenal? You done crying about the girl and ready to get back into action? Yeah, I'm ready. The next day after burning Jason's shower curtains off, Arsenal explains that he spent all of their money on some nifty new gadgets. So to get some new money, they take an offer that was made to them by Tara Battleworth to assist her in keeping the rich and famous of Washington's problems silent. Their first job takes them to Paris, France. And their job is to recover a thumb drive stolen by a diplomat. They're gonna do this as silently as they can. So while Roy is trying to make some new female friends, Jason thinks that they should stick to business, and he has a list of things for them to do while they're in Paris. Like fight bad guys, boss levels to beat, coins to collect! You really need to cut back on the video games, Roy. But yeah. And with that, the Red Hood and Arsenal video game begins. Level 1, Red Hood battles against various Parisian terrorists. Level 2 is an arms dealer and a level up. And level 3 is Arsenal's favorite, the Mobster Ninja People. Thank you for playing the Superhero Bros World 1. As they stand over the defeated enemies with Red Hood's guns smoking, Arsenal asks him, If you tell me that didn't feel like a video game, I'm gonna call you a liar. Eerily so. But that's when the boys get a phone call from Tara Battleworth. What are you two doing? I hired you to get a thumb drive, not have a streetwide tourist brawl. Save your threats, we're gonna get some dinner and then we'll get your thumb drive. Hood tells her as he hangs up. The two head off to dinner at the Eiffel Tower and Roy tries to pretend that he doesn't know why they're there. A notorious shade scientist is sitting across from them. And they're still on Jason's list of things to do while he's in Paris. As the scientist tries to get a little angry with the woman, Jason gets up and he punches him in the throat. Which gets all of the lackeys to jump through the window. Roy reaches for his duffel bag to suit up while Jason is being slapped around by the mime squad. Now can I just say one thing, Jason? When don't you say one thing? Just imagine if we were getting paid to fight these bad guys and helping people, instead of giving it away for free. Oh, and do you feel that? Which that? Like it's another montage coming on. Welcome to Mime Melee. Choose your hero. Red Hood with his ex-Robin angst attack, Arsenal with his trucker hat attack, or Allison with the mime this attack. Ready, fight! This time, the guys feel like they're fighting it out on a platformer using all of their weapons to save poor Allison. Her mime this attack isn't very effective. With the final villain on his list of people to beat up while in Paris done, Jason and Roy head off to get the thumb drive, which is so uninteresting that we're gonna keep it off panel. Then they return to Terra Battleworth, which locks them into her list of wet work operatives with paying jobs. Jason and Arsenal drop the money in the bank and then get ready for their next paying job. You know I'm gonna kill you when this is all over, right, Roy? Trained professionals should not threaten to kill people. Who's threatening? See, you think it's funny, but it just comes off as mean, Jason. Our story begins with Red Hood falling out of a building. Arsenal literally fires an arrow into his shoulder to catch him, and once it goes taunt, he screams out in pain. This is your idea of a rescue, Roy? It worked, didn't it? Then Red Hood hears the crowd below. Go Bat Guy, we love you! Red Bat rocks, I'd hire you! Is that crowd down below cheering for us? Red Hood asks. Well, they could be cheering for something else entirely, something I've been meaning to tell you about. That's when Jason Todd, the Red Hood, sees the newest billboard. Rent a bat, call now, 555 Red Arse. Their government contracts burst into their office crazy mad at them. Are you two out of your minds? I hired you because my clients want discretion. Now everyone knows who you are. And as Tara Battleworth leaves the room, Jason turns to Roy. Just tell me why it's so important that we make more money, Roy. Well, a national campaign costs a lot of money. Ah, oh, geez, this is my fault for allowing you to open up a joint banking account, Jason says as he face palms. Roy's plan does work though, and their first offer brings them to an old broken down house, with their first client being a rather large, disgusting looking person named Underbelly. 
He explains that he is thought made man. The corruption that runs through every major city in the world. The living embodiment of greed, sloth, envy, and murder. And he wants to hire Red Hood and Arsenal as his new enforcers. Red Hood stops him right there. Yeah, it's not just that easy. We don't just work for anyone. And Arsenal looks a little confused. We don't? Then Red Hood opens fire, completely destroying Underbelly. And he walks away. Arsenal flips out on him. Jason, you can't just kill every client that annoys you. This is why the freelance business was a bad idea, Roy. Every villain scumbag weirdo in the world has a direct line to us. I think he's twitching, Jason. Then Underbelly's goo begins to reform as his hands grab Red Hood and throw him into a wall. You weren't paying attention. I can't be killed any more than you can kill a thought. If you will not serve me, you will die, thunk. Did you just say thunk? No, it wasn't I. It was me, Arsenal shouts from a distance, and then Underbelly explodes again. It's going to take him a bit to reform from that. You know, Roy, you're wrong. If we didn't make that ad, we would never have found this guy. Maybe we can use this business to lure out more people like him. You had me and I was wrong. So if we're gonna shut him down for good, we're gonna need to find the center of his operation. And I've got a hunch where we should start. The most vile and crime-ridden pit of despair and debauchery. Or, as you call it, Gotham, home sweet home. Well, they both did some things in Gotham that needed to be done, like Jason meeting with some people who were in a bad way like he was, and Roy talking to an old friend named Croc who also has a drinking problem, like Roy did. Eventually, Jason shot out one of the cameras linked to the Batman balloon. And the Jim Gordon Robo Batman looks at the screen. Great. Get the suit ready. But back down on the streets below, Roy rides up on a new motorcycle asking Jason, what's with the dump nearby? And Jason tells him, this is where he thinks Underbelly is. You see, five years ago, this dump was the crown jewel of this hood, an exclusive club where all the crooks would go. The Joker was in there telling his latest plan to all of Gotham's other top crooks, and they were interrupted by a poor man that wasn't aware that they were there. The Joker opened fire on him with so many bullets that the man turned into a pile of mush. And that was when Batman and Robin showed up, Jason Todd Robin. They took out the Joker and they never really found out why the Joker called everyone there, and that the poor guy was left as a pile of mush. And that's when back at our current day, the robo-suit Batman, that is Jim Gordon, comes in in an attempt to arrest Red Hood and Arsenal for a multitude of things on their rap sheets. They launch out some smoke clogging up Batman's sensors and then Arsenal kicks him, telling him to say goodnight, robo-dork. Arsenal said that not me, Jason told him as he dove into Batman. Batman just throws the two of them aside. Did either of you really think that that would work? And that's when Underbelly comes walking out of his hideout, clapping. Friend of yours? Batman, Underbelly. Underbelly, Batman. Batman opens his attacks with sonic blasters on Underbelly, breaking him apart. And then Arsenal turns to Red Hood. These sonic blasters that Batman has are great! I so need to build me one of these suits. And Red Hood replies with, I can't hear you, but I'm certain you're saying something stupid. Jason then asks Batman if he thinks that was a little overkill. And Batman explains that the GCPD has actually been tracking Underbelly for a while, and they knew how to take him down. But while Batman is explaining, Arsenal is counting. Three, two, because Underbelly is reforming on one. Underbelly opens with a massive fist hitting Batman and taking him out. And then he turns to our two idiot former sidekicks. Gentlemen, you made great effort to find me. Have you reconsidered my offer? Not at all. Yeah, we're here to kill you for reals this time. Underbelly laughs and he tells them, you can't kill a thought. You see, the Joker stole a device that will trap psychic energy and he never got to use it. So once everyone cleared out of the club, the device took on the body of the janitor and it turned it into the Underbelly. The very idea of evil. It took him years, but the evil in the air of Gotham built him up and made him fatter until he was able to branch out. But while he was giving his monologue evil speech, Batman is recovered and he jumps in clobbering Underbelly and then repeatedly beating on him to tear him apart. Who are we rooting for, Jason? If you boys aren't a part of the solution, then you're a part of the problem, Batman yells at them, flinging various bits of Underbelly at them. Jason jumps onto Batman's back while Roy runs off for plan B. Well, while Jason tries to guess what that is, he opens fire on Underbelly until Underbelly grabs both Batman and Red Hood and he picks them up ready to kill them. But out of the blue, an arrow fires through his midsection and it begins to truly disrupt him. My beautiful body. Beautiful? There's someone for everyone, and while they recover from being picked up, Arsenal cheers himself on. Well, since no one is going to applaud, I'll do it. That was awesome, Arsenal. Total boss move. Sure, he's great, but is he like that in real life? Oh, and for the record, that error was built to disrupt neural functions, so I killed him for good this time. And then, all three of them stare at each other. Batman doesn't want them in his town. He isn't the old Batman, and he doesn't work with vigilantes. So Jason promises that in exchange for helping him, they'll leave by noon tomorrow, no more bloodshed. And Batman agrees. 
Jason spends the next morning visiting an old friend, Bruce Wayne, to let him know that the place he's working at now has helped out a lot of kids. And then, he hugged Bruce Wayne. Bruce has some form of amnesia and he has no idea who Jason is. But just knowing that Bruce is alive makes Jason feel better. And then he thanks Bruce for everything before leaving. Meanwhile, Arsenal is deciding that maybe he can move past his alcoholic past, just as Joker's daughter shoots him in the head. She now stands over him, victorious, explaining to Pallet and Susie Sue that she was the one to kill Arsenal, and now she's gonna go kill the Red Hood. The only thing that she wants is entry into their supervillain group, and their response is, who are you? None of your business, but you can call me Joker's daughter. So they let her go off to kill Red Hood as she asks, because as Pallet explains, if they have this girl do all of their work for them, then their first job is complete and they didn't even have to do anything. Jason, meanwhile, is sitting in an airplane on the tarmac of the Gotham City Airport, checking his phone. Why hasn't Roy answered his calls, or at least texted his location? As the plane begins to take off, a woman shrieks the sight on the wing, and Jason looks out to see Joker's daughter on the wing with a chainsaw. Knowing what this means, he kicks the door open and jumps onto the wing to battle against her. She starts swinging the chainsaw around and digs it into the wing, and the damage and speed of the plane tilt the plane. As she's about to fall off, Jason grabs her hand. You've got me, sure, but will you still have me when you learn that I splattered Arsenal's brains on the rooftop? No, it'll be more like, die, jerk, die! And then she pulls out a gun while Jason tries to process that. Roy, dead? Someday, but never by this kid. Over with Susie Sue, she's standing over the apparently dead body of Arsenal, stating that she can use his bow and arrow. It shouldn't be that hard to pull a bow, right? And then an arrow goes through the back of her neck. It's not a bow, it's an arrow. Roy says getting back up, and he rubs the back of his head and he realizes that he was shot with a paintball filled with someone's guts. Joker's daughter's twisted. Back on the plane, Jason can tell that she's not really trying to kill him. I mean, she is, but she's got no heart in it. And he begins to wonder, what's her story? They've both had their heads messed with by the Joker, and he remembers how when he first came back to Gotham, he was full of piss and vinegar. So he wonders, is she crazier than he was? The plane comes to a sudden halt, and he drops her on the tarmac. Then she makes a break for it. Back with Roy, he walks into the terrorist base, and he comes across one of the goons, smacking him upside the head, dropping him. Roy then flips over, lodges an arrow into the guy's foot, and then he sticks one into the guy's chest, dropping him. Joker's daughter gets back to the base and explains to Pallet that she didn't stand a chance against Red Hood. He was just too good! And unhappy with this, Pallet tells her goons to kill Joker's daughter. Joker's daughter calls out, but why? Why would you want to kill them so badly anyway? Pilot explains that she doesn't. It's business. They were working for Terra Battleworth and then they made their own business. That was Pilot's plan. And with them there, there's no use for her. So she's removing the competition. And then she turns back to Joker's daughter. And don't you think that I can tell that you were faking your fear? Joker's daughter laughs. <laughs> In my defense, I made a very convincing evergreen tree number three when I was in second grade for Christmas. Pallet begins to charge up her powers, but at that moment, Red Hood leaps in, firing his guns at all of Pallet's goons, dropping them. Then Arsenal throws an arrow into the back of Pallet's neck, and Joker's daughter exclaims, Wow! Aren't we a great team? Oddly enough, none of them died, and Red Hood and Arsenal packaged them all up in a crate to send them off to sea for six weeks. Joker's daughter asks, wouldn't it be easier to kill them? And Roy agrees, and even states that it's not like Red Hood is known for his non-violent resolutions. Jason stops him there. That was before. Before I joined? Joker's daughter asks. Yes, now Arsenal and I need to set an example for you. Roy wants to know, why would they hire Joker's daughter? And Jason tells him, your whole renobat thing was to clean up our image, right? Why not let three people clean up their image instead of two? Joker's daughter asks, full dental? And that's how she joined up with Jason and Roy. As Arsenal and Joker's daughter sit on top of a building, Red Hood tells them that he has some things that he's going to go follow up on, and they shouldn't follow him. He runs off to be a part of the Robin Wars, and that video will be down below. But Joker's daughter suggests that Arsenal and her follow him anyway. Arsenal tells her no. Red Hood cares about her, so for whatever reason, he needs to care by proxy. Later, while Joker's daughter is getting a drink off of the water tower's water, Arsenal gets a call for their business rent a someone asking for help rescuing some orphans at a circus. So, he takes Joker's daughter and they set off on the job, and Joker's daughter couldn't be more than happy to do something finally. She was getting really bored. When they finally arrive at the circus, Arsenal hears his phone go off that the client's money has already cleared his pay bud account. Now, they just need to find whoever it is that they need to beat up. Joker's daughter points and says, I guess it's over there, where all the people are running and screaming from. When Arsenal looks over, he sees Phosphorus, Rex, Big Tomp, and Siam. Arsenal begins to run in and tells Joker's daughter to stay, and she barks in reply, Woof! 
while Rex is speaking with Big Tom, Arsenal jumps in shooting an asbestos foam arrow at Rex and Siam, covering both of them so that they can't move. But just as Arsenal is thinking that that was a little too easy, he hears Joker's daughter call out to him to look behind him. But before he can react, Big Top jumps on top of him. Joker's daughter watches and tells Arsenal that it's a real honor to watch him work. And he tells her, fine, sicker. Just then, Joker's daughter leaps from the popcorn machine that she was on and cracks Big Top in the head with a wheel from the machine. She then turns when she hears a voice yell at her, how dare you? Rex begins to yell that they are the Circus of the Strange, and he shoots fire at Joker's daughter, having her jump over Big Top, causing Big Top to take the fire. She then throws the broken wheel at Rex, impaling him and knocking him out. Arsenal draws his bow on Joker's daughter and tells her, heal, and she tells him that he's really big on the dog metaphors, and it's a little sexist. She then points her gun down at the people that they just dropped, telling Arsenal that she wished she could have been good, but that's just not who she is. Arsenal tells her, whir, because if she pulls that trigger, she will be a whir, and Joker's daughter closes her eyes and says that she's sorry. A short while later, Arsenal decides that it might be best to drop Joker's daughter off, and Joker's daughter begins to wake up asking what happened. Arsenal tells her that he tased her with a few thousand volts, and she tries to tell him that she wasn't gonna shoot. Red Hood believes in her, which makes her want to believe in herself. Arsenal frees Joker's daughter, and he thinks to himself how he might be regretting this later, but before anything else can happen, creatures begin to start crawling up from the ground, and they look like zombies covered in lava, and Joker's daughter says that they're dwellers, mindless subhumans who live in the rock-bottom lava beds underneath Gotham. A short time later, Red Hood appears to meet up with them, and he notices that Arsenal's bike is melted to the ground. Man, this can't be good. Much later, Arsenal is being tortured and being asked how he knows Joker's daughter, and the woman tells him that she was sent by Sharon to know about those who signed with Joker's daughter. As they pull him out of a tank of ice water, she asks again, but Arsenal tells her that Joker's daughter is not his friend, just a friend of a friend, and this is the part where you guys are supposed to tell me where she is. And the woman asks, or what? And Arsenal tells her, well, spoiler, I'm gonna kick your asses. As the two thugs begin to walk to him, Arsenal breaks free, knocking the thugs out, and then he wraps the chain around the woman, asking again, so where's Joker's daughter? Elsewhere in the nethers, Joker's daughter finds herself chained up, and Sharon asks her how she once took away everything from him. Joker's daughter tells him that she is implosive like that. Kids, huh? But it doesn't matter. Those people are now her people, and she beats him in battle. Sharon tells her that it doesn't matter. He has a new tribe now, and they are going to drag Gotham into the fiery rivers of purification. As more of the dwellers start to crawl out of the ground, Joker's daughter lets out a small ape. Arsenal continues to try and look for Joker's daughter, but he finds himself starting to get surrounded by these dwellers. And he tells them, no touchies. The whole burning lava hands thing kind of hurts. So just point and he'll go. Back below, Sharon begins to have these dwellers push down the pillars that hold up Gotham, allowing everything to come falling down into this lava. And Joker's daughter tells him, hey, inflicting a little pain is fun, but this is millions of people. Sharon tells her that that is because of her. He was cast out from those people. And though he almost died, he found these dwellers and they began to follow his words. Joker's daughter begins to think that this is her fault. But before she can talk anymore, Arsenal is thrown into the pit where she is chained. So rude, Arsenal says. Joker's daughter asks if he came back for her and he tells her yes, she's essentially company property. Joker's daughter stares at him and asks if that's the only reason. And he tells her, for someone called Joker's daughter, you're a little humor impaired. As Arsenal begins to free Joker's daughter, Red Hood comes crashing down through the ceiling. See, they knew they needed him. Arsenal looks at him and tells him, I notice your guns are gone. You can go ahead and use the arrow gun. Just don't give me a hard time about it. Joker's daughter walks over to them and tells them, no, this is her fight. It's between her and Sharon. Joker's daughter then walks over to him and tells him that neither of them belong here, not as leader, not even as people. But she wanted to say, sorry. She extends her hand to give him a handshake and asks him if he's ready. And he asks for what? And Joker's daughter pulls his arm, pulling both of them down to the pit of lava. She comes closer and closer to the lava, so Arsenal fires a hook that grabs Joker's daughter by the hand before pulling her back in. When she comes back up, she asks, why did he do that? And Arsenal tells her, I don't know. Killing herself is stupid. Red Hood grabs her and tells her that he won't let her go until things get better. And they will. He promises. Later, Joker's daughter decides to leave behind the mask, the Joker skin mask, because the people down here can do better than her as a leader or even Sharon. But as Arsenal begins to walk out, he notices a figure just as it begins to vanish. Arsenal was suggesting that they lead the people of the underground to the top, but Joker's daughter tells him, leadership is pretty overrated anyways. And Arsenal agrees. Red Hood then asks Arsenal, what would you know? What have you ever led anyone? But he has. He led Iron Rule, the group that Red Hood fought to get down here.
As Jason and Roy find themselves in a firefight against Hive operatives aboard the USS Excelsior, Roy can only think about one thing. Wearing white is kind of empowering. The two continue to fight off the Hive agents when they begin to hear a siren go off, signaling that everyone up top needs to go down below. Jason says at least everyone knows that they're down here now, and Roy's concern is that they kind of may get shot along with the terrorists. Roy tells him only one problem though. First, Roy needs to disarm the bomb on this Navy vessel. And as Roy turns to look at the bomb, he states, Oh, yeah, about that. Jason looks back at him and he sees it along with Roy. That's a giant bomb. Do you think you can defuse it? And Roy tells him, Nope. I mean, sure, no problem, but mostly no. Nope. However, our story doesn't begin there. Five hours earlier, Jason and Roy went to visit Tara Battleworth regarding their new addition to their team, Joker's Daughter. Tara tells him that having JD along with them is probably not the best thing they could do for their new business, but as long as JD can pass the exam with the doctor that Tara has set up for them, she'll help them out. But while JD is off being evaluated, Roy received a call about a local job and decided that he and Jason should go check it out while they're trying to kill time. The two meet up with Noelle, a woman that works as an analyst for the USS Excelsior, and she explains a call that she received recently. Someone contacted her from some group called called Hive about a job. Jason asks her why doesn't she tell the Navy, but she says that the man also said that they had infiltrated the ranks of the Navy, and she didn't know who else she could call. She then goes on to state that the man said that whatever was going to happen was going to happen soon, maybe even today. So Jason tells her that this really isn't much that they can work off of, but Roy tells her they're going to take the job. Later, Jason and Roy snuck into the Pentagon because Jason wanted to check out how reliable their client was, and as they walked through the scanners, the two guards welcomed Colonel Clink and Admiral Worf, and Roy was surprised at how well that worked. And Jason tells him, remember that guy I worked with? Batman? Thus, that's how they got on the boat with the Hive agents all over them. Jason continues to fight off the oncoming Hive agents while Roy continues to work on the bomb, and Jason says that he wished that he knew at least what kind of bomb they were working with. And among the fallen Hive agents, one stands up and tells Jason that all he had to do was ask, imagine a dirty bomb, but instead of radiation, think of one that would embed the thoughts and schemes of all of the brilliant minds of Hive's most brilliant minds. Now imagine that bomb going off on the graduating class of an entire battalion of American soldiers. And Jason tells the man, no thanks, I'm not that imaginative. As the man begins to lean towards Jason, he then sees that the bomb has been turned off, and Jason looks to see Roy has just hit the council with a bunch of his arrows a bunch of times. Jason then tells the Hive agent, Looks like you just got pwned by a guy that wears chucker hats. Right! I mean, hey! Roy says. But while JD is being given the okay by the doctors, JD leaves and jumps into a lake and she swims. When she comes back up, she says, Hello, Daddy! And she puts on the Joker mask, stating that anything Daddy can do, she can do better, darker, and sicker. Later, back home, Roy begins to wake up from a nightmare, one that he's been having a lot more often. He remembers the time that he had to leave his mercenary group, the Iron Rule, having to let them die for losing their way by calling an airstrike on them. But why is he thinking about them now? Maybe it's because when he was down in the nethers rescuing JD, the man that he saw was a man named Everest, and he was with Iron Rule. Of course, this makes Roy realize that they're back. Elsewhere, Jason and JD go have a talk about how the doctor visit went, and how JD is looking forward to this fresh new start in her life. Jason tells her that Roy and Tara think that she's crazy, and he asks if she's sure she's ready, to which she replies, absolutely. Jason then begins to tell JD a story. His mother used to smoke, but his father used to hit her for it, and his mother could never understand how he would always find out. Well, it's because she used to smell. She never noticed it. He then reaches into his coat, and he pulls out the Joker mask that JD took back, and asks, does she know how bad the sewage-treated human flesh mask smells? The only thing Jason wants to know if this was all a lie from day one, and JD tells him no, but that's when she begins to laugh. <laughs> she then asks if he minds if she puts it back on, and then she tries to hug Jason, telling them not to fight. She shoves him back, taking his gun and pointing it right at his head, and she tells him to join her. Together they can burn Gotham to the ground, and he tells her he's sorry. She begins to ask for what as she begins to open fire on him, and he knocks the gun away from her and then kicks her off the goalpost that they were sitting on. As she lands, Jason fires one shot, hitting JD. She looks up bloodied and tells him, You shot me! Awesome! Jason then tells her that if it isn't obvious, she's fired. And back in the city, Roy begins to look for clues as to where Iron Rule may be hiding out. But as he walks down an alley, he begins to feel something, like he's being watched. And as he turns to draw his bow, he asks how he could not have seen this coming, when above him, stood Iron Rule, infected and changed from the radiation from the airstrike bomb that he called on them long ago. With Iron Rule capturing Roy and bringing him to the edge of death, they have one question for the internet as they stream the torture. Should Roy live or die? And the votes begin to come in, and everyone voted to die. 
With JD being shot, Jason stands by when he gets a call from Barbara Gordon, informing him of Roy's internet situation. But as Jason begins to leave to find Roy, the ambulance with JD begins to head towards the hospital. As the ambulance drives down the road, a hand reaches out of the sewer, knocking over all of the cars, and the ambulance flips over. As JD sits up in the tipped over ambulance, she begins to yell out, again, again. But from the outside, Everest helps JD out asking, you okay, boss? As she tells him, never better. But it would have been nice to have been rescued before getting shot. Back with Jason, he begins to search Roy's place for some clues as to where Iron Rule may have taken him. Jason then begins to find something that Roy crafted, something called a boomerang arrow. And with this, he'll be able to find Roy's quiver. As Jason begins to follow the signal back to his quiver, he notices a box with a biohazard symbol on it. And if this is what Jason thinks it is, it may have just saved his life. But back with Roy, he begins to wake up and the first thing that he sees is JD. Roy asks her how she found him. Furthermore, be careful because Iron Rule is around. But JD cuts him off, telling him that they are no match for the two of them. Let's get you out of here, Roy. Roy tells her, thank God that he was wrong about her and she stops him. Psych! Roy looks down to see JD holding a gun at Tara Battleworth's head. Roy tells her to let her go. She's not a part of this, but JD tells him that he's wrong. She very much is. She made Roy and Jason into respectable men, but the truth is, they are just as bad as JD. But before JD can pull the trigger, Jason appears on the screens around them, telling them all that they have five seconds to give up. And he begins counting down to one. As he counts to one, the lights go out and JD begins to laugh. <laughs> and then she asks, is it me or did it just get really hot in here? Everest begins to call out to Jason as he puts his hand closer to Roy, and then Everest is shot with an arrow, and Roy looks at him. Uh oh! Everest yells that he's basically a walking nuclear power plant. So what is this little arrow supposed to do? And Roy closes his eyes and begins to count backwards, when suddenly a small explosion goes off, and Everest begins to melt away. Roy yells that those arrows were supposed to put out nuclear energy, not be used on people. But one by one, Jason begins to shoot the rest of Iron Rule at them until only B is left. B quickly unties Roy and states that he's free, and Roy tells Jason not to kill her. The only reason that they are this way is because of him. And Jason tells Roy that he did his fair share of bad things, but nothing compared to them. As Jason holds the bow to her, Roy states that they are better than this. And Jason tells him, you're better than this. I, however, am not. Roy then elbows B, knocking her out and asks, Now what? You're not gonna shoot her while she's unconscious. And Roy's right. So Jason puts the bow down and states, Fine, you win. But she does go to jail. Then JD appears in the monitors, telling the internet, Oh my god, these two are so adorable! I almost don't want to kill them! Jason then turns his gun to JD while she holds a gun down on Tara and tells her that he was being nice shooting her in the shoulder before. Next time it's gonna be between her eyes. And Roy tells everyone to put their guns down. But while Jason and JD continue to talk, Roy shoots JD with a taser arrow knocking her out. Roy then looks back at Jason and he asks him, what the hell was that? Talk about overkill. You just killed four people with the world watching. No one is gonna hire us again. Jason tells him to grow up. Over 300,000 people you don't know just voted to kill you for fun because they could. Do you really think I give a damn what they think about us or me? Jason turns to the camera and he tells everyone the show's over and he shoots out the camera. Jason then goes on to state that this whole thing was never going to work. This thing with them. Roy has too much faith in people while Jason doesn't have any in people. Before leaving, Jason tells him that he won't ever be the hero that Roy wants him to be, but he will be the hero that Jason knows that he is. And he walks off to leave Roy to think about what to do next. Many years ago, Jason Todd found himself at Ma Gunn's school for wayward boys, the one that Bruce suggested he enroll into. Except at that time, Ma was actually using the school to recruit juvenile delinquents and make them into little soldiers. As Jason runs at Ma, who was holding a gun to Bruce, he tells himself that Batman could have totally handled this himself, but running her out of the window would be so much more fun. Now, in the current time, Jason finds himself doing the same thing, except this time he's not taking down Ma Gun, he's rescuing her from a building that's exploding. And as the building begins to explode, the blast sends both Jason and Ma tumbling outside. As she catches her breath, Jason sits with her asking, why would anyone want to do this? Ma tells him that she knows exactly why and who. Not knowing that she's talking to Jason, she tells him that long ago, she used Gotham's foster system to recruit her criminal enterprise. Though she recently got out of prison, she figured that she would pick up where she left off. And then she met with an old associate who was building an empire while she was away. That man was Black Mask, and she just declined his offer to go work for him. Jason says that she's lucky that he happened to be in the area. And Ma says that that's not the worst part. There was a holdup in her licensing for foster care. Right now, that building was supposed to be filled with children, but Black Mask couldn't have known that. So this wasn't supposed to be a warning, it was supposed to be a massacre. Later, Jason heads back to his hideout, pulling out all of the information that he has on Black Mask. His name is Roman Sionis, 
Born into a powerful crime family, he killed his own parents and he did a lot of black market stuff and now he's cutting down on his competition. Not long ago, Jason stopped a virus that Roman had used against the mayor. And the way it went down, it looked like it was supposed to be an execution. Afterwards, one of Roman's men offered Jason a job of working with them, thinking that he had actually killed the mayor. Jason decided that he would take up Roman on his offer, and he would shoot his way into Roman's car. He jumps through the windshield, kicking the driver and holding a gun to the passenger, and he tells Roman that he got his card. Roman begins clapping, stating, This is splendid! You're everything that I thought you would be! A little while later, Roman takes Jason to the top of the building to look over Gotham and he says that he was never one for dating when he was younger. If there was one thing that he learned, it was that people will always let you down. But a woman like Gotham, she's forever. She's been so mistreated over the years by people who used her like a doormat. And as Roman goes on, he tells Jason that the reason he wanted to meet him, it was because he wanted someone like him to be his second in command. An heir, really. The only reason Jason agrees to help Roman is because he's building a case against Roman since he was the one who infected the mayor with the virus. Roman then takes Jason down to the streets where four of his henchmen are, telling Jason, These men failed in killing someone, so I would like you to make examples out of them. Jason tells him, Are you asking me to kill these people? I'm gonna have to pass. And so should you, mainly because dead men make lousy henchmen. The men try to plead that it wasn't their fault that they couldn't kill Ma Gunn, but then Roman tells Jason, I respect your reason, and he presses a button. The men's heads all then explode, and Roman says that he has a business to run, though he does like a man who follows his own moral code. A little while later, Roman sends Jason to acquire something that is a game changer from a passing train, even though he didn't say what it was. Jason hits a button as the train gets into position and the brakes on the train come to a screeching halt. He leads some of the other henchmen to secure the cargo and as they get close, the doors from the train car fly off hitting the henchmen. A voice then says, put away the guns, little one. And Jason says that he hopes that nickname doesn't stick. Who the hell are you? The woman steps into the light holding a giant axe, telling him, my name is Artemis. And if you don't put those guns away, I will be the last woman that you ever see. Jason tells her that he's not the biggest fan when it comes to fighting women, and Artemis tells him, Do not worry, I'm not just any woman, I'm an Amazon. Jason points back, stating that the guy back there, Black Mask, he wanted me to grab whatever weapon was on this train, so unless it's you, please step aside. Artemis asks if he actually knows the amount of power that this weapon has. She's been looking for this for years, and it has the power to destroy the entire world. You know, that sounds a little dramatic. I also noticed that you're not wearing any magical bullet deflecting bracelets, so I don't think you really have a say in this. He then fires his gun and Artemis begins deflecting the shots with the axe telling him that she doesn't need any bracelets. In fact, she doesn't even need a weapon to deal with someone so fragile. Jason asks, who are you calling fragile, princess? She throws the axe into the ground telling him, just so we're crystal clear going forward, don't ever call me princess. She picks Jason up and he asks, just out of curiosity, before I die, what is on that train? She tells him that it is something called the Bow of Raw, an ancient artifact of incalculable power. He asks if she intends on selling it, because his boss is more like a crime boss and less of an annihilator of life on Earth type. But as Artemis tells him that he may not know him as well as he thinks, Jason releases his taser in his chest plate, shocking Artemis. Roman then walks up clapping. You are more resourceful and determined than I could have ever imagined. You're gonna make a perfect heir! As Roman walks with Jason, Jason asks if he's going to tell him what's on that train. And Roman tells him, of course, there's no more secrets between us. What's on that train is a cutting edge piece of technology. The future of genetics. As the two walk, Jason notices something and he pushes Roman out of the way as Artemis' axe slams down between them. She runs in grabbing her axe and swings it again, telling Jason, we are not done. And Jason jumps up stating, I'm pretty sure we are. What you're looking for isn't on this train. The henchmen begin opening fire on Artemis, telling Jason that he's covered. But as Artemis runs off, Jason follows stating, I got this. Once Jason and Artemis jump off of a rock, she tells him that he can drop this whole bad guy thing. She's been trained from the womb for battle and she knows someone who's pulling their punches. So Jason explains, all right, maybe I'm not a bad guy, but I'm being a bad guy to try and take down my boss. Maybe we can help each other out here? Artemis tells him, fine. She accepts his terms of surrender. But before Jason can argue that he is not in fact surrendering to her, a helicopter flies in to take away the train car. The henchmen open fire again and Jason jumps, pushing Artemis into the empty train car. As the two of them are looking at the train car flying away, Jason tells her that unless you can fly, we're kind of out of luck here. And Artemis tells him that even though flight eludes her for now, she can cover a great distance in a single bound. Jason realizes that that doesn't mean that he can get into the train car, so he turns to her asking what about himself, but within seconds he's thrown into the train car from the ground. He grabs onto one of the chains of the cargo, and then suddenly there's a giant crash on the side of it. As Jason and Artemis climb onto the cargo, he tells her that she really needs to find a better way to treat her allies. 
They then make their way into the container and Jason says that he has good news and bad news. The good news is that he's pretty sure that this isn't the ancient weapon that she was looking for. The bad news, he's pretty sure he's gonna need her help with this. Artemis looks forward stating, by the gods, is that him? And Jason tells her no, the game changer that Black Mask is referring to is a clone of Superman. Artemis says that she only came to Gotham to retrieve the Bow of Raw, but even she knows how apocalyptic it would be for a criminal mastermind to get his hands on a Superman clone. Roman's voice then tells them, Trust me, the possibilities would be endless! But we can all talk about it once you wake up from the gas that you've been inhaling. The next morning, Jason wakes up and to his surprise, he's in a bed, meaning he's still on Roman's good side, for now. As Jason gets dressed and heads out, Roman says that he's had a long night, taking down an Amazon warrior, luring her into a trap, that's no easy task. Even though he's sorry that both of them had to be put to sleep. Jason tells him, it's all water under the bridge. And Roman walks him out stating, I was waiting until you woke up before I showed you what was gonna happen next. They both take the elevator down, and Roman says that he learned that Lex was planning on destroying this clone, so he figured, why let it be destroyed when he can have it? Roman then tells the scientist to release the clone, and as the water pours out of the container, Jason can't help but feel like what the clone is going through is similar to what happened to him when he woke up in the Lazarus pit. Roman shouts for them to stop because it looks like the air is actually killing the clone. The clone then breaks out of the container, and just as he breathes, his skin turns white and he begins to grow. Jason runs over asking if all of this effort was to capture a failed experiment, and Roman says that it would seem so. Maybe this is why Lex discontinued his experiment. Jason picks up the clone, telling him that it'll be okay. Trust him. Afterwards, the clone is forced to sit and watch videos of Superman. And Roman says that he needs to learn what he's capable of before he can start telling him what to do. But while Jason and Roman watch, Jason says that he would like to try something if he wouldn't mind. Roman tells him not at all, and he'll leave him to it. As Roman walks off, Jason walks into the cell when he sees Artemis in the next cell over. He asks what she's doing here, and she says that she was observing the creature over there, and there is nothing there. Jason tells her that he can't break her out just yet, but he will find a way, and she laughs, stating that that is almost adorable. There is not a cell on Earth that can hold her. But as the two of them talk, they begin to hear the thump on the window, and they see the clone posing like Superman, stating, Pup, pup, away? Jason sneaks off to his hideout to try and get information from LexCorp about this clone. And as he looks through the records, he finds that the clone was named Bizarro. Later that night, he sits with Roman for dinner, and Roman mentions that he took time to try and find out more about him. Though he managed to find a ton of things on Red Hood, he would like to find out some information on the man under the mask. Jason tells him that he's a pretty shy guy, but if he has any questions, he can go ahead and ask. So Roman tells him that he couldn't help but notice the emblem on his chest, and he asks if he had a previous relationship with the Batman. Jason tells him it's nothing, just yanking his chain is all. And after their dinner, Jason decides to try something, and he brings Bizarro a Superman doll. Bizarro looks at the doll and says, Not Superman? Jason tells him that that's right, you're not Superman. And then Bizarro asks, Who am I? Artemis says, Whatever he is, he's a monster. And Bizarro stands up stating, No, me am not monster! Me am not Superman! Me am Bizarro! Bizarro slams Jason against the glass, and as Artemis just stands there, he tells her, It's cool! Don't help me or anything! And she says, The sad thing is, he's doing better talking to him than she expected. Bizarro begins blasting away at the cell, shouting, Too many words! Bizarro confused! And then he slams Jason into the ground, calling him rude. Artemis calls her axe just as Bizarro gets ready to smash down on Jason, but he tells her to wait. Jason holds up the Superman doll, stating, If you don't want to talk to me, that's fine, but you can talk to my friend here. And as Bizarro looks at it, he says, Pop, pop! And Jason says, that's right. Tell me why you're so mad. Bizarro looks at the doll and he tells it, me not mad, me just sad. Everyone thought I was Superman, but I'm not. I'm Bizarro and I'm alone. Jason sits down telling him, it's okay. You're not alone. I'm your friend. And so is this woman over here. Come say hello. Bizarro looks at her. Hello, red her. And Artemis says, hi. While Jason sits with Bizarro, Roman's men ask if they should shoot. And Roman watches telling them, no, let's see how this plays out. Once Bizarro is put back into a new cell, Roman tells Jason to come with him. He would like to share a few things with him. As the two of them walk down the hallways, Roman says that he's sorry that there are no lights here. Bizarro took them out when he went a little crazy. And after a bit more walking, Roman shows Jason a portrait, and he tells him that this was his mother and father. But rather than spending time with him, they spent their time handling their empire. Crushing disappointment, really. Jason asks what happened to them, and Roman says that he saw firsthand what he does to people who have failed him. What does he think happened? Soon, the two of them make their way to a giant storeroom full of weapons, with Artemis following closely behind. Knowing Artemis is close, Jason asks if this storeroom has the thing that Artemis is looking for. The Bow of Raw, maybe? Roman tells him, Sadly, no. I did once have it, but a week ago I sold it back to its original home for profit to the country of Korik. Artemis listens in, and after hearing the location, 
She heads off. As they walk, Roman pulls out a vial telling Jason that here it is. And Jason is confused, asking what is that? Roman says that it's the same virus that he used to control the mayor. The control that he lost during his last assassination attempt. Jason looks at him, realizing that he's just been ousted. How long did you know? And Roman says, I always knew. I knew from the very beginning, the moment I sent the man to give you the card. But together, we can recreate the city in our image. Jason tells him that even though he may agree with him on wanting to get rid of the city of crime, gonna have to pass on this one. Roman takes out a syringe and injects himself and tells Jason, you brought me him, you showed me his worth. And then an explosion goes off behind Roman. And Roman says, and I will rule this city with an iron fist, me and my Bizarro. Bizarro begins charging towards Jason, and as he misses, he runs through the wall and begins to fall outside. As Jason is holding onto Bizarro's cape, he tells him he's trying to fly. He's kind of heading in the wrong direction if he is. The two crash into the fountain below, and with Bizarro knocked out, Jason tells Roman, they don't make Superman knockoffs like they used to, huh? And Roman calls out telling him, it was easy to control the mind of the mayor being an actual person. Bizarro's gonna take me a little bit of work. Jason aims his gun and he lines his sights up right with Roman's head, telling himself, he can end this. Roman is a bad guy. And then he remembers back when Bruce told him that he can only do this his way if he doesn't kill. And with that moment of hesitation, Bizarro jumps up, grabbing Jason, throwing him into a tree. Jason leans back up and he says, ah, I really wasn't using those ribs anyway. And then he notices the tree is somewhat frozen. Bizarro runs up ready to smash down on Jason and Jason tells him, I didn't want to do this, bud. And the tree shatters. And then Bizarro looks down to see Artemis' axe lodged into his chest. Artemis tells Jason that she was leaving town until she heard the sounds of him getting his ass kicked. Bizarro begins struggling, trying to pull the axe out. And Artemis tells him that he's wasting his time. There's no way that he is strong enough to wield an ancient axe of the gods. But as he continues to struggle, Bizarro manages to pull the axe out, breaking off a piece of it. Artemis begins to scream in pain, and as Jason asks what's wrong, she tells him that she was bound to that mystical axe. She too feels its pain. She runs up, calling her axe, punching Bizarro in the head, and launching him across the yard. That felt good, and Jason agrees. It sure did. But Roman up there isn't feeling too good about it. Before Artemis goes back to beating on Bizarro, Jason tells her to do him a favor. Please try not to kill him. Artemis shrugs Jason off, telling him that she'll try not to kill him, but she will not be trying very hard. While Artemis runs back towards Bizarro, Jason heads off in the opposite direction. He remembers back when he had the antidote for the mayor, and he figures that maybe he has enough left to try and snap Bizarro out of this. He opens up the container with the gun and the antidote, and that's when Roman's voice tells him that following him is easier than he thought. Jason opens fire, but while Roman hides around the corner, Jason begins running, and as Roman pokes his head back out, Jason kicks him in the head. Topside, Bizarro asks, what am Red Her doing? As Artemis tries pushing Bizarro back as he walks, she tells him, Me am stopping you, or trying to anyway. Back down below, Roman tells Jason, You're actually kind of a coward. You lack the strength of your convictions. I knew how you wanted to be an outlaw, yet you still follow Batman's ways. He reaches into his coat and he pulls out a gun and he opens fire. The shot knocks Jason back down to the ground and Roman grabs the antidote gun and then he pulls his mask off, telling Jason, you're about to stare into the face of death. Roman pulls out his own gun, pointing it at Jason. And that's when Artemis and Bizarro come crashing down into the hideout. With Roman distracted, Jason pops a knife out of his boot and he kicks Roman in the ankle. Jason gets back up and Roman calls out to Bizarro. And Bizarro throws Artemis at Jason, knocking them both away. As the two crash into the wall, Jason says that he has a plan. And Artemis says that she hopes it's better than every other failed plan that he has come up with since they have met. Jason tells her the longer the virus sits in Roman, the more it rages through his brain. He's just gonna need to keep fighting it long enough for the side effects to take over. The two get back running into the fight and Artemis tells him, sure, but this time you can handle Bizarro while I'll handle Roman. With no answer from Jason, she tells him to relax. She's only joking. Artemis then kicks Bizarro telling him, I'm sorry for this. And he responds with, Red her not seem sorry. Jason jumps on top of Roman, punching him down to the ground. And as Roman tries to taunt him, he screams out in pain. And that's when Jason realizes the side effects are kicking in. There we go. Roman leans up speaking in a different language. He begins to crawl towards Jason, telling him to give him the cure. And that's when Artemis sees Bizarro in pain and tries to subdue him, asking if it's helping. And he says, maybe, it mostly just hurts. Roman then says the language is Kryptonian. He can see it. He can see everything. Even how his love for Gotham means nothing in the great vastness of the cosmos. Jason then hits Roman on the head with his gun, telling him, who would have thought hijacking an alien clone was a bad idea? Roman falls over as he begins to foam at the mouth, begging for the cure. Jason takes the antidote out of the gun and crushes it. Jason walks off stating how he would love to take credit for taking him down, but he really has no one to blame but himself here. 
back over with Artemis and Bizarro. Bizarro gets ready to smash Artemis, and as she braces for the hit, Bizarro leans down, brushing the rocks off of her, telling her, Me, I'm sorry. Am you okay? She tells him, of course, she's an Amazon, for goddess sake, but what happened? And he says, Me not sure. Batman and Bizarro's head, then poof, gone. The three begin to crawl out of the wrecked hideout, and Artemis says that she's happy that everything has been taken care of, but she really has to go. Jason tells her to hang on a second. She doesn't have to be down there on her own. It's not like they don't know her one. She continues walking, stating that this quest is more than just honor. It's personal, and she cannot ask them to join her. She will get back the Bow of Raw. Bizarro says, Bizarro, I am confused. We am not joined already? And Artemis stops. Fine, you can help. But afterwards, we go our separate ways. However, several days later, someone begins putting together pictures of Jason, Artemis, and Bizarro. The person cuts out one more article and he pins Dark Trinity to the boards of pictures. And he says, I love it! Over on the city limits, Bruce pulls up to find Jason and he asks him to tell him the truth. What happened to Roman? Jason tells him to not get his bat panties in a bunch. He kept his word he didn't kill him. In fact, he actually didn't do anything at all. Jason then turns to Batman telling him, That's the last time I play by your rules though. I tried it your way and it totally sucks. Bruce pulls down his hood, and Jason asks if he's going to be okay with them not being like him. And Bruce says, There's already a Batman, and a Wonder Woman, and a Superman. Jason then asks if Batman's okay with him having Bizarro. And Bruce tells him, The last person who owned a Bizarro was an evil megalomaniac. But the two did save the world. And Jason tells him, Fine. But last question, You hungry? The two begin to sit and eat their burgers, and Bruce says the world has enough heroes. Maybe they can have a few outlaws. But seriously, where's Roman? Jason says that he's just over with a mutual friend of theirs. And over at Ma Gunn's home for the criminally impaired, Ma begins feeding Roman, telling him to come and eat his num-nums. Certainly, he wouldn't want to make her mad, would he? Now with Black Mask gone, Jason and Bizarro decide that they're going to help Artemis as she hunts down the Bow of Raw. There's a little problem. Bizarro's a little out of control. While Artemis is searching for leads, Jason figured that it was time to clean out the last of Black Mask's crew. So he sits in a warehouse full of Black Mask's thugs, and he tells them that they all had it pretty easy, smuggling drugs. But now, he's in charge. And as of right now, they can all consider themselves out of business, and they should probably get out of Gotham so they can live to see the next morning. One of the thugs pulls out a gun and points it at Jason, asking, What is it you're going to do about it? And Jason sits back, telling him, Not a damn thing. My friend, though, that's a different story. The thug's arms all begin to freeze over, and Bizarro jumps in, smashing the ground, shouting, Me, I'm friend, he referenced! The two begin beating and taking out the rest of the thugs, and Jason asks, What did I say about being too mean? Bizarro drops one of the thugs that he was crushing and says, Not so hard, me, I'm sorry, read him. But just as Jason finishes knocking out another thug, the wall bursts open and Jason is thrown across the room. Bizarro catches Jason, telling him, Me am looking forward to crushing anyone who hurt Bizarro's only friend, besides Red Her, and Pup Pup. Jason looks back to see Killer Croc, and he says that he's pretty sure that Killer Croc joined the Suicide Squad. So why is he here? Bizarro's eyes begin to glow, and then he fires an ice blast, freezing over Croc's head. Jason shouts for him not to do it, but Bizarro takes both of his hands, and he punches Croc's head off. As Croc's body falls, everyone sees the mechanical parts, and the last remaining thug says that he didn't know he was buying a synthetic Croc. As the two leave, Jason asks Bizarro if he knew it was a robot. Be honest about it. Bizarro hangs his head telling him, Sure, Bizarro knew. Me knew. A short while later, at their hideout at Ma Gunn's home for the criminally infirmed, Jason asks if he's crazy for feeling bad about yelling at Bizarro. Artemis tells him that she supported his decision to try and work with Bizarro, so whatever his problems are, they are equally her problems too, which brings her to her next topic. While looking for leads on the bow, she managed to get into a computer archive for LexCorp and thought that Jason would want to see this. A video begins to play as a scientist from LexCorp goes over explaining the wonders of working on a genetic clone. As the dates and the reports go on, the scientist starts to state that things have gone all wrong, and there's no real way to make a perfect clone. In fact, the project that they are working on could lead to an apocalyptic event given the abilities of these clones. They could grow physically, but not mentally, and soon they would be a small tantrum away from being thrown into the sun. The video goes on showing Bizarro's killing some of the other scientists, and Lex telling them to destroy everything. None of this ever happened. Jason asks if he did the right thing by bringing Bizarro back with them, and Artemis says that that's not really the question. The correct question would be if he trusts himself to do the right thing when it matters. Jason then asks if she's trying to state that they should kill Bizarro before he can kill them, and Artemis says no. 
She does not believe that her life is any more important than any others. But there are a lot of innocent people who may not have the types of resources that they have. What do they owe with them? A little while later, Jason takes Bizarro out to a lake. And he tells himself what he just took from Bruce was something that he had kept in case he had to kill his own friend. As the two lay down, they talk about the world and how pretty things could be. Jason goes on stating how being raised in Gotham, it could easily make you hate the world when the only thing that you knew was a small portion of it. Bizarro tells him, Sorrow not hate world. Even when in glass room, me had memories. A better place. Man and woman sending me away from world on fire. Another man and woman loving me. And as Bizarro talks, Jason loads a kryptonite bullet into his gun. Bizarro continues telling his story though. Friends, secrets, truth and justice, American way. But me not stupid. Am not me memories. Never mind. Bizarro's real memories not start until read him and read her. Jason points his gun at the back of Bizarro's head and Bizarro continues. Bizarro am not perfect, but read him show him how. And me promise to be best Bizarro me can be. Jason stands there with his gun aimed at the back of Bizarro's head. And he puts it away, stating, It's late. We should get back, Bizarro. Bizarro asks him, could Red him stay longer? Me like this place. And so, Jason sits with Bizarro as the two watch the sunset. As the bartender hands Jason a glass, he tells him that he really doesn't care who he is, even if he is going to make a name for himself being the bad guy. But around this place, he's just another customer. A customer who hasn't earned the right to ask about a regular like Mr. Stirk. Jason tells him that he's just trying to hire the guy, not looking for any trouble or anything. Artemis says that actually, that would be her. And the bartender asks, who exactly would you be? Artemis spins back, smashing a glass into one of the many villains surrounding them and shouts, she is the one looking for trouble. As the entire bar breaks out into a fight, Jason and Artemis make short work taking out the thugs until one calls out, sister, to Artemis. When Artemis turns back, she sees her friend Akilla, and she asks, by the goddess how? Akilla asks if she really thought death would stop the Shimtar, as she pulls an arrow out of her bow. Jason cracks her in the back of the head, telling her, Yeah, yeah, no one is buying the whole shape-shifting Sturk thing. As Sturk starts to change back into his own form, Jason says, So, what's the deal? Sturk obviously shown you an image of someone that you knew. And Artemis says, What is that expression that you people have? None of your business. Artemis pours herself a drink and downs it in one gulp. She says that her name is a killer. They were best friends growing up, both trying to hone their skills in combat so that they could become the one true protector, the Shimtar. However, Akilla didn't believe fighting for a pantheon that she felt had long ago abandoned them. The place that they were staying, Bana Maidal, was a haven for warrior women who had left Themyscira when a foremother had fallen out of favor with Queen Hippolyta. One day, Akilla vanished into thin air, disappearing without a word, and then weeks later, she just appeared. When she was found, she knew that she had changed. She had been summoned. She couldn't speak of anything because she was duty bound by the gods. Time passed and one night the village was attacked and Akilla defended it using the bow of Ra. That's when she appeared, Diana of Themyscira. She had come to stop Akilla from using the bow's destructive powers. All she wanted to do was protect the sister that she loved. So Artemis attacked Diana, but knowing what she knows now, she would have rather welcomed Diana's help. The bow had changed Akilla, changed her into something that could kill everyone. And in the end, she stood with Diana, and it was by her hand that she killed Akilla. Artemis looks at her glass, saying that the bow was thought to have been lost in the conflict, reclaimed by the gods, or so her and Diana thought. Jason tells her that they need to go find it, and Artemis slams her glass down, telling her, Let's. As Jason and Artemis fly to Karak, they watch a news report about how General Ahmed Haneli, a self-appointed dictator, has bombed his countrymen when they attempted to flee to the neighboring countries. The news says that the attack was something unidentified, but Artemis says that the power that they just saw was the power of the Bow of Ra. And Jason adds that Black Mask did say that he sold it to someone in Karak. Jason tells her that magic isn't what it used to be. Maybe Heleni found a way to use it. Pray to all of the gods of every pantheon that this isn't the case. Humans, a man in particular, cannot be trusted with the destructive power of the sun. Her and Akilla had trained their whole lives to become the defenders of their people, the ones who could even use the bow. And if the power drove Akilla mad, what chance does a mortal have? But before Artemis can say another word, the plane receives a transmission from Haneli, telling them that they are in a no-fly zone. They must turn back or they will be shot out of the sky. They've already witnessed the power that he's capable of. Jason grabs the radio, telling him, Sorry, 
but orders aren't really our strong suit. Tell your minions to lock and load. Artemis says that that was rather bold, and Jason tells her, Relax! It's not anything that Bizarro can't handle. Outside the plane, Bizarro sinks, as he sees a missile heading straight for him and then explodes. As the smoke clears, he tells them, Hmm, that am rude. He lets go of the plane to chase the jets that are after them. As the plane starts to fall, Artemis hits the roof, stating that they couldn't just steal a plane that flew. Jason had to make Bizarro feel useful, huh? Bizarro shoots over to the fighter jets chasing them, and he begins to tear apart the planes, asking, There! How am you like it? Back at the falling plane, Jason says, Look, Bizarro let the pilots escape! Kinda feels like we're having a positive effect on the guy! Bizarro quickly flies back over, catching the plane, and as a bright light shines, Bizarro says, Me am back, but me am confused. It am nighttime, where did sun come from? Another explosion goes off, sending everyone to the ground, and a short while later, Jason wakes up covered in ice. He zaps the ice off, breaking out, stating that he's so done crawling out of graves. But thanks to Bizarro, wherever you are, he's okay. Suddenly, rifles are thrusted into Jason's face, and he tells them, Look, how about we don't do something that you are going to regret later? Elsewhere, Bizarro begins to feel a stick pointing his face, and when his eyes open, he shouts, Reds! Bizarro, I'm save you! And when he sees that he landed in the middle of a town with strange people around him, he says, Bizarro, I am not have any idea what is going on. As usual, <sighs> The next morning, Jason wakes up in his cell and the soldiers guarding him tell him that they know that he's an American, which makes him stubborn and arrogant. He needs to tell them why he's here. Jason says that he'll only talk to the general, not his lackeys. And one of the men tells him, look, we decide whether he sees you or not, so give us something to work with. Jason looks out the bars of his cell telling them, fine, I have a history here. I once died. A man sent me on a wild goose chase to find my birth mother, and then I was nearly beaten to death and blown up. As Jason goes on, he trails off, seeing the old destroyed building that he was left in. And then he turns back to the soldiers, asking, Is this just another one of Joker's games? One of the guards asks, What the hell are you even talking about? And another says, Look at his eyes. That's the eyes of a crazy man. Jason then shoes off the guards, telling them that they're gonna have to find the pasty-faced freak if you want me. I'll be right here. If not, go get the general. As the guards leave, Jason sees himself as Robin. The young Jason asking, This is what you became? Maybe I would have preferred death. Jason leans against the wall, telling them, Yeah, maybe. In another part of the country, Artemis is bound and chained. And even before she opens her eyes, she knows the smell. The smell of a thousand men never fades. But the voice that she can hear shouldn't be alive. Artemis opens her eyes and sees Akilla with her war axe, and she shouts, I have killed you! Akilla says, We shouldn't dwell on the past, but we're together again. And all is as it should be. Now it's time to save the world, Artemis! Later, Artemis stands in a chamber with other Amazonian women. They all begin toasting, telling Artemis that they have heard a great many things from Akilla. Artemis turns to the groups, telling them, I, I need a moment. And in the back of her mind, she knows that she can't stay. She needs to find Jason and Bizarro. Akilla follows up behind her, telling her that she's sorry for stringing her up and stealing her beloved axe. She just needed time to explain. Artemis looks out at the restored city and says that that isn't the problem. What she wants to know is how their home is even here. Akilla says that Ra doesn't explain his ways to her so they should just take a moment and be grateful. Welcome back, little sister. Meanwhile, out in the desert, the young boy Olan is hanging off of Bizarro's shoulders, asking if he's sure that this is where he wants to take them. Bizarro tells him, Yes, you am wanting to be free. Me am bringing you to the Reds. They am way smarter than Bizarro. As Bizarro looks in the mountain right in front of them, he then adds, What a problem! One of the men in the group shouts, what is he, stupid? There's a mountain in our way. But before he could go on, a voice calls out to the refugees, telling everyone to stop. They are in violation of the general's orders. Suddenly, an attack helicopter flies by, firing into the crowd, telling them this is their final warning. Bizarro uses his freeze abilities, hitting the helicopter, telling them, Here am your final warning! Bizarro, do not do warning! Bizarro does mad! All of the refugees begin to run away from the helicopter, but before it can crash, Bizarro catches it, telling them, Bizarro might not be as smart as Red him, but me am not stupid. After throwing the helicopter out of the way, Bizarro turns back to the mountain telling everyone, If mountain am problem, Bizarro will move it. Duh. And then he punches it. Back with Artemis, the two continue to look over Bana Madal, and Artemis asks if she still wants to believe that this is all possible. What is the meaning of gathering these warriors? Akilla holds her glass to the women, telling them that they will reclaim the bow of Ra. The bow was her responsibility. Artemis grabs Akilla's hand, asking, What happened? How are you even alive? And Akilla tells her that it was that man. General Heleni, after recovering the bow, he attempted to use it to no avail. Heleni then researched and looked for someone who could use the bow, and that's when he heard of me. After finding my tomb, he used his technology to bring me back, but I escaped shortly after waking. Artemis turns her head crying, saying that it just tears her up to hear this. And Akilla wipes her tears, telling her, I forgive you no matter what you had to do. 
Ra is bestowing his blessing on the people of Bana Madal, so it is time for them to put an end to the general. Meanwhile, over at Jason's cell, a few more images of his former self flash by, and then he wakes up tied to a chair thinking, so that's why I had the visions. Concussions! As Jason looks up, Hanelli says that he thought keeping him alive would prove useful, perhaps learn how he survived their attack on his plane. Hanelli then turns back, telling the guards to take the American out and shoot him. But as they undo his ropes, Jason quickly knocks them out, grabs a rifle, and points it at the general's neck, asking, what did you mean by there? Because there would mean that you didn't attack my plane. It also would mean that you're not in possession of the bow. Hanelli then pleads, telling him that he doesn't understand. He has to act like he is the one who did this because he doesn't want to show weakness. Yes, at one point he did have the bow, but Black Mask told him that only one person could use it. Jason's eyes widen, saying his partner told him only a Shimtar could wield the bow. She also said that the last one to use it is dead, unless. Back at Bonham Adal, Akilla heads back to her chambers and quietly calls her mistress to her. The bow of Ra begins to form in her hand and Akilla says that in the name of their beloved Ra, soon all will kneel before his power or they will burn. Later as the night goes on, Jason finds himself standing with Anelli and his men as Akilla appears before them, shouting that he would soon rather die before surrendering Karak to them. Jason tells him, man, spoken like a true statesman. Akilla calls out to Hanelli and his men, telling them that she is Akilla, Shimtar of Banamadal, and their reign of terror is finally over. As the Amazons charge down, Artemis grabs Jason, telling him, There you are! Though I never thought you died in the plane crash, I never thought I'd find you on their side. Jason starts fighting back Hanelli's men, telling her, Yeah, I was gonna say the same thing, but there's definitely a perfectly good reason. He says that he doesn't have it. She does. Artemis punches another man, asking, how can you believe those words? And Jason tells her, For starters, if Anelli did have the bow, wouldn't he be using it right about now? Artemis pauses for a moment and says, He must be lying. She runs through the battlefield, grabbing the general, shouting for him to tell her where the bow is before she removes his head from his shoulders. He calls out asking if she really thinks that he would use something to kill his own people. It might be time for her to ask herself who hates Karak, the current leader or their leader? Artemis tightens her grip, telling him, Call off your men. And Hanelli tells her that he will not, he will not leave the mercy of his citizens to their angry goddess. Akilla pulls back on the bow, telling him, so be it. And Hanelli bursts into flames. Akilla then shouts for everyone that in the name of Ra, she commands them all to surrender. Artemis holds out her sword, calling back to Akilla, telling her, you were lying to me. You're the one from the news who killed all of those people. It was you who brought down our plane. As Akilla looks back down, she tells Artemis, I knew I could only deceive you for so long. So once the enemy is destroyed, we will see. Jason says that he's sorry, but they have to do this. People change when they come back from the dead. Trust him. Artemis calls out to her mistress and her battle axe appears. Before anyone can continue fighting, there's a rumble in the ground and then an explosion goes off, causing part of the mountain to fall on Akilla. Bazaar walks out of the hole, scratching his head. Reds, me brought new friends to you. Can er, we go home now? Akilla bursts through the ground, punching into Bazaar, shouting, You can go straight to hell! Bazaar is launched across the battlefield, and Artemis tells the Amazons to take the people to safety. She will handle this. Akilla then releases an arrow towards Artemis and the refugees, stating that these people are only taking up space! Artemis asks herself, How far is Akilla gone? as she braces herself from the hit from the arrow. A fiery blast rips through the land, slamming into Artemis, and once the smoke clears, Akilla walks down asking if she's. Artemis holds out her battle act, telling her, Of course. Of course not. This is her damned mistress, a metal guardian that she does not deserve. A killer reaches out telling her that this is her last chance. Join her, please! And just then Jason appears slashing into Akilla's back with the all blades, telling her that she must be dense. After Akilla turns back and punches Jason down, he says, that must be it for those blades. And then Akilla brings the bow up shouting, just shut up and die. Jason begins shooting, telling her, not a bow. And then Bazaar punches Akilla, shouting, Anyone who hurts Bazaar's friends gets hurt even more! Jason tells Bazaar, Do you remember the thing he said about not hurting people so hard? This is the one time to forget it, man! Akilla starts fighting back, shouting, No science is stronger than the will of Ra. But then Artemis picks up the bow, pulling back three arrows, telling Akilla that it wasn't the axe who saved her. She was once told that a warrior doesn't choose her weapon, it chooses her. Akilla looks back, asking if she has any idea of the horrors that fall on those who do not deserve to wield the bow. And Artemis tells her, yes. She's staring right at her. And she releases the arrows. As they shoot off, Artemis thinks back that it should have incinerated her, as it would to anyone not a Shimtar. But it obeys, and it becomes a part of her. If Ra agreed with Akilla's plight, then his flame would do no harm to her. But clearly, as she is burning, Akilla was mistaken. 
Akilah's beginning to burn, and Bizarro says, Fire Lady getting hotter? Akilah struggles to talk, stating that she can no longer control it. Please, do whatever is right. Artemis says that she won't fail her like she once did. Bizarro. Bizarro grabs a hold of Akilah's body, and as Artemis says her final goodbyes, he rockets into the sky, holding Akilah, allowing Akilah to explode and harm no one. Short while later, Jason asks Artemis if she's okay. And she rests her head on his shoulder, telling him, not at all. After finally landing on the ground, Bizarro gets up, telling the both, Me, me, I'm not feeling so well. Jason then asks, now that she has the bow and assumed the role of Shimtar, does that mean that the outlaws just lost her? Artemis tells him not at all. The people can choose their own Shimtar. The time for her being here has passed. Jason asks, what about the bow of Raw? You're not keeping it, are you? And Artemis says, of course she is. Why wouldn't she? Jason tells her, ah, no reason. Suddenly, Olan's voice cuts through the crowd, shouting for someone. Help! It's Bizarro! His heart's not beating! He's dead! Our story begins in the middle of the Baltic Sea as the captain of the ship says that he's not too comfortable just floating around out here. Dimitri tells the captain that he comes from a wealthy and powerful family, and this is why his humiliation at the hands of the Red Hood cannot stand. They are here to spend as much money as they need to hire the Beast so that he can. The captain stops him. Who? We're here to get the Beast? I'm turning this boat around right now. Dimitri pulls out his gun, telling him, You will do no such thing. And the captain shouts, Go ahead and shoot me! It would be a mercy compared to this. Dimitri looks at him again. The Beast worked for my grandfather. We're practically family. All I'm here to do is talk. Suddenly, explosions begin to go off all across the boat, and bullets fly into every standing person. Through the flames, a man walks out, and Dimitri begs the man, please don't kill him. Beast looks down at him, and he says, You wanted to talk, so talk. Meanwhile, over in Gotham, Dick Grayson sits in the stands of a circus, asking himself, what did Jason get himself into? The ringmaster welcomes everyone to the spectacular show of the World Circus of Russia. With them tonight is the masked marksman with his aim true, and the amazing Amazon, as well as the man of might. An hour later, in the tents, Dick Grayson is knocking on a trailer when a voice shouts, It am unlocked! Dick walks in to find Jason, Artemis, and Bizarro in their trailer, making dinner for the night. Jason says that it looks like he got the message, and Bizarro tells everyone, Mmm, beans am good. Dick says not exactly. He got a text with a longitude and a latitude and a trailer number, so he's here. But sure, they'll go with he got a message. As the boys sit, Bizarro serves Dick a bowl of beans. And Dick then asks, I would really like to know why I'm even here. Artemis asks Jason, did he really just come here without telling him what's going on? And Jason says what? And give him a chance to say no way? No way. But in any case, we're here to deal with the Russians. They're mad for no particular reason, and I can't think of anything else to do other than tell them to get the hell out of Gotham. A week ago, the Russians showed up, but they didn't attack, so I tailed them to the circus, which is why we're here now. And Dick tells him, right. So why am I here exactly? Jason scratches his head, telling himself to just come out with it. Tell him about how Dick Grayson used to be his hero when he was younger, watching him perform, being so free and happy. Jason stutters and instead says, well, since we're at the circus, and Nightwing loves the circus, Dick gets up stretching, telling him, that's my cue. It's great to see you. If the outlaw thing doesn't pan out, maybe you can have a future in the center ring. Jason grumbles, muttering, Fine. I can use another set of eyes on this. These are your kind of people, and I figured that I could use some ha uh, ha uh, help. Dick looks at him. I can get the Titans to help, so... Artemis steps between them, stating, By the seven beards, I've never had a brother, so I don't understand what you two are doing, but clearly everyone wants to work together. Maybe one or both of you can grow the hell up? Dick asks, Is she always this forward? And Jason says, Yeah, sometimes too forward. Suddenly, there's a knock at the door, and the ringmaster shouts that they know the rules. No visitors. Jason tells him that he's not a visitor. They're practically brothers. They worked together before, which is why he thought he'd be perfect to headline the circus tomorrow night. Jason pulls out a clown costume, and he says that he would like to present Flippy Flop, the acrobatic clown. And Dick sighs, telling him, yeah, that's me, all right. As the night goes on, all of the performers gather to share stories when Dick says that it's probably time for him to get some sleep. Artemis tells him that she's sorry to see him go. Shall they walk back to the trailer? And Dick bends down, telling her, how could he refuse? As the two walk off, Jacek mimics them, stating, Maybe you can help me count my muscles. Only if you help me count mine. Could they be more obvious? But as he talks to Bizarro, Bizarro doesn't respond. And Jason sees that he's staring at a woman with a bandana playing the violin. Jason punches Bizarro, telling him, Just go over and say hi. You represent the outlaws. That's an order. Bizarro gets up, but he says, If it's an order... Back with Dick and Artemis, Dick asks her if her and Jason are, you know, together. And she asks, her and Jason? Anyone and Jason? Goddess, that is too funny. She sits down at the step of the trailer, stating that if they really are like brothers, 
How are they both orphans? And Dick tells her, well, they're not really, they just shared a father. Back at the bonfire, Bizarro sits next to the woman playing, and she asks if he's here to make fun of her too. Do the others put him up to this? And he asks, put me where? And the woman says that she's sorry, even at the circus, people can be cruel if you're different. Bizarro then asks, different and bad? To who? And the woman tells him that that is so sweet. She reaches back to undo the bandana, and she asks if he's gonna promise not to laugh, and Bizarro tells her, promise. She pulls down the bandana and says that her name is Angelique, and yes, she was born with the beard. Bizarro tells her, me, my name is Bizarro. You am, are, most beautiful woman me am ever seen. And without even saying a word, she grabs Bizarro and kisses him. As Jason watches, another man speaks up and tells Jason that he's a good friend. Angelique is his daughter, and she's had a bit of a difficult life. Jason then says, welcome to the club, right? And the man laughs. He gets up and he tells Jason that he has some extra work for him and the others. Work that doesn't include the big top, so stop by tomorrow while the new guy is performing. The next night, during Dick's performance, Jason and the others head over to where they want to meet, and they see a group of men surrounding a hole filled with water. The man tells him that this is a bigger job than anyone realized, but down there, remember to take a deep breath. The three jump in and they follow the path until they reach a room. And as they get out of the water, Bizarro asks, Who am? And Jason tells him that he's a little less concerned about who right now, and more about the what. The room is filled with government munitions, and the man standing there tells him that they act as if they've never known a government to hide things near the heart of a city. Jason says that it looks like KG Beast isn't very surprised to see them. And Beast looks back and says, Beast now. Of course I was expecting you. It's much easier to let you come to me than going to look for you to kill. Artemis tells him that that doesn't explain what he's doing here among all of these weapons. And B says that he took this contract. He learned of a renegade US Army Battalion dedicated to destroying Batman. While they were defeated, they apparently left a secret armory behind. He reaches down picking up a weapon and he says, Take this one for example. It could stop a rampaging rhino. Or perhaps even a bizarro. Bizarro shouts, me am not afraid of, and Beast pulls the trigger with a beam shooting, knocking him away. Artemis calls upon her axe and she slices through the barrel of the gun, and Jason follows up, firing as the Beast pushes her back. The three jump on and struggle with the Beast, but before they can stop him, Beast launches his gun hand, causing it to explode, blasting everyone away. Artemis then jumps back into the fight, asking if he really believes that his training is a match for an Amazon, and he takes out a knife, slashing at the sword, telling her, absolutely. Jason fires again, trying to help Artemis, but as he does, Beast holds back Artemis and steps on Jason's head. And as Beast sees his hand freeze, he then asks if this is the work of their Superman facsimile. He takes his frozen arm and he punches it down on Jason's head, shattering the ice, and then he breaks Artemis' guard, throwing his blade, hitting Bizarro in the head. He walks over, attaching his gun hand back, telling them, It's interesting. You call yourselves the outlaws, but you're doing good. Fortunate for you, I shall grant you the honor of a quick death. And that's when Dick Grayson jumps on Beast's shoulders asking, do I get a vote? Because I'm gonna go on the side that there are no deaths, including yours. Beast says, every time I come back to the city, I forget how much I truly hate this place. He then grabs Dick throwing him, and before hitting the ground, Dick reaches out grabbing Bizarro's arm, swinging back to allow both him and Jason to land with hard hitting punches. The Beast stumbles back and then he starts to get back up and Jason says, honestly, I was kinda hoping that would take him out. Just as they prepare to attack again, Artemis Bizarro leap through, beating Beast into the ground. And Dick says, all right, that did it. And Jason tells him, of course, we wore him out for you guys though. Bizarro says, right. And Artemis tells him that even Bizarro is not falling for that one. A short while later, as the police arrive, Dick says that if they want to help, they can go talk to the cops while he speaks with Argus. And Jason tells him, yeah, about that. We're supposed to be outlaws and all. And Dick says, oh, that's right. It's just you do such good things that I forget that you're one of the bad guys. The two shake hands and Dick says, it's really nice to see you and how you're being a better big brother to Bizarro than I was to you, Jason. Jason tells him, you did okay. You deserve more credit than I could ever give you credit for. Dick then jumps off the ledge telling him that he's going to assume it's pointless to tell him to stay out of trouble, right? Artemis watches and asks, he didn't even say goodbye. And Jason asks, missing your boyfriend already? Artemis laughs telling her and Nightwing, goddess you are a scream. And Bizarro says, Bizarro kissed bearded lady more than once. Jason tells him, that's good, did you get her number? And Bizarro tells him, yes, eight. And Jason tells him that they're gonna talk about this when they get home. After having escaped the events of Karak, the outlaws turned to the only place that they knew that could keep Bizarro safe, Ma Gun's home for the criminally infirmed. As Artemis wipes the sweat from his forehead, she says that Bizarro is going to need to be in a hospital at the very least. And Ma Gun tells her that they're going to do their best for the circumstances that they have. They are international war criminals now, Artemis, Red Hood, and Bizarro. While Bizarro sleeps with his favorite doll, Pop Pop, Jason holds his hand, telling him, Hang in there, buddy. Everything's gonna be fine. 
Artemis asks, why would you lie to him at a time like this? But Ma Gun tells him that if what they want to do is their banter, take it at least to the living room. She was a surgeon in the MASH unit during the Korean War, so she knows her way around a human body. Though she's no xenobiologist, she can tell one thing, and that's that Bizarro's cells are deteriorating at a rapid rate. So let him rest. A short while later, Jason says Black Mask told him that Bizarro had a shelf life. They knew that he was going to die. And Artemis places her hand on Jason's shoulder, telling him, No, it doesn't. It's never easy to watch a friend pass, no matter the circumstances. But before they could go any further, Ma Gun comes into the room and says that they have a problem. The TV continues its report that the escaped Arkham inmate, Solomon Grundy, is rampaging through the annual street fair in the old G-Town neighborhood of Gotham. Jason Cox his gun, stating that it's only five blocks away, and Artemis leans down to give Bizarro a kiss and whispers, May the goddess watch over you, my friend. I'll see you soon. A few moments later in the fair, Solomon grabs a water tank, shouting, Solomon Grundy! Suddenly, this is on his back, and Artemis jumps in, kicking him, shouting, Artemis! Jason tells Artemis to be careful. Do not underestimate this one, and Artemis says, please. Even his. But before she can finish her sentence, Solomon throws a control unit hitting Artemis, and he shouts, Solomon Grundy! Jason tells him, I thought you were your brother Wendell. Well, you should probably get a name tag. Solomon then punches into Jason, knocking him through the attractions. Meanwhile, back at the lab, Ma Gun continues reading Bizarro a story. When he wakes up, he groans, stating, Bren's need, Red's need. Ma Gun asks if he can hear them from here, and Bizarro tells her, Me hear everything, all the time. Ma Gun places her hand on him, saying that he knows that he's sick. If he's to leave now, he won't make it back. He gets up from the table, grabbing his suit, telling her, Yes, me know, but friend's more important. Bizarro then flies off, breaking through the wall, and Ma Gun sighs, telling him, There was a perfectly good door not five feet away. As she sees letters getting scattered to the ground, she notices one for Jason, and she asks, What is Faye doing? Back at the fair, Solomon grabs Jason by the leg and he slams him into the ground. As he gets back up though, Solomon rips a fire hydrant from the ground and holds it above him. This will kill him, Jason has no powers. As Solomon gets ready to swing down, a force shoots by, knocking him back, and Jason yells, Bizarro, stop! Bizarro punches into Solomon as he yells, Solomon Grundy! And Bizarro tells him, yes, me heard. Solomon then grabs a table and cracks it across Bizarro's head and Jason shouts, stand down Bizarro! And Bizarro says, down is opposite of help. As Bizarro looks up, he sees Solomon holding both Jason and Artemis by their throats, and he begins to gather what strength he has left. As he turns his fists into ice blocks, Bizarro rockets forward, punching Solomon, telling him, this is the end of Cinnamon Grumpy. He punches over and over and over, saying, do not hurt Bizarro's. And Jason screams for Bizarro to stop, and he's going to die if he doesn't stop it. And Artemis tells him, that's enough. It's time to go home. Bizarro turns back with sadness in his eyes, telling them, Me, and home. Me here, with you. And then he falls on his back. Jason and Artemis run over, and Bizarro's condition becomes even more visible as he asks, Did me do good, Reds? Jason tells him that he did great, and Artemis says that they would be dead without him. As Bizarro's eyes turn black, he says, Do favor? And Artemis tells him anything. He holds out his hands, and he says, Take care, pop pop. But before Jason can grab his hand, he lays back down and he takes his last breath. Jason gets up strucken with grief and he shouts, he can't be gone, a Lazarus pit. Maybe that'll work, we have to do something. Artemis looks down and drapes a cloth over Bizarro's eyes stating that they can honor the passing of a hero. Let them not shame his sacrifice with tears. Jason stands there telling her, he wasn't just a big lump of Kryptonian DNA, he was my my. Artemis reaches down, grabbing Pup Pup, and the two mourn their loss. As something begins to float down behind them, they turn back and they're shocked and then knocked out. And Lex looks at Bizarro's body, stating, Intriguing. But as Bizarro was closing his eyes, and he was passing on, he began to remember his past. His dad was there, and his mother told him to write to them if he ever learns to write. Kara was yelling, You am bestest cousin ever! And Crypto was panting. As Bizarro's crib lifted off to fly around, he thinks, Bizarro family is weird, even by Bizarro standards. When I came to Earth, I made friends. There was Nightlight, Wet Wet, Go Go, Batman, Rope Lady, and Cyborg. But the more that Bizarro thinks, the more he remembers that those weren't his memories. His memories started somewhere else, here in the womb, 
where God says that Bizarro should die. That moment, Bizarro remembers, was the moment that Lex had shut down the cloning project. And he told everyone to kill the clones. In the current times, Jason asks, did he really make the right choice? Putting all of their trust into a lunatic like Lex. Seriously, what the hell is he even doing to the body of Bizarro? And Artemis tells him that they had no choice. He was the one who created Bizarro. If anyone can save him, it's the world's preeminent mad scientist. Lex then steps out, telling them, nice talk. The truth is, that thing that you call Bizarro is wholly owned and trademarked property of LexCorp. Jason gets up shouting for Lex to call him a thing again, and Artemis stops him telling him that nothing that Lex said was incorrect. We should just listen to what he has to say. Lex tells him, well, yes, this man, the two of you have clearly bonded with, Bizarro. You'll be glad to know that we got his heart beating yet again. At this point, there is a 0.37% chance that I can save him. For anyone else, that would be the impossible, but for me, that's just Tuesday. Lex walks back into his lab and Jason asks if they can see him and Lex says, Soon, until then, I will leave it to the lawyers to settle the matter of ownership after I've pulled off yet another miracle. Jason leans back and says that this is all his fault. Bizarro has been pushing himself from the start to try and make him happy. And Artemis tells him that Bizarro is not a pet. You can't command him to sit or stay. He is his own person and if he wants to help, there is nothing that either of them could have done to tell him otherwise. Jason's eyes stating that he can't even imagine what's going on in Bizarro's brain right now at a time like this. And in Bizarro's mind, many images begin to blend together from the time of his beginning. Everything up to the point of when he was in a test tube, wondering if Bizarro is bizarre because he was born this way, or if he would be normal if he had not spent so much time trapped in the womb. He could remember no air, no air and bad, even for Bizarro. There was a panic, and then him. At the time, he didn't know red yet, and it was the most beautiful thing that he'd ever seen. And then he heard the first words spoken to him. It'll be okay, big guy. Trust me. Someone tried to make Bizarro into Superman. He didn't know who, besides what he was told. Then there was her, Red Her. She let Bizarro know that he wasn't alone. Not really alone. She could leave as she wanted, but she chose not to. She taught him letters, and letters became words, and then finally words let thoughts out of Bizarro's head. At this time, he had never seen her, only felt her with Bizarro's heart. When asked, Artemis told him that if she would have to describe herself, it would be like trying to explain the sun to a blind man. But does he see the color of that man's cape? The videos of Superman playing for Bizarro began to roll by, and then Bizarro said, You call Red. But outside, while Jason and Artemis try to comfort each other, Bizarro thinks, If Bizarro stop, me will miss them. But they will be okay. Back in the real world, Lex looks down at Bizarro's body and he asks if he remembers him. He thinks back to the times that he spent with a clone during Forever Evil. And then he tells Bizarro, no, you're not him. Lex takes out a syringe of green liquid and says that kryptonite injected into Superman's veins would kill him. But since you're the genetic opposite of him, this could save your life instead. He slams the needle down onto Bizarro's chest, telling him that his friend was murdered before he even reached the deteriorative state. So he's going to give him a chance that his friend never had, his Bizarro never had. Do not screw it up. A short while later, Lex leaves the lab, and Jason says that he's not smiling, so it must be bad news. And Lex says that their friend is going to be fine after a brief period of adjustment. Jason says that that sounds unnecessarily cryptic, and Lex tells him, not at all. It will become very self-evident when you see him. With Bizarro no longer being of any use to me, I've signed over the paperwork, giving you, Jason, total custody of him. Lex reaches out to shake hands, and Jason says, out of the kindness of your heart, huh? Lex tells him, nothing I do is out of the kindness of my heart. Jason and Artemis then head back into the labs to see Bizarro whistling while putting something together. And Jason says, Hey there, big guy. How is everything? A mature, sophisticated Bizarro looks back and says, Jason and Artemis, what an absolute pleasure it is to see you again, compatriots. While I am grateful for Lex's efforts on my behalf, I feel totally at ease returning to my domicile. Artemis blankly stares and Jason asks, Uh, what? It's now been several days since Bizarro returned to the Outlaws and he's been busy providing support to Jason and Artemis in the form of making new tools. The first being a pair of rocket packs, allowing Jason and Artemis to fly, which Jason really likes. As the two rocket onto the scene, Jason tells Pig's gang that he's sorry to inform them, but the truck that they're trying to steal does not belong to them. Like, why would you even need $11 million? Artemis shoots out small discs onto the truck, stating that she really hopes Bizarro is correct about the functionality of these devices. And Pig watches, shouting, How dare you do this to me? And Artemis swoops in, asking him if he's never met Red Hood. There isn't much that he won't dare to do. Once the gang is taken down and the car pulls up, Jason asks, Who does this belong to? The window rolls down, and Penguin tells Jason that he's an odd one. 
Why go to all the trouble of saving my money? Jason leans down, pushing a button, and as the truck begins to disappear, Jason tells him, relax, I just teleported it away. It still exists, but now it's under the ownership of the outlaws. Penguin shouts, you're gonna pay for that! And Jason says, well, at least I'll have money now, right? Soon, the police arrive telling Jason and Artemis to freeze or they'll shoot. And as the two of them fly off, Jason tells them, you are already shooting at us, so yeah, we're not gonna stop. Nearby, Bizarro pulls out his earpiece, stating that that went well. But he noticed Ma Gunn walking up holding a letter. Gunn says that she would often receive letters while walking over the kids. These ones are from Jason's late father. She would normally hide the letters that the parents would send over because it was easier to keep control of the kids, but Bizarro places his hand on Ma Gunn's shoulder, telling her, that's all in the past now. We're doing important work. Jason needs to keep his eye on the ball. Gunn tells him, of course, you're right. Thank you for your time. Bizarro tells her, not a problem, but in my mind, I say, no, not yet. Back with the others, Jason and Artemis touch down in Crime Alley, and Artemis comments that she scarcely believes that he grew up in this concrete toilet that they call Crime Alley. Jason says that if you could even call it growing up, but now with Brain Zaro helping us, it feels like we're actually making a difference now. Artemis says that last week his IQ was 30, now it's 300 and climbing with no end in sight. There is reason for her to be cautious over this. As the two of them set down, they feel something pull them up, and suddenly a tractor beam appears, sucking them into the sky. Jason shouts to Bizarro, asking if this is his work, and once the two of them land inside of their new base, Bizarro tells them, yes, and welcome, friends. This is clearly the new and improved secret headquarters, a labor of love from me and my ever-expanding intellect to you. Jason looks around at the giant facility and tells them, uh, yeah, thank you, and you're welcome, maybe? Artemis says this place goes on forever, but how? Why didn't they see this from below? Bizarro explains that it's because of the pan-spatial visual distortion and post-gravity stabilizers. So anyone not inside of the complex sees just another starry night in Gotham. Jason takes off his helmet, telling him, This is amazing! We have our own invisible bat cave over the city! Bizarro steps down from his station, telling him, Please, don't be impressed yet. Allow me the honor of giving you a tour of the facilities. Artemis pauses for a moment and then points back, stating, Wait, how is what? And Bizarro says, Please accept my apologies, Lady Artemis. I should have predicted that this would be a little concerning. Back at the station, another Bizarro sits working on the terminals, and Bizarro explains that this is merely a holographic projection that he leaves behind to operate things. It monitors the parameters of a predictive crime alternate program. Jason tells him, Predictive? Sounds a little too proactive, no? And Artemis says, at least your intent is noble. Bizarro then begins to give a tour of the garage and the war room, but Artemis begins to notice that something is behind a big wooden door. Artemis then asks, what in the seven beards is that thing? I've seen it everywhere, but where does it lead? Bizarro happily runs over, stating, it's not the door that's important, but rather the doorway. He opens it and then walks into Batman's Batcave. Bizarro goes on stating that this is his quantum translocation system. Next, the group walks through the door again, and now they're in Superman's Fortress of Solitude. And Jason asks, Do you even know how much trouble we would be in if they found out that we were here? Bizarro laughs, stating, I can't even imagine. I'm practically his younger brother. We may as well be family anyway. But before they could go on, Bizarro's hologram then reports that they have a situation. Please report back. Down in the sewers below Arkham Asylum, Victor Zaz runs through stating that he's going to get that guard back by making him watch his entire family be slaughtered before him. However, just as he looks at his knife, it begins to freeze and Artemis looks down stating, if you're looking for a new scar, allow her. Later that night, Jason and Bizarro get ready for bed when Bizarro mentions that it seemed that Artemis isn't too thrilled about all of this. Jason tells her that she's a soldier. She likes order and hates change, but she'll come around. As Jason goes to his room, Bizarro says that he'll be coming shortly. He needs to check on something first. Bizarro then sits down at his terminal and on the screen, the original Bizarro, the dumb Bizarro, tells him, You'll know this name not forever, right? And smart Bizarro tells himself, Yes, I know. Meanwhile, over at the Belfry, which is the base that the characters in Detective Comics use, another one of Batman's teams, Batwing tells Batwoman that they may have a bit of a problem. There has been zero crime for three nights in a row. No robberies, assaults, or murders. Not even so much as a cat stuck in a tree. Batwoman asks if that's really a bad thing, and Batwing says that that's not the strange part. He then pushes a button, and on the hollow table is an image of the city and something floating above it. Batwing says that there's an invisible building sitting above us right now. Just as Batwoman asks what it could be, the hologram begins to distort and a message begins to play. If you are reading these words, then you are probably a costumed crime fighter or vigilante. Please be advised that your services are no longer required in Gotham City at this time. Yours, the outlaws. Batwoman stares at the message and she says, 
Red Hood has a lot of explaining to do. Back at the complex, Jason begins telling Artemis a story about how he once kissed Catwoman, and then they flew away in a magical unicorn with dyslexia. Artemis agrees, nodding, and Jason says, You are not even listening. None of what I just said made any sense. I can only assume that you're still obsessed with Bizarro. And Artemis corrects him, stating that she is concerned. Bizarro has been spending more and more time alone in his lab. Bizarro then looks at an image of the human brain and begins to wonder methods of how he can study the cerebral, cerebral zebra cereal bowl? He pauses and screams, no, me no, will not, I will not go back there. Bizarro begins punching the ground in frustration that he's losing his train of thought. And then he notices his hands are covered in mud. A short while later, Jason and Artemis stop by the lab to see Bizarro gone and the ground is covered in clay. Artemis then asks, why would there be clay up here? And Jason tells her, there's only one thing that comes to mind. Over in the belfry, Bizarro sits in a chair stating, I'm impressed. You thought to adapt a device meant to contain clay face so that it may restrain me for the time being. Batwoman says the device will hold as long as they need it for answers. He came to them, but he wasn't very subtle about it. Batwing tells him that he built a veritable fortress, but somehow allowed Clayface to slip in? Why? And Bizarro says that it was because he can simply allow him to. Moments later, Jason and Artemis jump through the dimensional doorway into the Belfry, and Jason asks, This is embarrassing. Did I just burst into a meeting of the Bat Losers Incorporated? Batwoman tells Jason to be quiet. The adults are talking. She'll be with him in a moment. Suddenly, the ground begins to shake, and Clayface begins to wrap himself around Jason and Artemis, trapping them where they stand. Batwoman then turns back to Bizarro, asking what he's doing in Gotham, and Bizarro tells her his job, and apparently yours as well. We plan on eradicating crime here in Gotham, so you're either with us or against us. Azrael looks at Clayface and says that he's looking a little bit more pale for being a pile of mud. And suddenly, everyone hears Artemis shout, Mistress to me! And the giant battle axe tears through the center of Clayface. The axe is thrown into the machine holding Bizarro, and with it weakened, Bizarro breaks free asking if everyone can call it a day now. He then jumps into the fray, punching right into Batwing, and just as he does, Batwoman pulls out a red pill and tosses it into Bizarro's mouth. Bizarro asks, was that a throat lozenge? And Batwoman tells him that it turns all of the oxygen in his lungs to silicone, just long enough to take him down. Jason looks back as Bizarro falls and shouts, he's only a month old, so help me God if you people heard him. But as he finishes, Batwing tases him, telling him, Bizarro did start this. That sounded really immature when I said it out loud. Clayface then punches Artemis in the face, knocking her out. And Azrael then asks, what do they do now? And Batwoman says the only thing that they can do, call her. As John Constantine smokes his cigarette in the dark, foggy night of Gotham, he sighs, saying, Come to Gotham, you say. Now, it's urgent, he says. As Atana walks up, she says that she thought she smelled tar in the air. And John tells her, Well, well, stockings, long time, no restraining order. And then a football player shuffles out, stating, Help me. So Satana says, Okay. Suddenly, Dead Man jumps out of the back of the football player, asking, How do you like my new ride? Traded in for the old one. A leg had gone green and moldy. Satana then asks, why are the three of them here? Why are the Justice League dark here? And then a door opens. Batman tells the group, I'm glad you came. You should know that I wouldn't have called you together unless I absolutely had to. Unless they absolutely had to. Behind him, Diana struggles with her lasso, telling him, not a moment too soon. And John laughs, stating that Zatanna and Wonder Woman are in the same room. Be still, my beating libido. Then shouting fills the room, and Dead Man asks who's the screamer. And a demonically possessed Red Hood yells, I hate you! Kill you all! The bat will pay! Batman tells them, His name is Red Hood, and once, long ago, he was Robin. Superman then says this power that has Red Hood has something to do with a magical pool of pure evil called the Pandora Pit. Jason Blood couldn't control it and almost died trying. Dead Man floats close by asking, What if I was to possess him? Kick out whatever's in there and we can bind it. Red Hood yells, You will fail! And Batman says, Save him. Be careful. Dead Man starts to enter into Red Hood's head, and he says, I'm already dead. What's the worst that could happen, Batman? Soon the room falls silent, and everyone stands around Red Hood waiting. Superman asks, Did it work? And just as he says, that energy shoots out of Red Hood's eyes and mouth. Dead Man tries to escape, shouting, I can't control it! It's too powerful! And as everyone tries to help pull Dead Man out, the demons inside of Red Hood pull back, and they take Zatanna with them. Red Hood leans up, stating, Magic shall rule, the Trinity shall die, and the new age of darkness will come. This cannot be stopped. John gets up, stating, Sorry, Bats. Shame it didn't work, huh? Guess it's time to be off. As Superman stops him, telling him, No, you won't. You're going to save them because it's the right thing to do, Constantine. 
John tells him, look, this is kind of outside scope, all right? Whatever's in there is some serious crap. Diana tightens her lasso, stating that he would do best to end this charade. She can see it in his eyes, the lives that he's lived. Beneath the sarcasm, there is some good. The room falls silent and John says, I really hate action figures. As he starts to draw a circle on the ground, Red Hood shouts, You will never find the Pandora Pits! There is a map and only she has it! Once John is gone, he tells Superman that he's going to need some of that brute strength to pull the demon's mouth open. And once John starts to get in, he says, There's an ancient god stuff map to these bits, and she has it. So I'm going to guess that at least one of you know who she is, and it's probably the only Amazon delivery that I'd like to get. Diana grips the lasso and says, Cersei. Cersei is behind this. Suddenly the roof begins to crumble and the demonically possessed Bizarro and Artemis crash through. And Diana shouts, they found us! Superman tells John that he has to hurry and as John ducks in, Red Hood chomps down telling him, you have no idea the power that you're messing with. Bizarro punches into Superman telling him, demon Bizarro, I'm not eat your soul! As Artemis lunges for Diana, Batman jumps back in to block the attack and Artemis tells him, kiss Artemis. As Superman fights back, Bizarro hits him one more time, knocking him into Diana, ultimately loosening her grip on Red Hood. She tries to grab the lasso, but Red Hood gets up from the table, stating, There must be a sacrifice to release the army that is waiting. Three sacrifices, a trinity to kill a trinity. In the not-so-distant past of the Pandora Pits, Cersei, along with Ra's al Ghul, tells Red Hood and the outlaws that they are friends here. They have great plans together. Red Hood tells her that she better start explaining or he's gonna start shooting. And Cersei goes on telling him, You have no say in this matter. Everything that has come is fated. We've invited you here as a trinity just as you are. Roz then says, I tire of this. An immortal life can only sustain so much annoyance. First Luther walks away from this plan and now this. Make good on your promise, woman. Suddenly, Annie Man and League Assassin jump out of the shadows and Cersei tells Roz now. He throws three knives, each hitting Red Hood, Artemis, and Bizarro, and their blood spills into the Pandora pits when a massive energy force reaches out grabbing them. All three are pulled down into the Pandora pits and Cersei tells them, You should all be thanking us. After all, we're giving you your heart's desire. Back in the current times, Red Hood grabs Batman by the throat, telling him, He gave into this position willingly. Now he will do what he's always wanted to do. He will finally kill the Batman. While Superman and Diana fight against their counterparts, Batman slips from Red Hood's grasp, escaping into the mansion's basement. He says, To come out, let me help. We can get you through this. And Red Hood's voice calls from the shadows, telling him, Admit it, you wanted him dead, all because he wasn't like Dick Grayson. Picking him up was a rebound choice. Too angry, not like he was. Batman quietly tells him, Shut up. And Red Hood continues to taunt him until he springs from the ceiling down onto Batman. Red Hood pulls Batman's face close and he tells him, You didn't want to save him. You're the true demon here, always have been. Just before Red Hood can twist Batman's neck and arm shoots through the ceiling and Superman pulls Red Hood out by his leg, throwing him into the second floor. As Superman helps Batman up, Batman asks, Where are Bizarro and Artemis? And Diana tells him, They are gone, along with the tiny demons. And Superman adds that he can hear their screams. While the three of them run towards the city, Batman says that this isn't Roz's game. Why would Cersei be doing this? And Diana tells him that Cersei is trying to sacrifice them to gain whatever is inside those Pandora pits. But there is more than that. With Cersei, there is always more. Meanwhile, in another part of the world, John falls from the sky into a snowy mountainside, stating that this is what he gets for jumping through magical portals into demonic superheroes' big mouths. He tries to light a cigarette in the wind, and just as he finally gets it to light up, he shouts it's magic. A giant demon face then appears roaring at him. He asks, came out for a smoke too, huh? And the demon swings an axe that phases through John. The giant demon falls over the ledge and John tells him, Magic's all about misdirection, you know. Now, where were we? Mountains, big snowy mountains, trans-Antarctic range if I'd have to guess. North Victoria land near Cape Roberts. He begins walking into a cave and he looks around the corner when he sees three pits. And he says that he's going to guess that those are the Pandora pits. He's nothing if not observant. Down below, Cersei laughs, stating, This is unexpected. It seems the Pandora Pits offer us unexpected gifts. From the pits, both Zantana and Deadman rise, and Roz grabs his knife, shouting, This will not help us. Their sacrifice will not usher in the power of these pits. He swings his knife, and John runs down, shouting, Whoa, 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 hang on! I really didn't think things through, huh? Cersei says that he is a magician, a powerful one that has gained access here, and John tells her, You must be Cersei. Looking good for an immortal. Roz takes out his knife, and he presses it to John's throat, asking, why shouldn't I remove your head right this instant? 
John tells him, look, you sent demons to get the Trinity here right. One for soups, one for Batman, and one for the hotness. All for some prophecy or something, right? Well, their prophecy is of threes, and there's only two of them. So I would take a guess and assume that Cersei here is spinning you like a yarn, mate. Cersei says that he is interesting. Stab him in the heart. Roz thrusts his knife into Jon's chest, and as Jon kneels down, Cersei tells him, if you must know, I want power. Jon tells her, that's cliched nonsense. There's something else. I can see your looks changing. Cersei pauses at the remark and then tells Roz to throw the body outside so the anti men can feed. He starts to twist the knife and John tells him, I can give you the Trinity. Cersei turns back and asks, How? And Roz pulls the knife out as John points at Deadman, stating, That's how. Back in Gotham City, Superman, Batman, and Diana just finished stopping the outlaws when suddenly mist starts coming out of both Red Hood and Bizarro's mouths. Deadman then appears before them and Batman asks, did Deadman manage to escape? But as Superman takes a closer look, he says, I don't think Deadman escaped. Deadman lunges forward right into Superman's mouth and as Diana asks if he's okay, Batman tells her, no. Superman looks back shouting, magic. He was vulnerable to magic and now he is at our command. From Superman's crest, a demonic mouth shoots forward and dead man comes out of Superman stating, Look at your friends. They look good enough to eat. Superman jumps at Batman so that his chest can eat him and Diana grabs onto Superman from behind telling him that this is not him right now. His neck snaps as it spins around to look at Diana and he tells her, You're right, this isn't Superman at all. With one powerful head, but he launches her across the street and Bizarro grabs her by the neck before she can get up. Deadman then says that they have Superman and Wonder Woman, two of the most powerful of the Trinity. Batman asks, Really? You don't have me. And with one swing of kryptonite, Batman stops both Superman and Bizarro. The two supers fall and Batman says that Constantine was supposed to save Deadman, not allow him to possess Superman. Diana tells him Constantine either failed or ran. We need to find the Pandora Pit so that we can stop Cersei and restore our friends. You're the world's greatest detective. Solve this. Batman says that magic isn't his, but Diana stops him, telling him that it's his IQ against magic. She knows where her money is. He tells her they need to do science for this. They need to get back to the Batcave. And she points her sword at Red Hood, telling him to use him. She will stand to protect Gotham herself. Superman and Bizarro start to get back up, and as they do, she takes her sword, carving a line in the streets, telling them, You will not cross this line. So swears Diana of Themyscare. Batman grabs onto the lasso and begins running to the Batmobile, throwing Red Hood into it and taking off. Red Hood asks, It's any wonder that you dress like a demon. Why would you want to scare people? It's because you belong to the dark side. You're a killer at heart and you know it. Batman doesn't say a word and then he takes out a small knife, stabbing it into Red Hood. He cuts off a small part of his jacket and he places it in the scanner. He tells the computer to scan for any residue and then run the results through the computer back at the Batcave according to location. Meanwhile, at the cave in the Trans-Antarctic, John Koss telling Zatanna that he's in a bit of a spot here. He's going to bleed out and any help would be appreciated. Cersei calls out that he told her that Deadman would bring them the Trinity and advised to keep this other magician alive as a potential weapon. She's beginning to think that he lied. John then asks, what about Roz? Where did he go? Maybe he's finally seeing through your lies? Cersei thrusts her hand into the wound on John's chest, telling him that his agony will be over soon. But as she pulls her hand back out, she notices that John's blood is subsiding. She shouts that this is impossible, and he laughs. Nay, just a bit of magic. It's what she does, puts things in reverse. Cersei looks back at Zatanna and asks, So it would seem that she has some influence to try and save you. She must really care for you. Cersei then creates a small dagger and begins to stab Zatanna in the gut with it. John watches, not being able to do anything, and Cersei tells him, Abracadabra, and now she's gone. Zatanna's blood drips into the pool, and the mist begins to reach out, grabbing and pulling her down. Back in Gotham, Superman tosses Diana into a building, asking, Are you tired yet? We only need the Dark Knight now, and then the three of us can eat this world. But just then, there's a flash of light, and the demonic Zatanna steps out, shouting, Mean block of the room. The pits command it. As Superman is being sucked back down, Deadman is being ripped out of Superman's body without the demonic possession. He shouts, No! She's going to take them back to the Pandora pits! If they do that, the world's gonna fall! Diana grabs onto what she can, and as the force of the portal is too strong, soon all three of them are sucked in. At that time, over in the Batcave, Red Hood asks, What is science going to do to help you? Batman turns around holding a syringe, and Red Hood asks, What are you gonna do with that? Batman begins to walk towards him, telling him, I'm gonna kill you. Just then, Bizarro punches through the wall, shouting, Demon Bizarro, I'm not here, and your shall sold not to be eaten. Batman then takes out a gun and fires a blast into Bizarro, knocking him out, and then looks back at Red Hood, asking, Where were we? Back at the Trans-Antarctic Cave, Roz looks down at one of the pits, stating that this prophecy is all nonsense. The bat remains at large, Luther refuses to help, and this sacrifice falls apart. Roz al Ghul has had enough, and he will have the truth. 
Cersei asks, you want to know the truth? Long ago, I traded my soul to a dimension of hell. No matter how I've tried over a millennia, I've never been able to break through the barrier. The pits are that barrier and the power shall breach it. She walks over to Roz and with a push shoves Roz into the pit, telling him, I am alone and soon will be whole. This world will be my sacrifice. Just then, the League Assassins jump out, and with one swipe of Cersei's magic hand, she dumps them all into the pit. Her eyes begin to flicker, and she says that that's it. The more that go in, the more power that she gains. Soon, the ultimate sacrifice of the Trinity will be complete. Back from the pit, the bodies of Zatanna, Superman, Deadman, and Diana all rise, and as Cersei looks at them, she says, maybe just two of them will be enough. John leans up from behind, asking, that's the plan, then? Sacrifice them all into the pits to regain your soul? Cersei looks back, telling John that he offers nothing. His soul is as vacant as her, but these heroes, they are the most selfless of souls. She will honor them as she consumes them. Nothing will stop her. John weakly says, actually, Batman can. And just like your prophecy said, you need all three, unless you're just starting to make this whole thing up like a cheap con artist like me. Just then there's a rumbling from the cave's roof and that's when Red Hood and the outlaws along with the bat plane crash in. Red Hood asks Cersei if she missed him. And from the cockpit, Batman shouts, get away from my friends or I'll be forced to blow you back to hell. Cersei shouts asking, how? Nothing can break the control of the Pandora pits. And as Red Hood and the others tear into the Anti-Man, he says, it's simple. Batman killed us. And Batman adds, temporarily. He used a potassium chloride injection to stop our hearts. The possession left when we died. So this is your last warning. Release our friends. Cersei yells, it doesn't matter. You're too late. Magic rules here. Batman fires a blast at the four held captive, stating, actually, I prefer science. He goes on to state that the heart vibrates at a certain frequency. Basically, that blast killed his friends for one second. Sorry. And then Superman tells Batman, you're forgiven. And he grabs Cersei. As Superman holds up Cersei, she casts a spell to free herself and shouts for her anti men to gather. As everyone stares, Deadman says, Ah, they grow up so fast, don't they? Cersei, now in a giant body constructed of anti men, shouts that Cersei will have her soul. Diana, Superman, Bizarro, and Artemis all jump onto the anti men to hold Cersei in place, and from behind, Batman hits her with another blast. While she's stunned, Zatanna shouts, And all of the anti men begin to be pulled apart. Artemis hands Diana her lasso, and as Diana asks Superman if he would, he shoots by grabbing and tying it around Cersei. She tightens the lasso and tells Cersei that there will be no sacrifice today and Cersei begins to laugh. Cersei yells that this is where you're wrong. There was a sacrifice, just not one that you expected. And everyone looks over to see John Constantine. Cersei goes on stating that he tried to save them all and even gave his life for Zatanna. Seems he was really a hero. Zatanna quickly runs over and says, let's see it, do it. And John begins coughing up stating, fly me, I've died and gone to heaven. Zatanna kneels down telling him no. You haven't yet. And John tells her, I'm not so sure. You look like an angel to me. As Superman and Diana begin to walk Cersei away, something starts to creep out of a pit. As Cersei shouts that she could feel it, death is coming. The figure from the pit lunges at her, and as Roz stabs his knives into her back, he tells her, You're right. There is no hope when you cross Roz al Ghul. Only retribution. He pulls her body back and throws it into the pit before suddenly vanishing. Inside the pit, Cersei begins to sink, thinking that there is no hope for any of them. No redemption. Nothing lies beyond. She's scared. She doesn't want to die. There is no hope. And as she looks up, she sees Diana swimming down, reaching out to grab her. Back up top, Superman begins to pull Diana out, and he says that the magic is weakening him. And Batman tells him, it's okay. We have help. And with that, the outlaws and the Trinity pull out Cersei, because no one dies on this night. As Jason Todd sits chained to a chair, a voice tells him, I have it on word that you become the scourge of Gotham. Came out of nowhere one night and started lobbing heads into duffel bags. Suppose I should be shaking my boots. But when I look at you, I don't see an outlaw. All I see is a punk. The interrogator begins to write and says, Please, Mr. Boomerang. Boomerang stops him and tells him, It's Captain. And the interrogator says, Okay, please, Captain Mr. Boomerang, you are here to just observe. Boomerang doesn't listen to the man and picks up Jason's costume asking, Are you a crime boss? Why in hell keep the bat symbol on your chest? Jason smiles and says, cuz. And Boomerang shouts, cuz why? Just then the costume releases an electrical charge, shocking Boomerang and the two guards that are with him. And Jason tells him, just cuz. The other guards ask him, what do we do now? And the interrogator shouts, kill him, kill him now. Two shots go off and a second later, the interrogator struggles not to swallow. Jason, still wrapped in his chains, holds the interrogator's pen to his throat, telling him, be a bud and get the keys to get these things off. The interrogator tells him, uh, of course, right away, but I should point out that this place is the most secure facility in the world. Jason pushes the pen against his throat even harder, asking, do I look very secure to you? 
over in another cell, the sirens begin to go off and Harley Quinn says, whoop whoop, I hate the whoop whoop. Whoop whoop roughly translates into someone is trying to escape. Where were we? Oh, Harley goes back to her clipboard stating that they should really just concentrate on the task at hand. They were really close to a breakthrough. Now, where were we? We were just starting to talk about your mother and how she was never there for you while you were growing up. Artemis sighs telling her, by the seven beards, I said no such thing. Harley then yawns, telling her, this is boring. You don't cry, you don't beg. All Amanda wants to know is what Jason is up to. But if you're not going to respond to my Jungarian psychoanalytic exploration, then I'm just going to have to find out a less subtle way to examine what's inside of your head. Harley reaches under her pillow and slams the giant mallet onto the ground. And that's when she hears Artemis tell her, to me, mistress. The ropes holding Artemis rip off, and as Artemis stands there, her axe is suddenly with her. And she says, I need to find my teammates, so are we gonna do this? Harley shouts, that's fine with me! I don't get paid either way! Back down the hallway, Jason makes his way through the facility when he's suddenly stopped by four armed guards. The guards begin to yell to throw down his weapons or they're going to be forced to terminate him with extreme prejudice. And Jason tells them, Jinkies! I was just gonna say the same thing, but fine, I guess I'll throw my guns down. As he holds his arms up, there are several smacks. And when Jason looks back, he sees Artemis standing there over the guards. He asks, how did you escape? And Artemis tells him, how did you escape? Jason tells her, that's a fair question, but seriously, how did you escape? She asks him, you're, you're kidding, right? If you could escape, why do you believe that I wouldn't be able to escape from Harley Quinn? The two begin running and Jason says, wait, you just took on Harley by yourself and she's fine? Artemis says that she's just a lunatic with a hammer. Why on mother earth would she not be fine? Once the two reach the sick bay, Jason kicks in the door and both him and Artemis ask, Bizarro? And he looks back up from his chair telling them, Well met, my compatriots. Director Waller and I were just discussing our relationship over tea and this delicious mayo and cucumber sandwich. Amanda, you know Red Hood and Artemis. And Amanda sips her tea, telling Bizarro that she knows of them. Jason pulls out his gun, asking to give him one good reason he shouldn't put a bullet through Waller's head. Bizarro puts the gun down, telling him, That Red Hood, always joking. Bizarro goes on stating that as an act of good faith, he shared with Amanda an interesting observation while he scanned the facility with his microvision. He couldn't help but notice the subatomic tremors, most often associated with long theorized precursors to the apocalyptic shifting of the Earth's tectonic plates. An image projects from Bizarro's suit and he says that after running a planet-wide diagnostic through the onboard computer that he built into his suit this morning, he has found four underground installations built into the Earth's crust with futuristic technology that is currently not existing in this time period. That alone would be alarming, but one of these, which contains the power source of all three, has fallen into a state of neglect. Miss Waller was kind enough to confirm that these bases are called colonies, and they were a communion of a hateful creature known as Harvest. Harvest has dedicated his time traveling resources to establish an organization called Nowhere, which was designed to capture the next generation of metahumans and force them into servitude. Jason says, so he's turning kids into soldiers. Waller knew that, so what? She's planning on letting Harvest do the recruiting and training first before she comes to shut them down? Bizarro tells Jason, you need to focus. If we don't shut down the unstable core and soon, the earth will be no more. Amanda then says that she'll be sending them along with the members of her team to this colony to shut it down. They need to come back dead or alive. Either way, she's fine. As the outlaws begin to suit up, Jason then asks, how does this help us with our undercover war on crime in Gotham City? Bizarro finishes fitting Artemis's harness and says, on the contrary, we can't very well accomplish our worthwhile goal if the outlaws are incarcerated and forced to work for the authorities. Why? You do trust me, right? Jason tells him, of course. And Artemis says that she does for the moment. As Bizarro sets up his quantum doorway, everyone begins to walk through it and Bizarro tells Amanda that he must thank her for this opportunity. They will prove that they are more valuable as free agents than members of Task Force X. Amanda then asks, is that what you think this is? We'll talk about it if you come back. As she goes to slam the door shut, everyone walks out into the Arctic snow. Harley shivers, stating that if she knew where they were going, she would have worn her insulated bloomers. Not even five steps in, Boomerang shouts at the doorway could have taken them anywhere. And it decided that freezing them to death was a good way to go. Bizarro tells him, please relax, we are exactly where we need to be. His eyes begin to glow when he releases a blast of heat melting parts of the ice away to reveal the entrance to the colony that he was talking about before. Boomerang then says, look, the Suicide Squad is mostly about overthrowing governments and assassinating peeps, but this... Artemis tells him that if he'd like, he can wait outside. And Harley grabs Jason from behind shouting, dibs on body heat, to which Jason gently yells, don't even. 
Croc begins to open up the hatch, telling everyone, Crocs aren't known for their warm blood, so if nobody minds, we're taking this inside. As everyone gets in, Bizarro begins to display a hologram of the facility's map, breaking the group into three teams. Red Hood and Croc will search for the resources left behind by the previous owner, Harvest. Artemis and Harley will perform a cursory search for any of the teenage survivors, and the remaining Suicide Squad members and himself will deal with shutting down the facility. Before everyone breaks off, Deadshot points his gun at Bizarro, telling him, There's only one problem with that plan. We don't work for you, and we sure as hell ain't gonna take orders from you. Bizarro tells him, Fine. Who is your field commander, then? Harley says that'd be her. But what does she know about all this brain talk? Sounds good to her! A short while later, as Jason and Croc search the facility, they come across two steel doors, which Croc easily pries open. They both look up to a cross that someone is tied to, and Croc says, Ain't that Harvest? The guy that runs the place? Jason tells him, past tense, apparently he pissed someone off, huh? Croc tells him that that ain't their rodeo to find out. They should just grab the booty and get out of here before something goes boom. Over with Artemis and Harley, they begin searching through the residential wards, but soon they touch down into the lower levels, and Harley begins to run off on her own. Artemis quickly grabs her, telling her not to move. This place is sacrosanct. Death has happened here. As Artemis looks around the ruined housing area, Harley takes a deep breath, telling her, Finally! Just when I was starting to hate this place! Artemis silently tells herself that there is something very wrong with this girl. Over at the colony's core, which is covered in defense lasers, Bizarro asks, So, what do you think? Boomerang says, Actually, I was wondering why you needed me here at all. And Deadshot says, Actually, I agree with that. Why are we even here? Bizarro explains that Harvest built this core with the idea of defending it against a Kryptonian clone. If he tried to enter, he would have been killed. Boomerang looks up and says, Talk about a suicide mission. And Bizarro pats the two of them, telling them, Nonsense, gentlemen, I will tell you exactly what to do. It will be fine. Back with Jason and Croc, they begin loading up the weapons cache when Jason says this tech is incredible. Just think of the damage that I could do. And Croc asks, is that really what you want from life, to do a lot of damage? Jason tells him, absolutely. I want to crush the other criminals and got them. If these weapons can help me do it, fine. Croc then goes on telling him, right now you're just a good kid trying to be bad. Take it from me. Roll around on the sewer long enough, the stench won't watch off. You got friends. Keep in the path you're going and you'll find yourself in a cell next to mine for good. Is that what you want for your friends? For yourself? The two stop what they're doing to reflect on what Croc said. And Jason then asks, want to go have these? Croc then picks up another crate telling him, have these is fine. Back with Artemis and Harley, Artemis grabs Harley by the throat, asking, Is nothing sacred to you? Do you believe in anything? And Harley says that she believes that right now her head is going to explode at a whim. Some people have their freedom, so don't judge those who don't. As she tightens her grip, she says, I don't know you that well, but from what I do know, the entire world would be better off if I just snapped your neck. Artemis throws Harley aside and sits down, telling her to be quiet while she prays to the fallen here. Harley gets up, telling her, quiet as a mouse, got it, and then she pulls out her mallet. She answers closer and closer to Artemis, and Artemis says, I swear to goddess, if you hit me with that thing, I will shove it up your bottom. Harley puts the mallet down and sighs, promises, promises. Over at the core, Boomerang and Deadshot duck and dodge the defense lasers, and Boomerang asks, any last instructions? And Deadshot tells him, you know that Bizarro left like five minutes ago, right? As the two get to the core, Deadshot says, All right, we have to strike the core receptor at the same time. And they both attack, and as they hit their mark, the core explodes. Boomerang then shouts, asking, Where is that freak? I'm gonna wring his blade neck! Bizarro then appears behind them, patting their shoulders, telling them, Please forgive me. I forgot to mention that I had to leave so that it wouldn't be exposed to the kryptonite wavelengths. Boomerang says, uh, not a problem, mate. Bizarro walks the two of them out, stating that he's confident that they've accomplished everything that they need to do for the day. Shall we go back to the others? A short while later, as everyone is heading back through the quantum doorway, just before Jason and the others can get through, Amanda blocks their path. She tells them that Task Force X is enough of a handful. She doesn't need to spend time babysitting the outlaws. They helped stop the complex from blowing up, and she got some weapons. Someday, if he's not dead, he'll be convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Then she won't have to make any deals with him. He'll be hers forever. She can wait. Amanda slams the door shut, telling them to leave, and Jason shouts, Forget to call! Back in the floating hideout of the outlaws, Jason begins checking off the weapons that he secured, and he says, Neurosplatter? I almost don't want to know what that does. Artemis walks up asking if he's not concerned, and Jason asks her, What, about Bizarro? I'm beginning to think that you're having trouble getting over the fact that he doesn't need us anymore, not like he used to. And Artemis says, No, that is the only part that makes her happy at all. Jason tells her, You might say that, but I don't think you've accepted that our Bizarro is all grown up now.
As some of the upper class of Burnside gather for a party, a man named Ben attending the party checks his henchmates app looking for some good news. Just as he gets a notification about a possible job, his girlfriend Emma walks over asking what is he doing? And just as she starts to pull Ben over, she notices the app open on his phone asking, what the hell is this? I thought you gave up this life. Ben tries to tell her that he was, but this job. And Emma says, just forget it and she leaves. Meanwhile, over at the Gotham Empire Hotel, a man wakes up from his sleep and Jason looks up from his book, stating, Oh, I hope I didn't wake you. The man shouts that he doesn't know who the hell he thinks he is, and Jason tells him, I'm wearing a red hood. I'm in Gotham City. Who do you think I am? The man yells, You have no idea who I am! And Jason says, Actually, I do. Jacoby from the so-called Avocado King of Belgium. I also know that your produce empire is a cover for an international munitions dealing empire. Jacoby gets up and swings at Jason, and as Jason leans back to avoid the first hit, he says, you know, that would have hurt if it had connected. Jason then lets Jacoby pass by and hits him in the back of the head with his gun, telling him, consider your visa revoked. You came to kiss Cobblepot's ring, but you're leaving tonight. Jacoby yells, the penguin will be very disappointed if I leave, and Jason points his gun, telling him, if you don't, you're gonna be peripherated. Later over at the 50s diner, Artemis and Bizarro sit down for a cup of coffee, when Artemis says that things have gotten rather boring ever since they started the predictive analysis. As she goes on, Artemis says that there's something that's been bothering her. She can tell that he's been manipulating them. She would like to know why their friend Bizarro is messing with them. Bizarro looks her dead in the eye and he tells her, If I told you, <laughs> I'd have to kill you. After a few moments of silence, he bursts out laughing. <laughs> you should have seen the look on your face. Too funny! Artemis sarcastically tells him, oh yes, a riot. As Bizarro's laughter dies down, Jason walks and stated that he likes what he sees. His two favorite people getting along again. A short while later, as the sun begins to rise, the three step out and Jason asks, is it me or is this the first time in a long time that we've all felt normal? Bizarro tells him, yes, it was fun. But now we must go get supplies for a new static cling force that I am creating. Jason tells him that's cool. He needs to get some ammo anyway. And Artemis tells the two of them that she'll see them later. Bizarro heads off into the crowds, Jason suits up, and he keeps a close eye on Bizarro. Once Bizarro walks into the hotel, Jason activates the invisibility on his suit and he jumps down. Inside, the young man, Ben, arrives to the meeting that he was supposed to attend, and the hotel staff directs him into the ballroom. As Ben passes through the doors, he sees the entire room filled with many of Gotham's two-bit henchmen. After seeing the competition, Ben decides that he should just pass on this, but suddenly the room begins to fill with purple gas. All the henchmen begin to cough as they choke, and through the gas, Bizarro tells them that he came here today to cut off the supply of henchmen who work for the crime lords. It's believed that they are diseased limbs that do the handiwork for Gotham's unending parade of bad men. Jason, standing behind Bizarro, silently says to himself, Don't do this, B. And then Bizarro says, After seeing you like this, it makes me wonder, what is the difference between a good guy and a bad guy? If I'm good and doing bad things for a good reason, am I a bad guy? The men continue to struggle for air, and he closes off the gasway, telling them, This is your last chance. Do better in life. Jason then steps in front of Bizarro, stating, I have to ask, did you stop because you knew I was there? And Bizarro turns back, telling him, No. The truth is, I shouldn't have done this in the first place. I am ashamed of what I've almost done, Jason. Jason turns to him, telling him, I would be the last person to judge you, but we should be thankful that you didn't do anything that you're going to regret later. As Jason and Bizarro head back, Artemis begins to go through Bizarro's room, still feeling that something is off, that he is lying to them. She looks at Pup Pup, the little doll that Bizarro has had since he was born, and then she sets him down, noticing a green light coming from the cracks in the floor. She calls her axe to herself and pries open the hidden door, and then walks down into the glowing green light. What she finds are tanks of synthetic kryptonite, the same stuff that Lex gave Bizarro to make him a genius. She says to herself, asking, what has he done? And then she hears footsteps. She looks back to see Bizarro holding her axe, telling her, I really wish you hadn't done that, Lady Artemis. Artemis turns away, telling him that he has 10 seconds to put her axe down and explain himself. Bizarro tells her, Please, I know the sight in here is bad, but you've known me my entire life, which admittedly is not a very long time, but I'm asking you to trust me. She asks him, trust? There's a secret chamber underneath your bedroom filled to the brim with liquid kryptonite. Something that increases your mental capacity each time you use it or abuse it, apparently. Bizarro sighs and tells her that he understands why she'd be mad, but he just doesn't know anymore. He falls to his knees yelling that he doesn't know what he's supposed to do anymore. What is he supposed to feel? By row, he can barely remember how to think. He can't go back to the dark and lonely place, please. Help me. He reaches for her hand and Artemis tells him, of course, friend, she'll help him with anything. Meanwhile, a mile away at Penguin's Iceberg Lounge, a disguised Jason Todd with a fake mustache is sitting at a poker table yelling, yee-haw, that's another one. I love this place. The dealer pushes a pile of chips over, stating that these are his winnings, and Jason shouts, you're losing, hee-haw. 
Just as Jason gets up, a beautiful woman taps him on the shoulder, telling him that she could think of another way to have an amazing night. Jason gets up and follows her, stating that he likes the way she thinks, but just as they step into the woman's room, there's a, what? And Jason asks, what in the name of all Petunia? On the bed, Penguin claps, telling the woman that she did a good job. Remind me not to kill your father for this. Jason then asks, ain't you the Penguin? And the Penguin says, the very same. But that won't concern you much longer, Red Hood. Back in the floating hideout, Artemis and Bizarro sit along the ledge, and Bizarro says that he is so peaceful up here. But to be honest, I really don't get humanity. Artemis tells him that she fears that she cannot help him with that. These people mean a lot to Jason. He came from them. And Bizarro looks down and says, The two of you, though, you're better than them, all of them. Artemis says that that's enough. She's tired of the speeches. He let his mask skip downstairs. She cares too much for him to put it back in place. Bizarro smiles, telling her that even when he was dumb, she would never let him get away with anything. But ever since Lex injected him with kryptonite, he's been regressing back to his old self. Artemis asks if it's really a bad thing, being your true self. And Bizarro stares off, stating, When I didn't know any better, it was fine. But now, it scares the living hell out of me. Imagine one day that you can barely put two words together, and then the next there's nothing between your mind and anything. You could go anywhere, do anything. There isn't a thought you couldn't explore, but now it's all slipping away. Did I steal the kryptonite from the colony? Absolutely. Anyone would have, right? Artemis places her hand on Bizarro, telling him that this isn't about her. She can't imagine what he's going through. She can't believe being an addict is better. Bizarro turns and leans in to kiss her, and she stops him, stating that it would be a mistake that they can never unmake. But come, walk with her. Back over at the Iceberg Lounge, the Penguin laughs as he pours a cup of wine, asking, Did you really think that you could launder money that you stole from my casino? Jason laughs, asking, Haha, <laughs> too much, right? I thought the same thing ten minutes ago! Penguin hands Jason a glass, telling him that there is no scenario in which he gets out of this alive. And Jason says, Actually, I can think of like a dozen. Just then, the lights go out, and Jason says, That was number seven. As the security guards run in to report everyone is getting out of control, Jason runs, jumps out of the window, stating, Looks like you got your hands full! Perhaps another time, Penguin. Over at the hideout in Bizarro's secret room, Artemis tells him that he can do this. Bizarro turns and begins smashing the kryptonite tanks. And as Bizarro does that, Jason goes back to the diner to enjoy a burger when a young woman walks up. She says that she's sorry for being so mysterious, but she asked her to make sure that he was alone before she came to say hello. Jason looks at the woman asking, Who is she? And she extends her arm, stating, Her grandmother, the one that she is named after, Faye Gunn. Jason tells her that he mercifully doesn't see a resemblance, and he's glad to hear that she's resurfaced again. Faye says that she hasn't. Last week, she told her that if she ever went missing, she was supposed to deliver this package to Jason. Back in the hideout, Bizarro stares at himself in the mirror as he brushes his teeth, and a voice asks, Doesn't that feel better? The hallucination of Pup Pup says that all you had to do was reach out to her, or me. You gotta get over yourself, and now here we are! I'm so proud of you! Bizarro opens the cabinet, pulling out a small green inhaler of kryptonite, and Pup-Pup smacks his head, yelling, For the love of Rao! Are you kidding me? But the next day at the LexCorp Tower, the secretary at the desk welcomes the person who walked in asking if she can help him. Artemis tells him to inform Lex that he has a guest. Out on the streets, the man at the hot dog stand asks if there'll be anything else, and Bizarro takes the hot dog, telling him, no, thank you. As he walks and begins to eat, he thinks that it's not all about the quantum mechanics or finding the square root of pi. It's about the little things. The taste of a hot dog, the heat of the sun on his face, the small things that he will miss. As Bizarro looks up at the floating hideout, an older man taps, asking, Would you mind helping me across the street? Bizarro tells him, of course, and the man tells him, Thank you. Thank you for saying sir and not old timer. Bizarro helps the man across, stating that he likes to try and be helpful. He's not sure how much time he has left. And the old man tells him, None of us do. As the two reach the other side, the older man says that he is a fine man, and Bizarro responds, Meam? And the man laughs, asking, Am. Bizarro watches the man leave, and he says that he's going to miss it all. But he made a promise to Artemis. Whatever his fate is, he'll face it, surrounded by... Surrounded by... What? Bizarro begins to get frustrated at losing his train of thought, and he says that he just needs to go... Go to back over at LexCorp. Lex says the synthetic kryptonite pilfer from the future. It certainly sounds like a recipe for disaster. The boy isn't giving this up without a fight. Artemis tells him that he will give him more credit than that. He created him and then pretended to fix him and now he'll help him. Lex snaps back. I will do no such thing. I gave him life twice. My obligation to that creature is complete. Artemis tries to ask nicely. Please, I know you care about him or you wouldn't have given him back to us. Lex bursts out laughing. <laughs> that is rich. I didn't return him to you out of ridiculous sense of altruism. I did it because I simply wanted to observe him in an uncontrolled habitat. Screens of the outlaws begin to appear, and Lex goes on stating that the three of them are nothing more than a lab experiment. You are a control group. The three of you playing house, 
It has shown me more potential in my creation than I ever imagined. At the end of the day, though, you are nothing more than rats in a cage. As the images begin to fade, Artemis tells him that that's the thing about lies. After a while, you start to believe them. As she leaves, Lex stares at one image of Bizarro. And he says, like father, like son. As the moon comes out, Bizarro sits out in a field. And Jason calls out to him. Bizarro says that he came. And Jason says he always will. What's up? Bizarro says the sky, orbit, the sun, the moon, all up. And just then he hangs his head and says, not what I meant. Me called because forgot how to get home. Me even forgot the word home. Bizarro looks away and he says, me tried. I'm trying so hard to be the person you want me to be. Jason tells him that he was always the person that he wants him to be. You big goof. Bizarro notices the envelope from Ma Gunn's granddaughter, Faye. And he asks, what's that? And Jason asks, who cares? Could worry about it tomorrow. The two lay down on the grass and Bizarro says, Jason, me, I'm scared. And Jason says, it'll be fine, buddy. Trust me on that. But in the back of Bizarro's mind, he thinks, he am lying, but it am okay. It has to be. As the rain comes down on Potter's Field Cemetery, Jason looks back holding his shovel, telling a group of armed men that tonight is not the night. One of the men calls out that they aren't sure who he's looking for, but Penguin said that he may as well be digging his own grave. Without saying a word, Jason spins around hitting the man's knee and he proceeds to beat the men with a shovel, thinking to himself, yeah, not a good night. However, this all started one hour earlier at Ma Gun's school for wayward boys. Jason sits by a fire, reading through several letters left for him by his own father. The first was left by Ma Gun herself, though, and she explained how much regret she was filled with by holding back these letters that his father had sent to him while he was growing up. She did this so that she would have more control over the boys, but for Jason, these letters could have changed his entire life. With that, hopefully one day he could forgive her, because she knows in her heart she can never forgive herself. Jason tears open the first letter from his father that he had written while in prison. He wrote that it looked like the judge threw the book at him, keeping him locked up for a very long time. But while sitting in prison, it has given him time to reflect on the things that were important to him. And one of those things was his son. How much he doesn't want him to be like him. It all started when he was younger and became a self-employed dealer working for the Big Pharma. He would deal to kids, bums, junkies, it didn't matter who. Business is business, that is, until it wasn't. The day that he met the girl who later would become Jason's mother and she walked into his life. He knew that he should not have sold to her. He should have told her to walk away and even a bum deserved a chance at happiness. To the surprise of no one, his mother's parents weren't thrilled that their daughter was dating a drug dealer, even a retired one. But his mother did something that no one else had ever done before and she chose to stay with him. While they were dating though, they had nothing, but it was their nothing. They adjusted to living, and one day he found that his mother passed out on the floor. He thought the worst, but as it turned out, Jason's mother was pregnant with him. After that, he swore that he would do his best for his child and get an honest job washing cars, of all things. They even went to classes on how to become parents, but apparently the teacher frowned that his mother would bring beer to the class. They couldn't really afford to go to the doctor's office, so they ended up having Jason in their own apartment. The day that he was born, he was brought up to the roof of their building and shown his new home, Gotham. He was going to be a prince of Gotham one day and have a dad that he could look up to. But looking back on things, Jason can guess how it all turned out, can't he? They were doing fine for a while, however, having a kid is expensive. Maybe it was the drugs that his mother never stopped taking or maybe it was just their bad genes but the doctor saved him that night. But even after being stabilized, he was going to need medicine therapy. Things that a job at a car wash wasn't enough to pay for. He was thinking about dealing again, but being a dad, dealing was just too dangerous. So he manned up and nailed the first interview with one of Gotham's villains. After that, he bounced around henching for whoever needed it. But the problem with that is you needed to learn how to take a punch from a guy who likes to punch. It wasn't a glamorous lifestyle, but it put food on the table. He even gave a little bit extra to sometimes go out to the fair. They used to have lots of fun there, but the next job that he would take would turn out to be his last job. It was a job for Cobblepot. And Cobblepot didn't need a hench, he needed a fall guy. So while Penguin was out there living the high life, he was serving 20 to life. He also learned what happened to his mother while he was locked up, and he's so sorry for that, Jason. He won't get it now, but one day you'll see that love alone doesn't fix everything. This letter may be my last for a while, maybe even ever. I made a deal today. I agreed to be a scientific pincushion. They agreed to let me out early if I lived through it. Crazy. Absolutely. But I'm what your mom used to call Wiley. Trust me on that. I'll see you soon. Love, Dad. 
Jason folds the letter back up and he begins to cry. And then he notices something else inside of the envelope. He picks it up and sees a photo strip from his father and him from one of the times they went to the fair. Now, back in the current times in Potter's Field Cemetery, Jason goes back to digging the grave and off in the distance, Penguin tells his gunman to keep a close eye on that boy. The gunman says that it's kind of creepy killing somebody already in a cemetery, you know? Jason tosses the shovel and he lifts the coffin out of the ground, the coffin that holds his father's body, and he tells himself that he never once visited his father in prison or even at this grave. He knew where it was, he just never had anything to tell him. The gunman looks over asking Penguin, should I shoot? Penguin looks through his binoculars telling him, no, not yet. Jason flips open the cover of the coffin to find nothing, no body, not anything. He was thrilled when he heard that his father had died. He wasn't around to stop his mother from doing so, but the problem is he didn't die. Quietly, he said. Penguin gets up tapping the rifle, telling the gunman to go wait in the car. I've seen a lot of pain in my life and caused a lot too. I don't know who or what Red Hood was expecting to find, but it looks like it ripped his heart out. The penguin laughs and Jason tells himself, you can't make me care about what happened to you back then. Not after everything you did to my mom and me. Jason screams out, I don't care. The next night, Jason sets out with a new group of outlaws, adding to his ranks not only Artemis and Bizarro, but Arsenal, Starfire, Pop Pop, and Creeper. They would fight against Gotham's greatest villains, even ones not originating in the city. And after taking down every single one of those enemies, Jason held the gun to Joker's head, getting ready to pull the trigger. But before he could, Bizarro grabs the gun, telling Jason, No, we have won the day. As of today, we are moving forward. So as you would so crazily put it, Outlaws, onward! However, as Bizarro is watching the What Could Be video, he smiles, stating, Me love you guys. Meanwhile, at the Ice Patch Fair opening, Penguin steps out onto the stage, telling everyone that looking at all of these people gathered here today, it reminds me of my late father. He would always say, never underestimate the power of a free meal. A long time ago, this place used to be a sanctuary for the small, socially awkward boy. But look at what it's become, a majestic playground. As an adult, I have entrusted the people of this city with the hopes and dreams of the child that I once was. Because we can all agree, it's more than they deserve. While the crowd collapses, a button is pressed and an explosion goes off, destroying one of the ice sculptures right behind the penguin. Through the smoke grenades, Jason walks through, thinking to himself that he did promise Batman that he would never kill anyone in Gotham again. But promise is a strong word. Penguin's guards jump in front of him, but Jason shocks them and Penguin begins to laugh, telling Jason, You are so dead! Just as Penguin finishes speaking, Jason jumps towards him, kicking him to the ground! Penguin grabs his face and Jason tells him, You better stand up before I kill you where you kneel! Penguin asks, What the hell is this on about? And Jason tells him, I'm here about Willis Todd. But several blocks away, high above Gotham, Artemis finds herself in a fight against their base's own defense systems. She thinks to herself that like the rest of the technology that Bizarro has created, this has gone askew. As Artemis gets closer to the base, the Bizarro projection calls out, please be aware, any attempt of entry to the facility will be met with immediate death. This base will self-destruct in eight minutes and counting. Artemis asks, it's going to self-destruct over the city? Thousands of people will be killed. And the Bizarro projection says, tens of thousands to be exact. She shouts to shut down the self-destruct, but the Bizarro projection tells her, that is impossible. The facility and everything else came from the mind of Bizarro and can no longer exist now that his intellectual capacity has regressed. Have a nice day. As the projection fades, Artemis yells for Bizarro to wait, and once it leaves, she throws her axe into the base of it, telling it, Bring it back! Back on the fairground, Penguin says, Okay, fine, I'll bite. Who in God's name is Willis Todd? Was it the chump that you were looking for in the empty grave last night? Jason pulls off his mask, stating, Willis Todd was my father. You hired him to work the game. Yeah, he sucked as a dad, but he didn't have to go away to prison taking the fall for something that you did. I've lost everything. Penguin laughs. <laughs> this is too rich. You threw your identity away in probably Batman's for a nobody? In fact, less than a nobody. Jason grits his teeth, grabbing Penguin, telling him, I'm sick of this little merry-go-round that we have, the whole catch and release thing. Penguin asks, so what? I should apologize? Jason puts back on his mask, telling him, I didn't come to hear you say you're sorry or beg for your life. I'm not going to arrest you just so you can find a corrupt judge to bail you out. I'm here to end this tonight. Jason pulls out his gun, pointing it at the penguin, and the penguin laughs. Ha 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 ha! Put it away! No one here believes you're gonna shoot me, kid. You can play at being one of the bad guys, but we all know deep down you're a kid playing dress up. 
Seconds later, the police surround Jason, telling him to put the gun down, and Penguin says, Don't worry! The gun is harmless! Just another bad brat. Jason takes it, pushing it into Penguin's monocle, telling him, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. I am my father's son. Penguin tells him, Good for you, kid! And then, bang. Blood splatters across the Red Hood mask and Penguin's shattered monocle hits the ground. Jason thinks that when he was born, his father told him that he'd be a prince of Gotham. And now, he is. Back in the Outlaws base, Bizarro sits in the theater room watching his movie and suddenly the picture begins to melt away. Bizarro begins to shout, What the happened to me movie? Want to know what happens? How does Bizarro's story end? And Pup Pup says, The same as everyone else, big guy. Bizarro then says, Bizarro am sad. And Pup Pup flies down hugging him, telling him, Try never be sad. We'll be friends forever and ever. Moments later, Artemis bursts through the door shouting for Bizarro. And as she takes off her jetpack, Bizarro walks out asking, Red her? Artemis pauses asking, Are you gone or back? And he tells her, Red her. Artemis reaches out stating that she's going to need him to come with her. And Bizarro takes her hand stating, Anywhere, always. But as Jason begins to lose the police, he heads back to Crime Alley so he can be brought up to the base. He radios up to Artemis and Mazzaro, telling him, If you can hear me, I screwed up big time. However, as he looks around, he sees the base is on fire. It is coming down in flames. Also, at this time at the Batcave, the video of Penguin's execution is played and Bruce watches it on loop over and over again, with all of the local news outlets playing it. Alfred tells him, Master Dix and Timothy are on the phone, sir. Others as well. Bruce pulls the cowl down, standing up, telling them, We well, they need to stand down. I'm gonna bring him in. Alfred then says with all of his heart, I'm sorry that it has come to this. Many years ago, there was a time when Jason, back as Robin, found himself at the bottom of the lake. Alfred was yelling in his earpiece to wake up, and when Jason came to, he realized what had happened. The Batmobile had flipped and it had fell into the water, and Bruce was trapped inside. Alfred told them repeatedly that he needs to go up to the surface for air, but Jason swam to that car. He risked his life, and he pulled Batman out. As he finally managed to get him and Bruce out of the water, Alfred continued to tell him that he was going to need to. But Jason stops him, telling him, With all due respect, shut the hell up! Jason lays Bruce on the ground and he starts to perform CPR, hitting Bruce in the chest, yelling for him to wake up. And after a few hits, Bruce begins to cough and Jason laughs. <laughs> you thought you could get rid of me that easily? Ha! Ah! Bruce leans up, placing his hand on Jason's shoulder, telling him, If you ever leave, it's going to be by your own choice. Back in our current time, Jason stands in the middle of a group of police who are looking for him after shooting Penguin. One of the officers yells to spread out and find him. He couldn't have gone far. Jason thinks to himself that he really hasn't gone anywhere. He's just invisible, just like his outlaw secret headquarters floating above the city. Or at least, it was floating. Another officer tells him that it's over and don't bother trying to deny it, and Jason reaches for his gun. Just then, Jason's suit shorts out and his body becomes visible to everyone. All of the officers stop what they're doing and they point their guns at him. One of them tells him that it's over, don't bother trying to deny it, so Jason reaches for his gun. And that's when something from the sky hits the officer in the shoulder. He screams out in pain and everyone looks back and they see the outlaw's headquarters crashing into a nearby building, dropping debris all over the place. While all of the officers begin to run for their lives, Jason follows suit, stating, I'm really hoping that Artemis is up there doing something. Up in the facility, the ground shifts and Artemis grabs onto the wall, stating, By the seven beards, I am ordering you to stop this madness. The Bizarro hologram says, Unfortunately, this entire building, myself included, is wired directly into Bizarro's brain. This building and everything in it, including myself, will now disappear. Artemis shouts, Fine! Go! And she throws her axe into the hologram's chair. Bizarro then says, if you were mad at that Bizarro, you were mad at this Bizarro too. Me, I'm sorry for whatever me did. Artemis sighs, stating, oh, Bizarro, no, you didn't do anything. You're just trying to help. If anything, it was my fault for not trusting my instincts. Suddenly, there's an explosion, and as the building shifts again, Artemis tells Bizarro, you need to think there must be some way to stabilize this. Bizarro begins to concentrate and then says, Me, I'm no idea what you am talking about, Red Her. Me, I'm sorry. Back on the ground, Jason charges through a door onto a rooftop and he jumps off the edge stating, Please be there, please be there, please be there. But that's when he feels something tug at his leg. He quickly realizes that falling face first is the last thing that he should be worrying about. Batman pulls on the battering wrapped around Jason's legs, throwing him onto the roof. Jason gets back up asking, Are we really gonna do this again, old man? And without saying a word, Batman kicks him across the face, shattering the red hood. He then grabs him, lifting him, stating, I was a fool for ever believing in you. Jason laughs. <laughs> You're a real character. I've never seen you hit the Joker that hard. You hate me. Batman backhands Jason, breaking more of the mask off. Shut up. We had a deal. You could operate in Gotham. You could stay free if you didn't kill anyone. 
You shot the penguin point blank. Unlike Batwoman, you did it as the world watched. Batman picks Jason up, and as he tightens his grip around his throat, Jason asks, So what? After the stuff Penguin did over the years? All the people he's hurt? Killed? Or are you just sad about losing another play date? Batman pulls Jason to him, headbutting him to the ground, stating, No more jokes, Jason. No more excuses. No more Red Hood. As he pulls his fist back, suddenly he disappears into a hole, and Bizarro floats there, stating, No more am talking. Batman make Bizarro's head hurt. Jason says, <laughs> What? How? And Bizarro tells him, Red Her said find you. She said I'm important. And you okay, Red Him? As Bizarro flies off, Jason says, yeah, bud, I'm good. Back in the facility, Artemis tries to go through the controls to stop the building from falling, and she asks herself, what could they have done? What have they done to this city? As Bizarro holds Jason up, he tells her, you don't need to be asking yourselves that. We need to figure out how to stop it. Artemis runs over, hugging Jason, and Jason takes a look at the controls, and he asks, Maybe we could steer it off and land it in the bay? Artemis asks, really? You don't think I tried that? And Jason says, I'm not saying you didn't, but you know, it's not like you have a lot of cars over at Amazonia. While the two go back and forth, Bizarro comes up with an idea. Jason and Artemis stop arguing when they hear the sound of metal being ripped apart. And when they look over, they see Bizarro pulling a giant cable out of the ground. Jason tells him, actually, we're thinking less damage more than more damage, big guy. And Artemis asks, what is he doing? And Bizarro says, me am told you. Me go anywhere, anytime. Me meant that. But before the two of them could ask another question, he takes the cable and he flies through the quantum door. The quantum door that allows him to go anywhere, created by the super intelligent Bizarro. Suddenly the facility begins to pull itself inside out through the doorway, sucking everything inside. Jason yells to Artemis that they need to go after him and she tells him, no, we don't. I will. She picks up Jason, stating, Someday you'll understand how much I owe you. The mistakes that I've made. How much you've suffered because of me. Jason tells her, Don't do this. It doesn't matter what you think you've done. We can. She pulls him close, giving him a kiss. And Jason says, Finally! So what do you think, princess? Artemis tells him it's okay. For a boy, just don't ever call her princess. Artemis then throws Jason out of the facility back onto the roof. Jason screams for her not to do it, but without any way of getting back up, all Jason can do is watch the facility implode upon itself. But before he can even mourn, he gets up asking, You're behind me, aren't you? He quickly spins back, kicking at Batman, and Batman catches his leg, lifting him up and throwing him onto his back. As Jason lays there, Batman reaches down, ripping the bat signal from his chest, and he begins to throw him away. Batman then tells him, I told you once before, if you ever left, it'd be by your own choice, not mine. Just then, he begins to hear something hissing, and red smoke begins to spread across that rooftop. Batman reaches for his belt, but an electrical arrow is shot into his hand, shocking him and knocking him out. Through the smoke, Roy Harper begins to pick up Jason, stating, Easy does it! I got you now, bud! A few weeks go by, and Jason's standing on the beach, aiming his gun, still bruised and broken from his fight with Bruce, stating that he was beaten to death with a crowbar once before, but that, that didn't hurt nearly as bad as he does right now. He struggles to pull the trigger, and as he focuses on the coconut in front of him, the gun goes off. The recoil from it throws Jason off balance and onto his back, and when he looks up, he sees that he missed the coconut. Roy then kneels down, asking, Really? When you said you needed to lay down, I thought you meant in bed. Jason says, Be a doll and hand me my gun. Roy then tells him, Absolutely not. You know how many stitches you just ripped with that stunt? Roy holds out his arm to help Jason up, and as Jason grabs it, he tells him, I'm fine. I appreciate the help, but I don't need it. Roy puts Jason's arm over his shoulder, telling him that he's lucky that Batman did knock his head clean off the way that he was hitting him. Anyway, here we are, home sweet home. Jason looks up to see the crashed Tamaranian Star Cruiser and says that he can't believe that this thing is still standing. This is the base that he had at the beginning of the New 52 with Arsenal and Starfire. Roy tells him that he needs to quit being so stubborn. This ship still has alien tech that can help with his recovery process. Didn't their mutual princess patch him up before? Jason grabs onto the railing, telling him that he'll do it one step at a time. If he doesn't like that, he can fluff off. Roy tells him, oh, so sensitive, yet G-rated. If you don't mind, it's time I got back to my super secret project that I can't even tell you about. Oh no, I said too much already. Jason tells him next time that he's left for dead, leave him for the dead. Roy waves, yelling, off to save the world by myself with nobody. And then he slams the door shut with the words, super top secret project, no Jason's allowed. Jason laughs to himself, stating, you're an idiot, sure, but your heart's in the right place. It's been almost a month since I've been able to stand and walk, and this ship doesn't remember anything. As Jason stands by the door, it opens up and a voice says, Jason Todd, enter. Jason looks up to see Princess Cory, Starfire, First Lady of the Outlaws. Cory says, I'll be praised. It's been too long. Jason smiles and says that he didn't think that she'd be here. And Cory tells him that she's not. This is a holographic interaction pre-recorded, triggered by your signature biorhythmics. 
I'm sorry that I'm not able to help you with whatever problems have brought you home, but you should always feel like you're among family here. Jason sighs, taking a seat, stating, yeah, right, because I'm so good at being a part of a family. Meanwhile, in Roy's super secret project room, he sits in front of a hologram of Croc, stating that he needs to shoot Amanda a thank you letter for allowing this. Croc tells him that she'll get her pound of flesh, it's what she does. Roy goes on telling him that he just wants to be able to help his friend. He just can't figure out the outlaws. Croc tells him, I hear you. I got a friend who can't pull his own head out of his butt either. But really, are you in any position to help when your own life is crap? Roy looks down telling him, truth bombs. Haha. <laughs> yeah, I don't have a good answer for that. Croc tells him, sure you do. Maybe it's time to go back to rehab. And Roy says, I might know a place. Croc then tells him, great, give him a call. And Roy says, right now isn't good. I'm in the middle of something, but let me finish here and I'll go. I promise. Croc tells him, the first live an addict kid. Life always starts tomorrow. Roy laughs, telling him, you know, you're not such a bad guy. How did I get so lucky to have a sponsor like you? Croc thinks back, telling him, I don't really recall luck having much to do with it. It's whom made the change, but I need to go in the meantime, work the program. Back over with Jason, the computer tells him analysis complete, no sign of, but Jason hits the table shouting, again! The computer runs the scan again, repeating, analysis complete, no sign of Artemis or Bizarro, anywhere in the known multiverse. No known life forms exist. A few weeks go by again, and Roy wakes up knocking on Jason's door to wake him up, and when he opens the door, he finds Jason not there. Roy laughs, telling himself, <laughs> that can't be good. Over in the training room, Jason hangs upside down, telling himself that he doesn't care what the computer says. He knows that they're out there, and they will be together again. A few moments go by, and Roy walks in, telling Jason, welcome back to the land of the living. And Jason tells him, you're a few years late to that particular salutation. Jason then swings around into a flip, landing on the ground, and Roy asks, does that mean you're ready to get back to work? And Jason laughs, telling him, I thought you'd never ask again. The next day, Jason and Roy fly out, and while on the plane, Jason says that he's sorry. And Roy asks for what? And Jason tells him he's got things pretty wrapped up. He hasn't had a best friend like him in a while, and he hasn't asked how he's doing. Roy looks at the window, telling him honestly, he face-planted off the wagon more than once since they uh, broke up the little Red Hood Arsenal thing. There was a few times that he wanted to call him, but he just didn't feel like he could let him down. Jason tells him that's not even possible. He's the bravest guy that he's ever known. Anyone can get knocked down, but he keeps getting back up. Roy taps his bottle onto Jason's soda, telling him, getting back up, and Jason tells him, every time. Later, after the plane lands at the hospital, Jason asks, why are they in Beijing? And Roy explains that he did a lot of research on something called the Underlife. It's sort of like an umbrella consortium of sorts. The Yakuza mafia cartels, pretty much anybody going by anything large scale, they work together under a certain set of rules. Jason says, using a word like consortium, it's impressive all on its own, but why them? Roy says, because he tracked down the bad opiate shipment that caused 300 people in the States to become hospitalized. And guess who's responsible? Jason says that he's going to assume it's Susie Sue, seeing how she's currently still recovering from whatever. The two look at her in the hospital bed, and she's laying there with several medical devices hooked up to her. Roy says that it's got to be a cover. Her charts state that she has had catastrophic liver failure, and she's been in critical condition for a month. If she was behind the drug, she would have needed help. Jason says that Susie was never about delegating things though. She's always been on the outs with her family, blood and crime. The two step into an elevator and while they talk, a nurse asks if they can hold the door for a second. Jason whispers, asking if that bag has his hood. He's probably gonna need it. Roy starts to pull down his glasses, telling him, sure thing, but uh, anyone else smelling gun oil or is it just me? The elevator dings as it reaches the roof and when it opens, four women inside begin to attack Jason and Roy and the doctor with the blue hair shouts, we are the sisters of Susie Sue. Everyone stumbles out and the doctor goes on stating that the woman with the mask is Knight. She's Blanc. The blonde is Candy and the other is Anastasia. But as the Sioux sisters try to attack, Jason uses their numbers to attack each other. And while Roy takes care of Knight, the two look at Candy telling her that she can walk away. Roy then asks, wait, you look like you're 14. Candy shouts, I am 16 and I won't back down. I'm a Sioux. Jason then tries deflecting Candy's attack, asking why are they here? Every time that he's talked to Susie, she said that her family hated her. Candy manages to get a kick in asking, seriously? We're sisters! And even if we're mad at each other, we'll fight to the death for each other. She jumps over Jason, punching Roy, and as the two are knocked down, Roy grabs an arrow, telling him, it's time. And Jason yells, don't! As in, do not! Seconds later, the roof explodes as the girls are knocked down to the lower level, with Roy holding Jason as they float on his propeller arrow. Jason sighs, stating, have I told you recently how much I hate this thing? And Roy tells him, sure, next time I'll carry the shovel red hood off the sidewalk arrow. 
as the two lay and Jason tells him, we just want to know who sent the bad shipment. We're not going to ask again. Candy tells him that they'll compromise. They can tell them by carving it into their corpses. Just then a voice shouts enough and from the stairway, Susie shouts that if there's anybody that's going to beat the crap out of her worthless siblings, it's going to be her. Susie turns to the boy, stating that she heard about the stupid shipment. The whole thing was a setup. Someone in the Underlife, an American, which sucks because the whole point of being in the Underlife is carving out territories and respecting boundaries. Jason tells her, well, all right then, uh, don't do it again. And Roy says, yeah, what he said. While everyone walks Susie back to her room, Candy turns around, sticking her tongue out at Jason. Later back in the States, Jason and Roy drive down the road, with Roy pulling over and Jason asking what's up. Roy says, actually, there's a place that he's heard about. Rehab for capes. Sort of. He's gonna go and he's gonna give that a shot. Jason gets out grabbing his bag, telling him, no problem. I'll track down these leads so we can catch up later. Roy gets out telling him, you call me brave, but the truth is, I drink because I'm scared. Sometimes I'm scared because I think I'm gonna die. More times I'm scared, I will wake up and have a whole new day to prove to the world how much of a failure I am. You said you're going through stuff too, so maybe you want to come? Jason tells him that he knows what he thinks about rehab. It's for quitters. And Roy stares, and then a second later, the two burst out laughing. And Roy says, you're such an ass. If you ever wonder why people hate you, don't. Jason wipes the tear from his face, stating that his family at least had to put up with him. But he's the idiot who chose Roy to be his best friend. Roy tells him, see, you need therapy. The two hug, and Roy says, I'll be seeing you, Jaybird. And Jason, in his mind, says, count on it. Godspeed, Roy. Moments before the outlaw's headquarters imploded on itself, though, the quantum door opened up, and as Artemis told Jason to never call her princess again, she was thrown out onto the ground. Time passed, and Artemis felt a hand tapping on her face. She woke up to see Bizarro, and Bizarro told her, Do not be mad at her, but me looked through your body for broken bones. You're going to be fine. Artemis tells him, Thanks. How long was I out? Bizarro says, Out where? Me stopped counting moons. Me wanted to wake you and say sorry. Me did not want to pull you into Big Door. Bizarro did not want ship to smash Gotham, so me. Artemis grabs him and hugs him, telling him to hush, they're together. Everything else will just get better. And Bizarro smiles, telling her, you am smart. Artemis then looks around, asking, do you know where we are? This place is all destroyed. And Bizarro tells her, someplace not nice, but good news, doorway can still take us back to. But as he begins to speak, the quantum doorway begins to splinter and it falls on Bizarro's head and breaks. He sighs, and then as they look up, he asks, Red her? What am me looking at? And Artemis tells him that she can't say for sure, but she very much is hoping that this is an alternate reality. Bizarro tells her, me agree, me guess. And before the two of them, we see the Justice League Hall of Justice, but here it reads, Hall of Punishment. Now, it's in the middle of nowhere America, with Jason sitting on an empty bus as the bus driver tries to make small talk with him. Jason lets the man go for a bit, but then he tells him to stop. The bus driver says that he really doesn't have to be rude about it, and Jason points, is telling him, up ahead, someone's on the road. The bus comes to a screeching halt, and Jason tells the bus driver to open up the door. The bus driver says that he can't. That would be an unauthorized stop, and he could lose his job. Jason says that, or you could lose your teeth. The door opens up and Jason steps out, with an injured woman in the road telling Jason to get back on the bus. Her name is Special Agent Melissa Mitchell of the FBI, and she's ordering him to leave. It is not safe for him to get involved. Jason leans down and picks Melissa up, stating, yeah, I'm not leaving without you. Once he sets her down on the bus, the bus driver asks what happened to her. She tells them that her and her partner were dispatched to pick up a fugitive crime boss, except the boss had other plans. She barely escaped with her life, but her partner, she witnessed the execution of a federal agent. Just then, a light shines on the bus and a group of bikers appear in the street. The leader of the group holds up a bottle of alcohol and a flare shouting to the bus driver to send out the FBI agent and no one gets hurt. They got one minute to respond. Jason gets back out of the bus telling them, that's good, that leaves us 45 seconds of free time. The biker asks, what do you reckon you're gonna do with that time? And Jason tells him, first, I'm gonna beat the crap out of your friends, and then I'm gonna shove that flare up your, well, <laughs> you get the idea. The biker shouts to the others to kill this punk, and just as he finishes, Jason kicks him in the face, taking the bottle and the flare. As the other bikers begin to run up, he lights the bottle, throwing it into the crowd, covering them in flames. More begin to show up, and as they charge in, Jason grabs one with his own chains, and then he throws him at the others. One man with a knife lunges in out of the fires, and as he goes to stab Jason, Jason steps out of the way, taking the knife, slamming it into the man's neck. The remaining men grab their guns and they open fire. But before anyone can hit Jason, he runs through, stabbing one of the gunmen and taking his gun, killing the rest of them. With everyone dead, 
The leader of the group begins to scoot back, telling him, Please don't kill me. Jason reaches down, grabbing the flare from the man's mouth that he shoved in and telling him, You have bad memory. I didn't say I was going to kill you. After making good on his promise, Jason gets back on the bus and Melissa asks where is he going. He pulls out a mask from his bag and he says he's going to work. Melissa pulls her gun, telling him, she knows who he is. The mask changed, but he's still the same guy who tried to assassinate Cobblepot. You're under arrest. I can't let you walk out of here. As Jason finishes getting changed, he puts on his mask and he says, The only reason I'm even here is because me and a friend are tracking down a drug ring with ties to underlife. Your situation indicates to me that I'm on the right track. Besides, in your current shape, you're not stopping anything. Melissa tells him that he can't go. She's an officer of the law. And as Jason gets off the bus, he asks, how did the law work out for your partner? A short while later, down at the County Sheriff Department building, Sheriff Bradford tells the crime boss, LaCroix, to please be reasonable. He came up with a cover story, but before he can, they're going to need to get out of there before the FBI comes around looking for their dead agent. LaCroix says no. He and his men aren't going anywhere until they get the lady agent's carcass. Just then the lights go out, and Jason jumps through the window wielding a crowbar. One of the thugs begins to open fire where Jason landed, but then he stops when he sees nothing. Bradford grabs his flashlight and he calls out that he doesn't know who he is, but I'm the sheriff around these parts. Jason hits the sheriff in the throat, knocking him out, and LaCroix asks, do you know who I am? I'm a part of Underlife. That makes me untouchable. Jason cracks LaCroix from behind, telling him, I just touched you. What does that make me? Using the crowbar, he beats down the men, killing them with it. As Bradford gets up, he runs to his desk, calling for help over the radio, but when he doesn't get an answer, he notices Jason standing there, holding the plug. Jason starts to walk forward, telling him, A week ago, I never even heard of Underlife. Now is the only thing that anyone is talking about, so tell me everything. Bradford cowers, begging Jason not to kill him. If he says anything, Underlife will kill him. And Jason tells him, Did I somehow give you the impression that I wouldn't kill you? Meanwhile, outside, the crow runs to one of the only patrol cars with keys, and when he turns on the lights, he sees Jason leaning against a wall. He plugs his ears, and the crow says, I don't get it. And then he looks down at the steering wheel, and he sees a note. Boom. Later that night at the hospital, Melissa turns off the news, and she asks if he's going to stand there all night or actually turn himself in. Jason tells her neither. Here, this belonged to your partner. I figured you'd want it. He hands Melissa the badge to her partner and she says that his family will be very grateful. She's grateful. She then says that she's a little surprised that a Gotham crime boss would be so sentimental. Jason tells her that he recently lost two partners himself. Melissa tells him that this goes against every rule in the book, but she could use some of his expertise on this. Jason gets ready to leave through the window, telling her, Yeah, because that always works out. Believe me, the last thing that you need is this outlaw. The next night at the diner, a trucker sits at the bar telling Molly the waitress, Come on, give me your seven digits. I'll guess the area code. Molly says, like she said before, she's pretty sure that her boyfriend wouldn't like that, so he's going to have to settle for coffee. Jason sits next to the man, stating, Make it two. The trucker then asks if there's a reason that he's sitting there when there's open chairs to stretch out in. And Jason tells him that he's curious and he wanted to know if he can help him. He knows the truck out there is hauling three million in stolen medical supplies for underlife. But you're going south. What's south? Texas, New Mexico, south of the border? The trucker says, I'm afraid you're going to be scratching your head for a while. Jason tells him, or you could be spitting the answer out along with your teeth. The trucker laughs as he grabs his knife, but before he could pull it out, Jason breaks the sugar dispenser across the trucker's face. As the rest of the truckers get up, Jason knocks them all out one by one until he's punched in the face by a massive fist. He groans, telling the large man, Tiny, that he should get license plates for those fists. Tiny puts his fists together, telling him, We aren't a bunch of yokels. The underlife united us. We're a part of something bigger. Nowhere. But you? You're just a dead man walking. Just then, there's a quiet plink and Tiny falls to the ground. Jason looks back and he sees Bruce Wayne, aka Batman, standing there, out of costume. He gets up stating, If you're here to fight, can you give me a second? I gotta recover. Bruce tells him, I'm not here to fight. Sit. Bruce gives Jason a cup of coffee and Jason takes a sip, asking, Don't you think it's a little strange? If this is about taking me back to Gotham, it's not gonna happen. Shooting Penguin wasn't a crime, it was a public service. Bruce tells him, Actually, Cobblepot didn't die, so technically you didn't break our deal. But it sure wasn't for a lack of trying, Jason. Okay? So why are you here, Bruce? Bruce sips his drink, and after a moment of silence, he puts his hand on Jason's shoulder, telling him, Roy Harper is dead. I'm sorry. Jason holds his head, and he says, We just talked last week. He... How? Bruce goes on, telling him, We have a place called Sanctuary. 
and Jason repeats the line, Rehab for capes, he said. Bruce continues, We don't know who or why, but a lot of people were killed there. Trust me when I say that I won't rest until we find out who is responsible. Jason sighs. It's a lot of people that are going to be out for revenge. No one needs me getting into the mix. And Bruce tells him, I agree, but Alfred said it was important to let your feelings out. Seriously? Grief counseling from a guy who dresses like a bat? Death isn't the worst thing that can happen to a person. I would know. Am I going to grieve over him? Yeah, absolutely. But everyone who has ever put a mask on is living on borrowed time. Roy would be upset if I spent the life that I have left moping around. Even though everyone has either run away or knocked out, Bruce leaves money on the table, and he heads outside. Jason follows, and Bruce asks, Is there somewhere you need to go? And Jason tells him, Actually, no. I just need fresh air. But Bruce, neither of them say a word. They just hug. And in the reflection, we can see Red Hood hugging Batman. Jason pulls back, and he tells him, Thank you for coming out to tell me yourself. I know it wasn't easy since, you know, we hate each other. I never hated you, not for a single moment. I won't deny that maybe you need to get your ass kicked once in a while, but at the end of the day, I know we both have each other's backs. Later down the road, Jason takes out his phone to make one last call to Roy. He leaves a message and he says that he just heard what happened. This is exactly why he'll never try and get his head together. He just wanted to tell him that he may have been a mediocre archer, but you were the best friend I ever had, Roy. Next time we meet, I'm gonna kick your butt for this whole dying crap, buddy. Jason hangs up his phone, and then he hovers his thumb over the delete contact for Roy. The next morning, Jason finds himself walking through Appleton, home of the world's best cobbler. Everyone here is friendly, like the complete opposite of Gotham. There's just an all-around positive vibe coming out of this place. Heck, even the older couple running the inn are as sweet as pie. No pun intended. Jason steps out onto the porch thinking that it's a real shame that he's going to have to tear this place down, brick by brick. As he looks out onto the town, there's someone else looking in on him. The next day, Jason watches the townspeople as they attend the Apple Days Fair. Jason tries to find something out of place when a woman walks up stating that she just sees someone with an empty mouth. He didn't come all this way to their humble little town to miss their world famous apple pie, did he? Jason tells the woman that he appreciates it, but he's not really an apple pie kind of guy. But while he's talking, the woman says nonsense, stucking a fork full of pie in his mouth. He chews, stating, Okay, that's actually delicious. She laughs, telling him to enjoy his time in Appleton. He then notices the innkeepers at their cider booth and they call Jason over for a drink. He takes a glass stating that everyone here is so hospitable. He holds it up and he sees the reflection of the old man grabbing a gun. The man opens fire with Jason kicking the booth, throwing both the woman and the man off balance. The woman grabs a knife, charging after Jason, and as the second man grabs onto him, holding him into place, he shifts his weight, throwing the man over his shoulder, having him stab a woman instead. Jason pulls the knife out of the man, stating that he's pretty sure the Chamber of Commerce isn't going to be thrilled to hear about this. And the old woman shouts that he's gonna die here. So Jason tells her, nah. He looks at the rest of the townspeople surrounding them and he tells them, you all have 10 seconds to walk away. He slowly begins to count, but even before 10 seconds could pass, Jason simply says, screw it. And he begins to fight the crowd back. Even though Jason can hold his own against most odds, a bat to the back and a hammer to his face can really put a dent on that record. After blacking out, he feels something tapping on his face. And when he wakes up, he finds himself on a cross. He looks at a person who's tapping him and he asks, Do I know you? The giant Solomon Grundy looking zombie begins to laugh. The zombie reaches out grabbing Jason by the chest and he begins to squeeze down cracking and breaking his ribs. So he kicks him back and then he gets ready and he swings. He leans to his side stating that he really hopes this work and the zombie ends up punching through the cross, destroying it. The zombie then trips afterwards though and as he begins to get back up, Jason takes one of the broken poles stabbing it into the zombie's back. With the pole sticking out through his chest, the zombie laughs, and as it grabs Jason by the neck, it begins to crush him. He thinks to himself that he generally feels bad about this, but there's no way he's going to let this happen. So he reaches down, grabbing his hands around the pole, and then he pulls up, ripping through the zombie's torso. As purple and green guts splatter everywhere, Jason falls down, stating that it's a lot grosser than he was expecting. He begins to spit up what fluids got into his mouth, and then he notices that these guts are actually wires. Well, at least the zombie wasn't a real zombie. However, before Jason could even ask anything, he feels a pitchfork poking at his back. He looks back, and Batwoman tells him, You're a long way from Gotham. And Jason tells her, You're not a long way from having your ass kicked. Jason grabs onto the end of the pitchfork, pushing it onto the ground, throwing some of the zombie guts into Batwoman's face. She yells at him, That is so gross! And kicks the pitchfork, breaking it in half as Jason tries to shield himself. He tells her, I didn't go back with him. I'm sure as hell not going back with you. And Batwoman tells him, That's that healthy Jason Todd ego. The truth is, 
We really don't have time for this crap. Jason looks back at the rest of the zombies coming their way and he asks, Why couldn't you just open with that? As Batwoman scans the area, she tells Jason that they know that these things are constructs, so they don't have to go easy on them. Jason takes the broken pitchfork, stabbing the handle through the throat of one of the zombies while running in to help. But as he tries to jump away, one of the zombies grabs him by his jacket, throwing him across the field. Batwoman takes out a set of batarangs, throwing them into one of the zombies, but without Jason for support, she quickly gets captured. A few seconds later, the sound of a motorcycle can be heard, and Jason speeds by, throwing a pitchfork into the head of the zombie, holding Batwoman. As he lands, he says, I found another pitchfork, and Batwoman tells him, clearly, nice bike by the way. He revs it up, asking, you coming or not? As the two of them begin to get away, Batwoman brings up a projection of the target mansion and asks, now are you agreeing with the plan? And Jason tells her, fine, let's just go. As he starts to walk, Batwoman stops him, stating that she just wanted to say she's sorry for his loss. She never really got Arsenal, but she did know that they were close. Jason tells her, I'm an asshat, but Roy... He was always too good for this world, deserved better. Batwoman then says that if he ever needs to talk, and Jason stops her stating, that will never happen, but thanks. As the two begin to take off, Batwoman says that she probably owes him another apology, you know, for getting you and your friends thrown in the Bell Reeve. And Jason shrugs it off, telling her, turns out it was all a part of Bizarro's master plan. It was just a role that you were assigned to play. She laughs, asking, so she was tricked into kicking his butt? That's a novel way of looking at it. Just then, one of the zombies lunges out, grabbing the bike from the back wheel, flipping it up into the air. Jason and Batwoman flip off of it, catching themselves, but as the first zombie breaks the bike in half, Jason grabs onto the chain that flies off of it. He jumps over the zombie, using the chain to cut off the head of the zombie, leaving Batwoman to deal with the rest of them. But before she could really attack, she's knocked back, and Jason catches her. He says that he would feel guilty about leaving her, and Batwoman wipes her mouth, telling him that if he did stay, she would tear out his lungs through his nose. Go! As Batwoman gets up and runs back into the fight, Jason hurries on ahead, telling her, You're just so classy. He quickly makes his way to the mansion, but as he walks up, a group of assassins jump out and surround him. He says, Well, at least you're the saving the trouble of knocking. Meanwhile, inside of the mansion, a robot monitors the situation, telling his boss that there is nothing to worry about, ma'am. This place is fortified with the most high tech. Then there's a low whomp sound as the power goes out, and the woman in the shadows asks, You were saying... The robot tells her not to worry, the auxiliary power will kick in and they will be, but before he can finish the sentence, the doorway explodes, blasting him away. Jason walks through, stating, I think the robot was gonna say safe, but now I'm gonna go with damned. You took a whole town hostage and I'm here to liberate them. Oh, and you're the pie lady. The woman from before who fed Jason holds her hands to her hips, stating, she is much worse than that. She controls underlife territory across three states. She is protected in ways that he cannot imagine. He sets down his gun holding up C4, and he says, People keep saying that to me, right up to the point before I kill them. The woman lunges forward, punching Jason, shouting that she is also holding the children of Appleton hostage. Kill her, and he will never find them. As Jason kicks her back, he says, Pfft, Batwoman already located them before she found you. And those punches? So not human. You are hitting way too hard. The woman throws Jason back, stating, Yeah, she's the latest model of constructs. She didn't birth the others. She's just a distributor. Jason asks, birth? And the woman jumps on him, stating that all of these people were created in a lab in New Mexico, a place called Herve El Agua. Jason uses the chain wrapped around his fist to swipe at the woman's face, yelling, I don't need an address, I need a name. As the woman picks herself up, she says that his name is Solitary, and she can die happy knowing that he is going straight to hell. Jason grabs his gun, stating, yeah, see you there, pie lady. And a short while later, as Jason walks out of the mansion, Batwoman asks, how did it go? The mansion explodes behind him, and he tells her, You tell me. As the sun comes up, Batwoman brings all of the children hostages back to their families, and she leaves with Jason. Jason asks, Do you ever feel like we got it all wrong? She asks how so. The bad guys. They're everywhere, even hidden in the middle of nowhere. They're always better financed and equipped. They either hire goon soldiers or apparently make robots now. Batwoman says, Look, we both have strayed from our original path. He forgave me. Show him that you can learn from your mistakes and he'll forgive you too. Jason tells her, You shot Clayface because it was the right thing to do. I shot Penguin because I was angry. There's no walking away from that. Just then a car honks the horn and Batwoman says that there she is. She jumps in telling Montoya to meet Jason Todd, professional drifter. Jason, meet Detective Renee Montoya. Montoya says to hop in anywhere she can drop him off and Jason says that he's heading south. As he gets in, Batwoman whispers and asks, No questions? And Montoya tells her, Please. I know better by now. Besides, I'm off till Friday. So south it is.
Since the death of Roy Harper, Red Hood has been wandering and searching for answers. Answers about who killed Roy, but also answers on the one called Solitary. Shortly before Roy's death, he and Red Hood were investigating a drug trafficking ring that first led them to Beijing. That is what brought Red Hood to Mexico, or more specifically, Hervé al Aqua. No one speaks of the abandoned prison. Even the locals are petrified just hearing the name. So the question is, what's everyone afraid of? Back in Appleton, the pie lady turned out to be someone called Monday. Just one in an army of clones serving the underlife boss known as Solitary. She claimed that he controlled a huge part of the country that isn't Gotham or Metropolis, which only makes you wonder why Red Hood hasn't ever heard of him. As Red Hood gets to his truck, he looks up, stating that he can see why this place has the locals spooked. This prison is more like a fortress, the one you're not supposed to go into. Red Hood opens up the metal doors and begins to look around, but one of the first things that he sees is blood splatter. By the looks of it, it was caused by a sword, a long one, and who would attack a prison with a sword? But after only getting a few feet within, Red Hood notices a small drone following him, and he thinks at least he's not alone. The next thing Red Hood sees is a giant door torn apart by what seems like an axe. Could a meta have done this? The only one that he can think of that could have done this is Artemis. He hasn't seen Artemis and Bizarro ever since Bizarro sucked the entire floating base that Red Hood, Artemis, and Bizarro had into a portal above Gotham. Just as Red Hood starts to head in, he's struck from behind by a man in a Bat Family costume. The wingman costume, and the man tells him that he'll be honest. That went a lot easier than he thought. Red Hood reaches for his crowbar, stating that his mind was elsewhere. Just like that head is about to be. The man kicks Red Hood in the face, telling him, that's a good one. And a short while later, Red Hood wakes back up, stating, not gonna happen, wingman. No way some third tier wannabe bat is gonna drag me back to Gotham. Wingman tells Red Hood that he's a little confused. He's here to beg him to come back under his own volition. He took Red Hood's old suit, the wingman's suit, to show him that he was wanting him to return. There are interested parties who believe that he is needed. Not everyone agrees with Batman's methods in Gotham. They've been waiting a long time for a prince of crime to lead them out of the darkness. Red Hood then says, well, uh, that was unexpected, but why the getup? Why an old identity of mine? Before Wingman can answer, a brick is thrown, knocking Wingman out. With no one in sight, the bricks begin to move on their own from the wall, and they all aim straight for Red Hood. Red Hood braces himself, but the bricks pass through him and only damage the chair that he's in. Red Hood gets up to look out of the hole in the wall, and he sees a floating arrow made of bricks pointing in a direction. Red Hood tells himself, very subtle. Not like I wasn't going to explore this place anyway. And as Red Hood follows the path, he finds a test tube with another clone inside. Batwoman called them Mondays when he worked with her because the clones were created by the stolen DNA of Solomon Grundy. Red Hood realizes that this is depressing, but the rest of these test tubes, they're terrifying. Just then he hears something and he points his sword at whatever made the noise and he sees a dog. Red Hood says that she's a cute one and he holds his hand out for the dog to sniff. She sniffs and wags her tail, and Red Hood tells her, Good. Now that we're friends, lead on. Just don't expect a name. I'm not very good with names, hence Red Hood. As the dog guides Red Hood through, she brings him to a room filled with the Underlife's tainted drugs, all packed neatly and ready for shipment. Red Hood picks up one of the packages, stating, This is it. They did it. But why can't I shake the feeling that something bad is about to happen? The dog starts to bark at the shadows and Red Hood follows, and that's when he finds some stolen Star Labs tech. When he looks up, Red Hood sees one more test tube, except it's not another clone. It's the metahuman Bunker. Red Hood reaches for the emergency release, and just before he can press the button, a man with three shifting heads appears. Son, Red Hood tells him, Right. I'm gonna go out on a limb and state that the three of you are solitary. Solitary holds his arms up, stating, I knew we would meet again, but I always thought that I would come to find my son, the king of his own domain. Disappointed, to say the least. Red Hood tells him, That's cute coming from someone who kidnapped a 19-year-old metahuman for God only knows why. Or maybe you're scared? Red Hood throws his crowbar at Solitary, and Solitary dodges it and shouts, Ha! Missed by a country mile! Red Hood then says he also missed what the crowbar was being thrown at because it looks a lot less like an experiment and more like a cage. You're scared to death of Bunker, and I'm about to find out why. The crowbar pierces through the glass of the test tube, releasing the water from within, and Solitary yells, You have no idea what power you just unleashed! You forced my hand, son! Bunker was supposed to be used to get a better control over the clones, and all of that will be sacrificed to just maintain Bunker. 
As Solitary runs to the controls, Red Hood tackles into Solitary and gets ready to punch, but the dog starts to bark elsewhere. Red Hood looks up and sees Solitary standing across the room, and he says that he controls perception. He could be standing on his throat and no one would be able to tell the difference. He's called Solitary because only his vision matters. His word is law. Red Hood gets up running away, telling him, unfortunately for you, I'm an outlaw. So your word doesn't mean crap. Solitary begins to lift the bricks up, asking where is he going? And Red Hood says, just out of the line of fire. As the bricks shoot through the air, they hit the test tube containing Bunker. And Bunker steps out shouting, ah, how long have I been in there? The last thing I remember was a psionic disturbance. Solitary begins to escape, stating, it would have been you. You were a threat to everything that has been built. But before Bunker could follow, Solitary begins to get away, and Red Hood stops him, telling him, Hey, I need a favor. A few moments later, Red Hood tracks down Solitary alone with the dog. And just as he turns the corner, Wingman jumps out. Red Hood quickly ducks, grabbing onto Wingman, throwing him into a wall, stating, I'm going back to Gotham on my terms! Wingman punches back, telling him, That's not good enough! We need you now! Red Hood takes the crowbar, cracking into Wingman's arm. The Wingman spins back, slamming Red Hood into the wall, telling him, I will drag you back if I have to! The dog bites into Wingman's leg, causing him to let go, and the ground suddenly begins to shake. Wingman asks, What's going on? And Red Hood tells him, that is the work of my friend leveling this hellhole. You can be a part of the solution or a part of the problem, but you can't be both. Red Hood begins to run off and Wingman gets up stating, That did not go as well as I'd like. Why couldn't you just be honest with me? Red Hood follows the dog as he searches for solitary until he finds him sitting in a cell alone. Red Hood asks, Are you okay? And solitary says, Didn't want it to end this way, Jason. Before Red Hood could ask, everything changes around him and he places the two of them outside of the prison. Red Hood tells him, ah, right, perceptions. And Solitary tells him, yes, this is what I looked like years ago, normal. I was a prisoner locked up for a crime I didn't commit. I wasn't blameless, but in this case, I was unjustly accused. I spent my life writing and trying to reach out to my family. And then the government made me an offer. Red Hood looks at the images of three men strapped onto tables, and he says, yeah, the government would experiment on you in exchange for your freedom, right? But just as they were starting, there was a massacre ordered by a man named Lex Luthor. He wanted his stolen technology back. He sent in a woman to make a statement, and her name was Artemis. She had depths of compassion few will ever know. The process merged me and the two other inmates into one being. Solitary. I was given this power for a reason, and now, together, our father and son, and we can rebuild the Empire, Jason. If that's so, show me the tattoo. It was something you were proud of. Solitary says he must be mistaken, but Red Hood rips off the sleeve to Solitary's shirt, and Solitary backs away, standing he doesn't understand. The ground shakes and Solitary falls, and just as Red Hood begins to reach for him, the dog barks in the other direction. Red Hood whips back, throwing the crowbar into Solitary's chest, and he begins to escape. Solitary calls out to him, but Red Hood tells him, You hurt a lot of people. No one's gonna care if you die on the dirt floor of an abandoned Mexican prison. Solitary coughs. <coughs> you can't talk to your father that way. A week later, in a cemetery outside of Seattle, Red Hood visits the grave of Roy, telling him that he never said this before, but he always hated that hat. That trucker hat that he wore? He's not sure who did this, and he doesn't even care. All he knows is that this has to stop. Never again, buddy. Never again. Bunker asks him, where to next? Red Hood tells him, Gotham City. But I'm gonna need you to go on ahead and set the tables. Bunker then asks, what about you? And Red Hood responds, I have a few things I need to take care of first. Gotham City. Despite everything people read in the news, the city is not the scariest, most dangerous place in the world. Okay, maybe it is, but it's more than that. They have a wonderful nightlife. Despite all the PSAs about their astoundingly high crime rate, tourists flock by the millions annually. Sure, there are some places that are a little less friendly, but see, five miles offshore, they can have nice things. This place is called the Iceberg Lounge, a place where no one is discriminated against. The rich, the poor alike, are both welcome to lose everything at the Berg. And right now, it's under new management. The floating casino now is watched over by none other than Jason Todd. Why would he ever take over a casino? Because he wants to do his part in cleaning up the city. Susie Sue, well, she was brought in to help keep things under control when some of the patrons decided to uh, break the rules. And it's not just her, the rest of the sisters Sue are here. Blanc runs the books. Candy was eager to join the waitstaff. 
Anastasia performs on stage at night. Well, she doesn't trust anyone. Great dealer. Then there's Wingman. Literally, he's Wingman. Probably a long story, but no one's bothered to ask him it. But it's not all fun and games, especially when members of the Falcone family have just lost a considerable amount of money. They yell at the dealer, stating that the game is fixed, and if they don't get their money back, they're gonna melt the place down. Jason smiles, telling them that he certainly hopes they don't. What can he do for them to make this the most unforgettable night of their lives? Because he'll do anything. Well, how about for starters, Miguel here brings them to their exclusive igloo suite while they look into this egregious charge. Bunker, out of costume, tells the three that if they would, they could follow him to the suite. The three follow Miguel upstairs, and then he bows as he opens the door to the most luxurious room in the lounge. The Falcones look around, stating that this is it. They're finally getting what they deserve. Miguel tells them that he is certain no one will argue that. That's when the bricks start to pull out of the ground and they form a circular prison, trapping all three of them inside. As the ball falls into the waters below, Jason asks Bunker if he's sure that it'll stay airtight all the way back to the docks. He shrugs, telling him, probably. Hopefully. Later in the evening, Jason heads back to his office to go over Susie's report when suddenly there's a blinding light that shines through the window and bangs on the door. Dog runs over and starts barking, so Jason tells her to come back and get away from the door. He's pretty sure he knows what's coming next. Jason watches as the bat jet flies by and Susie opens the door with Batman charging in, punching her into the ground, knocking her out. Jason calmly drinks his champagne, asking, Ah, uh, should I pour another? You are out of your mind if you think you're going to get another attempt at playing the bad guy. Jason tells him, Haha, you got it all wrong. Penguin disappeared all on his own. Batman yells, If anyone else would have told me that, I would have believed it. But instead of staying out of Gotham, you've returned. That was a big mistake, Jason. As Batman steps forward, Jason holds up his wrist, telling him, All right, take me in. Batman pauses at the willingness of Jason to come forward. But Jason continues, Oh, wait, that's right, it was Red Hood who shot Oswald Cobblepot in the face. Certainly there would be a perfectly reasonable explanation why Batman's bringing in one of his foster sons to the Gotham City Police. Batman pauses. Jason asks him, What's the matter? Forgot your bat cuffs? See if they can convict me. Send me to Arkham. Wouldn't it be a riot if I wound up in the Joker's old cell? Batman grits his teeth as he turns away, jumping out the window. Jason tells him, stop by any time, dad. He then shuts the balcony door, thinking to himself that he wasn't really lying. Penguin did run. He just ran into an impenetrable panic room right over here in the Berg, and he's locked inside of it now. Jason pours himself another glass of champagne, raising it up to the fish tank behind him. And on the other side, Penguin beats on the glass, with Jason going on, stating, it's sad that I can't see the Penguin through this one-way illusion of depth. Can't even see a thing. But I do take solace knowing that Penguin will see his empire crumbling before him and there's not a damn thing he can do about it. Meanwhile, in the thousand acres of all, a white-haired woman is holding a sword walking through the swampy marsh stating, I know you're here, I've always known. And a voice calls back to the woman stating, What do you want, Essence? Essence tells the floating sage that they need to talk, mother. They need to talk about the mistake that she must long last rectify. They need to talk about Jason Todd. Mother floats for a moment in silence and then says, damn. Elsewhere in Gotham, at Gutter's Fine Fish Products Factory, a butcher is whistling while he throws the next batch of fish into the grinder. A linky shadow opens the door, telling the butcher that they are needed. The butcher then asks, have they been summoned by the penguin? And the shadow says, worse, we haven't heard from him in a week and we have to find out why. Back over at the lounge, Jason walks through the game floor when he notices a blonde woman at the bar staring back at him. She waves, stating that he probably doesn't remember her, but her name is Isabel. They used to date a while back. While Jason goes to rekindle an old flame, there's an explosion that shakes the entire casino. Everyone begins to run away from the smoke, but through it, five men step through and the shadowy man from before tells the others that their boss went off the grid a week ago. Which means the five aces have been activated. We have to find Penguin. But just as the five men are about ready to move out, the lanky man asks, What the hell are you looking at? Susie, along with the other sisters, tell him that the sisters Sue are here to kick their butts and toss them overboard as poorly dressed shark food. Take them down, girls, hard and fast! A brawl erupts as the five sisters begin fighting. They notice the leader of the group disappears. Elsewhere in the casino, Jason tries to lead Isabel to safety when they're suddenly shot at. She tells them, Look, if you need to kill this guy, but before she could finish, a layer of bricks forms shielding them from the gunfire. She asks where the hell did the wall come from, and Bunker walks up holding a briefcase, telling them, that would be me. 
But if you could follow me, our insurance premiums would skyrocket if you were wounded or killed on the property. As Jason takes the briefcase, he opens it and he smiles, telling him, Damn, you really are good. Seconds later, he bursts through the wall of bricks and lands, telling the leader that he's pretty far from the thousand acres of all. The man throws some guns, asking, How did you? And Jason finishes, telling him, Know you're all cast? I can smell a lot of you from a mile away. The man draws a sword, stating, I've heard of you. Others have spoke of you. You were the chosen one. Jason lunges at the man, telling him, Damn straight I am! Now that sucks for you! Moments later, Susie runs into the game room, shouting and asking if Jason is in there. Jason stands in front of a smoldering pile of ash, taking his mask off, telling her, Yeah, I'm here. Susie then says they cleaned up the four aces, but one got away and they aren't sure where he went. So Jason takes a drink and tells him, I'm not sure. Just be glad all our people came out okay. I'll get maintenance to take care of, uh, this mess. But before in another plane of existence, Jason picks himself up, battered and bruised, staring at an unimaginable horror. He tells the giant creature before him that he has two choices. Let the kids go now or be killed. Or free the kids and be killed. The creature opens up its gaping mouth, asking if Duca chose to send a child after him. The devourer of young souls? She has lost none of her humor over the millennia. Jason holds out a glowing sword, stating that she didn't choose him. She just knew better than to try and stop him. The creature laughs, asking, Is that the Allblade? In the hands of a human? How the Allcast has fallen? You expect me to cower and fear over a single weapon? Jason smiles, telling him that the Allblade is the physical manifestation of one's soul. As you can see from all the swords, clearly, I have a lot of soul. He then wakes up in a fountain. The old woman, Dukra, tells him that he is welcome to stay among them. He'll always have a home in the Allcast. Jason says someday he'll return, after Batman and the Joker's heads hang from matching pikes in the center of Gotham City. Meanwhile, in current day Gotham City, Bunker gets to work with the repairs in the casino, heading into Jason's office to get something. Penguin bangs on the glass, shouting, asking, Why did I insist on a soundproof room? As he sighs, he hits his head against the glass, and Bunker stops and looks back. Over in the thousand acres of all, Essence sits before a fire and calls out. Essence, the first daughter of the Allcast, summons you from the grand beyond. The fire flares up and an image of the Ace's leader appears and he shouts that he must be avenged. Essence tells him that he lost the right to be avenged when he walked away from them. She compels him now to tell her the last thing he saw before dying at the hands of Jason Todd. The man says he saw Jason's eyes and there was nothing there. The one who once walked among them, he is gone. Essence waves her hand, dispersing the man's specter, stating, And now, so are you. Meanwhile, over in Paris, Jason walks into a perfume store, and he tells the cashier that if she would like to live, leave. She runs out of the store, so Jason kicks in the back door, stating, You made a good choice. He grabs the guard standing on the other side of the door, several people sitting at the table, then shout at him, asking, What is going on here? The woman at the head of the table stands up, shouting, Euro Blanc has no time to waste dealing with the hired assassin, Red Hood. One of the men calls out that they were summoned here by the new owner of the Iceberg Lounge, Jason Todd. And Jason tells them, You got it all wrong. Todd works for me. He's the public face that handles the business interests. I didn't call together the five biggest crime families in all of Europe for nothing. Another man asks, Then you would be able to tell us what became of Cobblepot then? Jason tells him, Look, if I knew where Penguin was, I'd give him up in a heartbeat. He hit a mountain of expenses when Jason took over the lounge. Probably the same reason he left town in the middle of the night, like a coward. Another man calls out that it was not Penguin's establishment to sell. They have invested hundreds of millions of dollars into the Iceberg Lounge to keep their money clean. Jason tells him, yeah, about that. That's why I called you all here. I'm not in the laundering business. Too bad for you. Laser sights all begin to target Jason, and another man says that he's going to call the casino to have them wire all their money back. If not, he will not leave here alive. Just then, Jason's phone rings, so he grabs it, telling them, uh, hang on, give me a second to dump this call. He hits the button and Wingman appears and tells him that he just wanted to give him a status report on the situation up top. In short, they're locked and loaded. Give the word and the international board meeting becomes a smorgasbord. Lasers start to drop off one by one and Jason asks, are you done? Smart. Ladies and gentlemen, it was an absolute pleasure not doing business with you. Back at the Iceberg Lounge, Penguin is snoring as he sleeps against the glass. But he hears a sudden knock. He opens his eye and Bunker asks, Send your Cobblepot, a moment of your time. Later, as Jason returns to the city, Wingman drives Jason to the docks, asking if everything's okay. He says, I guess, Wing. And Wingman tells him that he's been meaning to ask him about that. First, they were at each other's throats, but he saw past that. He even hooked him up with a job. All this time, he's never really asked his real name. How do you know you can trust me, Jason? Jason tells him, 
I like to keep things simple. Betray me and I'm gonna kill you. Wingman tells him that that is, uh, fair. As Jason hops on his boat to head to the casino, he looks at his costume, stating that after Artemis and Bizarro, you think he'd learned his lesson. All these people around him now, they're growing on him. But just then, the mist swirls around the boat and Jason sighs, taking off his coat, stating, Ha ha! There she is! She wants to stop me. Bad chance of that happening. The all cast is a warrior cult dedicated to protecting humanity from an unspeakable evil. Jason suits up and says, they don't usually like to get involved with anything besides the untitled. I should be honored, Essence. Essence appears before him, stating that it's not something that he should be making a swell of pride with. She knows what he's planning to do, and she's here to stomp it. She reaches up for Jason's mask, stating that she's not sure whether to kiss him or kill him. But his smile, it's gone. He tells her, well, yeah, we're a long way from the thousand acres of all. He goes on asking, what did Dukra think of this? And Essence says that she had to be convinced. She really doesn't want to hurt him. So Jason puts back on his mask, telling her, I'm not really worried. Just then his surroundings change, and Essence takes him to another plane of existence, thinking to himself that he is the only human to be trained by the all cast. Essence was the only heir to the throne that she ever wanted. It was never going to work between them. She thinks fighting on this astral plane was going to throw Jason off his game, but she couldn't be more wrong. She kicks Jason back and Jason tells her, okay, maybe I'm a little rusty. She tells him that her mother was wrong to take him in to teach him their ways. So he charges forward, swinging his sword, stating, maybe not. Maybe she just saw more in me. Essence knocks him back, telling him that he broke her mother's heart when he left. He broke her heart as well. She lunges with Jason knocking her back, stating, stay down, please. But she jumps into the air shouting, never! She showers Jason with energy bolts and he tells himself that it worked. He took a risk to make her angry. Now let's hope he lives through to collect on it. He falls to the ground with Essence's sword in his chest, stating that when they started their training, he took the all blades. She chose the blood blade. She yells that she can slay evil and carry it forever in her blade. He has no idea what she is feeling having to kill him. And he laughs, stating, <laughs> don't feel too bad. Just then her body is sucked into the blood blade and she asks, what is the meaning of this? Once she is trapped within the sword, he pulls it out of his chest, stating, the all blade is a manifestation of what passes for his soul. The blood blade became a sacred trust to never draw the blood of an innocence or be trapped within it forever. He looks at the sword, stating that she made the same mistake everyone else does. Jason Todd, the Red Hood. He's not evil or good. He's just practical as hell. Later, he staggers into his office, placing the blood blade into a safe, and then he hears a click. He looks back to see the penguin sitting on his desk with a gun pointed at him, stating, Wah! Jason slowly raises his hand, stating that he's kind of surprised this didn't happen sooner. Penguin grips the gun, stating that he has one question before he shoots. Why get involved in something so suicidal? What does the Red Hood have over you? Jason pauses for a second and asks, You don't remember? Penguin says, I got shot in the eye, kid. There's a lot I don't remember. Plus, I was at the grand opening of the ice patch when I woke up in a hospital missing an eye. Jason lowers his hand, stating, I was a hired hand by Red Hood. He's the one who owns the place now. Just then, Penguin gets ready to pull the trigger and Dog jumps up, biting Penguin, causing him to miss the shot. Jason runs over, taking the gun from the Penguin, and the Penguin asks, You can't really believe that I'm afraid of you. Jason tells him, No, not me. But Red Hood had a meeting with Euro Blanc a few days ago. They're eager to talk to you about the money that they were laundering through the casino. Penguin jumps to his feet, shouting, Out of the way, I'm ruined! Everything I've worked for! Just then the wall bursts open, his bunker shouts for him to stomp. Penguin jumps up, cheering, That's it, Miguel! Nail this crap to the wall! Bunker tells him, Just a moment. And he forms a wall around both him and Jason. Jason asks, were you the one that let him out of his cage? And Bunker tells him, absolutely. When I first came to work for you, I believed in you. I believed in you until I found that the previous owner was being held hostage, starving, filthy, and dehydrated. Jason shouts, asking, do you even know what the Penguin does? How many families he's ruined? Can't you tell the difference between me and a homicidal maniac? Bunker lowers the brick, stating, I thought I could. As Bunker breaks through the window and the Penguin escapes, Wingman flies down, stating, that he can get the wing ship in the air and blast him out of the water. Jason tells him no. Penguin is wanted by an international cabal five times larger than his own organization. Everything came together in the end. Wingman takes off his helmet stating, wait, you never planned on killing him? Jason tells him, no, I just wasn't gonna let him off that easy. I just needed him off the table while the game was reset. Taking away everything that the Penguin cared about was my goal. Seconds later, Susie bursts in asking what the hell happened and Jason tells her, yeah, you're gonna wanna get a broom or a mop for this. So she punches Jason in the arm, stating, You had me confused with a maid. Jason then says, Not at all. 
As the owner of the Iceberg Lounge, you're going to need to take some pride in this place. After a few moments of silence pass, Susie says, You're serious. She hugs him, stating that she never wanted a life of crime for her sisters. And she just gave them a second chance running this place. Later, as Wingman drives Jason back to the docks, he looks up at the city, stating that he can sit here and marvel at the view all night. It looks majestic, like she could hold you. Jason tells him, Yeah, but she's a liar. No matter how much faith you put in her, Gotham will always let you down. No matter how much of yourself you give, it's never enough, is it? He jumps off the boat and Wingman says that he's more than he'll ever know. He always has been. He takes off his coat and he touches the Batman tattoo in his arm, stating that he couldn't be more proud of his Prince of Gotham. And for those of you who don't know what that means, Jason stated earlier when he thought he met his father, that his father had a Batman tattoo in his arm to remind him of Batman. And when he thought he had met his father, he discovered it wasn't his father when he was missing the tattoo. So the tattoo in his arm implies that Wingman was his father. But anyway, a short while back in the city, Jason gets ready to leave town when a small Brainiac drone stops before him in the middle of the road. An image of Lex Luthor appears, and Jason asks, what could he possibly want from someone like him? Lex Luthor tells him that he comes with an opportunity. He learned everything about a so-called hero under the mentorship of Batman, and still he died. He became a villain pretending to be a hero, and then a hero pretending to be a villain. There's a new generation that could use the talents of one named Red Hood, and he could learn from the experience. He's offering Red Hood the chance to get it right, where Batman got it wrong. Jason sits up on his bike. All right, I'm listening, Lex. Robin has created a black ops prison where he's keeping prisoners in what he is calling the proper way to handle them. He doesn't agree with Batman's plan to put them into Arkham Asylum. So his plan was to create his own prison beneath the base where the Teen Titans work, but then tell none of them that this even exists. And he's dealing with that right now. He's also been getting his information as to where to get these individuals from Red Hood, but it seems like Red Hood may have betrayed them, leading us to today's story. The Teen Titans, well, Robin versus Red Hood. Deep below Mercy Hall, the current headquarters of the Teen Titans, there's a smile that comes across Robin's face. This prison that he built, it's dark, it's cold, it smells. Everything a real prison could ever hope to be. But it must remain a secret. Not many could even stomach what it takes to succeed, except for the one person that has learned his secret. Prior to this, Robin led the team on a covert mission to obtain something within the Batcave itself. Roundhouse steps into the giant halls asking if this is really the Batcave. Also, the Batcave is real? Kid Flash tells him, hold up, why are we here? And Robin tells him because they're gonna steal from Batman. My source has been compromised. It's clear the others reach in the criminal underworld may be wider than anticipated. If we're going to fight this, we're gonna have to level the playing field and take Batman's most powerful tool, information. Robin then tells Roundhouse that they're going to need full backdoor access to Batman's computers. While they work on that, he has something else to deal with. Roundhouse begins to get to work, but while everyone crowds around the computer, Crush looks around, noticing Jin is missing. Just then, an alarm goes off, and Red Arrow asks, what did he do? Roundhouse asks, would you believe me if I told you nothing? Meanwhile, upstairs, Robin passes a portrait of Thomas and Martha Wayne, with Alfred stating that he remembers the day that they set for that painting. Welcome home, Master Damien. You should know, Master Bruce spends many a sleepless night thinking of you and your well-being. Robin pulls up his hood, stating, That man barely sleeps anyway. But as he walks away, Alfred stops him, stating, You shouldn't take things that don't belong to you. Robin starts to state, I didn't. And Alfred stops him, telling him, I also don't appreciate someone going through my things. I cannot allow you to leave with what you took. Robin asks, Why are you protecting him? And Alfred tells him, Because Jason is your brother. I'm going to do for him what I would do for any of you. Just then, the alarms reach the main floor, and Robin says, it sounds like you're needed down in the Batcave! Alfred sighs, telling him, Oh, Master Damien, it's being handled. Down in the cave, Roundhouse says, I got good news, I stopped the alarm. Should be smooth sailing from here on out. But that's when from above them, Batman leaps out of the shadows. Back upstairs, Robin tells Alfred to move. Red Hood betrayed me! I'm just doing what Father should have done a long time ago. Alfred tells him, Jason's methods may be unorthodox, but he is a part of his family and on the side of good. Do not presume malice in what is perhaps a miscommunication. Talk to him. Do not make rash decisions that you may regret later. Robin leaves walking down the halls of the Batcave, passing all of the portraits of everyone. When he looks up at the painting of Bruce and all the others, he scoffs, continuing on his way. But behind him, Jin is watching from afar. Down below, Kid Flash runs through the cave, yelling to Batman, You know us! Stop this! Something's not right here! 
over by the giant penny. Roundhouse is hiding, praying to God that if he survives, he will limit himself to only playing two, maybe three hours of Fortnite a night if they make it out of here. Batman starts to walk closer when Robin jumps through, cutting off Batman's head. Roundhouse screams as Batman's head bounces on the floor, but then everyone notices the circuitry hanging from the neck. Roundhouse shouts, asking what just happened, and Robin tells him, it's a rare case where Batman wasn't here. There are security measures in place. But when everyone gets ready to leave, Red Arrow asks Jin where she's been the whole time. She thinks about it for a moment and says that she must be mistaken. I was here the whole time, Red Arrow. Back in the current time, our current day, Robin hears his name being called out. And in that moment of not paying attention, Black Mask reaches towards Robin with a makeshift ship. A Red Arrow shoots past him and into Black Mask's hand, and Red Arrow says that she thought they were in this together. That mission they went on, that was a distraction, wasn't it? What were you really doing there? Why keep me in the dark? Robin picks up the shiv, telling her, it was a uh, family business. Red Arrow then says that she knew working with Red Hood was a bad idea. He was the one who tipped them off about Gordon, but the other knew they were coming when they went for Lady Vic. So Robin tells her, I know, trusting Red Hood was an error in my judgment. Red Hood is in league with the other. And Red Arrow says that, or he is the other. As the two head back up to the loft, Robin takes out a small box stating that their mission was to retrieve this. And with it, Red Hood will no longer be a problem. Later that night, Robin follows a stumbling Jason Todd out of a bar. He didn't want to confront him like this, but things need to be taken care of. He sits on a stool next to Red Hood and he tells him, You look like crap. And Red Hood asks, Are you even old enough to be in here, Damien? Robin laughs, stating that the law states that minors can be in businesses that serve alcohol as long as they are accompanied by an adult. So that's you. And we need to talk. Red Hood grabs his beer, telling him, No, we don't. Besides, you're already too late. The old man already found me. Told me what happened to Sanctuary. Red Hood then pulls out a dart and lines up his throw, stating, You better find out who killed Roy, or I will. The dart is thrown, and Red Hood says, I was very clear how this works, Damien. You come to me, not the other way around. And Robin tells him, We have a situation. Lady Vic is dead. The other killed Vic before my team could get her. They blew up the whole building with us inside. We barely got it alive. Red Hood asks, is everyone okay? And Robin tells him, yeah, but perhaps you were expecting otherwise? Hoped maybe we would all die? Red Hood then asks, what are you talking about? And Robin tells him, someone knew we were coming and I know who, it was you. Robin whips his arm back with the dart stabbing into Red Hood's leg. And Red Hood shouts asking, are you crazy or something? A second later, Robin is thrown out of the bar and as he gets up, he quickly changes into his costume with Red Hood storming out yelling, what the hell do you think you're doing? Robin jumps up, throwing Batarang, telling him, I know it was a setup. Nobody knew we were trying to stop Lady Vic other than you. You're the one who gave us the mission. Robin starts swinging, but Red Hood catches his arm, stating, don't do this. Robin then jumps onto Red Hood's back, ripping off his mask, stating, I am going to take you down for good. After an electrically charged hit to the face, Red Hood falls. Robin tells him, say it. Say you're working with the other. You've got enough of your own sins. You're not going to get me to confess to something I didn't do. Robin then asks, you want to keep playing games? Okay, let's play. He then takes out the small box that he got from the mansion. Red Hood looks up at it stating, what's in there is my business. It's bigger than this whole crusade. Even Batman wouldn't stoop this low. Robin tells him, say the truth now. Red Hood tells him, you want the truth? Now I'm pissed. He smacks the box out of Robin's hand, and as Robin tries to run for it, Red Hood grabs him by the cape, flinging him into a truck. He takes out both his fists, cracking Robin in the back, telling him, I would ditch the cape if I were you. Robin laughs, stating that he's done taking lessons from him, and Red Hood picks him up by the hair, punching him, telling him, next time, you need to check your facts. You always think you're the smartest one in the room, and there's some truth to that, but you're still just a kid with a lot to learn. Red Hood then finishes with a knee to the face, and as Robin falls, he tells him, Consider this one final lesson. Don't start a fight you can't finish. Robin leans up, opening his vest, showing a bomb, shouting, Even if I lose, I'm gonna win! Red Hood stares up for a moment, and then he smiles. <laughs> nice bluff. We've both been dead once before, but you lost the minute you showed up. I'm not working for the other. In time, you'll understand that. But from here on out, if you and your team come looking, I will put you all into the ground. As Red Hood picks up the box, he leaves. And elsewhere, the other watches. Even later that night at Mercy Hall, Robin tosses in his bed groaning with Jin asking what's wrong. He tells her nothing, and Jin says that she's here to help him. He needs to be honest with himself. So he gets up stating that he just misjudged something, that's all. And Jin tells him, ah, I can see it now. You're feeling sorry for yourself. Robin spins back shouting, I am not! But in doing so, it causes him enough pain to fall to his knees. 
She kneels beside him, telling him that she can heal his physical wounds, but he needs to let her in. The body and the soul are more connected than he might realize. This requires trust. He swats her hand away, stating, Trust is a commodity I can't afford. I would expect you to understand that more than anyone on this team. She places her hand on his shoulder, telling him that he withholds from the team for the greater good. But his wounds are severe enough that they require attention either from her magic or a physician's hand. So what are his barriers worth to him? Will he maintain them at the cost of his life? He shuffles in the bed, stating that he'll be fine. He just needs rest. As he sits on the bed, Jin says that he had absolute power with her ring and he chose to return it to her. She trusts him. If she heals him, he will need to trust her. That is why she will share with him one of her own secrets, her greatest shame. 4,000 years ago, there was a tale that angels were created from light, and Jin was created from smokeless fire. Her brothers existed before man walked this earth, but she was born in a time of humanity. She is Scylla, a female Jin, rare amongst her kind. Shrines were built to her, sacrifices made in her name. It wouldn't be long before she drew the attention of the eldest of them, the most powerful Jin there is, and ever was. His name was Elias, and he was the most beautiful thing that she had ever seen. He opened her eyes to the truth of all things, but the Creator made them to be subjugated to the will of humanity, to a life of servitude, not gods, but slaves. Elias taught them that they could fight back, and they did. They fought against those wishing to control them. Eventually, their mission took them to Maka, the mother of all cities. They were there to retrieve the infamous Stone of Souls. It was a stone that was said to have descended from heaven itself. As they prepared for the fight of their lives, they found the stone's protectors were mere children. She refused to kill them, and Elias grew angry. He questioned her loyalty to him and their kind. So she turned and used her magic to stop him, and her other brothers fled with the stone. She cast a protective spell upon the children, but for betraying Elias, she would be punished. Instead of killing her, he did something far worse. He took her ring and made it into a prison. He then commanded her to kill every one of the last children she tried to protect. But her punishment had only begun. He never stopped looking for the stone, and over the thousands of years, he lended her ring to other masters who might help him achieve his goal. But a year ago, the unexpected happened. A young boy stole the ring from his master and gave her back her freedom. Since then, she's had to hide her powers in fear that Elias would come back. Jin looks at Robin and asks, Do you hate me for knowing my secret? He tells her that he's not really in a position to judge. She isn't the only one who's done things that will follow them forever. He's hurt people too, taken lives. But he's always had a choice. She can't blame herself. He then takes off his mask, telling her that she isn't alone. My name is Damien Wayne. And Jin says that it's nice to meet him. As the two begin to get closer to kiss, there's a beep coming from Robin's mask. He looks at the visor, and an image of Deathstroke comes on the lens. Jin asks what's the matter, and the words, Deathstroke escapes Arkham, begin to flash. So he puts on the visor, stating, Everything. As Jason Todd walks through a park, he holsters his gun, and he puts back on the hood, stating, Hey buddy, you got a second? The young boy, Vessel, sings on the swing set, telling him, Sure, anything for you, sir. So Jason kneels down, and he says that he knows about his ability to sync with the dead, to use their superpowers, and he needs him to do it right now. Vessel stops swinging, and he tells him that he really doesn't want to. Sometimes it hurts. Jason leans in, stating that he really wasn't asking. Either Artemis or Bizarro. Can you find them? So Vessel's body begins to shake, and Jason reaches for his gun. But then, Vessel stops. He tells him, nope, nothing. Sorry, Mr. Hood. So Jason tells him, no, it's fine. You did good. Let's go or you'll be late for class. Vessel hops off the swing, stating, but I have good news, though. It didn't hurt that time. It's getting easier to do. And as the two walk out of the Tranquility program, Jason knows that this actually is a good thing. The fact that Vessel can't commune with the ghosts of Artemis and Bizarro means that somewhere out there, they're alive. Now let's go back in time a bit. Six months to be exact. We're going to see exactly what happened to the ones known as Artemis and Bizarro. After jumping through the quantum doorway in an attempt to, to save Bizarro as he was mentally digressing, the two found themselves in a strange and faraway land. One where the Hall of Justice was in ruins and it was labeled the Hall of Punishment. Bizarro looks up at all the spikes sticking out of the building and he asks, We am going in? And Artemis tells him, We certainly am. But off in the distance, there are two people watching, known as the Dairy King and Air Quote. Dairy King takes a puff of his cigar, lowering his binoculars. It looks like they've got themselves some capes. One of them, they are superheroes that were supposed to save the world. Call the reinforcements! Stat! The young girl next to him lifts her hand up, and as she makes the call, she says, Yeah, hostiles. Yeah, I'll hold. As Artemis and Bizarro walk into the hall, Bizarro sets his hand on fire with laser vision. 
Artemis asks him, doesn't that hurt? Bizarro asks, does what hurt? Artemis sighs, not even bothering to follow up the question, and then stops Bizarro from moving any further. In front of them stands the shadowy figures of the Justice League. Bizarro asks, Why am nobody happy to see us? Artemis tells him that it's not the Justice League, but their statues. They've been destroyed. Someone is trying to tell them something. Just then a voice calls out, Excuse me, but the museum is closed for the evening. You're not supposed to be here. The two turn back to see a security guard holding a flashlight and Bizarro quickly freezes up his hand. The guard then asks, how did you just do that? Unless you are capes, bona fide capes. The light chuckle, the guard says, <laughs> I'll show you around a bit since you don't seem to know where you are. Truth is, I haven't seen a real live cape since Hero Day. Artemis asks, what is Hero Day? The guard leads them to a large door stating that it was the day the whole world fell apart. The day that mere mortals had to get themselves back on track one hero at a time. The massive doors open and Artemis and Bizarro see Superman's body, his head crushed under the weight of the Daily Planet antenna. Artemis grabs her sword looking back at the guard stating that he's gonna tell her exactly what happened. The guard says, could have been Lex Luthor, Brainiac, hell, a mishap at Star Labs. The thing is, no one really knows. All we know is that the bomb went off, something genetic, like a switch that had been flipped. Every metahuman on Earth had their powers just turned off. And nearly every ordinary human wound up with a superpower. Some got one of each, some got all. Apparently you lured it over people long enough. Some people are eager to settle the score. Suddenly the ice covering the guard's fist begins to crack and spikes like what's covering the Hall of Punishment shoot out. Artemis calls upon her axe, but it doesn't come. And instead she feels as if her very essence is being ripped from her. Bazara catches her asking, you am okay? Me think mostly, where am mistress? Artemis tells him that she doesn't know. She summoned her, but she's not here too far too. Bizarro tells her, Now a bad time to sleep, Red! As Bizarro sets Artemis down, spikes shoot out from the ground, impaling Bizarro. He screams in pain and then looks back, stating, You did this! A security guard, now covered in spikes, says, Yeah, and I'll confess, I sure do enjoy putting capes like you in your place. I didn't do it alone, though. Many of us rose up, thousands of us. Without your so-called powers, you were nothing. Soon the spikes begin to crack and Bizarro walks out telling him, Power does not make you something, but sure am helps. Say goodbye, jerkhead. Seconds later, the security guard can be seen flying through space and into the sun. Bizarro dusts off his hands with Artemis getting back up, stating that she normally wouldn't condone such an act. But as he put it, he was certain a jerkhead. But they can't stay here. They need to go and get a lay of the land. There could be hundreds of superpower vigilantes, maybe millions. And Bizarro then says, or lots. Outside, a group of superpowered humans patrol the area while Artemis and Bizarro watch from afar. Bizarro asks, can we just kill them first? Red her? And she says that she's thinking, but that's when a voice tells her that thinking is the highest cause of death around these parts. The two look back to see a slender man, somewhat looking like the Joker who says that his name is Knife, Jack Knife. Now stay and be slaughtered by a never-ending wave of superpowered norms, or join the resistance and live to fight another day. So six months later, around the time frame of Red Hood's current adventures, a superpowered human named Flutterby flies through the city telling herself just a little further. But soon her wings of fire fade as she crashes down into the pile of bricks. A voice tells her that she gave it her best shot, but she chose the wrong side in the meta-biological conflagration. She was one of them, but instead she turned coat and chose to die with a bunch of genetic dead ends. Flutterby smiles and says that she supposes that's one way of looking at it, Kennel. Kennel stares for a second in his suit of armor made out of a car, and then says, wait, why are you smiling? A second later, a bearded Bizarro bursts out of the ground, punching a hole in the suit, shouting, Me am why! Me am Bizarro! People smile when me around! Kennel falls out of the suit of armor, and Flutterby jumps up shouting to end him. But Bizarro stops her telling her, No, Red Him said not to kill, so Bizarro not kill. Mostly, you have the jewel thing we needed? Flutterby hands over the small green jewel, and Bizarro walks away looking at it, stating, Me am walking away, in case you want to do more for good. In which Flutterby flies up and sets Kennel on fire. Meanwhile, over in the Pentagon, Jackknife holds his hands out of the cell, stating that all it took was one bomb and everything changed. Artemis' voice asks if he really thinks that she is seriously listening to him. Artemis, now having one side of her head shaved, leans against the cell wall. When two guards walk up telling her to step back, she knows the drill. She turns her back to them, holding her hands out, stating, yeah, yeah. 
Yet every time that she does as she's told, they tase her anyway. The other guard says, not this time, but as he tases her, he laughs shouting, just kidding. She groans as she starts to get back up, stating that they have six seconds before the recharge. Can he do it? So Jackknife jumps over her, stating, Absolutely, positively lootly, your royalness! He kicks both men in the necks, knocking them out, but as he jumps down on one of them, ready to kill, Artemis grabs him by the tie, stating that they don't have time for this. The two make their way through the halls of the Pentagon, and as they enter in the monitor room, a man stops them, stating, Welcome. He knows who they are and what their pathetic resistance is trying to do, and it ends here. They may call him General Samuel Lane. Artemis tells him that they have decimated his forces over the past few months. What makes him think that he can really defeat them? Lane asks, in a word, reinforcements. Apparently, there is an opening between here and another universe through a quantum wormhole of sorts, which means that they'll have an entirely new Earth from which they can call metas while making normal people more plentiful in the process. The screen lights up with images of Artemis and Bizarro's home world, and Jackknife asks, That's where you came from, huh? Artemis then asks, How do you plan on delivering your genetic bomb? Lane says, Admittedly, I do not know. But another voice says, But for me, it's child's play. A moment later, a giant brain with a face comes rolling up, and Artemis says, Lex. A hologram of Lex's face appears, and he asks, Have we met? And Artemis says, To her eternal shame, she used to work for him in another reality. Jackknife then says, that That's Lex! He's the guy behind Hero Day? And Artemis says, Was there ever really any doubt? But why would you think that you can send a bomb across the universe? The brain turns around and slowly wheels away, and Lex says, quite easily. As you can see, this quantum doorway that I have found and repaired can allow me access to the multiverse. No other individual but myself could have fixed this. Jackknife looks up to see the fragmented quantum doorway put together, and he asks, should they be scared of a glowing block of wood? What am I missing here? Artemis thinks to herself, stating that she cannot let Lex have this. She must. But as Artemis jumps into the air, Lex electrocutes both Artemis and Jackknife, stating that they're pathetic creatures. Quietly, she says, now be. Lex asks, be what? Just then the shadow of a man appears and Bizarro jumps through with other members of the resistance shouting, Outlaws! Outlaw! As Jackknife grabs the genetic bomb from one of the guards, he tosses it to Bizarro. And the shadow then grabs Ondaline, shouting that you may have destroyed our base of operations, but you cannot kill the brains behind our plan. Artemis tells him that he would be surprised. She comes down slashing through Lex's giant brain and the hologram begins to fade. Bizarro holds up the small jewel from before the bomb and says, Done. So Jacknev then takes the bomb and says that this should reverse everyone's genetic alterations, even if most of the original heroes are dead. But maybe it'll be better that way with no one having powers. Artemis takes Bizarro by the hand and tells him that heroes and outlaws are wherever you least expect to find them. You realize that there's no way to know if this is actually going to work, if your door is going to bring us back to our original world. And Bizarro says, Me know where Red Her is. Bizarro will be. And with that, the two jump through the quantum door and hopefully, they're returning home. It was a dark night in Gotham as a man runs through the freight harbor yelling that he doesn't know anything. Suddenly, he slams into a metal container and breaks his nose, but as he gets back up, he continues to run. But before he could get past the clearing, he's shot in the arm and Red Hood tells him to relax. It's rubber bullets. I can shoot you again, or we can talk about the new drug that's making its rounds. As Red Hood gets closer, the man shouts that he doesn't know anything about it. Don't shoot! And Red Hood presses the gun against the man's head. He panics, stating that he only knows where he gets it. The building on the corner of 7th and Orchard. Red Hood pulls back his gun. He knows the junkie is telling the truth. It's time to see if this info is any good. This new drug is the kind that gives people a sense of euphoria and extremely pleasant hallucinations. They're called cheer drops. It all sounds good, except the addicts can get trapped in that state of cheer, walking in front of cars, drowning, committing self-harm, all while witnessing their greatest dreams coming true. But while he's making his way to the building that the man gave him, Red Hood overhears two officers stating that they just received a shots fired call. One asks the other if they want to check it out, and the second officer asks, with no backup, no chance. First one says that it could just be kids. Last week, McAdams and Rodriguez chased a bunch who were shooting bottles down by the wharf, gangbangers showing them how to use guns before initiating them. The second officer says, really? This city? Kids should just be kids. It's sad to see them get raised around this stuff. Those words remind Red Hood of a time when he was younger, back when Batman first brought him in. It was before Batman 
actually took him out on patrol, and Alfred would remind him that he should be training rather than lazily hanging around the cave. With nothing else to really do, the young Jason did just that, and when he went to get a pair of batarangs, he noticed another room in the armory, one that was filled with guns. Before Jason could even reach up, Batman appeared behind him, stating that he isn't allowed in here. And Jason asked, what is this? Don't you hate guns? Batman responded with, he does, but he still needs to know them for forensics work. He needs to master everything, including the things that he hates. Guns are a coward's weapon, and we will not be cowards, Jason. Now, let's see how good you've become at long-range knife targets. Meanwhile, in the current day, elsewhere in Gotham, Batman has also witnessed the effects of the new drug as a man who thinks that he's at an amusement park jumps off of a building. Batman quickly jumps to save the man, thinking that he's going down a roller coaster, setting him down, telling him that he's going to be okay. But as Batman leaves, he takes with him the used cheer drop packages. Back with Red Hood, he investigates the building that the junkie told him about when he hears sniffling from the other side of a door. He looks in to find a child screaming to see him, so Red Hood takes off his helmet, telling him that it's okay. He's not gonna hurt anyone. Is this your mom? The panicked child tells him yes. She was in the bed laughing and happy, and now she's... Red Hood looks at the woman, stating that she's... She's okay. Uh, she's just asleep. What's your name? The child cries. Tyler. Red Hood tells him. Okay, uh, I'm gonna get your mom some help. But do you have a dad or another mom? Tyler says that his dad is at work. His name is Andy. So after calling for an ambulance, Jason calls Oracle, stating that he needs to locate a person. She asks him what is it for, and Red Hood says that it's the kid's mom. She OD'd on that new street drug. He's alone. Shortly after that, Oracle gets another call, but this time from Batman. He tells her that he's run some tests on the cheer drops. The drug is a modified version of Scarecrow's fear gas, seemingly creating the opposite effect, which means that it's likely that Dr. Crane is in fact not dead. He'll need the current activities of all of Scarecrow's known associates. But as Oracle hears the request, Batman asks if she's there, and she tells him, actually, Red Hood is also investigating the drug? I know you two aren't exactly friends, but... Batman turns on the Batmobile, telling her, Jason is a killer. I'm going to do this alone, Barbara. Later, outside of Andy's work, Red Hood tells Tyler that he's going to have to wait here. Can you uh, be a superhero and do that? Tyler asks if he can pick his name, and Red Hood tells him sure, but he'll have to stay put and wear the super mask while he gets his dad. So Red Hood fits his mask over Tyler's head and tells him, if anybody bad comes, all you have to say is, Oracle, I need help. Now, what's your superhero name? Tyler asks, what's yours? It's Red Hood. Well, then I'm gonna be the Blue Hood. I like blue. That's perfect. Uh, sit tight, I'll be right back, okay? Blue Hood. But of course, this rundown building is not the ideal place for someone to work. Not unless you're a construction worker or someone really not wanting people to see what you're doing. As Red Hood gets to the top of the building, he sneaks in through a window and a man with a gun asks, who the hell is he? Red Hood quickly kicks out the legs of the gunman, and then he sees that the place is actually where the cheer drops are being manufactured. He jumps down tackling more of the dealers, asking which one of them is Andy, and a man runs out of the building, and Red Hood follows, kicking down the door in his path. He takes one shot at the man's back, and he trips, but Red Hood tells him not to worry. Rubber bullets. Is your name Andy? The man rolls over. Yeah, who wants to know? I'm here with Tyler, your son. His mom is in a coma from the drug. I came here because I didn't want Tyler to end up with the state, but it looks like that's what's gonna happen anyway. Andy laughs. <laughs> Who cares? The kid was a pain in the ass. Him and his mother. Honestly, I don't care if he lives or dies. The kid's a whiny brat. Even when I gave the kid his own supply to keep him happy, both those leeches can go straight to. But before Andy could finish, Red Hood fires three more shots into Andy's chest. Except they weren't rubber bullets. Andy slumps back onto the ground, blood pooling around him. Red Hood falls to his knees. Oh god, the kid, what have I done? As the rain pours down in a back alley of Gotham, Jason Todd stands over the dead body of the man. He has taken the lives of people that he's never known before, except that they had guns aimed at him. He didn't have time to think of the mothers getting the news or the kids being, well, before he could really process his thoughts, he calls Oracle to tell her that he messed up. She asks him what happened, and Jason tries to steady his shaky voice. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give you the location. When he was younger, his mother would often send him to get stuff from the store when one of her friends would come by. But Jason knew. Those friends were her drug dealers. 
One night as Jason left, one of the hitman's dealers came by asking if she was home. Jason said some very not nice things to the man, and the man slammed him against the wall telling him that if he wants to be tough, he better be prepared to back it up. The man then said that they were there because his mother was sick and that she needed medicine. But back in our current times, three men drive down the street and one of them looks at a list asking if they're getting groceries. The driver asks, really? Why even bother sending three of us? And then a deep voice says, Sydney Page, you disappoint me. I told you to stop, and now here I am. The passenger, Sydney, jumps out of the moving van with the driver coming to a screeching halt. As they get out, they grab their guns, and down the street, they see Batman. The streetlights come on one at a time until finally it's pitch black. Sydney curls up quietly, saying no, while Batman takes out one of the passengers. The driver then points his gun where he heard the sound of his screaming friend, but Batman kicks the gun out of his hand. The driver starts to aimlessly swing, yelling that they don't scare him, so Batman points a small crossbow at the driver's head. No. He lifts his arm, shooting the bolt into a nearby street post, and as the wire that the bolt is connected to tightens, he digs it into the driver's leg, pulling him into the air. Sydney gets ready to crawl away, but Batman grabs him, asking, Where were they? Ah, I was going to ask you why you were working for the Scarecrow again. However, judging by your winter coat, it's freeze this time, isn't it? Sydney yells, Yes, Scarecrow's dead! Work dried up! So I threw in with Freeze's gang! Batman asks, What is Freeze up to? Sydney tells him, I don't know, honest, Freeze had us going for groceries. So Batman lets go of Sydney as the streetlights come back and he radios back to Oracle about his report. She says she got it, but Red Hood might be in trouble. Later in Jason's apartment, he tries to collect his thoughts when the young boy Tyler asks if they're going to find his dad. Jason looks back, yeah, your mother's very sick. She's uh, getting help and your dad, he's a sick too. We're gonna stick together until things get better, okay? Tyler nods, okay. Can I play with your mask again? Jason tells him, of course, and as Tyler puts it on, Jason steps back asking, What am I doing here? I can't take care of a kid. But if I put him in the system, it won't get any better. What I really think I'm doing is waiting for an obsessed militaristic billionaire to adopt him. The kid's dad is scum. He hurt Tyler. He hurt his mom. And if, if Tyler's mom doesn't pull through, he's just going to be another orphan. Tyler is too young to really see what he's gone through. He can still be saved, unlike... Unlike... Jason thinks back to the night that he waited outside of his apartment while his mom's friend was still over. Eventually, the man shuffles up sniffing and wiping his nose, asking, What? Have you been here the whole time, kid? Oh, well, took longer than normal. Decided to take some medicine, too. Apartment's all yours, tough guy, but mom's gonna be sleeping for a while. As the dealer begins to walk down the stairs, Jason turns back, pushing him down. That dealer didn't survive that night. Back in the current times, while Jason relives those events, Tyler says that the mask is talking to him. It says that Batman wants to talk and, uh, he's here. Jason quickly looks back at the door and when he turns back, he sees Batman standing in the window. Batman tells him, the police are cleaning up your mess, including the body. Was it you? Jason takes his fighting stance. Yeah, it was. Batman steps through. I warned you, no guns, no killing, not in this city. Jason yells, can you even hear yourself? What? Did I step over some municipal border? That guy was hurting people, and he'd just do it again. As Batman grabs at Jason's arm and tells him to stop, Jason swings with his free hand up, elbowing Batman in the face. Batman manages to push him back in the two trade blows, destroying the furniture around them. Batman swings, catching Jason in the chin, telling him, Stay down! Don't make me! But Tyler runs up, Leave him alone! Red Hood's a good guy! Jason starts to get back up. Hey there, kiddo. It's all right. Everything's fine now. As the little boy Tyler stands between Jason and Batman, he yells, Leave him alone! Red Hood is a good guy! Jason sits up and he hugs the boy. Hey, kiddo. It's all right. Everything's going to be okay. Batman kneels down asking, What's your name? And Tyler tells him, I am the Blue Hood. After glancing at Jason, Batman begins to reach into his belt. It's nice to meet you, Blue Hood. But can you do us a favor and wait over there for a moment? If you do, you can have this lollipop. Tyler takes it, telling him, yes, thank you, Batman. As Tyler walks off, Jason looks at him. Really? Lollipops? And Batman tells him, it's effective for distracting children at emergency scenes. But Jason, what the hell is going on? Who is that kid? Jason looks down. The guy that I killed, the cheer drops dealer, that's his son. Batman begins to speak, but Jason quietly tells him, Look, Batman, the man was trash. He was drugging Tyler and he put his mom into the hospital. She might not live. The kid might, he might be an orphan. 
like us. And before you say it, yes, I know, this is Gotham. No killing in Gotham. But that guy, he deserved it. Batman stops him. Okay, what now? You're going to be this poor child's warden because of your guilt? The boy needs help, Jason. Jason tells him. Y you're right. That guy deserved it, but I, I messed up. I just, I don't want to see Tyler in the system. It's different when you have people like Alfred and money, but Tyler has nothing. Batman begins to walk towards Tyler. I'm going to get the best doctors on his mother's case, and I'll clean up this mess and shut down whoever's making this cheer drops drug. Jason stops him. I'll shut it down. Batman looks back at him. We'll shut it down. But first things first, let's get Tyler in good hands. So a short while later in the backyard of Dr. Tompkins, Leslie hears a dog barking and asks if he is... The dog runs over to Tyler, wagging its tail, and Batman says, I apologize for dropping by unannounced, but I have a request. This boy's name is Tyler. His father just died, and his mother's in a drug-induced coma. We're hoping that she pulls through, but Jason doesn't want Tyler in state custody for, obviously, a personal reason. Until we shut down the person who caused this and come up with a permanent solution, I was hoping that you would look after the boy for a few days. Leslie tells him, of course, as long as his permanent solution isn't going to be creating another Robin. Batman looks back and pets the dog with Tyler. It's not. If anything, it's to help a Robin. Batman tells her as he looks over at Jason. Afterwards in the garage, Jason looks at the data stating that the cheer drops share a lot of similarities to Scarecrow's fear gas, which probably is the best place for them to work backwards from. Crane was a trained psychologist. He was never a trained chemist. He needed help creating the gas in the first place. The compound breaks down quickly. No one's ever been able to analyze the fear gas, except Batman. Jason looks at him. I'll assume that there's someone that he worked with at Gotham State University then. Do you have anyone in mind? And Batman glances down at his former Robin. Exactly. Looks like we're going to make a detective out of you yet. Later at the Gotham State University, Dr. Romero begins to collect her things for her lecture when, out of the shadows, Batman tells her, We'd like a moment of your time. Dr. Romero asks who's they, and they can just call her Olivia. Please sit, Mr. Uh, Batman. It's okay, I'm actually here to talk about your old associate, Dr. Jonathan Crane. She sighs. Oh god, I'd like to say that I hadn't thought of him in years, but every time he shows up as that scarecrow, I'm reminded of it all over again. So Batman asks, Were you the one that created the fear gas? He tells him, yes. Dr. Crane approached her department, wanting to do experiments on fear, pitching it to her as a way to study it in order to overcome it. But after he became the scarecrow and started abusing the formula, she destroyed all copies of it. However, it was too late. He'd learn how to make it on his own, better than she did, more powerful, more insidious. And after that, she stopped working in the lab and halted all of her research. The university was gracious enough to allow her to stay and teach, but all of her goals and science were ruined because of Jonathan Crane and his abuses. Batman tells her, It's okay. You don't have to continue. I'm only interested because the new street drug, Cheer Drops, share chemical similarities with your original formula. I would love to hear any insights that you might have once you start studying the variant. I will also leave samples as well as a phone for you to contact me day or night. As the two leave, Jason asks if that's it. Are they just going to believe her? She wasn't lying. I did, however, scan her computer so that we have something to review back at the garage. If it wasn't Dr. Romero who made the cheer drops, it was someone else who had access to her formula. Crane was too protective of it to let it get out of his hands. So we're just gonna go back to the garage and do what? We should hit the Bowery, crack some skulls, get some answers, Batman! Batman tells him, it's broad daylight. It's best used for gathering clues. And Jason gets frustrated. It's a waste of time. We could easily shake down the people using the drugs, get to the dealers, and then to the suppliers. Why would we wait until night? Batman tells him, we might not see eye to eye on most things, but there's a reason I've been able to operate as long as I have. We go out at night, we repair during the day. We aren't reckless, Jason. Jason scoffs, waving him off. What you call reckless, I call saving more lives. Go hibernate in the cave while I get answers. So a short while later, Jason heads into the drug dens following a lead, but the abandoned apartment building is a little too quiet. No one is in sight. Jason basically talks to himself, stating that he could go knocking door to door. But as he gets close to apartment 2D, a cool mist begins to seep out. The mist begins to flow into his mask's ventilation. And just as Jason realizes that it was a trap, he can feel his entire body beginning to freeze over. The apartment door opens up and a voice tells him, Hello there, young man looking for a hit or something? At that moment, Mr. Freeze walks out holding his Freeze gun and smiles. 
Jason could feel it in his bones as the ice slowed his movement. He walked right into Mr. Freeze's trap. Freeze stands over his body, telling him, Not quite the bat bounty I was hoping for, but I'm still quite happy to see you. Jason reaches for his knife, but as he tries to swing, he only manages to catch Freeze in the leg and send them both off balance. He stumbles, the floor beginning to crack, and he crashes down to the floor beneath them. Freeze shoots down into the hole, yelling, Do not move! I am only trying to help! Jason shakes what ice he can, running for the door, asking, Is Freeze on cheer drops? I can figure it out later. Right now, I need to get out of here before I freeze to death! As he breaks through the door, he finds that even the windows are frozen, trapping him essentially in a freezer. Jason then hears Freeze again, telling him, Do not worry, it's going to be okay. As Freeze gets closer, he points his freeze gun at Jason's face, and Jason radios to Oracle. He needs help. I need Batman! Back at the clock tower, Barbara answers the call, asking, Jason? Jason! But when she doesn't get an answer back, she runs over to the computer, radioing to Batman, telling him, Jason needs your help. It's Mr. Freeze. Batman responds, Freeze. He's supposed to be laying low. And Barbara tells him, not anymore. Jason's signal shows him going down Lillo Drive towards the bridge. And Bruce, Jason has never asked for you before, but this time he asked for you directly. He asked for Batman. Batman's entire body trembles for a moment as he realizes the meaning behind this. And he tells her, understood. He slams his foot on the gas pedal, telling Jason, Hold on, I'm on my way. I won't let what happened before happen again. Moments later, Batman radios back. I just caught up to Freeze, but he's guarded. Barbara tells him that she sees him, and it feels like a trap. At that moment, Mr. Freeze leans out the window, tossing a grenade, and when it detonates, it creates a giant ice pillar, forcing Batman to smash through. He ejects himself out, hooking onto the back of Freeze's truck, and he begins to pull himself in. Once in place on the back of the truck, Batman takes out a small explosive, attaching it to the door, and he swings back, blowing the door off. Through the smoke, Jason's frozen body falls out onto the road, and Batman gets ready to stop the truck when he sees a van stop at Jason's body. A group of men get out, one pointing a gun, stating that according to the boss, they don't need this guy anymore. Before the man could fire, a batarang is thrown into his head and Batman quickly starts to take the thugs down. First one gets a punch to the face, then he grabs him, throwing him into the others. With the thugs taken care of, Batman hurries back over to Jason and through the cold. Jason looks up at him. You, you're here. Batman smiles, telling him always. And then suddenly, Batman is hit with a freezing blast. At that moment, a man walks up with a yellow painted face, telling Batman, It is such an honor to finally meet you. As Jason looks up in the sky, he can feel himself able to move. Not a lot, but just enough. Bruce saved him by taking the blast from Mr. Freeze. He has to move. He has to get away from this. But as the others begin to load Batman into the van, the other shooter asks, what about the other guy? Cheer looks down and smiles. Sometimes we can only help people by letting them go. Do you understand? As Cheer grabs the shooter's face, he tells him, but, uh, yeah, sure, man. Goodbye me. The shooter then turns to point his gun at Jason, but before he can pull the trigger, Jason kicks the gun out of his hand. The others turn to stop Jason, but as Freeze lifts his Freeze gun, Cheer stops him, telling him, We need to stick to the plan! Don't let distractions intrude on your happiness! Freeze aims his gun back down, of course. And then he releases an icy blast on the ground, creating a wall of ice, stopping Jason in his tracks from following. Later, Jason is speeding down the street on his motorcycle, asking Oracle if there's any word, and she tells him nothing yet. The others are looking too, but you've been awake for days now, Jason. You need to rest. Everyone else can. Jason interrupts her, though. I'm sorry, but I'm going to keep looking. He pulls up to a house, taking off his helmet, thinking that he is bone tired, and cracking heads is getting him nowhere. He needs to step up and investigate. Not like Bruce, not as cold and clinical as Batman, but rather as a person. He walks up the stairs, knocking on the door, and as it opens, he tells the person, yes, it's the other dark vigilante with much less brand recognition. I'd like to apologize for the other day. Dr. Romero tells him that she's sorry, but she didn't know they were allowed to. Jason asks, not wear costumes? Believe me, those things get filthy real fast, and this is my laundry day. Do you mind if we just talk for a little bit? Olive lets him in, telling him, of course, but where's Batman? 
Jason looks around, telling her that that's why he's here. Batman is missing and is tied to the damn cheer drug. Olive tells him that she told him everything that she knows, and Jason tells her that he knows it's just, it's his fault that Batman is missing. He needs to go over everything again. She tells him, of course. She just had some water boiling for tea when he likes some. Jason tells her that it'd be great. Do you mind if I use your restroom though? She heads into the kitchen and Jason goes to the bathroom and begins to examine it. There were a pair of men's shoes at the front door, but there's also only one toothbrush in the bathroom. Is her husband away? Bruce told them once that if they wanted to know the most about a person, look in their bathroom cabinet. As he opens up the mirror, he sees a lot of medication. Most is for Silvano Romaro and an unusually large supply of SSIRSs and SNRIS. No doctor would ever prescribe such a mix. Also, he takes his toothbrush, but not his antidepressants. Seems like a thread to pull. So after a few moments, Jason returns just as Olive sets down the tea, stating that she hopes that he doesn't mind that it's a little strong. Jason sits down telling her it'll be fine. She has quite a lovely home. Is it just her living here? Says that it's her and her husband, Syl. But he's at, at work right now. Jason pauses. On a Saturday? Oh man, what does he do? She tells him that Syl is a chemist. They met in school, actually. They. But before she could finish, she begins to cry. Jason tells her that he didn't mean to pry, but Olive tells him that it's okay, rough patch. Happens to all couples. She feels foolish for even saying it. Jason leans over, telling her that he has been through his fair share of rough patches. In all manners of relationships. May seem strange, but sometimes opening up to a stranger can do wonders. Meanwhile, in Freeze's hideout, Freeze says that all he ever wanted was to be his friend. They could do so much together, both of us. And Nora, don't you agree, Nora? Batman stares down as he is now suspended from his ice shackle, stating, I couldn't agree more. I think Nora agrees as well. I'd imagine that she'd want you to remove these restraints so that we can go into the world together. Cheer laughs. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm afraid Batman is trying to manipulate your kinder impulses. Imagine being that untrusting that you should have to trick others in order to get what you want. I have spent my life pursuing happiness for myself and others. And you know what is essential to that happiness? Honesty. And for an openness to accepting that honesty. Batman tells him, I don't consider hallucinations to be honesty. Cheer asks Freeze, why don't you go take Nora dancing in the other room? Freeze smiles. That is an excellent idea. Nora loves to dance. As Freeze leaves, Cheer tells Batman that he sees his hallucinations as pure honesty. Your mind revealing your absolute desires, stripped of fear and regrets. Batman scowls. You tell that to the woman in a coma in Gotham Hospital. Cheer tells him, I'm sorry, but do you expect me to feel sad about that? To feel guilty? That woman who felt so low in her life that she would take my cheer drops is now experiencing a world of pure bliss before she exits a world that has only shown her cruelty. And you, you look so unhappy. So really the question became, what would Gotham look like without some angry vengeful monster hiding in it? What would Batman become if he was happy? Cheer then grabs a mask telling him, life is funny. Did you know that my wife created Scarecrow's fear gas? It was genius. She's a genius, Batman. But like most people with talents, she was never appreciated for it. I would bang my head against a wall every day, trying to create something even close to that level. Liv is like a virtuoso composer, while I was perpetually in the cover band. And to be honest, it made me quite sad. And then I realized something, besides Olive. I was the only person in the world who had access to her formula, and I could change it, build upon it, make it a force for good. After all, isn't that what science is? Building on the work of others. Batman struggles to break free, stating, you broke the cardinal rule. You've gotten high in your own supply. I've studied the formula and it's dangerous. Prolonged use can lead to psychosis or a total shutdown of, cheer pauses. I admit it does need some refinement. Everything does, right? This was developed just for you, though. A tougher formula, stronger. One that not only will give you happiness, but an overwhelming sense of satisfaction of a job well done, Batman. Happiness from being finished with a war on crime. Well, are you ready to the ascent to the next level, to a world without Batman?
Jason runs into the cave telling Barbara that he appreciates the assist, and she tells him that Batman would kill her if he finds out that she did this. Jason opens up one of the coolers telling her, yeah, but he'll also be dead if he doesn't get this antidote. Only problem is that the computer has only been able to produce one. Barbara tells him that there's only one because they need to study it before using it on a real person. Jason tells her that he knows, but he's going up against Cheer and Mr. Freeze, and who knows what they have planned. As he looks over at the bat suits, he says that he can't just go in unprepared. Meanwhile, back at Cheer's lab, Cheer says that it's fear. Fear of what his Cheer gas will do to him. What it will unlock. Batman struggles in his frozen shackles with the gas mask on his face. And Cheer goes on telling him, I could see it in your stare, trying not to breathe. But I am here to say that you have nothing to fear. I am here to help, to make you whole, Batman. As Cheer steps back, one of Freeze's thugs punches Batman in the gut, forcing him to breathe. And Cheer says, It's no use fighting. Let the light in. Let in some cheer. Just then, there's an explosion, and Jason jumps in wearing one of Batman's suits. Boo! Jason begins to fight back the thugs, but Freeze hits him with the freeze gun, telling him, I admire your persistence! Jason can feel the ice forming around him and the suit beginning to get a bit bulkier. But it does come with an added bonus. The bat symbol on the chest begins to glow orange along with the rest of the coils lined up throughout the suit, and Jason breaks free, giving Freeze a kick to the head. But the weight makes Jason just a little bit slower, allowing one of the thugs to get a clean hit to his face. He stumbles back and Cheer throws one of his cheer bombs, telling him, it'll all be okay, just breathe it in. Jason remembers the antidote, but if he takes it, he can't save Batman. At that moment, the world begins to change and Jason tells himself that it's not real. Bruce tells him that it's okay. It's over, he did it. Joker was the last one, but he's dead. There are no more villains. That means no more Batman. No more masks. As Bruce walks outside, Jason tells himself, this isn't real, and he grabs his gun. But what he sees is peaceful. Bruce says, it's exhaling for the first time. It's family. It's life. Lives stripped free of masks. We can live together as family, Jason. We never have to fight again. Jason repeats to himself, this isn't real. And Cheer asks if he's ready to peel back the facade of anger to discover the joy within. Jason struggles, smiling. I feel that happiness can wait until I'm done stopping men like you. He lunges out, but Cheer steps back. Okay, that was quite impressive. Admittedly, that was a lower level of the gas, but you are remarkable. But I would highly suggest standing down. That woman in the hospital, the one with the boy, the one that overdosed, one word and she'll depart this world. So how about it? Are you ready to try the good stuff? Jason laughs and Cheer tells him, ah, there's a smile, my gas worked after all. Jason continues, <laughs> no, this is genuine. You wanna know what happiness is? It's knowing that others have your back. At that moment, the rest of the Bat family swoops in, and while everyone begins to make short work of Freeze and his men, Cheer begins to escape, telling him, Well, that is true! Can't help someone who doesn't want to be helped! As Jason pulls himself from the group of men with his grappling hook, he throws a mini explosive to free Batman, but as he checks on him, Batman smiles. It's so great that we're together, Jason! Batman bursts out laughing, so Jason takes the antidote, slamming it into Batman's chest and Batman falls to his knees, gasping for air. But as he regains himself, his happy expression quickly turns to pure rage, and he asks, Where's Cheer? Outside in the rain, Cheer runs, trying to escape, but Batman bursts through the door shortly after. There's nowhere to hide! Cheer backs up along the edge of the building. Hey, look what everyone does to you. They all want you like this. They want you angry, and... Batman grabs Cheer by the jacket, holding him over the ledge. Scarecrow was a monster, showing me my fears, but I already knew my fears. I consider them every night that I do the job. But this, you made me. Jason reaches down, telling Batman that this isn't him. God knows most days he wishes it was, but it's not. If he's going to come down from Mount Judgment to his level for once, 
Cheer is not the guy to do it. Batman shouts as he throws Cheer back onto the roof, falling to his knees. And Nightwing comes out telling him that everything is secure down there. Batman begins to tell him, I, I. And Jason tells him, look, we know big guy, it's okay. And so a few weeks pass, Tyler's mother was given a brand new apartment after she was able to leave the hospital thanks to the foundation. And as Tyler settles in, he tells Jason that this is Captain Powerful, but Captain Powerful isn't as cool as him when he's Red Hood. Jason laughs, <laughs> we talked about this little guy. You gotta keep my secret. And hey, here's something for being great with your mom during the move. Jason pulls something out of his back and Tyler grabs it telling him, it's a blue hoodie. Jason tells him, yeah, you're gonna need it if you're gonna be the blue hood, best superhero of them all. Jason smiles heading outside and Bruce is waiting asking if everything is okay. Jason tells him, yeah, Leslie's still talking to the mom. She's a bit shaky, but good. And Tyler, well, kids are resilient. But if cheer drops are anything like the gas that cheer infected them with, Tyler's mom is going to need help with recovery. He's sorry again. The intense dose of cheer gas and untested antidote put him over the edge. Jason tells him that it's all good and he's giving up the guns. Sure, he's been using rubber bullets lately, but, but none of this feels okay now. Batman tells him that he's glad and Jason stops him. Actually, I don't want to hear it. I'm not doing it for you. I still think that people should die and those people, I still want to hurt them. I just don't want anyone else hurt. Death has a way of rippling out to others. That's all. I'm still figuring things out. The two shake hands. Jason gets on his bike and Bruce calls out telling him that life is too short for them to be like this. Jason gives him a moment, pulls down the visor on the helmet, and he rides off alone again. As he leaves, Bruce gets into his car and Leslie comes out asking if they hugged. Bruce tells her that they shook hands, but they let each other down. It's what they do. It's going to take time to get past that point to help each other. Leslie leans into the car, telling him that he seems off. What did the gas show him? And Bruce looks at her and tells her happiness. He then drives off thinking about what he saw, what made him so mad that he was almost willing to kill. It was the same as Jason, a world where he didn't have to fight, a world where they were together, a world where he and Jason killed the Joker. Later, Jason returns to his home where he sees a box and a letter attached to it. The letter reads, only if you want it. Signed, B. P.S. Family dinner at my place Thursdays. Jason opens the box and laughs, telling him, maybe, just maybe. And inside is a red hood with a bat symbol on the chest. Thank you for watching today's episode of Comic Story in a Full Story. Let me know in the comments down below what you thought about this and who your favorite superhero is. And don't forget, you can check out the Comic Story in main channel to get daily videos. You can join us over at Comic Story in Movies, aka Absolutely, the podcast channel, to get our opinions on everything going on in the world of superhero movies, comic books, and video games. Or you can join us over at Manga Story, where we talk about manga. And don't forget to click the link down below to support us further. This hot sauce is a hot sauce that we have created. Hatch and jalapeno is a flavor that we created which involves infusing whiskey into a hot sauce. No, it's not alcoholic and yes, it is FDA approved. Anyway, once again, thank you so much for watching today's video. I'll see you next time right here.